peace at these demonstrations. By all means, protest, express your First Amendment rights. We will stand up for them. Uh, but we do need peace as well in our city. He would be happy that the people are riding for him in his name because he know that he was murdered. But he wouldn't want it to be this way. He wouldn't want people to get hurt. He wouldn't want businesses and, 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 and people to suffer and people to, to go more and dead and have to start all over. That's the, night, that's the type of stuff he wasn't with. He wasn't with that at all. The officials say at least 170 businesses have been damaged or looted and dozens of fires have started. The Minnesota National Guard is there providing support. The demonstrations in Minnesota have been the most volatile, but outrage is growing in other cities. Protests against police brutality are being held across the country, including in New York, Chicago and Denver. Changing gears back to the coronavirus and as companies are turning to high-tech helpers to protect customers during the pandemic, droids, drones and robots are making deliveries and helping to keep us safe. NBC's Gotti Schwartz has the latest. In the sky above North Carolina, the state famous for being first in flight, another aviation breakthrough as long-range delivery drones are called in to help in the fight against COVID-19. The company Zipline, whose drones have been dropping emergency blood transfusions in remote Rwandan villages for years, now working with Novant Health Systems to get emergency supplies to hospitals in a matter of minutes at the drop of a parachute. Two routes planned so far, with more possible in the future. Zipline drones can fly 100 miles, so it's 50-mile radius. If you think about a drone flying a 50-mile radius, 50 miles in all directions... That's 8,000 square miles. In Florida, drones flying for UPS are helping deliver medication from CVS to retirement communities, while Google's wing drones lowering food, coffee, and groceries from the sky. Here we go. On the ground in some medical facilities, the dangerous job of sanitizing left to automatic arms immune to any disease. And while humans keep their social distance, more robots with wheels are going the extra mile. Driverless cars like these from Neuro offering contact-free delivery, making pharmacy and supply runs in Texas. Here in L.A., food delivery giant Postmates sending yellow droids like this out for drop-offs. And fleets of what are called starships that became popular on some college campuses before the pandemic struck, now retooled to deliver to neighborhoods sheltering in isolation. A future among robots getting closer as us humans stay apart. Gary Schwartz, NBC News, Los Angeles. It was bound to happen now. It may happen even sooner. We thank you for starting your Friday with early today. Have a great and safe weekend. I'm Francis Rivera. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning. Breaking overnight, city under siege. Protests and riots rage in Minneapolis for the third night in a row over the death of George Floyd. Angry crowds set a police precinct on fire, forcing officers to flee. A state of emergency now declared. The National Guard activated. Our communities cannot and will not tolerate. Authorities appeal for calm. Give me and give United States Attorney, the time to do this right, and we will bring you justice, I promise. And this morning, the unrest spreading to major cities from coast to coast. Social media showdown. Twitter flags another post from President Trump, this time for inciting violence. Just ahead, what the president tweeted that set off alarm bells on the heels of his move to crack down on the company. Glimmers of hope. New York City, the epicenter of the nation's coronavirus outbreak, announces its first step toward reopening. Washington, D.C., beginning to ease restrictions today. But new areas of concern emerge where cases have spiked since lifting those stay-at-home orders. Make history. As NASA's groundbreaking SpaceX mission gets set for takeoff tomorrow, the U.S. Space Force launches a new recruiting campaign. I see the future. I see exploration and courage. Just ahead, our inside look at the mission of the nation's new military branch. You have so much talent in the Space Force. And the latest forecast for tomorrow's liftoff. And we're ready to launch. Our summer music series kicks off with a special performance from Lady Antebellum to get the weekend started right. Today, Friday, May 29th, 2020. From NBC News. 
This is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to you today. It is Friday morning, and we're glad to have you with us. Good morning, Savannah. We're going to start off with the tensions boiling over in Minneapolis and beyond over the death of George Floyd. It has been another difficult night, even at this early hour of the morning. It is a very volatile scene there. Police and the National Guard patrolling the streets. Multiple buildings on fire. You see it right there. After a night of protests filled with violence, even rioting, much of the anger aimed at the police precinct of the officers involved in George Floyd's death, who they've been fired, but so far no criminal charges yet. Yeah, the demonstrations are now fanning out to all corners of the country, cities like New York, Louisville, Denver, Los Angeles, and many others, Savannah. In a moment, Hoda, we are going to talk to one of the city council members in Minneapolis. But first, let's get right to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's there on the ground for us. Gabe, good morning. Tell us about the night. Savannah, good morning. This was a powder keg that exploded overnight. Behind me is one of the many buildings that are on fire right now. Many of the protesters here are livid that no charges have been filed against the officers involved in the death of George Floyd. Now, the National Guard and state police are here trying to keep the peace. But today, there are real questions about whether this chaos will keep escalating. This morning, Minneapolis is reeling, tensions running high in a city on edge. A third night of protest again turning violent, demonstrators clashing with police, buildings including this evacuated police precinct burning, protesters cheering as it went up in flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control, and smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. The rioting, a dramatic escalation from more peaceful protests earlier in the day. To tear down our city like this, what's this proving? People who are supposed to protect and serve us sit up and murder us in cold blood. In South Minneapolis and nearby St. Paul, looters ransack businesses. In Louisville, Kentucky, seven people were shot at a rally against police brutality. While nationwide, from Chicago to New York to Denver, there is mounting outrage over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of criminal charges against the four officers involved. This new video from a different angle shows two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. All four officers have been fired. There is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. This is the damage from the air. The governor has now activated the National Guard. We want justice. We're mad. I'm mad. Giovanni Thunstrom was Floyd's employer and landlord. He said Floyd had lost his job due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's like a brother to me, and uh, he didn't serve to die that way. This morning, South Minneapolis is now wondering when the violence will end. Throughout most of the night, there was no police presence here, but that has obviously changed. Protesters had actually cut off access to some parts of this area, so firefighters couldn't make it in here. But now this police has set up a perimeter. It's keeping protesters outside as well as the media. Here's what happened live on television on CNN a short time ago. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind whoa, 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 telling whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? Officers, we're with CNN and he's on the air right now. 
So certainly a very fluid situation here right now. We're keeping safe here with our security team. But as you can see behind me, a huge show of force right now from police on the scene as daybreak. We really start to see for the first time the damage here. It is extensive throughout most of the night. Again, it was chaos here, multiple buildings on fire. Now, though, you see emergency crews here trying to douse the flames and to keep those fires from spreading. Hoda, there are real questions here about what happens next. Wow, what a scene, Gabe. Thank you. We are joined now by Jeremiah Ellison. He's a member of the Minneapolis City Council. Councilman Ellison, good morning to you. I want to get to those protests in just a second, but at the heart of those protests, the rage is about the fact that no one has been arrested in this case. The mayor has basically called it a murder and is asking why that hasn't happened. A lot of people obviously have seen the tape of what happened. But here's what the county attorney said. He said, and this is Mike Freeman, he said uh, that there is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. Are you privy to what that other evidence may be? No, I think the statement's vague. Uh, I wish the uh, district attorney would be more specific. And more importantly, I wish the district attorney uh, would watch the tape uh, see what's evident on the tape as far as the fact that uh, four officers murdered um, uh, uh, Mr. Floyd and, uh, and make the arrest. Well, absent, absent the charges, council member, um, how do you calm a city? You know, I think that we had a great opportunity on the first night to uh, respond differently uh, when it came to the situation. I think for those of us who are who kind of come from more um, activist backgrounds um, and who have participated in mass protests before, uh, you can kind of see where a crowd's going. Um, and I felt like this was really preventable. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, conventional wisdom of, uh, of, 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 of force sort of won out. And uh, that was the strategy we pursued. And I, I think that strategy has proven to be um, uh, an unmitigated failure. You know what? It was interesting. Yesterday on our air, Craig interviewed one of George Floyd's best friends, NBA great Stephen Jackson. And Stephen, he was asked about those protests and what George would have thought. And he said he would have welcomed the support, but he basically said he didn't like that kind of violence in the streets. That wasn't, he said, what George Floyd would have wanted. Yeah. You know, I... I think one of the one of the dynamics when when you look at a protest like that is that really the protest is uh, it's about the death of the person um, and and not always necessarily what the person would have wanted. Right. Um, I imagine that nobody would want to see the kind of devastation that we uh, are experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, but what people are, are responding to uh, are, is not just uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, but also uh, Philando Castile. Uh, Jamar Clark, uh, Fong Lee, these are people who have been killed by the various police departments in the metro area um, and who have whose deaths have largely gone um, unrecognized as crimes. Uh, just pull out your tea leaves for one second and just tell me finally where you think we will be one week from today. You know, um, you know, all I can do is speculate. Uh, I, I hope that um, uh, that the district attorney is able to get his act together and uh, uh, make the arrest of the four officers who uh, uh, participated in the murder. Um, and, uh, and I hope that the crowd, um, I hope that the, the protesters um, uh, begin to, to, to recede and go home. Uh, I understand the rage. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is shocking to see the level of destruction that's occurred. Um, and, uh, and, and I just hope that we can um, keep as many people as safe as possible um, and, and begin to, uh, on a road to justice. Uh, and I think that's really what the protesters are calling for. All right, Minneapolis City Councilman Jeremiah Ellison. Councilman Ellison, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Savannah, over to you. Hoda, also overnight, a tweet about the situation unfolding in Minneapolis from President Trump led Twitter to flag it for violating the company's rules against glorifying violence. This happened just hours after the president moved to crack down on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has more on this back and forth. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. President Trump did take to Twitter overnight to weigh in on this violence in Minneapolis, calling the protesters thugs and warning that looters could be shot. Twitter, that has been locked in that bitter back and forth with the president this week, quickly flagged one of those tweets, as you noted, blocking it from being liked. 
saying the president's words violated the company's rules against promoting violence. Overnight, the president making his position clear, writing, These thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That tweet then flagged by Twitter, adding what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The president also going after the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry, calling him weak and saying he should get his act together and bring the city under control or I will send in the National Guard and get the job done right. The mayor responding overnight. Weakness is refusing to take responsibility for your own actions. Weakness is pointing your finger at somebody else during a time of crisis. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes, but you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. About that flag that Twitter posted on the president's tweet, the company in a series of tweets of its own overnight notes, the historical context of some of the language the president used in his tweet, its connection to violence as well, they say. Twitter does not specifically detail what it is referring to, but during the bloodshed of U.S. riots in the late 1960s, Miami's police chief infuriated black leaders at the time, famously crediting the calm in his city to a get tough warning that he had delivered, saying, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter has not taken down the president's tweet, saying it's determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. Back to you. All right. Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Let's turn now to the coronavirus. New York City, the main epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, is now ready to take its first steps toward reopening. But what will that look like? And will it be soon enough for struggling businesses? NBC's Kathy Park is in Times Square. Hey, Kath, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. When the stay-at-home order went into effect more than two months ago, the images of Times Square emptying out was just jarring. And this morning, it's still pretty empty. However, we are starting to hear the construction pick back up. And for the first time, we're getting a closer look at what reopening New York City will look like. This morning, New York City, the only part of the state that's still shut down, is on the verge of reopening. It's important to remind everyone, we say restart, we do not mean rushing back. The city is setting its sights on the next two weeks, sending between 200 and 400,000 New Yorkers back to work. It will also be a huge test for the city's sprawling mass transit system, which is now sanitized daily. The nation's former epicenter of the outbreak is close to meeting the final benchmarks for phase one, having enough hospital beds and contact tracers. We don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. By the first half of June, non-essential retail like clothing and furniture stores can reopen for curbside pickup. Manufacturing, construction and wholesale operations can also resume. But the new plans don't include bars and restaurants. They'll have to continue surviving on pickups and deliveries for at least another month. We're past the shock and awe phase and now we're ready for the rebirth. And the point is we, we, you know, we want it to keep getting better once it starts. Some businesses have defied the orders opening prematurely, like this tanning salon on Staten Island. The mayor says those businesses could face fines. The goal here is not to fine businesses, not to shut down businesses, but to educate and support businesses. But we got to get it right. While infections in the city are at the lowest level we've seen in months, Governor Andrew Cuomo highlighted the importance of taking precautions, issuing an executive order giving businesses the right to refuse service for customers without face coverings. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. While enlisting the help of longtime Brooklyn natives, Chris Rock and Rosie Perez to spread the message. I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. <laughs> And across the country, more signs of progress starting today. D.C. will be lifting some restrictions after noticing a 14 day decline in community spread and more businesses in Illinois will be coming online with limits. 
But in Kenosha County, Wisconsin, it's a different story. Health officials there are reporting a 20% spike in cases after their stay at home order was lifted. Hoda? All right, Kathy Park for us in what looks to be a busier Times Square than usual. All right, uh, Savannah, over to you. All right, some good news, too, for those of you looking to visit a national park in the near future. The Grand Canyon is expanding access to its popular South Rim entrance. Starting today, the entrance will be open from 4 a.m. until 2 p.m. And on June 5th, next week, it'll be open around the clock. The entrance was closed temporarily, of course, over virus concerns. The park's hotels are also planning to reopen soon. So we're starting to see the world come back a little bit. Yes, okay. come back to life. And it's a good time that we should say good morning to Mr. Roker. Hey, Al, get our first check of the weather. I do, guys, and we're going to be looking at some severe weather making its way into the northeast and mid-Atlantic states today. 29 million people at risk for hazardous weather, damaging winds, tornadoes, possible hail as well. One system pushes out and fades away, bringing up warm, humid air, and then inland storms intensify as the second front pushes through. As that moves off tomorrow morning, we've got cooler air behind it, strong storms firing up for the southeast. And in fact, as you look along the mid-Atlantic and southeastern states, we may see four inches of rain along the coastal communities and into the northeast locally could see upwards of two inches stretching into interior sections of New England and northern New England as well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Back now, uh, 730 on this Friday morning, unsettling scenes in Minneapolis. This morning, buildings on fire, riot police deployed. This is a third night of protests over the death of George Floyd. And as we say good morning to Craig, uh, that is where we start off our 730 headline, Savannah. Yeah, unfortunately, this breaking news continues. Hundreds of demonstrators clashing with police. Several buildings, including... This evacuated police precinct was set on fire. In other parts of the city, looters ransacked businesses. And around the country, there is growing unrest over George Floyd's death. Now, the four officers involved have been fired. They have not been criminally charged. Meanwhile, Twitter overnight flagging a tweet by President Trump that it says glorified violence and violated the company's policies. The president writing, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter then added what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The Boston Marathon has been canceled for the first time in its 124-year history. Originally, it was scheduled for April 20th. I guess it was really postponed. Organizers had pushed the race back to September due to the coronavirus epidemic. But Thursday, wow, it was called off altogether. Organizers say they'll have a virtual event instead. Participants who verify that they ran 26.2 miles on their own will receive their finishers medal. So I wonder if you have to verify that you ran the 26.2 at the same time. Like if you, if it's a cumulative. <laughs> 10 in the morning thing. and 10 at night. <laughs> right. Probably you can space you it out. the medal. Or, or what if you just moved, well, Craig, good idea. You could move the decimal point and just be like 2.62. There you go. Maybe there you then go. You know. I ran Boston. Yeah, why not? Guys, a lot of eyes are going to be on the Kennedy Space Center tomorrow afternoon for the historic SpaceX launch. It was delayed by weather earlier in the week. But space is really the hot topic these days, getting a lot of attention. And NBC's Carrie Sanders joins us from Cape Canaveral to explain why. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Well, good morning. It's all about Space Force, which is brand new. But I'm at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And right over there is where the U.S. Air Force launched the first satellite in 1958. And historians will tell you that Ever since then, there's been discussions about a need for maybe a new separate branch of the military. Now it's Space Force. And now, 62 years later, it's reality. 
and liftoff. There's a big buzz about space these days, and it's not just the SpaceX rocket set to carry two American astronauts to the International Space Station. The first crew launched from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. There's also a new division of the U.S. Armed Forces, Space Force. President Trump signed a new defense bill in December, officially establishing the sixth branch of the military, the first since the Air Force was created in 1947. The establishment of the United States Space Force. Space Force is working with a $15 billion military budget. To make sure that we have everything that we need to have in space and the ability to perform the operations that we need to do. The new division will take over the Air Force's existing missions in space, like protecting satellites and GPS, but that's not all. Defend the domain of space, which is really central to our way of life today. Focus our assets and capabilities in this new domain. A division so new, it hasn't yet decided its rank structure. Obviously, we won't be called airmen. But space cadets isn't going to be one of them. I, I sure hope so, but I don't think so. <laughs> the first class of graduates excited to be getting in on the ground floor of this brave new frontier. You have so much talent in the Space Force. I was extremely lucky to be one of the four cyberspace operations officers to be able to commission straight into the Space Force this year. And I had to ask. What about an alien attack? I have no responsibility of defending you from an alien attack, so. Space, such a hot topic these days. There's even a new Netflix series called Space Force. The president is creating a new branch, Space Force, <laughs> which Mark will run. <laughs> what? The galaxy far, far away is going to make for a great adventure. The universe is a big place. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. All right, it is exciting, Carrie. Carrie, and let's just hope that the Netflix Space Force does not resemble our actual Space Force. But, but paint a picture for us, if you can, buddy. What is this, this Space Force actually going to look like? What's it going to be doing on a daily basis? You know, it's so brand new. They only have 86 members right now. They haven't even figured out, as we know, the rank structure. Uh, but it will be based at the Pentagon. They will be dealing with things in outer space. It can be uh, satellites. It can be things that we don't know about because it needs to be secret. It can even be cleaning up space junk. And just to give you sort of a moment of history here, because we have all eyes on space right now with what's going to happen possibly tomorrow, over my shoulder there, that is where America's first astronaut into space, Alan Shepard, launched in uh, 1961. And it's really uh, kind of amazing to look at that replica of the Mercury that launched here. Uh, really quite a, uh, an amazing kind of attention that the whole nation is now giving to space with Space Force. And the reminder of what we can do. Uh, Kerry Sanders for us there at Cape Canaveral. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back with our series, The New Normal. Summer season is here. Families longing to escape and spend time away from home. But what do vacations look like in the coronavirus era? Well, with so many hotels still closed, a lot of people are looking to rent or buy RVs, according to one bank, applications for them and boats have exploded by 50 percent. So we asked NBC's tech correspondent Jacob Ward to explore the trend. Rise and shine. Good morning, Jake. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. That's right. You know, people are applying for the loans to buy an RV in huge numbers, and huge numbers of people who already own them are renting them out. It seems to be that the, the freedom of the open road is calling to America. Of course, that freedom comes with some new rules. The national mood right now is, well, you know what it is. Get me out of the house. The Reynolds family spent 66 days stuck in their house in Austin. I've been at home with my three children who are six and under, so just, you know, wanted to get out of the house. Now, they are first-time RV renters, and they just pulled into the Blue Water RV Resort on the Texas coast. Maybe we'll turn into RV people, <laughs> you know? Never never thought anything of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It feels like an all-inclusive resort. Now, my family loves to camp, and we would love nothing more than to do what the Reynolds family is doing. 
But we live in a county in California that's still under a shelter in place order. And as a result, here we are camping in our backyard. Across the country, it is a patchwork of reopenings and improvised regulations. You can't just get in an RV and park it anyway. Reservations are required at most of the places you want to go. And even if you do get a reservation, there are new rules to follow. No visitors, no playground, no bathrooms. Camping is limited to families or households that you typically would be hanging out with during the time of COVID. But we will take it. A survey by the U.S. Travel Association found that only 18% of travelers feel safe flying and only 18% feel safe at a hotel. Maybe that's why people are buying and renting RVs in big numbers. It felt like the right first step to returning to travel. They view RVs and boating as, as fun, safe ways to control their environment. Rental company RV Share says RV rentals are twice what they were last summer. And while most RV rentals are normally booked well in advance, another company, Outdoorsy, says half their bookings are now last minute. Lots of people want to rent an RV, and they want to do it now. We're at Lake Tower! I love that we could bring our own bedding from our house and don't have to worry about somebody else cleaning it or touching it during this time of social distancing. That is good news for RV resorts. All of our holidays are already booked up for the summer. Meanwhile, I'll have to be satisfied with just hearing about the Reynolds getaway by phone from my basement. Tell me, please, what's it going to be like on the beach? Just give me, paint me a picture here. What do you? Mostly just watch the kids build sandcastles and run into the water. Just relax, not yeah. be in our house or yeah. backyard. Exactly. You guys. You know, these are amazing machines, and some people are using them, of course, for more than just fun. An estimated one million Americans treat an RV as a primary residence, and in tough economic times, a lot of people are forced to make that choice. But they can be used for other things as well. There's even an RVs for MDs Facebook page that is pairing people who own RVs with first responders, doctors, and nurses who need a place to shelter away from their family. So a lot of people looking at RVs for a lot of reasons. You oh, guys. that is super. Super cool. Hey, Jake, I was wondering, do you need like a special driver's license if you're going to rent one of those or can you just use your regular one? You do. You're going to need one for one of the big self-contained ones. You have to spe uh, have a special license for that to be able to, to uh, tow one around or drive one of those camper vans. And those are the ones that, of course, I have been, you know, sitting here in my basement in California going, oh, oh, the, <laughs> the camper van. I would take a camper van. You know, those ones you can get right into and pull away, which is, of course, the dream here, you guys. I would love to do it. I, let's let's do it. Let's do a road trip later this summer, ladies. What do you say? I'll, I'll drive. Meet you. I'll meet you in the Al's middle of the country. I'll meet you somewhere. Years. I don't know. I'd love to do it. I think take, a road trip would be a blast. Take the show on the road. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Al has wanted right. to put That's us right. all in the Winnebago yeah. for a long, long time. I have <laughs> yeah. been begging. Haven't you, Al? Begging to do that. Yeah. Craig, and I, Craig, you and I did that, remember? I do. Up, up in New England. Where you drove like a madman. I remember that. Where I was, I was fearful for my life. That's right. Uh, while we have you, you cried like a baby. I knew that was coming. <laughs> while, while we have you, how about a check of the weather, sir, including how things might be looking for that, uh, that launch, fingers crossed, tomorrow. That's right. For Launch America, we are keeping our fingers crossed. Here's what we're expecting. Saturday, probably the iffier of the two days, a 60% chance of thunderstorms, southerly winds 10 to 15. Sunday, a 40% chance of thunderstorms. You can see on the future cast, a little clearer. So hopefully one of those two days is going to work and we'll see that, that crude ship take off. Above normal on both ends of the coast, but big changes coming to the northeast. You can see today temperatures anywhere from 10 to 15. 15 degrees below average, b above average, I should say. But behind that front, temperatures drop. And then by Saturday, it's cooler in Milwaukee, Buffalo, Charleston. Uh, fairly decent in the northeast. But then into next week, temperatures warm up nicely. By Tuesday, Kansas City are at 89, 73 in Detroit and Philadelphia, and 87 degrees in Nashville. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight, Minneapolis on fire. Buildings burn as demonstrators take to the streets for another night of violent protests over the death of George Floyd and the lack of charges against the officers involved. George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! This morning, the National Guard stepping in. We're live with the latest. Plus, fair share, how rideshare apps are encouraging customers to stay safe, even if that means staying out of the car. Just ahead, we'll hear from the CEO of Uber in an exclusive live interview. And champagne morning. We're kicking off our city music series with a performance from Lady Antebellum and a special surprise for some lucky fans you don't want to miss. Today, Friday, May 29th, 2020. <laughs> Today, we're the Carl family from Waco, Texas. Hey, San Antonio, you look good. I can add at home with Lady Antebellum in Larchmont, New York. From El Cajon, California, we, we love, love Lady A and today. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome back to today. It is so nice to have you with us. If you're just waking up, we have some great news for you. It's Friday. <laughs> That's right. How good does that sound? Friday. And we got some other great news, especially for you, Savannah. Lady Antebellum, I mean, come on. That's what you need on My this favorite. Friday. Hey, let's go to our big board and say hello to our Today Plaza crowd. Talk about Lady A fans. They are out in number this morning. You guys are lucky because this is our very first summer music series. And Lady A is kicking it off. So we'll speak to you guys in a bit. Yeah, they got front row seats, right? <laughs> yep. uh, meanwhile, Craig, we are really looking forward to a series that you're going to start next week. Tell That's us about right. It. That's right. We're going to be traveling, traveling around to give folks a firsthand look at reopening America. Our first stop is an iconic summer destination, especially in these parts. Delaware's Rehoboth Beach. Yeah. We're going to talk to business owners. That's right. This, this, these are your people. Business owners along the boardwalk there who are waiting and hoping uh, for tourists to return. So we're going to spend some time there in Rehoboth Beach. We'll go to Philadelphia. We'll spend some time around the New York City, New Jersey area as well. That's all next week here on Today, third hour of Today, MSNBC and NBC News Now.
Yeah, we're all going to get out and about this summer. Hoda mm -hmm. and I are going to take a trip as well, so we look forward to that. Um, we're going to be looking at the reopening of Las Vegas next week as well. One company's plan to keep hotels safe. And, of course, the official start of hurricane season, which Al has his eye on. So a lot to get to next week. Uh, but let's start with this morning and the news here at 8 o'clock. A third night of outrage over the death of George Floyd led to violence, to looting, and the burning of a Minneapolis police building. Protests have also spread to other major cities around the country. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. He had a long night watching these protests unfold. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. This was a powder keg and it exploded overnight. Take a look behind me. This is one of many buildings on fire and authorities are trying to douse the flames. Again, many buildings in this area went up in flames overnight and now the National Guard and the state police is here trying to set up a perimeter. So overnight officers were not here uh, because many of the protesters had blocked off access points here and prevented firefighters from arriving on the scene. But as you can see there is there are new flames new uh, more billowing smoke in the distance these state patrol officers are trying to keep the peace many of the protesters were furious at the death of George Floyd and that the four officers involved had not faced charges as of yet now the question is will this violence escalate Overnight, a city on fire. More protesters swarming the streets of Minneapolis. Some clashing with police and even forcing their way into the precinct. Before the evacuated building erupted into flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control. The smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. Days of violence leading the governor to activate the National Guard. These armed shop owners spending the day trying to protect their business from looters. The outrage mounting across the country over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of charges against the four officers involved. This new video showing a different angle of Monday's encounter between Floyd and police. Two other officers not seen before side by side next to officer Derek Chauvin who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. All four officers have been fired invoking their Fifth Amendment rights. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. The county attorney, who's facing growing pressure to charge them, is warning it's not a clear-cut case. We are going to investigate it as expeditiously, as thoroughly, and completely as justice demands. Sometimes that takes a little time, and we ask people to be patient. We have to do this right. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. Overnight, Floyd's brother watching the chaos unfold. It's literally seems like Monday all over again. Former NFL quarterback turned activist Colin Kaepernick defending the protesters earlier in the day, tweeting, we have the right to fight back. Every day I'm being haunted as prey. Amid the cries for justice, a song of innocence by 12-year-old Keydron Bryant resonating with millions. I just want to live. A desperate plea and a hope that this time Things will change. This morning, a much calmer scene than what we show, than what we saw overnight. Again, authorities are here on the scene trying to maintain order. Firefighters are trying to douse these flames, but more protests are expected later today. Hoda. All right, Gabe, thank you. Let's move now to the latest on the coronavirus. New hotspots emerging across the country, even as the original epicenter in this country, which is here in New York, prepares to reopen. NBC White House correspondent Peter Alexander has three things he's watching this morning. Hey, Peter.
Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. Here are those latest numbers on the coronavirus crisis. The death toll across this country rising to more than 102,000. Now more than 100, or excuse me, 1.7 million cases nationwide. Still, concerns are growing in places like Wisconsin that just saw its highest single day increase in cases and deaths this week, two weeks after that state's highest court overturned a stay at home order. There are new signs of progress, though, here in Washington. The district is lifting some restrictions today. That's after a 14 day decline in community spread of the virus. And in New York City, as you noted, the only part of that state that is still shut down, still on the verge now, fortunately, of reopening. The city preparing to send 200 to 400,000 New Yorkers back to work over the next couple of weeks. What will be a significant, a big test for that city's mass transit system, those subways and buses that are now sanitized daily. New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo giving businesses there a new tool to combat the virus. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. As for New York City, the new plan does not include bars and restaurants. They're going to have to stick with those pickups and deliveries for at least another month. Craig. Peter Alexander from the White House for us. Peter, thank you. Now to growing concerns around the world over a second wave of the coronavirus. This morning, health officials in South Korea are taking steps to control a new cluster of cases that suddenly emerged there. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul, South Korea for us. Kelly, good morning. Craig, good morning to you. It is Friday evening here in Seoul. You can see people are out and about enjoying the summer weather. But not for much longer, most likely. A big shift in government policy today. They're advising people to stay inside this weekend. They've closed public parks and public buildings as they battle this new outbreak. The last changing of the guard at Seoul's National Palace for another two weeks. Museums and parks are closing, libraries locking their doors because of an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse. 79 new cases Thursday, 58 today, the biggest jump in two months. Uh, yeah, we didn't, uh, Seoul's public uh, health director told me they're worried about the increase in daily infections and a rise in cases that can't be traced. It comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students in classrooms, worshipers at church. On Wednesday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof. That church now tells us they'll dial back on big services. In Brazil, the virus is still surging, with daily deaths over 1,000 for three days this week. Beaches in Rio are empty, but in the hardest hit city, Sao Paulo, they'll start reopening shopping malls and car dealers on Monday. Another hotspot in India, hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Britain, with the highest death rate in Europe, is getting ready to reopen schools. Prince William warning of the toll on mental health. It's scary. Um, it's making a lot of people anxious and uncertain. Back in Seoul, people are once again being asked to work from home and to avoid socializing, especially in big groups. With the new cases, are you worried? No, not at all. Many here still confident the country will bring the virus under control. And this new guidance is now in place for the next two weeks. This outbreak is connected to Seoul's or South Korea's biggest e-commerce business. They're testing a lot of employees. About 100 have already tested positive, including delivery workers and some of the people that they came into contact with. Health officials really stressing again that these next two weeks are critical. Craig. OK, we'll be watching Kelly Kobe Air Force there in Seoul. Kelly, thank you. All right. How about a little morning boost, kiddos? Yes. The mystery of the yes. big pink unicorn. <laughs> it's been solved and it's all good. OK, there's a unicorn that was seen prancing down the street in suburban New Jersey this week. Oh. She looked like she was on a mission, like she did have some place <laughs> to go. And she sure did. Before long, up came a little boy running up. Epic hug. It was followed by that hug and then another. And you know why that little boy was so excited? Well, they realized that was grandma in that inflatable suit. She hadn't hugged those two in two months of quarantine. So she zipped up the, the outfit and she was she got a big surprise. So that's crazy. Yeah, that's one way to do it. By the way, 
I bet those unicorn suits are flying <laughs> off the shelves. It's a great idea. Guys, this next boost also has a surprise ending, and it's pretty quick, so peel your eyes open. You don't want to miss it. The only thing more intimidating than this tall fence is the sign posted on it. There must be some ferocious <laughs> beast on the other side. Or not. And I mean, look, I think that little pup has the right idea. He's lounging, he's getting ready for the weekend. The only thing he needs is, I don't know, yes. a Michelob light or something. He's like a couch potato. I love it. He looks Coming more like a Nick Ultra guys. dog to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, the impact of the coronavirus has been devastating across the entire economy, but especially for ride sharing, an industry based around the very idea of sharing time and space in close quarters, Savannah. Yes, yeah, so it has been hard hit. Companies like Uber and Lyft are trying to battle back with a renewed emphasis on safety. And in a moment, we're going to have an exclusive live interview with Uber's CEO. But first, here's NBC's Sam Brock with the backstory. In a recent ad for Uber, a father holds his child. Friends and family wave from afar, and people hunker down in their homes, doing everything but get inside a car. The message, stay home for everyone who can't, reflects a reality devastating companies like Uber, Lyft, and Bird. Safety concerns and lockdowns have led to leaner ridership. Uber's bookings dropped 80% in April. Lyft rides fell 75% from the same month last year, and e-bikes and scooters have lost their buzz, with wheels and lime pausing operations in some markets. Not to mention the impact on drivers. How hard has it been for you driving recently in terms of just getting business? Not a lot of customers. I feel that it's, it's not a safe for everybody. So I am driving, but I'm, I'm not sure as if I'm doing the right things. So you keep Lysol in the car with you? Yeah. Walter Stefano returned to work a couple weeks ago, protected by a plastic barrier and plenty of cleaning products, but not armed for the economic bite. How much business would you say you've lost? About 60%. You've lost 60% of your customers? Yes. Uber has offered workers 19 million in financial aid so far and has buckled down on safety since the start of the pandemic. You can't enter a car without agreeing to wear a face covering and acknowledging no symptoms. The company's pumped $50 million into cleaning supplies and PPE for drivers and new this morning, riders can book hourly windows at a flat rate to reduce exposure. Lyft, likewise, making face masks mandatory for riders and drivers and investing heavily in cleaning supplies. For ride-sharing users like Amanda Rivera, the risks at this point seem manageable. As long as you're healthy and you're taking the right precautions, I think you're safe. Thanks for helping keep your community and yourself safe. A call to action for being conscientious, wearing a mask, and refusing to ride with those who won't. If someone is not wearing a face mask, you better use the face mask, they don't get in my car. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. And that brings us into to Dara Khosrowshahi, who is the CEO of Uber. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, the numbers are just jaw-dropping, ridership down 80% in April. You've called it a shock to the system. Do you feel the worst of this crisis is behind you for Uber and ride-sharing services? We certainly do. Uh, I think Uber essentially goes with the city. We are very much a local business, and when the heartbeat of the city starts beating again, uh, Uber starts moving. So we are seeing... Uh, business improve from those April lows, still down significantly, but we are seeing the improvement happening faster in some of the states and cities that are opening up uh, cautiously, obviously, in, let's say, in Atlanta or Houston. Uh, we are seeing volumes return. And even in other states that haven't completely opened up, they're off the bottom, but they still are down significantly year on year. But we are seeing signs of life, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you want to get moving, but you want to get moving in a safe way. 
Well, that brings me to my next question, because a lot of folks had come to depend on Uber. I know you, the company was about to be profitable for the first time uh, by the end of the year. How do you convince people now that it's safe, that they should get in a confined space with a stranger, convincing driver, drivers and customers? Absolutely. It's a it's a two way street. And, and for us, we have redesigned the experience from top to bottom with safety in mind. Uh, our drivers and our riders have to wear a mask. And for example, we are rolling out a technology feature for our drivers where the drivers actually have to take a selfie. Uh, and we have machine learning algorithms understanding whether that driver is actually wearing a mask or saying that uh, they're wearing a mask. If a driver sees a rider who is not wearing a mask, uh, they can cancel the trip uh, if they feel unsafe as well. Uh, we've invested millions in PPE. We've got we've secured 23 million masks and are distributing them to our drivers as well. Uh, so you know, getting out of the house, um, starting to move again, uh, is going to feel funny and it may feel unsafe. And we're doing our part to make it as safe as possible. And then we're also including two-way accountability. The rider and the driver essentially rate each other. And to the extent that they see behavior that's unsafe, uh, we'll instantly know about it and be able to do something about it. And to go in long term, I mean, so much about our society has changed and we don't know yet whether it's permanent. I mean, you're talking about companies who may start working from home exclusively or uh, in a much more significant way. People not going to doing the work travel so much of Uber or, or, or trips to the airport, things like that, or to concerts. Do you worry about this business long term being able to survive? I think that the focus right now, honestly, is short term and tomorrow. How can we build the safest service uh, we can. The long term will take care of itself. We think we can make the right adjustments. And actually, in certain places, let's say Hong Kong, uh, who is more advanced in terms of their uh, response, in terms of testing, masks, et cetera, we're seeing the business come back uh, even sometimes close to prior levels. People are getting back to work, even during what you call party hours, where people are going out to restaurants, life begins anew. While I don't expect behavior to revert to where we were previously, unless there's a vaccine or something very big happens, I do think that people, uh, behaviors and people revert to normal. They're gonna be, be more careful. They are gonna wear masks. We're gonna have cleaning supplies. So certain things are gonna change. But I do think that business is gonna come back. If life comes back into the city, then Uber will be back along with it. And in the short few moments we have left, you wrote a letter to the White House asking that Uber drivers be included in the stimulus package that gave relief. And one of the, it did, by the way, did include drivers and gig workers. One yes. of the reasons they hadn't been included is because they are not considered full time employees by a company like Uber. Do you have a change of heart at all about that? We just have about 30 seconds left. I know it's not your business model, but I just wonder how you're feeling about it. I do think that independent work should come with social protections, should come with minimum earnings protections, uh, health protections, accident protection, et cetera. That is a change from where we've come from. And we need to work with lawmakers, regulators to allow that to happen. There's no reason why independent work shouldn't come with respect and shouldn't come with the kinds of protections that I think society now is asking for. And we as a company completely agree with, we do want to be a leader here going forward. Well, Uber CEO Dara Khazra Hashahi, thank you so much. I know the company has also donated a half a million dollars to international relief efforts and wanted to mention that as well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Welcome back. Lady Antebellum has been making music together for more than a decade, racking up Grammys and other awards along the way. And we're so happy to have Lady A, Hillary, Dave, and Charles with us live from Nashville. Guys, good morning. Okay, so Hillary's in one place. 
<laughs> Charles and Dave are together. <laughs> Hillary, are you jealous? You guys haven't, you've, you've been like torn apart for the last few months. Oh, you know what? I'm actually going to be hanging out with them um, in a couple hours. So I'll see you in a oh. bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to write, we're going to write a Christmas yeah. song actually today. Yeah. Oh, wow. Perfect yeah. times. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll all be in the mood for that. Yeah. So Dave <laughs> um, and, and Charles, tell me how it's been going in quarantine. What have you guys been doing? I know you're not quarantining together, or are you? Yeah, we're, we're in Nashville now, uh, but we've watched every movie you can on Disney Plus and yeah. Netflix with the kids. So, But we're surviving. I mean, the kids are having a good time I and mean, just to be at home with them and but uh we've we've kind of hit that point we've hit that point we're ready to get out for a little bit <laughs> we've been doing a lot of writing songwriting over the over like that zoom app too which has been very interesting you know you kind of you got to get creative and so you know with all this time on our hands um you know we've been trying to write and just stay as productive as we as we can you know unfortunately we can't tour right now so it just is what it is what's good yeah, it's good to have the outlet. Hillary, you've got little ones, too. How are you keeping them entertained and still working? Oh, a lot of, um, same as Dave, Disney Plus. Um, ironically, you know, <laughs> with today getting up early and getting myself ready, we had kind of, we called in some some help to get, to make sure that the girls were covered because my husband, Chris, has been helping me get the setup going to be able to talk to you guys this morning. And, of course, they slept in. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I have to wake up extra early. They sleep in, <laughs> so that's just the motherhood. One morning, <laughs> it is. It totally is. By the way, um, Dave, you put a hilarious video on Facebook, which um, show you're, I'm glad your creative juices are still flowing, Dave. Uh, people should yeah. check that out. Hoda though has got one of your super fans on our virtual plaza. Hi guys, Hoda, what's going on? Hey, Hoda. hey, hey. honey, it's good to see y'all. We love you. We miss you. Look at our great big board. We have a lot of Lady A oh, fans. They all that? love you, all of them. But I want to single out Mindy and Chris from Centerville, Ohio. Hey. 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 Y'all, ten years ago, had their wedding in the summertime, and their first dance was to your song "When You Got a Good Thing." So now they got two kids. They got Luke and Leanne. And they only wanted two things for their anniversary. They wanted to see a Lady A concert, and they wanted to come hear you guys. Hi. Do y'all want to say hi to Lady and to Bella? Yes, we, oh, we love, love them. <laughs> hi. Thank you. That's so cool. Hey, guys, tell us about your why you picked them for your first dance. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we, we just... We've always been um, a great united couple, and we're actually like Team Newman. So we met on a blind date, and you know when it comes down to it, you got a good thing, and you got to stick through it. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, so cool. And how old are the kids? Um, we got Luke is five and Leanna seven. In a hat because in two months, I'll be eight years old. <laughs> well, you guys, here's some great news. You got to meet Lady A virtually, and you're going to hear them perform. And Lady A, I think they, you've got a little thing you want to give to this family? Yes. Yeah. We yeah, we're um, whenever we hit back on the road, we're going to give you guys some tickets and hook you up with a VIP experience. Backstage. So, yeah, oh, y'all can come here. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, guys. And then the next kids can play with our kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> seven-year-old can babysit our kids. Oh, I love that. <laughs> All right, guys, stick around. Miracle babies. Oh, Aww. don't go anywhere, guys. Don't go anywhere. They've got a song. They're going to play for you a special performance of Champagne Night. But first, this is today on NBC. Oh. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. are ready to kick off our city music series with a special performance they've recorded for us of their newest hit, Champagne Night. And here they are. The stars go out on the sunset strip Still stay lit Make it 20 last like it's 1990 We are here Where we're from We don't 
Friday, our thanks to Lady Annabelle. Don't they sound good? Yeah, yeah and our plaza. Our plaza loved that, too. Uh, that was fun. By the way, guys, the fun doesn't have to end here. We have a new project. It's called One Good Thing. It has more videos and stories that will all brighten your day. So just text today to 66866. Sign up for our daily newsletter, and it'll help boost your spirit. So text the word today to that, that phone number. Yep. Okay. Or something uh, like that. We You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus. The enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt.
You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Good morning. Breaking overnight, city under siege. Protests and riots rage in Minneapolis for the third night in a row over the death of George Floyd. Angry crowds set a police precinct on fire, forcing officers to flee. George Floyd! George Floyd! George Floyd! A state of emergency now declared. The National Guard activated. Our communities cannot and will not tolerate. Authorities appeal for calm. Give me and give United States Attorney, the time to do this right, and we will bring you justice, I promise. And this morning, the unrest spreading to major cities from coast to coast. Social media showdown. Twitter flags another post from President Trump, this time for inciting violence. Just ahead, what the president tweeted that set off alarm bells on the heels of his move to crack down on the company. Glimmers of hope. New York City, the epicenter of the nation's coronavirus outbreak, announces its first step toward reopening. Washington, D.C., beginning to ease restrictions today. But new areas of concern emerge where cases have spiked since lifting those stay-at-home orders. Make history. As NASA's groundbreaking SpaceX mission gets set for takeoff tomorrow, the U.S. Space Force launches a new recruiting campaign. I see the future. I see exploration and courage. Just ahead, our inside look at the mission of the nation's new military branch. You have so much talent in the Space Force. And the latest forecast for tomorrow's liftoff. And we're ready to launch. Our summer music series kicks off with a special performance from Lady Antebellum to get the weekend started right. Today, Friday, May 29th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to you today. It is Friday morning, and we're glad to have you with us. Good morning, Savannah. We're going to start off with the tensions boiling over in Minneapolis and beyond over the death of George Floyd. It has been another difficult night, even at this early hour of the morning. It is a very volatile scene there. Police and the National Guard patrolling the streets. Multiple buildings on fire. You see it right there. After a night of protests filled with violence, even rioting, much of the anger aimed at the police precinct of the officers involved in George Floyd's death, who they've been fired, but so far no criminal charges yet. Yeah, the demonstrations are now fanning out to all corners of the country, cities like New York, Louisville, Denver, Los Angeles, and many others, Savannah. In a moment, Hoda, we are going to talk to one of the city council members in Minneapolis. But first, let's get right to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's there on the ground for us. Gabe, good morning. Tell us about the night. 
Savannah, good morning. This was a powder keg that exploded overnight. Behind me is one of the many buildings that are on fire right now. Many of the protesters here are livid that no charges have been filed against the officers involved in the death of George Floyd. Now, the National Guard and state police are here trying to keep the peace. But today, there are real questions about whether this chaos will keep escalating. This morning, Minneapolis is reeling, tensions running high in a city on edge. A third night of protest again turning violent, demonstrators clashing with police, buildings including this evacuated police precinct burning, protesters cheering as it went up in flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control and smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. The rioting, a dramatic escalation from more peaceful protests earlier in the day. To tear down our city like this, what's this proving? People who are supposed to protect and serve us sit up and murder us in cold blood. In South Minneapolis and nearby St. Paul, looters ransack businesses. In Louisville, Kentucky, seven people were shot at a rally against police brutality. While nationwide, from Chicago to New York to Denver, there is mounting outrage over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of criminal charges against the four officers involved. This new video from a different angle shows two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. All four officers have been fired. There is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. This is the damage from the air. The governor has now activated the National Guard. We want justice. We're mad. I'm mad. Giovanni Thunstrom was Floyd's employer and landlord. He said Floyd had lost his job due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's like a brother to me, and uh, he didn't serve to die that way. This morning, South Minneapolis is now wondering when the violence will end. Throughout most of the night, there was no police presence here, but that has obviously changed. Protesters had actually cut off access to some parts of this area, so firefighters couldn't make it in here. But now this police has set up a perimeter, is keeping protesters outside as well as the media. Here's what happened live on television on CNN a short time ago. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? So certainly a very fluid situation here right now. We're keeping safe here with our security team. But as you can see behind me, a huge show of force right now from police on the scene as daybreak. We really start to see for the first time the damage here. It is extensive throughout most of the night. Again, it was chaos here, multiple buildings on fire. Now, though, you see emergency crews here trying to douse the flames and to keep those fires from spreading. Hoda, there are real questions here about what happens next. Wow, what a scene, Gabe. Thank you. We are joined now by Jeremiah Ellison. He's a member of the Minneapolis City Council. Councilman Ellison, good morning to you. I want to get to those protests in just a second, but at the heart of those protests, the rage is about the fact that no one has been arrested in this case. The mayor has basically called it a murder and is asking why that hasn't happened. A lot of people obviously have seen the tape of what happened. But here's what the county attorney said. He said, and this is Mike Freeman, he said uh, that there is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. Are you privy to what that other evidence may be? No, I think the statement's vague. Uh, I wish the uh, district attorney would be more specific. And more importantly, I wish the district attorney uh, would watch the tape 
uh, see what's evident on the tape as far as the fact that uh, four officers murdered um, uh, uh, Mr. Floyd and uh, and make the arrest. Well, absent absent the charges, council member, um, how do you calm a city? You know, I think that we had a great opportunity on the first night to uh, respond differently uh, when it came to the situation. I think for those of us who are who kind of come from more um, activist backgrounds um, and who have participated in mass protests before, uh, you can kind of see where a crowd's going. Um, and I felt like this was really preventable. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, conventional wisdom of uh, of, 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 of force sort of won out. And uh, that was the strategy we pursued. And I, I think that strategy has proven to be um, uh, an unmitigated failure. You know what? It was interesting yesterday on our air, Craig interviewed one of George Floyd's best friends, NBA great Stephen Jackson. And Stephen, he was asked about those protests and what George would have thought. And he said he would have welcomed the support, but he basically said he didn't like that kind of violence in the streets. That wasn't, he said, what George Floyd would have wanted. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the one of the dynamics when when you look at a protest like that is that really the protest is uh, it's about the death of the person um, and, and not always necessarily what the person would have wanted. Right. Um, I imagine that nobody would want to see the kind of devastation that we uh, are experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, but what people are, are responding to uh, are, is not just uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, but also uh, Philando Castile. Uh, Jamar Clark, uh, Fong Lee, these are people who have been killed by the various police departments in the metro area um, and who have whose deaths have largely gone um, unrecognized as crimes. Uh, just pull out your tea leaves for one second and just tell me finally where you think we will be one week from today. You know, um, you know all I can do is speculate. Uh, I, I hope that um, uh, that the district attorney is able to get his act together and uh, uh, make the arrest of the four officers who uh, uh, participated in the murder. Um, and uh, and I hope that the crowd, um, I hope that the, the protesters um, uh, begin to, to, to recede and go home. Uh, I understand the rage. Uh, it is it is it is shocking to see the level of destruction that's occurred. Um, and uh, and and I just hope that we can um, keep as many people as safe as possible um, and, and begin to, uh, on a road to justice. Uh, and I think that's really what the protesters are calling for. All right. Minneapolis City Councilman Jeremiah Ellison. Councilman Ellison, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. You. Savannah, over to you. Hoda also overnight a tweet about the situation unfolding in Minneapolis from President Trump led Twitter to flag it for violating the company's rules against glorifying violence. This happened just hours after the president moved to crack down on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has more on this back and forth. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. President Trump did take to Twitter overnight to weigh in on this violence in Minneapolis, calling the protesters thugs and warning that looters could be shot. Twitter that has been locked in that bitter back and forth with the president this week quickly flagged one of those tweets, as you noted, blocking it from being liked, saying the president's words violated the company's rules against promoting violence. Overnight, the president making his position clear, writing, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That tweet then flagged by Twitter, adding what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The president also going after the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry, calling him weak and saying he should get his act together and bring the city under control or I will send in the National Guard and get the job done right. The mayor responding overnight. Weakness is refusing to take responsibility for your own actions. Weakness is pointing your finger at somebody else during a time of crisis. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes, but you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. 
about that flag that Twitter posted on the president's tweet. The company in a series of tweets of its own overnight notes the historical context of some of the language the president used in his tweet, its connection to violence as well, they say. Twitter does not specifically detail what it is referring to, but during the bloodshed of U.S. riots in the late 1960s, Miami's police chief infuriated black leaders at the time, famously crediting the calm in his city to a get-tough warning that he had delivered, saying, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter has not taken down the president's tweet, saying it's determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. Back to you. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Let's turn now to the coronavirus. New York City, the main epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, is now ready to take its first steps toward reopening. But what will that look like, and will it be soon enough for struggling businesses? NBC's Kathy Park is in Times Square. Hey, Kath, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. When the stay-at-home order went into effect more than two months ago, the images of Times Square emptying out was just jarring. And this morning, it's still pretty empty. However, we are starting to hear the construction pick back up. And for the first time, we're getting a closer look at what reopening New York City will look like. This morning, New York City, the only part of the state that's still shut down, is on the verge of reopening. It's important to remind everyone, we say restart, we do not mean rushing back. The city is setting its sights on the next two weeks, sending between 200 and 400,000 New Yorkers back to work. It will also be a huge test for the city's sprawling mass transit system, which is now sanitized daily. The nation's former epicenter of the outbreak is close to meeting the final benchmarks for phase one, having enough hospital beds and contact tracers. We don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. By the first half of June, non-essential retail like clothing and furniture stores can reopen for curbside pickup. Manufacturing, construction and wholesale operations can also resume. But the new plans don't include bars and restaurants. They'll have to continue surviving on pickups and deliveries for at least another month. We're past the shock and awe phase and now we're ready for the rebirth. And the point is, we, we, you know, we want it to keep getting better once it starts. Some businesses have defied the orders, opening prematurely, like this tanning salon on Staten Island. The mayor says those businesses could face fines. The goal here is not to fine businesses, not to shut down businesses, but to educate and support businesses. But we got to get it right. While infections in the city are at the lowest level we've seen in months, Governor Andrew Cuomo highlighted the importance of taking precautions, issuing an executive order giving businesses the right to refuse service for customers without face coverings. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. While enlisting the help of longtime Brooklyn natives Chris Rock and Rosie Perez to spread the message. I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. <laughs> And across the country, more signs of progress. Starting today, D.C. will be lifting some restrictions after noticing a 14-day decline in community spread. And more businesses in Illinois will be coming online with limits. But in Kenosha County, Wisconsin, it's a different story. Health officials there are reporting a 20% spike in cases after their stay-at-home order was lifted. Hoda? All right, Kathy Park for us in what looks to be a busier Times Square than usual. All right, uh, Savannah, over to you. All right, some good news, too, for those of you looking to visit a national park in the near future. The Grand Canyon is expanding access to its popular South Rim entrance. Starting today, the entrance will be open from 4 a.m. until 2 p.m. And on June 5th, next week, it'll be open around the clock. The entrance was closed temporarily, of course, over virus concerns. The park's hotels are also planning to reopen soon. So we're starting to see the world come back a little bit. Yes, come back to life. And it's a good time that we should say good morning to Mr. Roker. Hey, Al, get our first check of the weather. 
I do, guys, and we're going to be looking at some severe weather making its way into the northeast and mid-Atlantic states today. 29 million people at risk for hazardous weather, damaging winds, tornadoes, possible hail as well. One system pushes out and fades away, bringing up warm, humid air, and then inland storms intensify as the second front pushes through. As that moves off tomorrow morning, we've got cooler air behind it, strong storms firing up for the southeast. And in fact, as you look along the mid-Atlantic and southeastern states, we may see four inches of rain along the coastal communities and into the northeast locally could see upwards of two inches stretching into interior sections of New England and northern New England as well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Back now, uh, 7.30 on this Friday morning, unsettling scenes in Minneapolis. This morning, buildings on fire, riot police deployed. This is a third night of protests over the death of George Floyd. And as we say good morning to Craig, uh, that is where we start off our 7.30 headline, Savannah. Yeah, unfortunately, this breaking news continues. Hundreds of demonstrators clashing with police, several buildings, including... This evacuated police precinct was set on fire. In other parts of the city, looters ransacked businesses. And around the country, there is growing unrest over George Floyd's death. Now, the four officers involved have been fired. They have not been criminally charged. Meanwhile, Twitter overnight flagging a tweet by President Trump that it says glorified violence and violated the company's policies. The president writing, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter then added what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The Boston Marathon has been canceled for the first time in its 124-year history. Originally, it was scheduled for April 20th. I guess it was really postponed. Organizers had pushed the race back to September due to the coronavirus epidemic. But Thursday, wow, it was called off altogether. Organizers say they'll have a virtual event instead. Participants who verify that they ran 26.2 miles on their own will receive their finishers medal. So I wonder if you have to verify that you ran the 26.2 at the same time. Like if you, if it's a cumulative. <laughs> 10 in the morning thing. and 10 at night. <laughs> right. Like you can space you it out. the medal. Or, or what if you just moved, well, Craig, good idea. You could move the decimal point and just be like 2.62. <laughs> there you go. Maybe there you then go. You know, I ran Boston. Yeah, why not? Guys, a lot of eyes are going to be on the Kennedy Space Center tomorrow afternoon for the historic SpaceX launch. It was delayed by weather earlier in the week. But space is really the hot topic these days, getting a lot of attention. And NBC's Carrie Sanders joins us from Cape Canaveral to explain why. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Well, good morning. It's all about Space Force, which is brand new. But I'm at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And right over there is where the U.S. Air Force launched the first satellite in 1958. And historians will tell you that Ever since then, there's been discussions about a need for maybe a new separate branch of the military. Now it's Space Force. And now, 62 years later, it's reality. And liftoff. There's a big buzz about space these days, and it's not just the SpaceX rocket set to carry two American astronauts to the International Space Station, the first crew launched from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. There's also a new division of the U.S. Armed Forces, Space Force. President Trump signed a new defense bill in December, officially establishing the sixth branch of the military, the first since the Air Force was created in 1947. The establishment of the United States States Space Force. Space Force is working with a $15 billion military budget. To make sure that we have everything that we need to have in space and the ability to perform the operations that we need to do. The new division will take over the Air Force's existing missions in space, like protecting satellites and GPS. But that's not all. Defend the domain of space, which is really central to our way of life today. Focus our assets and capabilities in this new domain. A division so new, it hasn't yet decided its rank structure. Obviously, we won't be called airmen. 
but Space Cadets isn't going to be one of them. I, I sure hope so, but I don't think so. <laughs> the first class of graduates excited to be getting in on the ground floor of this brave new frontier. You have so much talent in the Space Force. I was extremely lucky to be one of the four cyberspace operations officers to be able to commission straight into the Space Force this year. And I had to ask. What about an alien attack? I have no responsibility of defending you from an alien attack, so. Space, such a hot topic these days. There's even a new Netflix series called Space Force. The president is creating a new branch, Space Force, <laughs> which Mark will run. <laughs> what? The galaxy far, far away is going to make for a great adventure. The universe is a big place. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. All right, it is exciting, Carrie. Carrie, and let's just hope that the Netflix Space Force does not resemble our actual Space Force. <laughs> but but paint a picture for us if you can, buddy. What is this the Space Force actually going to look like? What's it going to be doing on a daily basis? You know, it's so brand new. They only have 86 members right now. They haven't even figured out, as we know, the rank structure. Uh, but it will be based at the Pentagon. They will be dealing with things in outer space. It can be uh, satellites. It can be things that we don't know about because it needs to be secret. It can even be cleaning up space junk. And just to give you sort of a moment of history here, because we have all eyes on space right now with what's going to happen possibly tomorrow, over my shoulder there, that is where America's first astronaut into space, Alan Shepard, launched in uh, 1961. And it's really uh, kind of amazing to look at that replica of the Mercury that launched here. Uh, really quite a, uh, an amazing kind of attention that the whole nation is now giving to space with Space Force. And the reminder of what we can do. Uh, Kerry Sanders for us there at Cape Canaveral. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. We're back with our series, The New Normal. Summer season is here. Families longing to escape and spend time away from home. But what do vacations look like in the coronavirus era? Well, with so many hotels still closed, a lot of people are looking to rent or buy RVs, according to one bank, applications for them and boats have exploded by 50 percent. So we asked NBC's tech correspondent Jacob Ward to explore the trend. Rise and shine. Good morning, Jake. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. That's right. You know, people are applying for the loans to buy an RV in huge numbers, and huge numbers of people who already own them are renting them out. It seems to be that the, the freedom of the open road is calling to America. Of course, that freedom comes with some new rules. The national mood right now is, well, you know what it is. Get me out of the house. The Reynolds family spent 66 days stuck in their house in Austin. I've been at home with my three children who are six and under, so just, you know, wanted to get out of the house. Now, they are first-time RV renters, and they just pulled into the Blue Water RV Resort on the Texas coast. Maybe we'll turn into RV people, <laughs> you know? Never never thought anything of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It feels like an all-inclusive resort. Now, my family loves to camp, and we would love nothing more than to do what the Reynolds family is doing. But we live in a county in California that's still under a shelter-in-place order, and as a result, here we are, camping in our backyard. Across the country, it is a patchwork of reopenings and improvised regulations. You can't just get in an RV and park it anywhere. Reservations are required at most of the places you want to go, and even if you do get a reservation, there are new rules to follow. No visitors, no playground, no bathrooms. Camping is limited to families or households that you typically would be hanging out with during the time of COVID. But we will take it. A survey by the U.S. Travel Association found that only 18% of travelers feel safe flying and only 18% feel safe at a hotel. Maybe that's why people are buying and renting RVs in big numbers. It felt like the right first step to returning to travel. They view RVs and boating as as fun, safe ways to control their environment. Rental company RV Share says RV rentals are twice what they were last summer. And while most RV rentals are normally booked well in advance, another company, Outdoorsy, says half their bookings are now last minute. Lots of people want to rent an RV, and they want to do it now. We're at Lake Tower! 
I love that we could bring our own bedding from our house and don't have to worry about somebody else cleaning it or touching it during this time of social distancing. That is good news for RV resorts. All of our holidays are already booked up for the summer. Meanwhile, I'll have to be satisfied with just hearing about the Reynolds getaway by phone from my basement. Tell me, please, what's it going to be like on the beach? Just give me, pay me a picture here. What do you? Mostly just watch the kids build sandcastles and run into the water. Just relax, not yeah. be in our house or yeah. backyard. Exactly. You guys, you know, these are amazing machines, and some people are using them, of course, for more than just fun. An estimated one million Americans treat an RV as a primary residence, and in tough economic times, a lot of people are forced to make that choice. But they can be used for other things as well. There's even an RVs for MDs Facebook page that is pairing people who own RVs with first responders, doctors, and nurses who need a place to shelter away from their family. So a lot of people looking at RVs for a lot of reasons. Oh, guys. that is super Super cool. Hey, Jake, I was wondering, do you need like a special driver's license if you're going to rent one of those or can you just use your regular one? You do. You're going to need one for one of the big self-contained ones. You have to spe uh, have a special license for that. To be able to, to uh, tow one around or drive one of those camper vans, and those are the ones that, of course, I have been you know, sitting here in my basement in California going, oh, oh, the, the camper van. I would take a camper van. You know, Those ones you can get right into and pull away, which is, of course, the dream here, you guys. I would love to do it. I, let's, let's, do it. let's do a road trip later this summer, ladies. What do you say? I'll, I'll drive. Meet you. I'll meet you in the Al's middle of the country. I'll meet you years. somewhere. I don't know. I'd love to do it. I think take, a road trip would be a blast. Take the show on the road. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Al has wanted right. to put That's us right. all in the Winnebago yeah. for a long, long time. I have <laughs> yeah. been begging. Haven't you, Al? Begging to do that. Yeah. Craig, and I, Craig, you and I did that, remember? I do. Up, up in New England. Where you drove like a madman. I remember that. Where I was, I was fearful for my life. That's right. Uh, while we have you, you cried like a baby. I knew that was coming. <laughs> while, while we have you, how about a check of the weather, sir, including how things might be looking for that, uh, that launch, fingers crossed, tomorrow. That's right. For Launch America, we are keeping our fingers crossed. Here's what we're expecting. Saturday, probably the iffier of the two days, a 60% chance of thunderstorms, southerly winds 10 to 15. Sunday, a 40% chance of thunderstorms. You can see on the future cast a little clearer. So hopefully one of those two days is going to work and we'll see that, that crude ship take off. Above normal on both ends of the coast, but big changes coming to the northeast. You can see today temperatures anywhere from 10 to 15. 15 degrees below average, b above average, I should say. But behind that front, temperatures drop. And then by Saturday, it's cooler in Milwaukee, Buffalo, Charleston. Uh, fairly decent in the Northeast. But then into next week, temperatures warm up nicely. By Tuesday, Kansas City are at 89, 73 in Detroit and Philadelphia, and 87 degrees in Nashville. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, breaking overnight, Minneapolis on fire. Buildings burn as demonstrators take to the streets for another night of violent protests over the death of George Floyd and the lack of charges against the officers involved. This morning, the National Guard stepping in. We're live with the latest. Plus, fair share, how rideshare apps are encouraging customers to stay safe, even if that means staying out of the car. Just ahead, we'll hear from the CEO of Uber in an exclusive live interview. And champagne morning. We're kicking off our city music series with a performance from Lady Antebellum and a special surprise for some lucky fans you don't want to miss. Today, Friday, May 29th, 2020. today. We're the Carl family from Waco, Texas. Hey, Sam and Rhoda, you look good. Talking out at home with Lady Antebellum in Larchmont, New York. From El Cajon, California, we, we love, love Lady A and today. Hi everybody, good morning. Welcome back to today. It is so nice to have you with us. If you're just waking up, we have some great news for you. It's Friday. <laughs> That's right. How good does that sound? Friday. And we got some other great news, especially for you, Savannah. Lady Antebellum, I mean, come on. That's what you need on My this favorite. Friday. Hey, let's go to our big board and say hello to our Today Plaza crowd. Talk about Lady A fans. They are out in number this morning. You guys are lucky because this is our very first summer music series. And Lady A is kicking it off. So we'll speak to you guys in a bit. Yeah, they got front row seats, right? <laughs> yep. uh, meanwhile, Craig, we are really looking forward to a series that you're going to start next week. Tell that's us about right. It. That's right. We're going to be traveling, traveling around to give folks a firsthand look at reopening America. Our first stop is an iconic summer destination, especially in these parts. Delaware's Rehoboth Beach. Yeah. We're going to talk to business owners. That's right. This, this, these are your people. Business owners along the boardwalk there who are waiting and hoping uh, for tourists to return. So we're going to spend some time there in Rehoboth Beach. We'll go to Philadelphia. We'll spend some time around the New York City, New Jersey area as well. That's all next week here on today, third hour of today, MSNBC and NBC News Now. Yeah, we're all going to get out and about this summer. Hoda and I are going to take a trip as well, so we look forward to that. Um, we're going to be looking at the reopening of Las Vegas next week as well. One company's plan to keep hotels safe. And, of course, the official start of hurricane season, which Al has his eye on. So a lot to get to next week. Uh, but let's start with this morning and the news here at 8 o'clock. A third night of outrage over the death of George Floyd led to violence, to looting, and the burning of a Minneapolis police building. Protests have also spread to other major cities around the country. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez joins us now. He had a long night watching these protests unfold. Gabe, good morning. Savannah, good morning. This was a powder keg and it exploded overnight. Take a look behind me. This is one of many buildings on fire and authorities are trying to douse the flames. Again, many buildings in this area went up in flames overnight and now the National Guard and the state police is here trying to set up a perimeter. So overnight officers were not here uh, because many of the protesters had blocked off access points here and prevented firefighters from arriving on the scene. But as you can see, there is 
There are new flames, new, uh, more billowing smoke in the distance. These state patrol officers are trying to keep the peace. Many of the protesters were furious at the death of George Floyd and that the four officers involved had not faced charges as of yet. Now the question is, will this violence escalate? Overnight, a city on fire. More protesters swarming the streets of Minneapolis. Some clashing with police and even forcing their way into the precinct before the evacuated building erupted into flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control. The smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. Days of violence leading the governor to activate the National Guard. These armed shop owners spending the day trying to protect their business from looters. The outrage mounting across the country over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of charges against the four officers involved. This new video showing a different angle of Monday's encounter between Floyd and police. Two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. All four officers have been fired invoking their Fifth Amendment rights. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. The county attorney, who's facing growing pressure to charge them, is warning it's not a clear-cut case. We are going to investigate it as expeditiously, as thoroughly, and completely as justice demands. Sometimes that takes a little time, and we ask people to be patient. We have to do this right. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. Overnight, Floyd's brother watching the chaos unfold. It's literally seems like Monday all over again. Former NFL quarterback turned activist Colin Kaepernick defending the protesters earlier in the day, tweeting, we have the right to fight back. Every day I'm being haunted as prey. Amid the cries for justice, a song of innocence by 12-year-old Keydron Bryant resonating with millions. I just want to live. A desperate plea and a hope that this time Things will change. This morning, much calmer scene than what we show than what we saw overnight. Again, authorities are here on the scene trying to maintain order. Firefighters are trying to douse these flames, but more protests are expected later today. Hoda. All right, Gabe, thank you. Let's move now to the latest on the coronavirus. New hotspots emerging across the country, even as the original epicenter in this country, which is here in New York, prepares to reopen. NBC White House correspondent Peter Alexander has three things he's watching this morning. Hey, Peter. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. Here are those latest numbers on the coronavirus crisis. The death toll across this country rising to more than 102,000. Now more than 100, or excuse me, 1.7 million cases nationwide. Still, concerns are growing in places like Wisconsin that just saw its highest single-day increase in cases and deaths this week, two weeks after that state's highest court overturned a stay-at-home order. There are new signs of progress, though, here in Washington. The district is lifting some restrictions today. That's after a 14-day decline in community spread of the virus. And in New York City, as you noted, the only part of that state that is still shut down, still on the verge now, fortunately, of reopening. The city preparing to send 200 to 400,000 New Yorkers back to work over the next couple of weeks. What will be a significant, a big test for that city's mass transit system, those subways and buses that are now sanitized daily. New York's Governor Andrew Cuomo giving businesses there a new tool to combat the virus. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. As for New York City, the new plan does not include bars and restaurants. They're going to have to stick with those pickups and deliveries for at least another month. Craig. 
Peter Alexander from the White House for us. Peter, thank you. Now to growing concerns around the world over a second wave of the coronavirus. This morning, health officials in South Korea are taking steps to control a new cluster of cases that suddenly emerged there. NBC's Kelly Kobiea is in Seoul, South Korea for us. Kelly, good morning. Craig, good morning to you. It is Friday evening here in Seoul. You can see people are out and about enjoying the summer weather, but not for much longer, most likely. A big shift in government policy today. They're advising people to stay inside this weekend. They've closed public parks and public buildings as they battle this new outbreak. The last changing of the guard at Seoul's National Palace for another two weeks. Museums and parks are closing, libraries locking their doors because of an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse. 79 new cases Thursday, 58 today, the biggest jump in two months. Seoul's public health director told me they're worried about the increase in daily infections and a rise in cases that can't be traced. It comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students in classrooms, worshipers at church. On Wednesday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof. That church now tells us they'll dial back on big services. In Brazil, the virus is still surging, with daily deaths over 1,000 for three days this week. Beaches in Rio are empty, but in the hardest hit city, Sao Paulo, they'll start reopening shopping malls and car dealers on Monday. Another hotspot in India, hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Britain, with the highest death rate in Europe, is getting ready to reopen schools. Prince William warning of the toll on mental health. It's scary. Um, it's making a lot of people anxious and uncertain. Back in Seoul, people are once again being asked to work from home and avoid socializing, especially in big groups. With the new cases, are you worried? No, not at all. Many here still confident the country will bring the virus under control. And this new guidance is now in place for the next two weeks. This outbreak is connected to Seoul's or South Korea's biggest e-commerce business. They're testing a lot of employees. About 100 have already tested positive, including delivery workers and some of the people that they came into contact with. Health officials really stressing again that these next two weeks are critical. Craig. OK, we'll be watching Kelly Kobe Air Force there in Seoul. Kelly, thank you. All right. How about a little morning boost, kiddos? Yes. The mystery of the yes. big pink unicorn. <laughs> it's been solved and it's all good. OK, there's a unicorn that was seen prancing down the street in suburban New Jersey this week. Oh. She looked like she was on a mission, like she did have some place <laughs> to go. And she sure did. Before long, up came a little boy running up. Epic hug. It was followed by that hug and then another. And you know why that little boy was so excited? Well, they realized that was grandma in that inflatable suit. She hadn't hugged those two in two months of quarantine. So she zipped up the, the outfit and she was she got a big surprise. So that's crazy. Yeah, right that's one way to do it. By the way. I bet those unicorn suits are flying <laughs> off the shelves. It's a great idea. Guys, this next boost also has a surprise ending, and it's pretty quick. So peel your eyes open. You don't want to miss it. The only thing more intimidating than this tall fence is the sign posted on it. There must be some ferocious <laughs> beast on the other side. Or not. <laughs> and I mean, look, I think that little pup has the right idea. He's lounging. He's getting ready for the weekend. The only thing he needs is, I don't know, yes. a Michelob light or something. He's like a couch potato. I love it. He looks Coming more like a Nick next, Ultra guys. dog to me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, Al, the impact of the coronavirus has been devastating across the entire economy, but especially for ride sharing, an industry based around the very idea of sharing time and space in close quarters, Savannah. 
Yes, so it has been a hard hit. Companies like Uber and Lyft are trying to battle back with a renewed emphasis on safety. And in a moment, we're going to have an exclusive live interview with Uber's CEO. But first, here's NBC's Sam Brock with the backstory. In a recent ad for Uber, a father holds his child. Friends and family wave from afar, and people hunker down in their homes, doing everything but get inside a car. The message, stay home for everyone who can't, reflects a reality devastating companies like Uber, Lyft, and Bird. Safety concerns and lockdowns have led to leaner ridership. Uber's bookings dropped 80% in April. Lyft rides fell 75% from the same month last year, and e-bikes and scooters have lost their buzz, with wheels and lime pausing operations in some markets. Not to mention the impact on drivers. How hard has it been for you driving recently in terms of just getting business? Not a lot of customers. I feel that it's, it's not a safe for everybody. So I am driving, but I'm, I'm not sure as if I'm doing the right things. So you keep Lysol in the car with you? Yeah. Walter Stefano returned to work a couple weeks ago, protected by a plastic barrier and plenty of cleaning products, but not armed for the economic bite. How much business would you say you've lost? About 60%. You've lost 60% of your customers? Yes. Uber has offered workers 19 million in financial aid so far and has buckled down on safety since the start of the pandemic. You can't enter a car without agreeing to wear a face covering and acknowledging no symptoms. The company's pumped $50 million into cleaning supplies and PPE for drivers and new this morning, riders can book hourly windows at a flat rate to reduce exposure. Lyft, likewise, making face masks mandatory for riders and drivers and investing heavily in cleaning supplies. For ride-sharing users like Amanda Rivera, the risks at this point seem manageable. As long as you're healthy and you're taking the right precautions, I think you're safe. Thanks for helping keep your community and yourself safe. A call to action for being conscientious, wearing a mask, and refusing to ride with those who won't. If someone is not wearing a face mask, you better use the face mask, they don't get in my car. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. And that brings us into to Dara Khosrowshahi, who is the CEO of Uber. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, the numbers are just jaw dropping ridership down 80 percent in April. You've called it a shock to the system. Do you feel the worst of this crisis is behind you for Uber and ride sharing services? We certainly do. Uh, I think Uber essentially goes with the city. We are very much a local business. And when the heartbeat of the city starts beating again, uh, Uber starts moving. So we are seeing uh, business improve from those April lows, still down significantly. But we are seeing the improvement happening faster in some of the states and cities that are opening up uh, cautiously, obviously, in, let's say, in Atlanta or Houston, uh, we are seeing volumes return. And even in other states that haven't completely opened up, they're off the bottom, but they still are down significantly year on year. But we are seeing signs of life, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you want to get moving, but you want to get moving in a safe way. Well, that brings me to my next question, because a lot of folks had come to depend on Uber. I know you, the company was about to be profitable for the first time uh, by the end of the year. How do you convince people now that it's safe, that they should get in a confined space with a stranger, convincing driver, drivers and customers? Absolutely. It's a it's a two way street. And, and for us, we have redesigned the experience from top to bottom with safety in mind. Uh, our drivers and our riders have to wear a mask. And for example, we are rolling out a technology feature for our drivers where the drivers actually have to take a selfie. Uh, and we have machine learning algorithms understanding whether that driver is actually wearing a mask or saying that uh, they're wearing a mask. If a driver sees a rider who is not wearing a mask, uh, they can cancel the trip uh, if they feel unsafe as well. Uh, we've invested millions in PPE. We've got we've secured 23 million masks and are distributing them to our drivers as well. Uh, so, you know, getting out of the house, um, starting to move again uh, is going to feel funny and it may feel unsafe. And we're doing our part to make it as safe as possible. And then we're also including two way accountability. The rider and the driver essentially rate each other. 
and to the extent that they see behavior that's unsafe, uh, will instantly know about it and be able to do something about it. To go in long term, I mean, so much about our society has changed and we don't know yet whether it's permanent. I mean, you're talking about companies who may start working from home exclusively or uh, in a much more significant way. People not going to doing the work travel so much of Uber or, or, or trips to the airport, things like that, or to concerts. Do you worry about this business long term being able to survive? I think that the focus right now, honestly, is short term and tomorrow, how can we build the safest service uh, we can? The long term will take care of itself. We think we can make the right adjustments. And actually, in certain places, let's say Hong Kong, uh, who is more advanced in terms of their uh, response, in terms of testing, masks, etc., we're seeing the business come back. Uh, even sometimes close to prior levels. People are getting back to work, even during what you call party hours, where people are going out to restaurants. Life begins anew. While I don't expect behavior to revert to where we were previously, unless there's a vaccine or something very big happens, I do think that people, uh, behaviors and people revert to normal. They're going to be, be more careful. They are going to wear masks. We're going to have cleaning supplies. So certain things are going to change. But I do think that business is going to come back. If life comes back into the city, then Uber will be back along with it. And in the short few moments we have left, you wrote a letter to the White House asking that Uber drivers be included in the stimulus package that gave relief. And one of the, it did, by the way, did include drivers and gig workers. One yes. of the reasons they hadn't been included is because they are not considered full time employees by a company like Uber. Do you have a change of heart at all about that? If we just have about 30 seconds left, I know it's not your business model, but I just wonder how you're feeling about it. I do think that independent work should come with social protections, should come with minimum earnings protections, uh, health protections, accident protection, et cetera. That is a change from where we've come from. And we need to work with lawmakers, regulators to allow that to happen. There's no reason why independent work shouldn't come with respect and shouldn't come with the kinds of protections that I think society now is asking for. And we as a company completely agree with we do want to be a leader here going forward. Well, Uber CEO Dara Khazra Hashahi, thank you so much. I know the company has also donated a half a million dollars to international relief efforts and wanted to mention that as well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. The City Music Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. Welcome back. Lady Antebellum has been making music together for more than a decade, racking up Grammys and other awards along the way. And we're so happy to have Lady A, Hillary, Dave, and Charles with us live from Nashville. Guys, good morning. Okay, so morning. Hillary's in one place. <laughs> Charles and Dave are together. <laughs> Hillary, are you jealous? You guys haven't, you've, you've been like torn apart for the last few months. Oh, you know what? I'm actually going to be hanging out with them um, in a couple hours. So I'll see you in a oh. bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to ride, we're going to ride a Christmas yeah. song actually today. Yeah. Oh, wow. Perfect yeah. times. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll all be in the mood for that. Yeah. So Dave um, and, and Charles, Tell me how it's been going in quarantine. What have you guys been doing? I know you're not quarantining together, or are you? Yeah, we're we're in Nashville now, uh, but we've watched every movie you can on Disney Plus and yeah. Netflix with the kids. So, but we're surviving. I mean, the kids are having a good time. I mean, just to be at home with them. And but uh, we've we've kind of hit that point. We've hit that point. We're ready to get out for a little bit. <laughs> we've been doing a lot of writing, songwriting over the over like that Zoom app too, which has been very interesting. You know, you kind of. You got to get creative. And so, you know, with all this time on our hands, um, you know, we've been trying to write and just stay as productive as we as we can. You know, unfortunately, we can't tour right now. So it just is what it is. Well, it's good. Yeah, it's good to have the outlet. Hillary, you've got little ones, too. How are you keeping them entertained and still working? Oh, a lot of um, same as Dave, Disney Plus. Um, ironically, you know, with today getting up early and getting myself ready, we had kind of 
we called in some some help to get to make sure that the girls were covered because my husband Chris has been helping me get the setup going to be able to talk to you guys this morning. And of course, they slept in. <laughs> yeah, I have to wake up extra early. They sleep in, <laughs> so that's just so motherhood. One morning. I think. It is. It totally is. By the way, um, Dave, you put a hilarious video on Facebook, which um, show, you're, I'm glad your creative juices are still flowing, Dave. Uh, people should yeah. check that out. Hoda, though, has got one of your super fans on our virtual plaza. Hi, guys. Hoda, what's going on? Hey, Hoda. Hey, honey. It's good to see you all. We love you. We miss you. Look at our great big board. We have a lot of Lady A oh, fans. They cool all that. love you, all of them. But I want to single out Mindy and Chris from Centerville, Ohio. Hi. Mindy and Chris, y'all. Ten years years ago had their wedding in the summertime and their first dance was to your song when you got a good thing so now they got two kids they got luke and leanne and they only wanted two things for their anniversary they wanted to see a lady a concert and they wanted to come hear you guys hi do y'all want to say hi to lady and to Bella? yes we, oh, we love, love them, them. <laughs> hi thank you that's so cool hey guys tell us about your why you picked them for your first dance Sorry. Um, we, we just, we've always been, um, a great United couple and we're actually like team Newman. So we met on a blind date and you know, when it comes down to it, you got a good thing and you got to stick through it. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, it's so cool. And how old are the kids? Um, we got Luke is five and Leanna seven. And a hat because in two months, I'll be <laughs> Well, you guys, here's some great news. You got to meet Lady A virtually, and you're going to hear them perform. And Lady A, I think they you've got a little thing you want to give to this family? Yes. Yeah. We yeah, we're um, whenever we hit back on the road, we're going to give you guys some tickets and hook you up with a VIP experience. Oh, backstage. So, yeah, oh, y'all can walk you. Thank you so much. All right, guys. And then it's here to play with our kids. Yeah, yeah. 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 A seven-year-old can babysit our kids. Oh, I love that. <laughs> All right, guys, stick around. They're miracle babies. Oh. oh. Don't go anywhere, guys. Don't go anywhere. They've got a song. They're going to play for you a special performance of Champagne Night. But first, this is today on NBC. Oh. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. are ready to kick off our city music series with a special performance they've recorded for us of their newest hit, Champagne Night. And here they are. The stars go out on the sunset strip call our still state make it 20 last like it's 1990 we are here where we're from we don't say la la carry on don't need no bottle service budget got no money but we love it reason passion cups you would like
was good. Hey. Champagne night, wow. pizza night, guys. Friday, our thanks to Lady Annabelle. Don't they sound good? Yeah, yeah and our plaza, our plaza loved that too. Uh, that was fun. By the way, guys, the fun doesn't have to end here. We have a new project. It's called One Good Thing. It has more videos and stories. They'll all brighten your day. So just text today to 66866. Sign up for our daily newsletter, and it'll help boost your spirit. So text the word today to that, that phone number. Yep. Okay. Or something uh, like that. We You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Good morning. Breaking overnight, city under siege. Protests and riots rage in Minneapolis for the third night in a row over the death of George Floyd. Angry crowds set a police precinct on fire, forcing officers to flee. A state of emergency now declared. The National Guard activated. Our communities cannot and will not tolerate it. Authorities appeal for calm. Give me and give United States Attorney, the time to do this right, and we will bring you justice. I promise. And this morning, the unrest spreading to major cities from coast to coast. Social media showdown. Twitter flags another post from President Trump, this time for inciting violence. 
just ahead, what the president tweeted that set off alarm bells on the heels of his move to crack down on the company. Glimmers of hope. New York City, the epicenter of the nation's coronavirus outbreak, announces its first step toward reopening. Washington, D.C. beginning to ease restrictions today. But new areas of concern emerge where cases have spiked since lifting those stay-at-home orders. Make history. As NASA's groundbreaking SpaceX mission gets set for takeoff tomorrow, the U.S. Space Force launches a new recruiting campaign. I see the future. I see exploration and courage. Just ahead, our inside look at the mission of the nation's new military branch. You have so much talent in the Space Force. And the latest forecast for tomorrow's liftoff. And we're ready to launch. Our summer music series kicks off with a special performance from Lady Antebellum to get the weekend started right. Today, Friday, May 29th, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to you today. It is Friday morning, and we're glad to have you with us. Good morning, Savannah. We're going to start off with the tensions boiling over in Minneapolis and beyond over the death of George Floyd. It has been another difficult night, even at this early hour of the morning. It is a very volatile scene there. Police and the National Guard patrolling the streets. Multiple buildings on fire. You see it right there. After a night of protests filled with violence, even rioting, much of the anger aimed at the police precinct of the officers involved in George Floyd's death, who they've been fired, but so far no criminal charges yet. Yeah, the demonstrations are now fanning out to all corners of the country, cities like New York, Louisville, Denver, Los Angeles, and many others, Savannah. In a moment, Hoda, we are going to talk to one of the city council members in Minneapolis. But first, let's get right to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez. He's there on the ground for us. Gabe, good morning. Tell us about the night. Savannah, good morning. This was a powder keg that exploded overnight. Behind me is one of the many buildings that are on fire right now. Many of the protesters here are livid that no charges have been filed against the officers involved in the death of George Floyd. Now, the National Guard and state police are here trying to keep the peace. But today, there are real questions about whether this chaos will keep escalating. This morning, Minneapolis is reeling, tensions running high in a city on edge. A third night of protest again turning violent, demonstrators clashing with police, buildings including this evacuated police precinct burning, protesters cheering as it went up in flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control, and smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. The rioting, a dramatic escalation from more peaceful protests earlier in the day. To tear down our city like this, what's this proving? People who are supposed to protect and serve us sit up and murder us in cold blood. In South Minneapolis and nearby St. Paul, looters ransack businesses. In Louisville, Kentucky, seven people were shot at a rally against police brutality. While nationwide, from Chicago to New York to Denver, there is mounting outrage over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of criminal charges against the four officers involved. This new video from a different angle shows two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. All four officers have been fired. There is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. This is the damage from the air. The governor has now activated the National Guard. We want justice. We're mad. I'm mad. 
Giovanni Thunstrom was Floyd's employer and landlord. He said Floyd had lost his job due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's like a brother to me, and uh, he didn't serve to die that way. This morning, South Minneapolis is now wondering when the violence will end. Throughout most of the night, there was no police presence here, but that has obviously changed. Protesters had actually cut off access to some parts of this area, so firefighters couldn't make it in here. But now this police has set up a perimeter. It's keeping protesters outside as well as the media. Here's what happened live on television on CNN a short time ago. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? So certainly a very fluid situation here right now. We're keeping safe here with our security team. But as you can see behind me, a huge show of force right now from police on the scene as daybreak. We really start to see for the first time the damage here. It is extensive throughout most of the night. Again, it was chaos here. Multiple buildings on fire. Now, though, you see emergency crews here trying to douse the flames and to keep those fires from spreading. Hoda, there are real questions here about what happens next. Wow, what a scene, Gabe. Thank you. We are joined now by Jeremiah Ellison. He's a member of the Minneapolis City Council. Councilman Ellison, good morning to you. I want to get to those protests in just a second, but at the heart of those protests, the rage is about the fact that no one has been arrested in this case. The mayor has basically called it a murder and is asking why that hasn't happened. A lot of people obviously have seen the tape of what happened. But here's what the county attorney said. He said, and this is Mike Freeman, he said uh, that there is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. Are you privy to what that other evidence may be? No, I think the statement's vague. Uh, I wish the uh, district attorney would be more specific. And more importantly, I wish the district attorney uh, would watch the tape. Uh, see what's evident on the tape as far as the fact that uh, four officers murdered um, uh, uh, Mr. Floyd and, uh, and make the arrest. Well, absent, <laughs> absent the charges, council member, um, how do you calm a city? You know, I think that we had a great opportunity on the first night to uh, respond differently uh, when it came to the situation. I think for those of us who are who kind of come from more um, activist backgrounds um, and who have participated in mass protests before, uh, you can kind of see where a crowd's going. Um, and I felt like this was really preventable. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, conventional wisdom of uh, of, 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 of force sort of won out, and uh, that was the strategy we pursued. And I, I think that strategy has proven to be um, uh, an unmitigated failure. You know what? It was interesting yesterday on our air. Craig interviewed one of George Floyd's best friends, NBA great Stephen Jackson. And Stephen, he was asked about those protests and what George would have thought. And he said he would have welcomed the support, but he basically said he didn't like that kind of violence in the streets. That wasn't, he said, what George Floyd would have wanted. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the one of the dynamics when when you look at a protest like that is that really the protest is uh, it's about the death of the person um, and, and not always necessarily what the person would have wanted. Right. Um, I imagine that nobody would want to see the kind of devastation that we uh, are experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, but what people are, are responding to uh, are, is not just uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, but also uh, Philando Castile. Uh, Jamar Clark, um, Fong Lee, these are people who have been killed by the various police departments in the metro area um, and who have whose deaths have largely gone um, unrecognized as crimes. Uh, just pull out your tea leaves for one second and just tell me finally where you think we will be one week from today. You know, um, you know, all I can do is speculate. Uh, I, I hope that um, uh, that the district attorney is able to get his act together and uh, uh, make the arrest of the four officers who uh, uh, participated in the murder. Um, and, uh, and I hope that the crowd, um, I hope that the, the protesters um, uh, begin to, to, to recede and go home. Uh, I understand the rage. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is shocking to see the level of destruction that's occurred. Um, and, uh, and, and I just hope that 
we can um, keep as many people as safe as possible um, and, and begin to, uh, on a road of justice. Uh, and I think that's really what the protesters are calling for. All right, Minneapolis City Councilman Jeremiah Ellison. Councilman Ellison, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Savannah, over to you. Hoda also overnight a tweet about the situation unfolding in Minneapolis from President Trump led Twitter to flag it for violating the company's rules against glorifying violence. This happened just hours after the president moved to crack down on Twitter. NBC's White House correspondent Peter Alexander has more on this back and forth. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. President Trump did take to Twitter overnight to weigh in on this violence in Minneapolis, calling the protesters thugs and warning that looters could be shot. Twitter that has been locked in that bitter back and forth with the president this week quickly flagged one of those tweets, as you noted, blocking it from being liked, saying the president's words violated the company's rules against promoting violence. Overnight, the president making his position clear, writing, These thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That tweet then flagged by Twitter, adding what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The president also going after the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry, calling him weak and saying he should get his act together and bring the city under control or I will send in the National Guard and get the job done right. The mayor responding overnight. Weakness is refusing to take responsibility for your own actions. Weakness is pointing your finger at somebody else during a time of crisis. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes, but you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. About that flag that Twitter posted on the president's tweet, the company in a series of tweets of its own overnight notes the historical context of some of the language the president used in his tweet, its connection to violence as well, they say. Twitter does not specifically detail what it is referring to, but during the bloodshed of U.S. riots in the late 1960s, Miami's police chief infuriated black leaders at the time, famously crediting the calm in his city to a get-tough warning that he had delivered, saying, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter has not taken down the president's tweet, saying it's determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. Back to you. All right. Peter Alexander at the White House. Peter, thank you. Let's turn now to the coronavirus. New York City, the main epicenter of the U.S. outbreak, is now ready to take its first steps toward reopening. But what will that look like? And will it be soon enough for struggling businesses? NBC's Kathy Park is in Times Square. Hey, Kath, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. When the stay-at-home order went into effect more than two months ago, the images of Times Square emptying out was just jarring. And this morning, it's still pretty empty. However, we are starting to hear the construction pick back up. And for the first time, we're getting a closer look at what reopening New York City will look like. This morning, New York City, the only part of the state that's still shut down, is on the verge of reopening. It's important to remind everyone, we say restart, we do not mean rushing back. The city is setting its sights on the next two weeks, sending between 200 and 400,000 New Yorkers back to work. It will also be a huge test for the city's sprawling mass transit system, which is now sanitized daily. The nation's former epicenter of the outbreak is close to meeting the final benchmarks for phase one, having enough hospital beds and contact tracers. We don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. By the first half of June, non-essential retail like clothing and furniture stores can reopen for curbside pickup. Manufacturing, construction and wholesale operations can also resume. But the new plans don't include bars and restaurants. They'll have to continue surviving on pickups and deliveries for at least another month. We're past the shock and awe phase and now we're ready for the rebirth. And the point is we, we, you know, we want it to keep getting better once it starts. Some businesses have defied the orders opening prematurely, like this tanning salon on Staten Island. The mayor says those businesses could face fines. The goal here is not to fine businesses, not to shut down businesses, but to educate and support businesses. But we got to get it right. 
While infections in the city are at the lowest level we've seen in months, Governor Andrew Cuomo highlighted the importance of taking precautions, issuing an executive order giving businesses the right to refuse service for customers without face coverings. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. While enlisting the help of longtime Brooklyn natives Chris Rock and Rosie Perez to spread the message. I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. <laughs> And across the country, more signs of progress starting today. D.C. will be lifting some restrictions after noticing a 14-day decline in community spread. And more businesses in Illinois will be coming online with limits. But in Kenosha County, Wisconsin, it's a different story. Health officials there are reporting a 20% spike in cases after their stay-at-home order was lifted. Hoda? All right, Kathy Park for us in what looks to be a busier Times Square than usual. All right, uh, Savannah, over to you. All right, some good news, too, for those of you looking to visit a national park in the near future. The Grand Canyon is expanding access to its popular South Rim entrance. Starting today, the entrance will be open from 4 a.m. until 2 p.m. And on June 5th, next week, it'll be open around the clock. The entrance was closed temporarily, of course, over virus concerns. The park's hotels are also planning to reopen soon. So we're starting to see the world come back a little bit. Yes, come back to life. And it's a good time that we should say good morning to Mr. Roker. Hey, Al, get our first check of the weather. I do, guys, and we're going to be looking at some severe weather making its way into the northeast and mid-Atlantic states today. 29 million people at risk for hazardous weather, damaging winds, tornadoes, possible hail as well. One system pushes out and fades away, bringing up warm, humid air, and then inland storms intensify as the second front pushes through. As that moves off tomorrow morning, we've got cooler air behind it, strong storms firing up for the southeast. And in fact, as you look along the mid-Atlantic and southeastern states, we may see four inches of rain along the coastal communities and into the northeast locally could see upwards of two inches stretching into interior sections of New England and northern New England as well. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Back now, uh, 730 on this Friday morning, unsettling scenes in Minneapolis. This morning, buildings on fire, riot police deployed. This is a third night of protests over the death of George Floyd. And as we say good morning to Craig, uh, that is where we start off our 730 headline, Savannah. Yeah, unfortunately, this breaking news continues. Hundreds of demonstrators clashing with police, several buildings, including this evacuated police precinct was set on fire. In other parts of the city, looters ransacked businesses. And around the country, there is growing unrest over George Floyd's death. Now, the four officers involved have been fired. They have not been criminally charged. Meanwhile, Twitter overnight flagging a tweet by President Trump that it says glorified violence and violated the company's policies. The president writing, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter then added what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The Boston Marathon has been canceled for the first time in its 124-year history. Originally, it was scheduled for April 20th. I guess it was really postponed. Organizers had pushed the race back to September due to the coronavirus epidemic. But Thursday, wow, it was called off altogether. Organizers say they'll have a virtual event instead. Participants who verify that they ran 26.2 miles on their own will receive their finishers medal. I wonder if you have to verify that you ran the 26.2 at the same time. Like if you, could, if it's a cumulative. <laughs> 10 in the morning thing. and 10 at night. <laughs> right. Probably you can space you it out. the medal. Or, or what if you just moved, well, Craig, good idea. You could move the decimal point and just be like 2.62. <laughs> there you go. Maybe there you then go. You I ran Boston. Yeah, why not? Guys, a lot of eyes are going to be on the Kennedy Space Center tomorrow afternoon for the historic SpaceX launch. It was delayed by weather earlier in the week. 
But space is really the hot topic these days, getting a lot of attention. And NBC's Carrie Sanders joins us from Cape Canaveral to explain why. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Well, good morning. It's all about Space Force, which is brand new. But I'm at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And right over there is where the U.S. Air Force launched the first satellite in 1958. And historians will tell you that ever since then, there's been discussions about a need for maybe a new separate branch of the military. Now it's Space Force. And now, 62 years later, it's reality. And liftoff. There's a big buzz about space these days, and it's not just the SpaceX rocket set to carry two American astronauts to the International Space Station, the first crew launched from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. There's also a new division of the U.S. Armed Forces, Space Force. President Trump signed a new defense bill in December, officially establishing the sixth branch of the military, the first since the Air Force was created in 1947. The establishment of the United States States Space Force. Space Force is working with a $15 billion military budget. To make sure that we have everything that we need to have in space and the ability to perform the operations that we need to do. The new division will take over the Air Force's existing missions in space, like protecting satellites and GPS, but that's not all. Defend the domain of space, which is really central to our way of life today. Focus our assets and capabilities in this new domain. A division so new, it hasn't yet decided its rank structure. Obviously, we won't be called airmen. But space cadets isn't going to be one of them. I, I sure hope so, but I don't think so. <laughs> the first class of graduates excited to be getting in on the ground floor of this brave new frontier. You have so much talent in the Space Force. I was extremely lucky to be one of the four cyberspace operations officers to be able to commission straight into the Space Force this year. And I had to ask. What about an alien attack? I have no responsibility of defending you from an alien attack, so. Space, such a hot topic these days. There's even a new Netflix series called Space Force. The president is creating a new branch, Space Force, <laughs> which Mark will run. <laughs> what? The galaxy far, far away is going to make for a great adventure. The universe is a big place. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. All right, it is exciting, Carrie. Carrie, and let's just hope that the Netflix Space Force does not resemble our actual Space Force. <laughs> but, but paint a picture for us if you can, buddy. What is this, this Space Force actually going to look like? What's it going to be doing on a daily basis? You know, it's so brand new. They only have 86 members right now. They haven't even figured out, as we know, the rank structure. Uh, but it will be based at the Pentagon. They will be dealing with things in outer space. It can be uh, satellites. It can be things that we don't know about because it needs to be secret. It can even be cleaning up space junk. And just to give you sort of a moment of history here, because we have all eyes on space right now with what's going to happen possibly tomorrow, over my shoulder there, that is where America's first astronaut into space, Alan Shepard, launched in uh, 1961. And it's really uh, kind of amazing to look at that replica of the Mercury that launched here. Uh, really quite a, uh, an amazing kind of attention that the whole nation is now giving to space with Space Force. And the reminder of what we can do. Uh, Carrie Sanders for us there at Cape Canaveral. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following internet national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 
We're back with our series, The New Normal. Summer season is here. Families longing to escape and spend time away from home. But what do vacations look like in the coronavirus era? Well, with so many hotels still closed, a lot of people are looking to rent or buy RVs. According to one bank, applications for them and boats have exploded by 50 percent. So we asked NBC's tech correspondent Jacob Ward to explore the trend. Rise and shine. Good morning, Jake. <laughs> Good morning, you guys. That's right. You know, people are applying for the loans to buy an RV in huge numbers, and huge numbers of people who already own them are renting them out. It seems to be that the, the freedom of the open road is calling to America. Of course, that freedom comes with some new rules. The national mood right now is, well, you know what it is. Get me out of the house. The Reynolds family spent 66 days stuck in their house in Austin. I've been at home with my three children who are six and under, so just, you know, wanted to get out of the house. Now they are first time RV renters, and they just pulled into the Blue Water RV Resort on the Texas coast. Maybe we'll turn into RV people, <laughs> you know? Never <laughs> never thought anything of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It feels like an all-inclusive resort. Now, my family loves to camp, and we would love nothing more than to do what the Reynolds family is doing. But we live in a county in California that's still under a shelter-in-place order, and as a result, here we are camping in our backyard. Across the country, it is a patchwork of reopenings and improvised regulations. You can't just get in an RV and park it anywhere. Reservations are required at most of the places you want to go, and even if you do get a reservation, there are new rules to follow. No visitors, no playground, no bathrooms. Camping is limited to families or households that you typically would be hanging out with during the time of COVID. But we will take it. A survey by the U.S. Travel Association found that only 18% of travelers feel safe flying and only 18% feel safe at a hotel. Maybe that's why people are buying and renting RVs in big numbers. It felt like the right first step to returning to travel. They view RVs and boating as as fun, safe ways to control their environment. Rental company RV Share says RV rentals are twice what they were last summer. And while most RV rentals are normally booked well in advance, another company, Outdoorsy, says half their bookings are now last minute. Lots of people want to rent an RV, and they want to do it now. We're at Lake Tyler. I love that we could bring our own bedding from our house and don't have to worry about somebody else cleaning it or touching it during this time of social distancing. That is good news for RV resorts. All of our holidays are already booked up for the summer. Meanwhile, I'll have to be satisfied with just hearing about the Reynolds getaway by phone from my basement. Tell me please, what's it gonna be like on the beach? Just give me, paint me a picture here. What do you? Mostly just watch the kids build sand castles and run into the water. Just relax. <laughs> Not yeah. be in our house or yeah. backyard. Exactly. You guys, you know, these are amazing <laughs> machines, and some people are using them, of course, for more than just fun. An estimated one million Americans treat an RV as a primary residence, and in tough economic times, a lot of people are forced to make that choice. But they can be used for other things as well. There's even an RVs for MDs Facebook page that is pairing people who own RVs with first responders, doctors, and nurses who need a place to shelter away from their family. So a lot of people looking at RVs for a lot of reasons. Oh, guys. that is super Super cool. Hey, Jake, I was wondering, do you need like a special driver's license if you're going to rent one of those or can you just use your regular one? You do. You're going to need one for one of the big self-contained ones. You have to spe uh, have a special license for that to be able to, to uh, tow one around or drive one of those camper vans. And those are the ones that, of course, I have been, you know, sitting here in my basement in California going, oh, oh, the, <laughs> the camper van. I would take a camper van. You know, those ones you can get right into and pull away, which is, of course, the dream here, you guys. I would love to do it. Uh, let's let's do it. Let's do a road trip later this summer, ladies. What do you say? I'll oh, drive. I'll meet, you. I'll meet you in the Al's middle of the country. I'll meet you years. somewhere. I don't know. I'd love to do it. I think take, a road trip would be a blast. Take the show on the road. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Al has wanted right. to put That's us right. all in the Winnebago yeah. for a long, long time. I have <laughs> yeah. Begging, Haven't you, Al? Begging to do that. Yeah. Craig, and I, Craig, you and I did that, remember? I do. Up, up in New England. Where you drove like a madman. I remember that. Where I was, I was fearful for my life. That's right. Uh, while we have That's you, right. you cried like a baby. I knew that was coming. <laughs> while, while we have you, 
How about a check of the weather, sir, including how things might be looking for that uh, that launch? Fingers crossed tomorrow. That's right. For Launch America, we are keeping our fingers crossed. Here's what we are expecting. Saturday, probably the iffier of the two days, a 60% chance of thunderstorms, southerly winds 10 to 15. Sunday, a 40% chance of thunderstorms. You can see on the future cast, a little clearer. So hopefully one of those two days is going to work and we'll see that, that crude ship take off. Above normal on both ends of the coast, but big changes coming to the northeast. You can see today temperatures anywhere from 10 to 15. 15 degrees below average, b- above average, I should say. But behind that front, temperatures drop. And then by Saturday, it's cooler in Milwaukee, Buffalo, Charleston. Uh, fairly decent in the northeast. But then into next week, temperatures warm up nicely. By Tuesday, Kansas City, you're at 89, 73 in Detroit and Philadelphia, and 87 degrees in Nashville. This morning, Minneapolis is reeling, tensions running high in a city on edge. A third night of protest again turning violent, demonstrators clashing with police, buildings including this evacuated police precinct burning, protesters cheering as it went up in flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control, and smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. The rioting, a dramatic escalation from more peaceful protests earlier in the day. To tear down our city like this, what's this proving? People who are supposed to protect and serve us sit up and murder us in cold blood. In South Minneapolis and nearby St. Paul, looters ransack businesses. In Louisville, Kentucky, seven people were shot at a rally against police brutality. While nationwide, from Chicago to New York to Denver, there is mounting outrage over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of criminal charges against the four officers involved. This new video from a different angle shows two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. All four officers have been fired. There is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. This is the damage from the air. The governor has now activated the National Guard. We want justice. We're mad. I'm mad. Giovanni Thunstrom was Floyd's employer and landlord. He said Floyd had lost his job due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's like a brother to me, and uh, he didn't serve to die that way. This morning, South Minneapolis is now wondering when the violence will end. Here's what happened live on television on CNN a short time ago. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why why am I under arrest, sir? So certainly a very fluid situation here right now. We're keeping safe here with our security team. But as you can see behind me, a huge show of force right now from police on the scene as daybreak. We really start to see for the first time the damage here. It is extensive throughout most of the night. Again, it was chaos here, multiple buildings on fire. Now, though, you see emergency crews here trying to douse the flames and to keep those fires from spreading. We are joined now by Jeremiah Ellison. He's a member of the Minneapolis City Council. Councilman Ellison, good morning to you. I want to get to those protests in just a second, but at the heart of those protests, the rage is about the fact that no one has been arrested in this case. The mayor has basically called it a murder and is asking why that hasn't happened. A lot of people obviously have seen the tape of what happened. But here's what the county attorney said. He said, and this is Mike Freeman, he said uh, that there is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. Are you privy to what that other evidence may be? 
No, I think the statement's vague. Uh, I wish the uh, district attorney would be more specific. And more importantly, I wish the district attorney uh, would watch the tape, uh, see what's evident on the tape as far as the fact that uh, four officers murdered um, uh, uh, Mr. Floyd and, uh, and make the arrest. Well, absent, absent the charges, council member, um, how do you calm a city? You know, I think that we had a great opportunity on the first night to uh, respond differently uh, when it came to the situation. I think for those of us who are who kind of come from more um, activist backgrounds um, and who have participated in mass protests before, uh, you can kind of see where a crowd's going. Um, and I felt like this was really preventable. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, conventional wisdom of uh, of, 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 of force sort of won out. And uh, that was the strategy we pursued. And I, I think that strategy has proven to be um, uh, an unmitigated failure. You know what? It was interesting yesterday on our air, Craig interviewed one of George Floyd's best friends, NBA great Stephen Jackson. And Stephen, he was asked about those protests and what George would have thought. And he said he would have welcomed the support, but he basically said he didn't like that kind of violence in the streets. That wasn't, he said, what George Floyd would have wanted. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the one of the dynamics when when you look at a protest like that is that really the protest is uh, it's about the death of the person um, and, and not always necessarily what the person would have wanted. Right. Um, I imagine that nobody would want to see the kind of devastation that we uh, are experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, but what people are, are responding to uh, are, is not just uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, but also uh, Philando Castile. Uh, Jamar Clark, uh, Fong Lee, these are people who have been killed by the various police departments in the metro area um, and who have whose deaths have largely gone um, unrecognized as crimes. Uh, just pull out your tea leaves for one second and just tell me finally where you think we will be one week from today. You know, um, you know, all I can do is speculate. Uh, I, I hope that um, uh, that the district attorney is able to get his act together and uh, uh, make the arrest of the four officers who uh, uh, participated in the murder. Um, and, uh, and I hope that the crowd, um, I hope that the, the protesters um, uh, begin to, to, to recede and go home. Uh, I understand the rage. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is shocking to see the level of destruction that's occurred. Um, and, uh, and, and I just hope that we can um, keep as many people as safe as possible um, and, and begin to, uh, on a road to justice. Uh, and I think that's really what the protesters are calling for. All right. Minneapolis City Councilman Jeremiah Ellison. Councilman Ellison, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Overnight, the president making his position clear, writing, These thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That tweet then flagged by Twitter, adding what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The president also going after the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry, calling him weak and saying he should get his act together and bring the city under control or I will send in the National Guard and get the job done right. The mayor responding overnight. Weakness is refusing to take responsibility for your own actions. Weakness is pointing your finger at somebody else during a time of crisis. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes, but you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. About that flag that Twitter posted on the president's tweet, the company in a series of tweets of its own overnight notes, the historical context of some of the language the president used in his tweet, its connection to violence as well, they say. Twitter does not specifically detail what it is referring to, but during the bloodshed of U.S. riots in the late 1960s, Miami's police chief infuriated black leaders at the time, famously crediting the calm in his city to a get tough warning that he had delivered, saying, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter has not taken down the president's tweet, saying it's determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. 
This morning, New York City, the only part of the state that's still shut down, is on the verge of reopening. It's important to remind everyone, we say restart, we do not mean rushing back. The city is setting its sights on the next two weeks, sending between 200 and 400,000 New Yorkers back to work. It will also be a huge test for the city's sprawling mass transit system, which is now sanitized daily. The nation's former epicenter of the outbreak is close to meeting the final benchmarks for phase one, having enough hospital beds and contact tracers. We don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. By the first half of June, non-essential retail like clothing and furniture stores can reopen for curbside pickup. Manufacturing, construction and wholesale operations can also resume. But the new plans don't include bars and restaurants. They'll have to continue surviving on pickups and deliveries for at least another month. We're past the shock and awe phase and now we're ready for the rebirth. And the point is, we, we, you know, we want it to keep getting better once it starts. Some businesses have defied the orders, opening prematurely, like this tanning salon on Staten Island. The mayor says those businesses could face fines. The goal here is not to fine businesses, not to shut down businesses, but to educate and support businesses. But we got to get it right. While infections in the city are at the lowest level we've seen in months, Governor Andrew Cuomo highlighted the importance of taking precautions, issuing an executive order giving businesses the right to refuse service for customers without face coverings. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. While enlisting the help of longtime Brooklyn natives Chris Rock and Rosie Perez to spread the message. I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. <laughs> Lift off. There's a big buzz about space these days, and it's not just the SpaceX rocket set to carry two American astronauts to the International Space Station, the first crew launched from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. There's also a new division of the U.S. Armed Forces, Space Force. President Trump signed a new defense bill in December, officially establishing the sixth branch of the military, the first since the Air Force was created in 1947. The establishment of the United States. Space Force. Space Force is working with a $15 billion military budget. To make sure that we have everything that we need to have in space and the ability to perform the operations that we need to do. The new division will take over the Air Force's existing missions in space, like protecting satellites and GPS. But that's not all. Defend the domain of space, which is really central to our way of life today. Focus our assets and capabilities in this new domain. A division so new, it hasn't yet decided its rank structure. Obviously, we won't be called airmen. But space cadets isn't going to be one of them. I, I sure hope so, but I don't think so. <laughs> the first class of graduates excited to be getting in on the ground floor of this brave new frontier. You have so much talent in the Space Force. I was extremely lucky to be one of the four cyberspace operations officers to be able to commission straight into the Space Force this year. And I had to ask. What about an alien attack? I have no responsibility of defending you from an alien attack. So Space, such a hot topic these days. There's even a new Netflix series called Space Force. The president is creating a new branch, Space Force, <laughs> which Mark will run. <laughs> what? The galaxy far, far away is going to make for a great adventure. The universe is a big place. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. All right, it is exciting, Carrie. Carrie, and let's just hope that the Netflix Space Force does not resemble our actual Space Force. But but paint a picture for us, if you can, buddy. What is this, this Space Force actually going to look like? What's it going to be doing on a daily basis? You know, it's so brand new. They only have 86 members right now. They haven't even figured out, as we know, the rank structure. Uh, but it will be based at the Pentagon. They will be dealing with things in outer space. It can be uh, satellites. It can be things that we don't know about because it needs to be secret. It can even be cleaning up space junk. And just to give you sort of a moment of history here, because we have all eyes on space right now with what's going to happen possibly tomorrow, over my shoulder there, that is where America's first astronaut into space, Alan Shepard, launched in uh, 
1961, and it's really uh, kind of amazing to look at that replica of the Mercury that launched here. Uh, really quite a, uh, an amazing kind of attention that the whole nation is now giving to space with Space Force. And the reminder of what we can do. Uh, Carrie Sanders for us there at Cape Canaveral. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. The national mood right now is, well, you know what it is. Get me out of the house. The Reynolds family spent 66 days stuck in their house in Austin. I've been at home with my three children who are six and under. So just, you know, wanted to get out of the house. Now they are first time RV renters and they just pulled into the Blue Water RV Resort on the Texas coast. Maybe we'll turn into RV people, <laughs> you know? Never <laughs> never thought anything of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It feels like an all-inclusive resort. Now, my family loves to camp, and we would love nothing more than to do what the Reynolds family is doing. But we live in a county in California that's still under a shelter-in-place order, and as a result, here we are, camping in our backyard. Across the country, it is a patchwork of reopenings and improvised regulations. You can't just get in an RV and park it anyway. Reservations are required at most of the places you want to go. And even if you do get a reservation, there are new rules to follow. No visitors, no playground, no bathrooms. Camping is limited to families or households that you typically would be hanging out with during the time of COVID. But we will take it. A survey by the U.S. Travel Association found that only 18% of travelers feel safe flying and only 18% feel safe at a hotel. Maybe that's why people are buying and renting RVs in big numbers. It felt like the right first step to returning to travel. They view RVs and boating as, as fun, safe ways to control their environment. Rental company RV Share says RV rentals are twice what they were last summer. And while most RV rentals are normally booked well in advance, another company, Outdoorsy, says half their bookings are now last minute. Lots of people want to rent an RV, and they want to do it now. We're at Lake Tyler. I love that we could bring our own bedding from our house and don't have to worry about somebody else cleaning it or touching it during this time of social distancing. That is good news for RV resorts. All of our holidays are already booked up for the summer. Meanwhile, I'll have to be satisfied with just hearing about the Reynolds getaway by phone from my basement. Tell me, please, what's it going to be like on the beach? Just give me, paint me a picture here. What do you? Mostly just watch the kids build sandcastles and run into the water. Just relax, not yeah. be in our house or yeah. backyard. Exactly. You guys. You know, these are amazing machines, and some people are using them, of course, for more than just fun. An estimated one million Americans treat an RV as a primary residence, and in tough economic times, a lot of people are forced to make that choice. But they can be used for other things as well. There's even an RVs for MDs Facebook page that is pairing people who own RVs with first responders, doctors, and nurses who need a place to shelter away from their family. So a lot of people looking at RVs for a lot of reasons. Oh, guys. that is super. Super cool. Hey, Jake, I was wondering, do you need like a special driver's license if you're going to rent one of those or can you just use your regular one? You do. You're going to need one for one of the big self-contained ones. You have to spe uh, have a special license for that to be able to, to uh, tow one around or drive one of those camper vans. And those are the ones that, of course, I have been, you know, sitting here in my basement in California going, oh, oh, the, <laughs> the camper van. I would take a camper van. You know, those ones you can get right into and pull away, which is, of course, the dream here, you guys. I would love to do it. I, let's let's do it. Let's do a road trip later this summer, ladies. What do you say? I'll, I'll drive. Meet you. I'll meet you in the Al's middle of the country. I'll meet you somewhere. Years. I don't know. I'd love to do it. I think take, a road trip would be a blast. Take the show on the road. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Al has wanted right. to put That's us right. all in the Winnebago yeah. for a long, long time. I have <laughs> yeah. been begging. Haven't you, Al? Begging to do that. Yeah. Craig, and I, Craig, you and I did that, remember? I do. Up, up in New England. Where you drove like a madman. I remember that. Where I was, I was fearful for my life. That's right. Uh, while we had you. Right. You cried like a baby. I knew that was coming. <laughs> In a recent ad for Uber, a father holds his child, friends and family wave from afar, and people hunker down in their homes doing everything but get inside a car. The message, stay home for everyone who can't, reflects a reality devastating companies like Uber, Lyft, and Bird. Safety concerns and lockdowns have led to leaner ridership. Uber's bookings dropped 80% in April. Lyft rides fell 75% from the same month last year, 
and e-bikes and scooters have lost their buzz, with wheels and lime pausing operations in some markets. Not to mention the impact on drivers. How hard has it been for you driving recently in terms of just getting business? Not a lot of customers. I feel that it's, it's not a safe for everybody. So I am driving, but I'm, I'm not sure as if I'm doing the right things. So you keep Lysol in the car with you? Yeah. Walter Stefano returned to work a couple weeks ago, protected by a plastic barrier and plenty of cleaning products, but not armed for the economic bite. How much business would you say you've lost? About 60%. You've lost 60% of your customers? Yes. Uber has offered workers $19 million in financial aid so far and has buckled down on safety since the start of the pandemic. You can't enter a car without agreeing to wear a face covering and acknowledging no symptoms. The company's pumped $50 million into cleaning supplies and PPE for drivers and new this morning. Riders can book hourly windows at a flat rate to reduce exposure. Lyft, likewise, making face masks mandatory for riders and drivers and investing heavily in cleaning supplies. For ride-sharing users like Amanda Rivera, the risks at this point seem manageable. As long as you're healthy and you're taking the right precautions, I think you're safe. Thanks for helping keep your community and yourself safe. A call to action for being conscientious, wearing a mask, and refusing to ride with those who won't. If someone is not wearing a face mask, you better use the face mask, they don't get in my car. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. Dara Khosrowshahi, who is the CEO of Uber. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, the numbers are just jaw-dropping. Ridership down 80% in April. You've called it a shock to the system. Do you feel the worst of this crisis is behind you for Uber and ride-sharing services? We certainly do. Uh, I think Uber essentially goes with the city. We are very much a local business. And when the heartbeat of the city starts beating again, uh, Uber starts moving. So we are seeing uh, business improve from those April lows, still down significantly, but we are seeing the improvement happening faster in some of the states and cities that are opening up uh, cautiously, obviously, in, let's say, in Atlanta or Houston. Uh, we are seeing volumes return. And even in other states that haven't completely opened up, they're off the bottom, but they still are down significantly year on year. But we are seeing signs of life, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you want to get moving, but you want to get moving in a safe way. Well, that brings me to my next question, because a lot of folks had come to depend on Uber. I know you, the company was about to be profitable for the first time uh, by the end of the year. How do you convince people now that it's safe, that they should get in a confined space with a stranger, convincing driver, drivers and customers? Absolutely. It's a it's a two way street. And, and for us, we have redesigned the experience from top to bottom with safety in mind. Uh, our drivers and our riders have to wear a mask. And for example, we are rolling out a technology feature for our drivers where the drivers actually have to take a selfie. Uh, and we have machine learning algorithms understanding whether that driver is actually wearing a mask or saying that uh, they're wearing a mask. If a driver sees a rider who is not wearing a mask, uh, they can cancel the trip uh, if they feel unsafe as well. Uh, we've invested millions in PPE. We've got we've secured 23 million masks and are distributing them to our drivers as well. Uh, so you know, getting out of the house, um, starting to move again, uh, is going to feel funny and it may feel unsafe. And we're doing our part to make it as safe as possible. And then we're also including two-way accountability. The rider and the driver essentially rate each other. And to the extent that they see behavior that's unsafe, uh, we'll instantly know about it and be able to do something about it. And to go in long term, I mean, so much about our society has changed and we don't know yet whether it's permanent. I mean, you're talking about companies who may start working from home exclusively or uh, in a much more significant way. People not going to doing the work travel so much of Uber or, or, or trips to the airport, things like that, or to concerts. Do you worry about this business long term being able to survive? I think that the focus right now, honestly, is short term and tomorrow. How can we build the safest service uh, we can. 
the long term will take care of itself. We think we can make the right adjustments. And actually, in certain places, let's say Hong Kong, uh, who is more advanced in terms of their uh, response, in terms of testing, masks, et cetera, we're seeing the business come back uh, even sometimes close to prior levels. People are getting back to work, even during what you call party hours, where people are going out to restaurants. Life begins anew. While I don't expect behavior to revert to where we were previously, unless there's a vaccine or something very big happens, I do think that people, uh, behaviors and people revert to normal. They're going to be, be more careful. They are going to wear masks. We're going to have cleaning supplies. So certain things are going to change. But I do think that business is going to come back. If life comes back into the city, then Uber will be back along with it. And in the short few moments we have left, you wrote a letter to the White House asking that Uber drivers be included in the stimulus package that gave relief. And one of the, it did, by the way, did include drivers and gig workers. One yes. of the reasons they hadn't been included is because they are not considered full time employees by a company like Uber. Do you have a change of heart at all about that? If we just have about 30 seconds left, I know it's not your business model, but I just wonder how you're feeling about it. I do think that independent work should come with social protections, should come with minimum earnings protections, uh, health protections, accident protection, et cetera. That is a change from where we've come from. And we need to work with lawmakers, regulators to allow that to happen. There's no reason why independent work shouldn't come with respect and shouldn't come with the kinds of protections that I think society now is asking for. And we as a company completely agree with, we do want to be a leader here going forward. Well, Uber CEO Dara Khazra Hashahi, thank you so much. I know the company has also donated a half a million dollars to international relief efforts and wanted to mention that as well. The last changing of the guard at Seoul's National Palace for another two weeks. Museums and parks are closing, libraries locking their doors because of an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse. 79 new cases Thursday, 58 today. The biggest jump in two months. Uh, yeah, we know. Seoul's public health director told me they're worried about the increase in daily infections and a rise in cases that can't be traced. It comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students in classrooms, worshipers at church. On Wednesday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof. That church now tells us they'll dial back on big services. In Brazil, the virus is still surging, with daily deaths over 1,000 for three days this week. Beaches in Rio are empty, but in the hardest hit city, Sao Paulo, they'll start reopening shopping malls and car dealers on Monday. Another hotspot in India, hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Britain, with the highest death rate in Europe, is getting ready to reopen schools. Prince William warning of the toll on mental health. It's scary. Um, it's making a lot of people anxious and uncertain. Back in Seoul, people are once again being asked to work from home and to avoid socializing, especially in big groups. With the new cases, are you worried? No, not at all. Many here still confident the country will bring the virus under control. Tonight, it's back to business at the Chattanooga Zoo. Three of the biggest new stars back in the spotlight. I think that it's very cool to have giraffes at a zoo because it's very hard to get them at a zoo. Whoa, a stingray! And excitement at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, also now open. We've been stuck at home, not be able to do anything because nothing was open. But there are big changes. The number of visitors has been capped at 20%, even though state rules allow 50% occupancy. The CDC has, has suggested masks, but in our case, all of our guests are wearing masks. Even though it's not a requirement by the government. That's exactly right. And now some signs of summer's biggest tourist attractions, ghost towns for months, are ready to to bounce back. Disney World, SeaWorld, and Universal Orlando, part of our parent company, NBC Universal, are planning to reopen this summer, mandating employees and guests wear masks. All parks will have temperature checks and cashless payments. But will it be enough to bring customers back? Would you feel comfortable going to a theme park right now? Theme park? Theme park. Health-wise? Eh, I don't know. 
probably not. I absolutely would not uh, hesitate doing that. Going to a theme park? Not at all. And I'd feel comfortable tomorrow doing that. Legoland, which also plans to reopen, says customers should be prepared to accept some risk. We are providing a safe operating experience from our operational changes, but they are still accepting the liability or any illnesses that may arise. For all these theme parks, there is a real urgency to get their employees and customers back. Analysts say collectively they're losing more than $2 billion a month. In the sky above North Carolina, the state famous for being first in flight, another aviation breakthrough as long-range delivery drones are called in to help in the fight against COVID-19. The company Zipline, whose drones have been dropping emergency blood transfusions in remote Rwandan villages for years, now working with Novant Health Systems to get emergency supplies to hospitals in a matter of minutes at the drop of a parachute. Two routes planned so far, with more possible in the future. Zipline drones can fly 100 miles. So it's 50 mile radius. If you think about a drone flying a 50 mile radius, 50 miles in all directions, that's 8,000 square miles. In Florida, drones flying for UPS are helping deliver medication from CVS to retirement communities, while Google's wing drones lowering food, coffee, and groceries from the sky. Here we go. On the ground in some medical facilities, the dangerous job of sanitizing left to automatic arms immune to any disease. And while humans keep their social distance, more robots with wheels are going the extra mile. Driverless cars like these from Neuro offering contact-free delivery, making pharmacy and supply runs in Texas. Here in LA, food delivery giant Postmates sending yellow droids like this out for drop-offs. And fleets of what are called starships that became popular on some college campuses before the pandemic struck, now retooled to deliver to neighborhoods sheltering in isolation. A future among robots getting closer as us humans stay apart. Gary Schwartz, NBC News, Los Angeles. This weekend also marks a turning point for several states and cities across this country, including the state of Maryland. Here to talk about that is Maryland Governor uh, Larry Hogan. Governor Hogan, always good to have you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Before we talk about the reopening of your good state, um, you have a unique perspective here. And I want to talk to you about the, the protests in Minneapolis over the death of George Floyd, because as, as you heard there in that news conference, the district attorney on uh, Thursday, he pointed to the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore back in 2015. He said that one of the reasons that they were withholding judgment is, was because they didn't want to rush to justice. His words, uh, like the rush that was done in, in Baltimore. Um, I was there in Baltimore when you called out the National Guard there. I, is that a fair comparison? Is that a fair characterization of what happened in 2015? Was there a rush to justice? I, I don't think it's a fair comparison. Um, I, the the evidence here seems overwhelming and clear to me. And you have a you know the video of exactly what happened. Um, but however, the, the situation on the ground is reminiscent uh, somewhat of, of uh, the actions that took place afterwards. And um, I think back to 2015, I had just become governor of Maryland. I'd only been governor for, for 90 days, and the, the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city. And I reached out to Governor Walls this morning to try to offer uh, my advice. Uh, our The way we handled this situation, look, it's a tragic situation. I understand the frustration in the community. I think they've got to act. Um, we sent in the National Guard and police officers to try to keep the community s safe because in the first few hours we had 400 uh, businesses burned and looted and destroyed and 137 police and firefighters injured. Uh, but then we sent in a strong force of police and National Guard and kept the peace while allowing people to protest uh, lawfully and to express their frustrations. I immediately went to the city of Baltimore, spent an entire week uh, talking with people and walking the streets and trying to lower the temperature and listen to the concerns. Uh, and we, after the first day, we had no violence whatsoever. Um, and I, that's just my advice is that you've got to act, uh, you've got to be decisive, uh, and you've got to uh, get in there and try, because there's, the violence is not helping the situation at all. There's legitimate concerns and frustrations that have sure. to be addressed. But burning down buildings and, uh, you know, this violence and looting and burning police stations is not the answer. 
You are also, in addition to your responsibilities as the governor of Maryland, you're also the chair of the uh, Republican Governors Association. Uh, the president of the United States tweeting overnight, I want to make sure I get this right, he called the protesters thugs. Uh, and then he went on to say that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. It was a tweet that was later flagged by, by Twitter uh, because it, it promotes violence, according to the platform. Um, you've got the ear not only of, of governors, you've got the ear of the president as well. Language like that, does it, does it help in, the, in a situation like this? Well, let me clarify. I'm the chairman of the national governors, of both the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, but, yeah, I don't think it's helpful. Um, I just mentioned uh, lowering the temperature, um, trying to uh, stop the violence uh, and to bring about calm and restore peace and law and order. And in inflammatory rhetoric, I just don't think it's helpful uh, on, on, on either side. Um, I, I do believe that you've got to have law and order, that we've got to stop the burning and looting. Uh, but uh, inciting, uh, you know, violence with, with Twitter is not the way to go about it. Like I said, I walked the streets face to face and calmly talked with folks. Um, but I, I, inciting things and, and inflammatory rhetoric isn't going to help. Thank you for the clarification, by the way. You are the chair of, of the National Governors yeah, Association. Sure. I didn't want to demote you there. Let's talk about this reopening. Yeah. <laughs> in, let's talk about this reopening in, in Maryland. Phase one, uh, outdoor pools, sports camps, outdoor dining. Um, what, what gives you the confidence to start this, this first phase of reopening there? Well, we've been doing everything uh, kind of based on the science and the, based on the facts. We've had a, a really smart coronavirus recovery team made up of some of the smartest scientists and doctors in our state and in the world uh, who have been advising us. We have great numbers that are coming down. Our positivity rate in the state is down 54 percent over its peak. Uh, we've been consistently going down on hospitalizations, on high ICUs, and on infection rates. Uh, our, we've been ramping up our testing capability and our, our, our surge capacity and our contact tracing. And so everyone uh, felt we were in a position to slowly, gradually, and safely open some of the low-risk things like outdoor activities. Uh, so we're going a little more slowly than some states, but uh, we needed to get some parts of our economy, get some of the more uh, safe activities back on track. And it's going pretty well so far. Over Memorial Day weekend, uh, we saw these As a white man without living those, those lived experiences of how very difficult that is. But I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard, not those who throw firebombs into businesses that are communities of colors have worked so hard to build back up areas that were blighted at one time and are thriving because of their entrepreneurship and their hard work. A library in an area where our children, as we know, are institutionally put behind and the achievement gap for our communities of color is a shame on this state that we continue to admire by talking about and don't repair it. And that tool to help with that burned last night. So I want to just call out very, very clearly as we put a presence on the street to restore order, it is to open that space to seek justice and heal what happened. I will not in any way uh, not acknowledge that there's going to be that pain, but my first and foremost responsibility to the state of Minnesota is the safety and security of all citizens. We cannot have the looting and the recklessness that went on. We cannot have it because we can't function as a society, and I refuse to have it take away the attention of the stain that we need to be working on is what happened with those fundamental institutional racism that allows a man to be held down in broad daylight and thank God a young person had a camera to video it because there's not a person here or listening today that wonders how many times that camera's not there. These are tough questions. These are things that have been brewing in this country for 400 years. We have people out there putting themselves on the line to try and put out fires in our firefighters that are under attack. Those are the things I'm asking you. Help me restore that order. We will do that under state leadership and state guidance. 
You will hear directly from them of once that decision was made around 12.15 last night and that first mission was executed around 3.45 at the third precinct, we will see a difference. So I'm asking you and you'll hear from them to talk about this. I also want to think about what happens when we don't have that. People who are concerned about that police presence of an overly armed camp in their neighborhoods that is not seen in communities where children of people who look like me run to the police, others have to run from. So I understand that that's out there. But last night I got a call from a friend and a dedicated public servant. Senator Torres Ray called in her district and it was on fire. And there weren't any police there, there weren't any firefighters. There was no social control and her constituents were locked in their house wondering what they were going to do. That is an abject failure that cannot happen. We must restore that order to that. Senator Torres Ray has fought her whole life on these issues of inequities and making sure that people's voices are lifted up. But what she understands is none of us can lift those voices. None of us can tackle these problems if anarchy reigns on the street. I also want to address an issue, and this one is on me, and, and I will own it. Uh, earlier this morning when this mission was carried out under my direction to resecure the third precinct, to do so in a manner which I am proud of how it was executed by this team, no injuries and no loss of life, a reestablishment to put the fires out for those businesses, a CNN reporter was, a crew was uh, arrested by the state patrol. A few minutes after hearing that, I was on a call with CNN President Jeff Zucker, who demanded to know what happened. Uh, I take full responsibility. There is absolutely no reason something like this should happen. Calls were made immediately. This is a very public apology to that team. It should not happen. And I want to be clear for those of you listening. I think our Minnesota's reporters know this. Um, I am a teacher by trade, and I have spent my time as governor highlighting the need to be as transparent as possible and have the press here. I failed you last night in that. And it does not escape me that we are here on the catalyst that lit this spark by what happened with a police detainment of George Floyd and the idea that a reporter would have been taken while another police action was in play is inexcusable. So to CNN, to the CNN team, to the journalists here, um, this is about having a plan and that's what these folks are gonna talk about. This is about having an aggressive approach to understanding what the community needs to not coming in heavy handed with them, but to create space where the story can be told. In a situation like this, even if you're clearing an area, we have got to ensure that there is a safe spot for journalism to tell the story. The issue here is trust. The community that's down there that's terrorized by this, if they see a reporter being arrested, their assumption is, is because something's going to happen that they don't want to be seen. And so that is. Uh, that is unacceptable. We will continue to strive to make sure that that accessibility is, is maintained, that not only that, the protection and security and safety of the journalists covering this is a top priority, not because it's a nice thing to do, because it is a key component of how we fix this. Sunshine, disinfectant, and seeing what's happening has to be done. So again, I uh, appreciate President Zucker's call. I appreciate his um, understanding in a situation that he was rightfully uh, incredibly angry and um, that falls squarely on me. An apology has been issued and I think going forward to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's time for us to clean our streets. It's time for us to execute today in a way that shows respect and dignity to communities. I'm going to ask for a lot of help today of those folks who want to see it. It is my expectation that justice for the officers involved in this will be swift, that it will come in a timely manner, that it will be fair. That is what we've asked for. I have been in contact with Hennepin County Attorney, and I am confident that those very things I just said will happen. We will continue at the BCA to do a fair, a full, and a swift gathering of all of the evidence involved. But I would reiterate again, for so many of us, 
Not all that's done in every other case where all of that evidence is gathered before, and I would ask that the swift justice um, be carried out. So Minnesotans, your pain is real. Um, the chapter that's been written this week is one of our darkest chapters, and we can choose a few things. We can choose to try and get past this. We can choose to put a force out there and, and, and stop things from happening. We can hope that in the midst of COVID-19 or something else, it passes by, and we don't have to turn that mirror to look at the harsh reality of those underlying gaps, whether it be healthcare disparities, whether it be educational disparities in our community's color, whether it be policing disparities in our community of color, whether it be wealth acquisition in our communities of color are all very real. We pride ourselves on a state of openness. We pride ourselves on a state of being friendly. I've talked a lot about one Minnesota. That wasn't on display last night. I don't naively think everything heals and you come to the forefront and you say it'll be better. This is a community that demands and should expect more than words. They should expect results. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and I have tried to make equity the center of everything we've done. But obviously in Minneapolis on Monday night, there wasn't a lot of equity for George Floyd. His family is probably wondering where the one Minnesota is for them. And that's on us, us as Minnesotans us as the governor and the team that works with me to put the things in order to establish order in our streets, to establish and rebuild trust in our communities, to lift those voices up, to be heard, not pleading for their lives, but demanding the changes necessary so no one else is put into that position. So I would uh, like at this time to turn it over to uh, Minnesota's Attorney General, Keith Ellison. Governor, thank you. Martin Luther King said many years ago that riot is the way that the unheard get hurt. He didn't condone it, but he said to the nation, as a person who always protested peacefully, that don't just dismiss that and ignore it and relegate it to just criminality and bad behavior. Actually ask yourself, what's going on there? And is it something that we as a society absolutely must pay attention to? I think we must pay attention to it. I'd like everyone to, to recognize the fact that the National Guard just a week ago was administering COVID-19 tests to help people, to help people. The presence you see on the street, don't react to them the way you might react to the Minneapolis Police Department. It's not the same group. They have different leadership, different authority, and their job is to try to bring peace and calm back again. Please remember that this is not the group that you associate with um, unfair conduct but it's a group that in fact just a week ago was trying to make sure that Minnesotans could survive and thrive and live because we are still in the middle of a pandemic. It is that sense of service where they get involved uh, when it comes to natural disasters, storms, floods, rains, diseases. Now they have to restore their own order on the streets. And I hope that you, the community who is protesting will uh, protest peacefully, but not see this as, as, an, as another occupation by another military force. It really is make sure that there's calm and peace and that everybody can operate peacefully. So please accept it as that I'm asking that of our community. It is essential, as, and I've said this before, everybody keeps asking the question, when, 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 when? And this is a, this is a perfectly legitimate question. It is important to know that under Minnesota statutes, the primary jurisdiction for criminal prosecution is with the county attorney in which the offense occurred. And I believe that the message has been sent and received 
that the wheels of justice must turn swiftly. Not unjustly, expeditiously, thoroughly, fairly, but swiftly. It is important that people have confidence that accountability, no matter who you may be, is how we live in Minnesota. Let me also say that this prosecution, this investigation, this criminal process is important and it's, is it is and it is and the whole country and the whole world is looking at it. Cannot solve the problem. As the governor so eloquently said, events like this start and they come to a conclusion, but we never start the process of real reform. I will submit to you that myself and uh, Commissioner Harrington, under the leadership of the governor, have already started a process on the working group on preventing and reducing deadly force encounters with the police. We have a report that we want attention from the legislature and the entire community on to focus on that so that we can really get to the bottom of this when it comes to issues of use of force, when it comes to officer wellness, when it comes to community healing and a whole rank training issues, all kinds of things that bear on this issue. And it's not just those things. We believe, I believe that the real work of our, our working group is the implementation of this and that really begins in earnest now and is more important now, I think, than ever. So I just want to, as I conclude my remarks, I want to say that we, we have to have a situation where Lake Street, a precious jewel of our state, is a place where Minnesotans can walk again, where businesses can be safe again. But I want to be clear that if the message was this situation with Mr. Floyd is intolerable, absolutely unacceptable, and must change, that message has been sent and received as well. And go the governor, myself, the lieutenant governor, all of us are committed to that long-term change. And I can tell you that I spoke with many legislators who feel the exact same way. People in the philanthropic community feel the exact same way. So I think we're gonna do some real change we're not just going to fix the windows and sweep up the glass. We're going to fix the broken, shattered society that leaves so many people behind based on their historical legacy of being in bondage and servitude, then second-class citizenship, and now fraught with disparities from everything from incarceration to housing to wages to everything else. And so with that, I want to I hand it over to um, General Jensen, uh, General, Major General Jensen, who will uh, further elaborate. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Major General John Jensen. I'm the Adjutant General of the Minnesota Army National Guard, and I've been the Adjutant General since November of 2017. And what I'm going to describe uh, this morning very quickly is the actions of the Minnesota National Guard since we were mobilized under the Governor Walz's executive order. Like many Minnesotans, I woke up yesterday morning to the news that the Minneapolis mayor had requested National Guard support. The only difference was uh, I opened up my phone and there was a text from Commissioner Harrington. It wasn't the newspaper or the morning news that notified me of that. So immediately yesterday morning, I made contact with the commissioner and we began planning on the potential employment of the Minnesota National Guard in support of Minneapolis. For those of you that may not understand how emergency management works in Minnesota, I'm just gonna take a quick moment and explain that. In Minnesota, county emergency management coordinators or the mayors of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, and Duluth may request National Guard support through the state EOC. So in accordance with that, Minneapolis Mayor, Mayor Fry, made that request to the Minnesota National Guard. What traditionally comes with the request, though, is a layout of capability needed and exactly the problem that's trying to be solved. Typically, the request for the Guard 
and that type of information come at the same time, sometimes it lags. So when it lags, we, what we do is we begin preparing for an unknown mission, but in this case, we sort of knew what we might be doing as it related uh, to civil disturbance in Minneapolis. But it's very important that we know exactly what we're being asked to do, so we make sure that we have the right equipment, we mobilize the right number of soldiers and the right number of soldiers and airmen to support those soldiers that are going to conduct the mission. That element was lacking. But with the governor's decision to allow me to continue to plan, we began notifying soldiers early yesterday morning of a pending mission. Once we notified our soldiers, again with the governor's verbal approval, we began mustering our soldiers and moving in moving them into the metro area, knowing that the most likely probabili probability of employment was going to be Minneapolis. As we, as we met as a senior team yesterday afternoon, the one topic that continued to be discussed was the lack of clarity and the lack of a mission and a description of what exactly the Minnesota National Guard needed to do. My concern to the governor was, was twofold. One, I didn't know what special equipment I might need to accomplish the mission. And two, I was very concerned about being asked to move to an unfamiliar area of Minneapolis under the cover of darkness. I wanted to get out when it was still daylight where my soldiers and my airmen could become familiar with their terrain and familiar with their mission. We never got such mission assignment. We never got such mission description. Yesterday, we performed four missions in support of the governor's executive order. The first mission came from the governor directly. That came when we were notified of a, an immediate and pending threat to the state capitol. My immediate advice to the governor was to assign that mission to the Minnesota National Guard. And he agreed with one caveat, and that is the state patrol also wanted to support that mission. So in cooperation with the State Patrol, we began that mission. The second and third mission came together. It came from St. Paul. Specifically, it was to provide security of the Ramsey County Law Enforcement Center and the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. The key part of that security was to ensure that St. Paul police officers were not required to secure those facilities and they were therefore relieved of that duty and able to respond throughout the city of St. Paul throughout the day. And then the last mission we did receive uh, yesterday evening was an escort mission for the Minneapolis Fire Department. The concept of the operations that we would move link up with the Minneapolis Police Department and as they went into unsecure and dangerous areas that we would secure the area so they could perform their life-saving and property-saving missions. And we continued to do those missions through the evening. As the governor indicated, about quarter after midnight this morning, the governor authorized a law and order mission into the third precinct, what we would call in the military a clear and security mission. So under the leadership of the State Patrol, in the Department of Public Safety, the Minnesota National Guard was assigned a task and a mission in support of the State Patrol. We would follow the State Patrol and we would help secure the area that they cleared. Our soldiers remain in that area as, we, as I speak now, still on that mission, still securing that location. So people and MnDOT can come in and begin the cleanup of, of that area. Now, we also have picked up one other mission with the city of, of uh, Minneapolis. I won't cover the exact details, but, but it's uh, ongoing right now with the Minneapolis Police Department. And I'm very proud of the relationship between the Minnesota National Guard and the Minneapolis Police Department that goes back to Super Bowl 52 just two years ago. Chief Rondo and I worked together during that, during that Super Bowl. So we, we have had uh, opportunities to serve together and I have a lot of respect for him. We will continue to uh, operate in Minneapolis until such time that the governor relieves us of that mission. Uh, and we will do so in support of the Department of Public Safety and the Minnesota State Patrol. 
So that's just a little bit of background of what the Minnesota National Guard since yes did since yesterday morning when we first notified of a possible deployment through the deployment and through our mission set last night and then early this morning. My recommendation this morning to the governor was that I continue to do the state capital mission and that I continue to do the mission in support of the Minneapolis Fire Department. I believe both of those are very critical mission, both to the state and to Minneapolis. And then we'll conduct follow-on missions again in support of the Minnesota State Patrol and the, and the Department of Public Safety. So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety, Commissioner John Harrington. Good morning. My name's John Harrington. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Governor Walz tasked me to prepare options and capacities and capabilities to respond to the civil unrest, the protests, but more importantly, and really more directly, to the unlawful behavior of the arsonists, the thieves, the burglars, the vandals who were tearing apart the city of Minneapolis. I want that to be clear that that's, I think, a clear line of demarcation that we were operating under because it is fundamental to the Department of Public Safety, it is fundamental to the State Patrol that we take an oath to support the Constitution and that we believe that our work is absolutely essential to allow everyone's First Amendment right to have their voices heard. We were not deployed and we have not been deployed, and we will not be deployed to stifle free speech. But we will not and cannot allow unlawful, dangerous behavior to continue. I, I am particularly proud of our relationship with both the Minnesota National Guard, uh, Commissioner Stroman from the Department of Natural Resources, and Colonel Langer, who works for the Department of Public Safety as the Colonel for the Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, we called and they came. Uh, and literally, it was that it doesn't make it much more complicated than that. I said, I'm going to need you, and I'm going to need you here in the city, and I may need you for two or three days, and I may need you longer than that, and I can't tell you what I'm going to need you to do yet, but I know I need you. And they came. They began preparing readiness to be able to move folks from all over the state of Minnesota literally from miles and miles away to come to the metro area to be prepared to help us keep the peace. Over the course of the day, I met with my counterparts in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Chief Arredondo and Chief Axtell, to talk about what missions they needed the state to help them fulfill. The Department of Public Safety uh, at that point was calling to say, we are here to support you. We are your partners. Tell us what you need and we will backfill. We will fill in the gaps. Tell us what you need for resources and we will help you get it. And we did get some very specific missions and in other cases, we got no real mission at all. And in the absence of a real mission, we began to identify where the critical needs were. We tasked the State Patrol, we tasked DNR, we tasked the Minnesota National Guard to meet specific missions that we were requested to do. But we also tasked them with being flexible because we knew that if things continued to devolve, that we might need to pivot and we might need to shift from a static post of guarding critical infrastructure to a fast-moving operational approach of restoring order. About midnight last night, I was party to a call where um, that pivot had to be made, uh, where the mayor of Minneapolis called and said uh, they had no more resources and they were not able to meet the public safety needs and control the behaviors that were occurring on Lake Street. They had lost the third precinct. There was concerns about a gas main, and there was concerns about continued looting and fire burning throughout the city of Minneapolis. 
And different than our first night, I had comparable concerns of looting and fires being set in the city of St. Paul, and so we had to divide our resources to meet the needs of both of the Twin Cities. The task the governor gave me was pretty simple, actually. It was to pull together a team that could go in, keep the peace, protect people, protect them, protect their safety, protect their lives, protect their liberty, and to protect property that was being burned up literally every minute that we delayed. The Henry County Sheriff was one of my first calls, and Sheriff Hutchinson immediately moved into action to give us support. We already had DNR, we already had State Patrol, we already had Minnesota National Guard. We had it available, but we hadn't tasked them with what we needed to do yet, and we had to create a plan. The U of M Police Chief, Matt Clark, offered support. Eddie Frizzell, the Chief of Police for Metro Transit, offered support. And with that team together, we put together a 250 ballpark cadre team to go in and restore order on Lake Street. We created a mission. It was very specific. I am a mission-driven person. We talked about the fact that we were going to be respectful of people's rights, that we were going to keep the peace and make people safe, and that we were going to follow our training and protocols by making a public announcement that they needed to clear the streets. And that if they didn't clear the streets, arrests were imminent. We made those announcements. We made those announcements repeatedly so that no one would be confused about what our intent was or what we were there to do. And then having made our announcements, we began to move to clear those streets. I will tell you that the vast majority of the, the great people of Minnesota and the great people of Minneapolis who are, who are still having their guts ripped out about the Lloyd murder, and we'll call it a murder, that's what it looked like to me. I don't want to prejudice this from a criminal perspective, but I'm just calling it what I see at that point. They weren't the people that were out there on the streets at 3 o'clock in the morning when we arrived on Lake Street. The people that were out there on Lake Street at 3 o'clock in the morning weren't the good people in Minnesota. They weren't the good people in Minneapolis. They weren't the people that, that wanted to mourn the lossing of a friend and a relative and a neighbor. And when they saw the National Guard, Minnesota State Patrol, and this cadre, this team moving down the street, the vast majority of them did what we thought they would do. They left. There were a few that decided not to leave. That was a choice that they get to make, uh, but we had advised them what that choice would result in. And we took action to respectfully and carefully take folks into custody as was necessary. And it was a very limited and very structured and extremely disciplined approach to making those arrests. I'm very proud of the fact that despite uh, what you've seen over the last few days of gas and canisters and foggers, almost no chemical agent was necessary to be used last night. We did it the old-fashioned way. Command presence, a uniform presence, and a clear intent to keep the peace, restore order, and to keep people safe. My task today is, uh, is a little different. Uh, having accomplished uh, that mission, and I think we've secured those streets, and I appreciate the fact that I've right now got National Guard folks still holding that ground that we took last night. We need to keep that ground, and we need to prepare for what may come today. Our task today is we're bringing together a unified command of metro area police departments, sheriff's departments, and other law enforcement jurisdictions and other public safety entities into a multi-agency command center where we will create a plan that will keep the peace, maintain the peace, and prevent further lawless behavior in the city of Minneapolis, in the city of St. Paul, and in the surrounding suburbs. 
we're going to do this the right way. We're going to do it with full knowledge that our oath is to serve the state of Minnesota, to serve the communities, and to protect them. We are fully confident that we can do that mission and that we can do it while still ensuring that the constitutional rights of those who need to have their voices heard and who need to freely assemble can be protected. I can tell you that no one could have heard Mr. Lloyd's voice in the chaos of the screaming and the shouting and the fires at one o'clock in the morning on Lake Street. My job is to make sure that tonight that the community is safe and that our team is ready and prepared to keep it safe. With that, I am very pleased to introduce the Colonel of the Minnesota State Patrol, Colonel Matt Langer. Well, thank you, Commissioner. My name is Matt Langer, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. I don't need to rehash what the Commissioner went through in terms of the detail that he provided on the role of the Minnesota State Patrol as it pertains to the City of Minneapolis this week. Um, I was thinking about what to say about this week, and difficult is the first word that comes to mind, and it doesn't seem to represent everything that has occurred this week well enough, but it certainly represents the challenges that the Minnesota State Patrol has faced the last couple of nights as we have worked hard to combat the lawlessness, the dangerous behavior, and the criminal activity that has occurred both in the city of Minneapolis and other places. I'll speak specifically to last night because, as you've heard, shortly after midnight, between midnight and 1 a.m., Governor Walls asked the State Patrol to lead an event in the city of Minneapolis to quell the unrest that was occurring in and around the 3rd Precinct. <clears throat> there were many challenges in that area. One of the main challenges in that area was that there were fires set, and the Minneapolis Fire Department was unable to get there and extinguish those fires because they were shelled by those that were demonstrating and choosing to make life difficult for everyone who was trying to improve the condition. So as the commissioner explained, we assembled a team, both with the State Patrol, the DNR, the University of Minnesota, Transit PD, Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, and the, the National Guard, and we assembled that team quickly, uh, swiftly, uh, strategically, and we descended into the city of Minneapolis with the one goal in mind to as safely and quickly as possible recover the ground that had been lost to lawless activity and make it safe again, and then restore order, clean the area, and get it presentable so that we can move into the future tonight and beyond with a much different picture of what it means to be a resident a citizen and, able, and your ability to demonstrate peacefully. Uh, that's the mission that we took on. That's what we did overnight. It was difficult, dangerous work uh, for everyone involved, the people that are demonstrating, those that are caught in the middle of a dem demonstration without uh, the desire to demonstrate, and the first responders that are there trying to do good work. We had a few troopers that suffered minor injuries. I'm thankful they're only minor. They stayed on the line and continued their good work because we needed every single one of them to do this job. We remain ready. We're there today with the National Guard. We're doing our best to hold that ground well and to make sure that we restore order, clean that spot up to the better than it was before, and to continue our efforts to make sure that public safety is of paramount concern uh, as we move forward both tonight and into the future, and then work together to restore order across the entire city of Minneapolis. Just as a side note, we had a couple missions other places last night. Of course, our responsibility at the state capitol, and we also assisted the city of St. Paul with some lawless behavior that was occurring on University Avenue with some of our mobile response team assets. Uh, one thing I'll note is that we have troopers in the metropolitan area from all across the state of Minnesota. That was an opportunity that we afforded the governor to make a staffing boost that is within the purview of the executive branch and within the ability of the state patrol to do on very short notice. Now, my hat's off to those troopers that responded, those DNR officers that responded from all across the state of Minnesota to come for an unknown period of time and to work very, very hard to make Minnesota what we believe it should be, a safe place for everybody. Thank you. I would note before we take questions, and we'll try and make sure we answer every one or as many as you need to ask, I would note to the 
To the reporters here in Minnesota, it was about three weeks ago I stood in front of you and I, as we passed 500 deaths by COVID-19, and said that on about the 29th of May, we would pass 1,000. That will happen today. So in the midst of this pandemic, um, we are still working that. We believe, again, numbers are down. Um, ICU bed capacity is stable, and we are doing everything we can. And as you heard from the folks speaking, the vast majority of people out there who were expressing their First Amendment rights and the rage over what happened to George Floyd were wearing masks, and we're trying their best to, to social distance and not touch things. I would, before I go to questions, note that the desire to get back to normal is so overwhelming for everyone. When so many in Minnesota would said, what else could happen? Um, we've witnessed this, but I think it's an important time to pause about that is. The problem is for so many of us, thinking that normal is where we wanna go, normal was not working for many communities. Normal was not working for George Floyd pre-COVID-19. It's certainly not working now. And so I think as you heard the Attorney General talk about that work that we're trying to look at to use this as a point and not just rhetorically, but a point to make those changes. With that, Mary, we'll start. Mary, yes. so the press, I failed you last night. What about the public? The public did not see you, hear you. You did not address the public the last two nights. Well, I certainly don't think it's important to be on, on, on TV. I think what you expected me to do is to be there is we were in a support role as state law shows. And once it became apparent to me that the city of Minneapolis would not be able to complete that, I was directing uh, the state to take that over. This is my responsibility. If, if, well, I think obviously if you think I didn't, that's probably the case as a reporter. But I think in the moment of making sure as those decisions were being made and that we were staying in the lane that we were asked to support this and as it deteriorated, it was at 12.05. There was a decision last night uh, that we made is to come in front of you at that time because that was the transition point because what you're seeing now is the state is the lead element now starting at 12.05 last night and those first missions that were carried out. So I think for many of you who know, I try and make myself as available as possible. I think it was important for me to be getting the data and the feedback I was watching where you were seeing and to be quite candid when the, when the third precinct was abandoned, um, it, it seemed at that point in time that that, that was a time to move. So, no, I stayed in the residence is where I work from. I have all the electronic tools, and we were on all night. And as I said, we were we were taking calls and adjusting, and I was able to track as the situation uh, evolved on going down. There was a dangerous uh, task that I, I tasked the state patrol and the national guard to go down and take that. Those of you who were watching that, as I was, as the lawlessness was burning down the third precinct or whatever. Uh, that can't be allowed to happen. It took a little while to plan this uh, to get going, but that's where I was at to make sure it was executed. Governor Walz, uh, Governor Walz, uh, there were millions of Americans and Minnesotans certainly watching on their TV screens as this unfolded last night. There was almost a complete lack of visibility of local police, state police, National Guard. After much fanfare about how the National Guard was coming in, people watched buildings burn, public and private, how could there not have been a clear mission for the National Guard when this, when they were called in and you knew things were going to happen last night? Yeah, I will let my leadership come back up there. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I think uh, that speaks to itself that by, uh, by shortly after 10 o'clock, it became apparent that that structure would go. The way this works is, is the mayors ask and they take charge and lead on the missions. Uh, I'll let the folks come up here said, I, I see that too. I think the decision to made to not engage. And I want to just be clear, there's, there's philosophically an argument to be made that an armed presence on the ground in the midst of where we just had a police killing is seen as a catalyst. My point to that was is we don't need a catalyst. It's already burning. And so this is trying to strike that balance. And so I am in total agreement with that. You will not see that tonight. There will be no lack of leadership and there will be no lack of response on the table. Follow up. Should there have been a National Guard presence on every corner in those areas last night as a deterrent, as opposed to having them come in uh, well, I'll ask, and I'll, under I'll answer this one uh, potentially, but the, the decision on that as it's made from the city and on this one, I, I think I would agree with them. We saw the first night decisions were made 
Up until about 8.30 last evening, it appeared that things were relatively peaceful on that. There was a decision during the day whether did you occupy the entire city and shut it down after those 24 hours. In retrospect, um, I, I'm assuming that, yes, we would say that. But at the time, and again, we will not know it as proving the negative, would it have simply started those uh, that movement faster and would we've seen it moved out of the third precinct? But, yes, yeah, certainly that's a, it's a valid uh, critique and point. Yes, Governor. You know, there was uncontrolled looting in St. Paul yesterday afternoon, and you're talking about making decisions at 10 o'clock. Why are you making the decisions then and not coming up with these scenarios as these things are happening just up the street from where The leadership happening? of communities is led by local leadership, their police force. They were at that time had sources in reserve. They were not being requested. They were not being requested. And I'm on with them. The reason we're standing here today is if this would have been executed correctly, the state would not lead on this. The state would have supported those and they would have moved forward. That did not happen. So now today we're taking that. We're making the decision to go and doing moving forward. And again, I would go back to Tom's question. Had I known that we were not going to see that or the capability to do it, should the state have come in? Potentially. But I want to be very clear. This, with the exception of the state troopers who have a very specific uh, statutory requirement on the highways, order is to the local police and sheriffs. We do not have a built-in police force. General Jensen is not a police force. DPS has experts in there, but these are not the police force that are on their streets with their people. And so that's a decision that uh, was made. It was in reserve. And, and, and yes, keeping in mind as this unfolded, the request came from St. Paul for the guard to be activated at five. I had moved on a warning order earlier than that to be prepared. You're really supposed to wait until you get that and start moving them in. That wasn't going to be possible. So by five o'clock yesterday, our guard troops were coming from all over. They were getting activated because of the events that happened the night before, and we were prepared to carry out those missions. And we were, they were, they were there. And as you heard, some of these folks, those missions never came. All that our folks talk. Yes. Yeah. Again, as as it relates to emergency management in Minnesota, county emergency management coordinators do exactly what you just asked. They define what they need and what they want, and then that's negotiated with the state EOC and the Department of Public Safety, along with the agency they're asking for. It's not always the National Guard. In this case, it is the National Guard. The reason why it's negotiated with National Guard is to make sure that we have the capability, the capability to do the mission that's being asked. So yes, we are always in support of the local leadership, the, the local civilian leadership. I have no authority to self-deploy the Minnesota National Guard anywhere in the state. I have no authority whatsoever. And so I follow exactly what you laid out, civilian leadership, civilian elected officials make the request, and then we work with them. Because if I'm not accomplishing their task and their mission, I risk failure of mission. I also risk the, uh, the uh, chance that I might break the law, right? I can't just march my soldiers down into Minneapolis and say, hey, this is what John Jensen believes we need to do. That's not how our government works, and that's not how our military uh, responds and reports to legitimate civilian leadership. And so what you asked is exactly right. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. Uh, all over Governor Walls, you told me in the morning by Mayor Fry that the plan was to let the protesters take over the third precinct. And if that's true, why did it take until 10.30 for that to happen? And then why were you not called until after midnight to take over the third precinct? I think that's a question you'll have to ask Mayor Fry. I assume that you were told in the morning. Uh, I, I think that the commitment to hold the third was was not one that I felt comfortable with, and it's one we discussed during the day. So, you were told so really early in the day. that the potential that the third precinct would not be held—that's correct. Governor, following up on that, we were told the same thing from sources that police in the third precinct were told before noon that they would be evacuating at some point. Essentially, the directive that they felt they were hearing was they would allow it to be taken over and to burn. What is your response to that tactic, given what we saw last night? Well, obviously, that was the, the turning point where we were prepared, and that's where we moved in. That's where we did not believe that the third should be given up, and that's why it's not, and that area was taken back by the force that we put together starting at 1215, um, executed about 340, 
a.m. Um, I, I simply think that this, I, I'm like all of you watching it, you can't have civil order deteriorate, and then you have to make a calculated decision about does force going in there escalate it? Does it stop it? Does it endanger civilians and the force going in there? And those are decisions, as you heard again, it is, it is local police departments is how this works. We are not a police force, the state. We have abilities to come back and backfill. The closest we have to that police force is the state patrol, but that's not their normal. Why allow it to get to that point? I understand what you're saying, but as people are watching, that's the question they're asking us. Yeah, from 8.30 to 10, that was a decision to go, and it took time to build the force to be able to go, too. Because, again, we're seeing it, and there was no definitive answer whether they were going to, and I'm seeing what you were seeing. There were still officers in the 3rd Precinct, at least, I believe, until maybe you can correct me on this, till 9 o'clock or so, maybe 10. Have you considered additional tools, additional powers, curfews, any sort of martial law orders to increase the authority of Certainly all those tools are there. And I, and I think what we'll do is that's what's the planning stage right now. I don't want to take these folks too long from what they're doing. Um, that's what's being done over the last you know, 24 hours as we prepared for this. But once again, the order structure of this, and many of us have been involved in these. I spent 24 years in the National Guard myself. I'm very familiar of how these works. I'm very familiar with what General Jensen's asking about. When my troops get their mission, they get their mission order, they get a warning order, they know what they're going to need to do. I then, as an enlisted soldier, would start working with my troops to make sure they were packing the proper equipment, check it out, be ready to go, drill through the things we needed to do. Those never came in many cases. So... In different situations, um, we weren't asked to help, and then it, at some point you were. Why in this situation wait for the ask to help? Why not take a proactive approach? Well, we are. And again, I think if we'd have seen two days ago, yeah, maybe, maybe yesterday. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that. I think in any of these things, if you're not... If you're not second guessing and if you're not looking at the decisions were made, you're going about this all wrong. I think the lessons learned, potentially so. But again, at that time, we've got to count on our partners in this as they say things are going. And uh, I'm not sure um, that quick moving group of anarchists that was moving so quickly. One of the things we said, if you think about this, to prevent this from happening, like at the Super Bowl or the RNC, 18 months of planning went into that. 18 months of planning and prepositioning. 18 months of uh, joint powers agreements, 18 months of lining up the materials that were there to make sure all those situations could be there. Because my situation on this is once you lose control like that, I'm deeply concerned that the bad actors, and I want to be very clear, we own this. We own this in Minnesota. But there certainly, as people saw this unfold, the concern was yesterday how many people would make their way here who are simply in that business. So, yeah, I think it's a valid question. I think for me, as I look at that, the point is I have to operate in real space and in real time. And by last evening was the second day we saw it. And from 8.30 or, or, or during the day until 8.30, we did see this in St. Paul. We continued to ask what was happening in St. Paul. The State Patrol was tasked on many of this, and they did stop a lot of that along the target and some of those. That was what was being asked from them. But it happened from about 8.30 at night when the sun went down, when what I saw was the the person breaching the barrier at the third, and then the decision to pull back out of there. So who hasn't asked? I gotta make sure I get to everybody. Governor. Dave, you're the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Governor, so it sounds like you are going to allow uh, demonstrations tonight, protests and stuff. These would be in violation of standing orders against congregations of more than 10 people. No, we're not, we're not allowing any of those. And we've said it, I, th I think the idea, again, the absurdity in the middle of COVID-19 where we have worked so dang hard as a state to keep people from congregating, if you think you could, but it goes back to this conversation we've had in Minnesota. This takes a social compact of people agreeing to do this. And I want to just say this. Watching what happened to George Floyd had people say, to hell with staying home on that. I'm going out because this can't happen again. The idea that we would go in there and break up those peaceful expressions of grief and rage was ridiculous. The problem was of not having in place with an expectation that a crowd that big over such a volatile issue, we have seen this happen in city after city, whether it was Ferguson, um, whether it was LA, we, we've seen these things. That was the thing why we started planning, started asking. But again, um, you're, you're seeing holes in planning. That's for darn sure as states and cities and counties on these things start to happen. Thank you. What's the rules for, for the rest of the day and tonight then? 
That's what's being worked on right now. And, and we certainly, this is the plan that will be presented to me. I think we want to be prepared to present that to, uh, to Minnesotans here by 2 o'clock or so. Um, what I can tell you is a lot of it is going to be the operational things that you would expect to happen that were asked. They will be there. There will be a presence out on, on the quarters. We will start to do that. But I'm going to ask again. I need to ask Minnesotans, those in pain and those who feel like justice has not been served yet, you need to help us create this space so that that justice will be served, and it's my expectation that it'll be swift and that we're able to maintain that order. And so that plan will start to happen today, and it will include, we will think of all the tools that are there. I want to come back to that again. The more of those things you use, the more those are viewed as the oppressive things that led to much of this in the first place. What we're trying to separate is the lawful First Amendment aggrieved citizens who need to express that from the folks who are clearly, I'm telling you what, the farthest thing from people's on their minds is they're burning down a family-owned store at 3 a.m. on Lake Street was George Floyd. And, and that's what we've got to get at. Governor, Let me go up front, Theo. Governor, question to you, question to the general. First of all, um, are you concerned that the civilian leadership of Minneapolis has lost control of its police department? And for the general, uh, are the guards and armed on the streets and what are the limits on that use of their apartment? Well, I'm candidly, I, I don't think this is a secret to anybody that um, the tension between the Minneapolis Police Department and many of their communities is is a pretty well-known thing. And, and I am certainly, I, I don't know any way to express it other than that they had lost faith in them um, and, and felt that they were part of the problems. And certainly, um, seeing a uniformed Minneapolis police officer's knee on George Floyd's neck on Monday pretty much tells you where the public is thinking towards that. So I, I don't think you could think it was a mistake of, of who was leading that down there and that it changed the tone that was there. So I am concerned. I, I think it would be disingenuous. I know this is painful. This is hard. There is going to be recriminations. There's going to be going back and looking at this as there should be. My top priority now is the immediate security to make sure that what happened the last 48 hours does not happen tonight. The state of Minnesota has assumed that responsibility. I don't think it's going to be easy. Because this whole whack-a-mole thing, and these folks are really good at what they were trying to do on causing destruction, the way we're able to stop it is employ these tools with the support of the public to make sure we isolate these folks. And, and again, as, as Commissioner Harrington said, the idea that you think you can firebomb a building and not be arrested and spend serious time in jail, I understand that. But the idea that we don't want to make people who are out there still asking, what about George Floyd? What happened to those people? What happened to the people who did this? That got lost in 48 hours of anarchy. That's what we're going to put again. We saw three television journalists get arrested early this morning on live television. Can you or anyone up there tell me how many looters and arsonists have been arrested over the past two days in know. the Twin Cities? I'm going to use this as an opportunity again, as I said, Tom. I, I am deeply apologetic that this happened. I understand that the community would believe if this were targeted. Um, I, have, as I told uh, Jeff Zucker, the president of CNN, I don't care at this point what the circumstance was, why they got arrested. It is wrong. It is unacceptable. And we needed to correct it. As far as others, who can answer? Yeah, how many? Yes, uh, both St. Paul and State Patrol and others have made arrests on burglary, arson charges. I believe arson charges. I know burglary for sure. Uh, that they have been arrested. There has been stops. There has been, in fact, folks incarcerated. I do not know have they been charged yet or not, because I think most of them were done in the last 24 hours. Yes, it's breaking into the breaking into the the grocery stores, breaking into the targets, breaking into the the uh, Walgreens. The pharmacies have been uh, just decimated uh, with folks we believe who are seeking oxycotton and other opioids out of the pharmacy stock. And so we've been uh, chasing that around as well as chasing the folks that have been setting fires. So yes, there have been arrests made, uh, and there will be more arrests made. If say again. I will get you a number. I don't have that. I'd ask the, the, both Minneapolis, St. Paul, and my other folks that were part of our, our unified command to get me information by 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock this morning. I have not received it yet, uh, but I'm hopeful to have a sit rep from the last 24 hours, and we'll get that to you as soon as I get it. Governor, I have to ask you your reaction to 
President Trump's tweets um, from last night in relation to Minnesota and, and, and what he said? Well, it's not helpful. I did speak to the president last evening. Um, at that point in time, um, it was in the process of where I said we were going to assume control of this, that it was uh, it was unnecessary. I did not know he was going to tweet. He certainly can. It's just not helpful. It's not helpful. The, the city of Minneapolis is doing everything they can. Um, if, if mistakes are made and there's an accountability, we need to do that. But in the moment where we're at, in a moment that is so volatile, anything we do to, to add fuel to that fire is, is really, really challenging. So as I said, I, I spoke to the president. He, he pledged his support of anything we need in terms of supplies to get to us. There's a way to do this without inflaming. And again, this one is so difficult, as I said again, the tools of restoring order are viewed by so many as the things that have oppressed and started this problem in the first place. So it would just be more helpful at this point in time. We may, if, if we need support from them, it's certainly appropriate that we will ask. But at this point in time, I'm confident that, that the plan we put together today to restore this order. So, Brent. Need to be seen at the Minneapolis Police Department. What kind of culture changes should there be um, more requirements on where officers live, or should they live in the communities that they police? Uh, should this yeah, be I don't know. I, I think maybe this is uh, Commissioner Harrington and and uh, Attorney General Ellison. When we first came into office last year, this was one of the things we wanted. And and I said this: I, as a governor, the the nightmare scenario of having a, a police involved shooting, or as any elected official is one. So they started working this. I think I'll hear from Attorney General. Well, Governor, thank you. Uh, I think this really is uh, the time to start talking about how we do meaningful deep dive reform. We took a year uh, to uh, grab in a number of people from diverse uh, interests in the community. We had people from the, the community, from the civil rights community. We had law enforcement there. We had law enforcement from across the state. We met for about a year. We had a professional assistance from the group that guided the uh, 21st century policing process that Governor, that President Obama started. And we came up with a number of key recommendations. We will get that report to you. We hope you write about it, but we not, but this supercharges the need for the effort. There was just a few recommendations, well, a few observations and a few recommendations. One observation is, you know, a lot of the uh, deadly force encounters that occur in our state are not concentrated in the Twin Cities. In fact, a majority uh, of them were in, were in greater Minnesota, although many were in the Twin Cities. Half of them were people in a mental health crisis. Uh, we talk in, 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 we also, so we talked about a number of things. We talked about officer wellness. Officers dealing from crisis to crisis to crisis need to be able to check in, get right before they go back and engage the public. We, we talked about changing and reviewing the standard, the use of force standard. Uh, we talked about making the sanctity of life a, a central principle, which uh, Mayor Hodges did when she was the mayor. We made the duty to intervene. A, uh, we're recommending that be essential, uh, uh, meaning if you're a police officer, you see a fellow officer doing something wrong, you cannot just say, it's not me, you've got to do something about it. Um, we came up with a number of other principles uh, that I think are really helpful, very useful, involving training, reform at the post board, and a number of things. And I think that now uh, there's a need to further the effort. Um, uh, I will say uh, that I think that looking at systemic pattern and practice problems uh, in Minneapolis Police Department uh, is an appropriate conversation at this time. Uh, I think that uh, we need to really do some deep diving and to make sure that you know the, our, our law enforcement professionals really do and really, really are um, serving the public, the whole public. So I will say that uh, I hope that our state legislature takes up some of the initiatives that we have in there, that the academic community will take up some of it, training communities will take up some of it. I mean, a dual, one of the recommendations um, was a dual, a joint or dual response uh, when there are chemical or mental health crises going on. Uh, so that it's not just officers that don't have the training on how to deal with somebody who's in that situation. Uh, so um, that is, that's a priority, uh, and I'll, I'll hand it to uh, Commissioner uh, Harrington. Attorney General Ellison covered the, really most of the, the points. The, the one other point that I will bring in is that this group was 
very much based out of community. Uh, we brought in folks from a variety of different uh, diverse and geographic communities. We brought in folks from the disability community uh, to make sure that all all kinds of voices were heard. And one of the voices that I heard most clearly was the need for community healing and community health. Uh, and, and so one of the recommendations that we have put forward, uh, we still think is what well, it was important before, uh, but I've never seen it as acutely as important as it is right now, is for community healing. Uh, the question that we asked and, and that I ask here with you is, how does the community recover when its heart has been ripped out? Uh, that's... Sure. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. At a playground memorial just outside Pittsburgh today, demands for justice for a three-year-old boy. Mikkel Fetterman died in April after being hospitalized for weeks with severe bruises, a skull fracture, and a brain bleed. He was a sweetheart. He was very loving. Like, he would come in the house, sit on my lap. His mother told police she was sleeping and her boyfriend was taking care of Mikkel. He has pled not guilty to criminal homicide. She's charged with involuntary manslaughter and her lawyer says she intends to plead not guilty. With families confined under pressure, it's not an isolated case. Child Help Crisis Counselor, how can I help you? At the Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline, desperate kids are sending heartbreaking text messages. School being out is scary for me because I have to spend more time with her. My parents hit me constantly and sometimes lock me in the garage at night with the rats. I can't take it anymore. Do you happen to know if she has any bruises or marks right now? Laurel Jacobs is the hotline's clinical program manager. How are things different right now because of coronavirus? Well, we believe that one of the biggest additional risks right now is kids not having access to the safety and security of schools, daycares, organized activities. Teachers, nurses, bus drivers who by law have to report any suspicion of child abuse just aren't seeing kids as much. Without those safe adults speaking up on behalf of kids, we think that abuse is going unseen. So official reports of abuse to many state child protective agencies are down, even as contacts to the national hotline are substantially up, 31 percent in March and 17 percent in April. Pediatrician Norell Atkinson is a child abuse specialist at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. We're seeing an overall decrease in the number of kids coming into the hospital with injuries, but the children that are coming to the hospital with injuries tend to have more severe injuries or injuries that require hospitalization. How concerned are you right now about children? Very concerned. So we have the kids that are reaching out. That actually makes me feel better, that they reach out and we can try to guide and educate and prompt. But the ones that we're not hearing from are the scariest. In this difficult period, she says, we all have a responsibility to watch for signs that a child is in danger. Kate Snow, NBC News. If you or someone you know needs help, you can text or call 1-800-4-A-CHILD or go to childhelp.org.
We're moving into uncharted territory. A gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions... Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability... Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America... And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Tonight, an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse is setting off alarm bells. It's just 79 new cases in a country of 51 million people. But it's the biggest spike in two months, and it comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students returning to classrooms, worshipers back at church. Just yesterday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof, sitting three feet apart, and all but the singing choir and the pastor wearing masks. Now, with new cases, authorities are taking a step back. The health minister saying museums, parks and theaters will have to close again. Churches urged but not required to suspend services. Meanwhile, the virus is still surging in Brazil, where they're also preparing to restart a shattered economy. NBC's Bill Neely is there. For the third day in a week, Brazil has reported daily deaths of over a thousand. But here in Sao Paulo, where the outbreak is worst, They'll start reopening shopping malls, car dealers and small shops Monday. Another hotspot, India. Hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Back here in South Korea, the government says if this latest outbreak isn't under control in the next two weeks, they'll have to close down even more. Tonight, the grim unemployment crisis is deepening. Another 2.1 million new jobless claims were filed last week, nearly 10 times more than a year ago. It's also the 10th straight week in the millions, but the number of claims is dropping slightly each week. And people getting unemployment for more than two weeks in a row has decreased. Among the state's hardest hit, California, where clothing boutique owner Brooke Rod just reopened her doors in Los Angeles. I support a family with three businesses. She's bringing back half her employees. It's been a struggle, um, obviously, for the reasons, you know, like unemployment and not having enough hours, but also allaying their fears. Shannon McKenna came back to work at the boutique despite making more on unemployment. Why come back? Well, because this is my job. I need some uh, getting up, getting in a routine and getting back to normal. That's that's what we need to do. Millions of other workers haven't been so lucky. Erin McGuire in Seattle was trying to buy a house when she lost her bartending job. We were a week away from getting the keys to a house we were closing on. And the last step was to verify employment. Meanwhile, Walmart, the country's largest employer, now allowing its 10,000 tech employees to work from home, saying in an internal email obtained by NBC News, working virtually will likely be the new normal. 
Another new normal, a University of Chicago study says 40 percent of pandemic layoffs will become permanent. This, as economists expect, the May jobs report next week to show 20 percent unemployment. Tonight, as our country faces an unprecedented health crisis, our nation is divided into regions of progress and setbacks. In the South, hospitalizations are up in several states. Today in Montgomery, Alabama, one hospital reaching capacity in its ICU after patients were transferred 90 miles away to Birmingham. In Tuscaloosa County, a big surge for a small region. I think we've entered a very dangerous stage of this uh, fight. In the past week, we've had a nearly 100% increase in those with uh, COVID-19 being in our hospital system. In Wisconsin, where the state fair has been canceled for the first time in 169 years, the state is experiencing a spike in hospitalizations since safer at home orders ended. Colorado now identifying 225 active outbreaks, many connected to large facilities like Amazon, senior centers and prisons. In North Carolina, where a large crowd gathered at a speedway, hospitalizations just hit an all-time high. As we test more, we're going to find more cases, but hospitalizations are a more objective measure of what the national trend is. In Massachusetts, where hospitalizations are going down, they're taking no chances, canceling the Boston Marathon, with doctors urging Americans to take precautions. A 99% survival rate and you're all wearing masks like sheep. For weeks, an ugly battle has been brewing over wearing masks in public. Today, New York's governor signing an executive order. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. But in a growing number of places, like this bar in Texas, patrons are banned from wearing face covering. You know, you just put that up there, if you, in other words, to let people know if they're not feeling good that they maybe shouldn't come. Today, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell donning his own mask. There should be no stigma attached to wearing a mask. What we all need to do is say, okay, I'm going to take responsibility not only for myself but for others. As our nation grapples with change and unimaginable loss, we are also reminded of resilience. 74-year-old Jerry Gustin spent nearly two months battling the coronavirus. Tonight, he's home, a symbol of strength. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. It gets done, but the questions that Minnesotans and the outrage they're feeling, I'm feeling them. It is taking all of my willpower to, to maintain that point of being asked, but the way I'm able to get them justice is by making sure that I put things in place that civil order is maintained, that we make it clear that there is an expectation that justice is, is moved forward. And as Attorney General Ellison says, this is a point in time that we cannot forget. Cannot forget George. We cannot forget the aftermath of this as if we would, but we have to get back to that point of what caused this all to happen and start working on that. So the, the, the anger and the frustration and the wondering why this is, this is a community that year after year, decade after decade, and generation after generation hears this. So right now, I know there's a lot of folks out there listening that their answer should be, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when justice is carried out. I'll believe it when equity actually means something. I'll believe it when the policies change. I'll believe it when my child gets the same education as your child and that that color didn't matter. So I get it right now. We're asking an awful lot to be based on faith, and that has not panned out. But I do want to say, this is a state that we, again, I, I think we are coming to grips with the good that we have and that that's not there, but it's always been about trying to strive to be better, trying to do more. I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. Just much like COVID-19, I've had to stand in front of you and tell you that it's going to get worse before it gets better. This is not going to be an easy journey. But the one thing that we have to ensure that civil order is maintained, so those changes we want to see. None of us can live in a society where roving bands go unchecked and do what they want to do, ruin property. And that the expectation is, where are the police? Where are the police? And this is the conundrum. Where are the police in the first place got us in this situation Monday night? And where are the police last night is it? And I heard from numerous people. I'm super nervous about the National Guard being brought in there. It's a flashpoint. This is a community. I understand that. 
I heard from some of those same people at 2 o'clock with a different tone. Where's the National Guard? Where is the National Guard? So over these next 24 to 48 hours, work with us to get the situation controlled. And I want to talk to those mayors who are up 24-7 in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's not about calling out someone on lack of leadership. It's about an issue as it developed and all of us figuring out how we get there. This is volatile. This has been building for decades. This flashpoint came to us, and now what are we going to do about it? And it happened in the middle of an unprecedented global pandemic. So it gives us a chance. We're going to get to pick our paths very quickly here. How are we going to be seen by the world in the coming days? How are we going to be seen after that? How are we going to respond to one another? And then what are we going to do about it? And again, if I were everybody in these communities listening, I'd say, well, I'm going to believe it when I see it. So the first task at hand is get civil control back, get justice moving quickly and fairly, and start talking about together how do we rebuild, how do we rebuild trust in the police, how do we rebuild those stores? How do we rebuild a society? How do we send that face to the world that sees us for so many positive things, but we need to recognize this is what they're seeing. And we need to take a hard look and figure out how do we change that. So I wanna thank you all. Again, I'm gonna close because of the importance I've said with the, uh, with the press, deepest apologies to the, to the reporters that were out there, um, expectations that Again, that cannot happen. We will do our best today, and I would ask all of you, as the ongoing mission to make sure that we have peace and security today is, is making sure that that story is told. I'm asking our team to make sure that cre press credentials, the ability to move you and protect you safely, needs to be out there so this is covered. Please let us know quickly on that. Please make sure that that's happening. Please show the world everything that's happening here through that lens of professional journalists who ask the questions you're asking today. So thank you all. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Never in my life did I think we would try to keep pigs from gaining weight. The idea has always been put muscle on pigs as quickly as possible. Now we are doing everything we can to keep them from gaining weight. These guys all should have been gone about 30 days ago. Chad Lehman is in a position he never thought he would be in. His farm in Eureka, Illinois, about two and a half hours south of Chicago, has too many pigs. We've never experienced a situation where we have nowhere to take pigs. There's always been uh, a home for pigs. Most of us would give our pigs away right now for next to nothing just to make room. <laughs> The third generation farmer grows corn and soybeans, learning the trade from both his dad and grandfather. But his main business is hog farming, sending out about 90,000 pigs a year to JVS and Tyson, the world's two largest meat processing companies. What once ran like a well-oiled machine is now completely upended. Many meat processing plants are still operating at reduced capacity over COVID-19 concerns, leaving farmers like Chad in uncharted territory. A typical week would be around seven to 10 loads of pigs. So somewhere, say, 15 to 1,800 pigs a week that need to go to market to make room for baby pigs that are coming in. As we sit today, we're approximately 30 loads behind in shipping, say 4,500 pigs. They probably weigh now about 305 to 310 pounds. These pigs have been on what we call holding diets now for approximately seven weeks where we've removed most of the calories, most of the energy from their feed in an attempt to get them to slow down on gain. Once a pig gets to about 330 to 340 pounds, 
Packers really can't do much with them. They're just too big. With Chad's market-ready pigs essentially in limbo, the question then turns to the younger pigs continuing to grow and the need to make space for the new babies. You've had to restrict space on big pigs due to the fact you've got to bring small pigs into the same barn. But all of us, I think, are in the same boat and that we're going to hold out as long as we can before we have to start depopulating these barns by means other than going to packers with the pigs. With nowhere to go, it's estimated that about 10 million pigs will have to be euthanized this summer. The surplus in market-ready pigs has also caused the price per head to tank, which will lead to about $5 billion in losses for the industry. It's very discouraging from our standpoint to see this meat just wasted, but unfortunately options at food banks, food pantries have been exhausted now just due to the fact that we're very limited in the, in the number of places that can turn pigs into pork. Tonight, signs that a critical link in the nation's food supply chain might be cracking. And the ripple effects of the pandemic are hitting not just hog farmers, but the entire agriculture industry, shaking up our food system in a way we've never seen before. That's due to those plant disruptions, but also food intended for places like restaurants and schools. It's a very efficient, well-run system, which has kept our food prices significantly down because we are keeping things at capacity. In my professional life and lifetime, we haven't seen a shock this big across the whole food system. We've certainly seen baby shocks in different parts of it. Say, for instance, when an E. coli outbreak has happened, we saw spinach not be there or romaine not be there. We've never seen this broad of a swath of the food industry affected at the same time. That's what's significant here. The supply chain in this country is really interesting because everything is very just in time. Most people are going into grocery stores seeing empty meat shelves and they think, wow, we have a, we have a meat shortage. There's no shortage of pigs. We have an inability to supply those meat shelves. If we can take care of that problem, we can get meat shelves restocked again fairly quickly. As much of the country starts to reopen, there is the looming question. What if we have a second wave in the fall, like some scientists predict? One good piece of news is we won't be as flat-footed. We as an industry know a little bit more what it's going to look like and what it's going to take to respond to. The more unfortunate thing is for the United States in the fall, we're talking about the high season for a lot of production coming um, to harvest. I think even though we might be better prepared because we'll have known what it's like and what it looks like, Unfortunately, we're going to have a, a lot, lot higher share of our production um, in play. I'm not sure how we can plan for it because we need to keep barns full. We'll have learned some things through this. We'll have learned that we can keep weight off pigs. But if our reaction is the same, I'm not sure that too many, too many hog farmers will get through that. And welcome back to the third hour of today. John and Terry Rexroad put their retirement savings on the line to help make masks for people who really needed them. Yes, in some places like San Francisco, masks are now mandatory, but not everyone has access to reusable ones. So John and Terry retooled their Connecticut manufacturing business to make masks for citizens. And they're joining us this morning. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, John, let me start with you. I know you decided to turn part of your safety netting business uh, that you turned or you started over 25 years ago, uh, Pakuda Leading Edge, into a mask making enterprise. And to do that, you risked a lot. Why did you decide to make the shift to produce masks? Well, it was important to bring my employees back to work and to make a supply of masks available to the general public. So retooling the factory and adding people and getting people back to work and masked out was important. And John, I, I understand this is pretty personal for you. You have already been a mask wearer with your experience of your wife's health. So you tend to wear a mask typically during flu season as it is. Tell us about that. Well, during flu season and whenever I'm sick, I wear a mask around my wife. Um, it's the same thing that the public's doing right now is they're wearing a mask to protect um, the people around them. And 
I, it's a necessary part of doing it. After her kidney transplant, she's taking immune suppression medications like a lot of people are at risk. Hmm. So, so, Terry, what did you think when John started bringing home cotton fabric to test and he said he was going to start making masks? <laughs> well, sort of, here we go again. Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, it, it, it was just something that needed to happen. I mean, it was... You who don't know the people who are joining me today, to my left is uh, Robert Mejica, Budget Director of the State of New York, to my... Immediate right, Melissa DeRosa, secretary to the governor, to her right, Gareth Rhodes, uh, who's been working with us from day one. Uh, thank you again. Thank you to Iona College, President Carey, for having us here today. I know it's a busy day and a distressful day on many levels, uh, but let's proceed. Today is day 90 of the corona pandemic crisis. Follow the facts, they will show you the way. A.J. Parkinson, that's what we've been doing in uh, New York, following the facts. The facts today, in terms of the coronavirus, are good. Number of hospitalizations are down. Net change in total hospitalizations is down. Intubations are down. And the new cases are down to uh, 152, which is a dramatic, dramatic uh, drop for us. Uh, at one point, you know, we'll never get to zero. What is the, the bottom of the curve? Uh, I don't know, but, but we're close. And the number of deaths, uh, thank the good Lord, continues to decline. It's at its lowest level ever of uh, 67 deaths. And uh, we hope and we pray that that continues to be the case. The question is on reopening. Uh, and as everyone knows, we've been looking at the numbers, looking at the metrics in terms of different regions across the state. The overall state was hit the hardest by this virus, and we're coming back as the smartest. Uh, we, we were forced to learn more and learn faster and respond quicker uh, because we were hit by the invisible enemy, the European virus, the virus from Europe, when everyone said, watch China, well, they were wrong. The virus came to New York from, a, from Europe. Uh, we have metrics that are posted. We want all the people to know exactly what we're doing because they're the ones who decide what happens. So communicating this information has been key from day one. Uh, we have now done even more testing we t test more than any state in the United States per capita. We test more than any country on the globe per capita. Uh, and that is helpful in a number of ways. It also gives us more and more information to make decisions. So we can now look at the number of tests we're doing by a specific area in the state and see on a day-to-day -day basis what is happening with the spread of the virus by the number of tests in that area. And you can actually see a trend line from day to day, right? This is all about opening smart, which means what? Which means you're tracking the virus. And we can now track it on a day to day basis to help us inform us about our decisions and how we should react. Uh, and we have a new dashboard that actually tracks that information. And you can see uh, remarkably clearly what is happening in terms of the spread of the virus, the severity of the new infections, new infections in the region. Uh, so everyone will know exactly what's happening and why we're doing it and what we're, uh, what we're planning to do. Uh, the reason we are so rigorous about this is because many states and countries have reopened and they made mistakes. Yes, everybody wants to open tomorrow. I want it to open uh, before we ever closed. But you have to be smart, and we've seen what has happened painfully when uh, cities and states and countries reopened too quickly. They, had to, they wound up closing again, which is the worst uh, situation. So. Uh, be smart. We have the data. We have more data than almost any other place on the globe because of our testing. 
and we have had it reviewed at every level. All the local officials sign off, the regional officials sign off, the best state experts, and then we go to global experts who have done this in countries around the world, who frankly have more experience than we do because they've been through this, the crisis and the closing and the opening and the closing again. Uh, and we review all the data with them. And I want to thank them all very much for taking the time to go through uh, the data. But these are literally the best minds that you can find on the globe and uh, when it comes to this. And they have gone through all the data. So I feel, feel confident uh, that we're, we can rely on this data and the five regions that have been in phase one can now move to phase two uh, because their data has been reviewed and uh, the experts say to us it's safe to move forward because people have been smart and you haven't seen the spike. So they go to phase two. Uh, phase two uh, is all office-based jobs, real estate services, retail reopening, barbershops, hair salons reopening. Uh, that's all part of phase two. There's specific guidance on how to reopen in phase two. It's not just open the doors and everybody has a uh, party. It's 50% occupancy in office buildings, uh, signage on markers, etc. no meetings without social distancing. Don't share food or beverages. I mean, I see people all the time sharing uh, food and beverages. You really don't want to do that now. Um, but again, the specific guidance for every area. Retail stores, 50% uh, occupancy, wear the face covering. A store owner can tell you they don't want you to come in if you're not wearing a, a face uh, covering. Why? Because uh, you don't have the right to infect the store owner, you don't have a right to infect other customers in the store, and you don't have the right to walk into a store and all the other customers run out because you don't have a face mask. Uh, malls are closed except stores that open to uh, external entrances, curbside, but again, uh, very detailed guidelines. Barbershops, hair, hair salons are open. Uh, by appointment only. The uh, professionals in those operations have to get a test every two weeks. Uh, we recommend that the professionals get a test before they reopen. Uh, that's not a mandate, that's a recommendation. And we recommend to customers to ask the barber or professional in the hair salon if they had a test before you uh, use their services. That's a recommendation. Uh, but they have to get a test every two weeks. Uh, and if I were walking into a barber shop, I would say, uh, I would ask the barber, did you get a test before you reopened? When was the last time you got a test? Uh, and if they got a test, they'll have a certification, they'll have a, a, uh, an evidence of that test. Uh, and people will wear face coverings. But the basic rule is still, uh, it's all about how we act. It comes down to that. How the employer acts, how the store owner acts, how the employee acts, how the individual acts, how the local government acts. Uh, reopening in New York City uh, is more complicated, uh, as we know. But we are on track to meet all the metrics. Hospital capacity of 70%. We want 30% hospital capacity, so God forbid something goes wrong, we have the hospital beds. We want to make sure we have the stockpile of PPE. We're not going through what we went through last time, uh, searching the globe for ventilators and masks and gowns. I mean, that uh, we learned that lesson the hard way. This entire country did, but it'd be madness to go through that again. Uh, we have to have the testing in place, which we do, the con contact tracing, uh, is being brought up to speed. Uh, we believe all of these things can be done next week. Uh, the MTA preparations for reopening. Uh, but we think all of this can be done by next week uh, and we would be on track to open the week afterwards. One of the things we want to do and we have been doing is I want to focus on the hotspots. Uh, Again, follow the facts, we have the data. We can tell you by zip code where the new cases are come, coming from. 
Uh, they are in New York City. They're outer borough. They're more Brooklyn. They're more the Bronx. They are lower income uh, areas. They're more minority areas. And we know where they are by zip code. Some of these zip codes, you have double the infection rate in those zip codes that you have citywide. Citywide, the infection rate is about 19%, 20%. In some zip codes, it's over 40% the infection rate. We know where these zip codes are. Next week, let's do a full court press on these zip codes. And we've been talking to uh, our colleagues in the city, speaking to the mayor about this. Uh, next week, hospitals, PPE, get that contact tracing up. Uh, MTA will finish their final preparations, but then Hot spots, hot spots, hot spots. We're in New Rochelle today where we had the first hot spot in the nation. There was no such thing as a hot spot before New Rochelle had a hot spot. Congratulations, New Rochelle, created a new term now used by every American, hot spot, uh, in this regard. But we know where the hot spots are in the city. We want to uh, focus on them next week, be ready to open. We are on track to open on June 8th, which is one week from Monday, and next week, as I mentioned, we'll be following up on these issues. Uh, phase one should bring about 400,000 employees back to work in New York City. Uh, remember that re reopening does not mean we're going back to the way things were. Life is not about going back. Nobody goes back, we go forward. Uh, and it's going to be different. It is reopening to a new normal. It's a safer normal. People will be wearing masks. People will be socially distanced. Doesn't mean they don't like you. It's not a personal reflection. It's just a new way of interacting, uh, which is what we have to do. And uh, wear a mask, get tested, and socially distance. Uh, it, is, uh, it is that simple but that hard. It is that simple, but that hard. Those simple devices, wearing a mask, hand sanitizer, they make all the difference. They make all the difference. You talk to all the experts, uh, what advice, what should we do? Wear a mask. How can it be that simple? Because sometimes it's that simple. The doing is what's hard, not the advice. Getting 19 million people to do it, that's what's hard. Um, and what happens is up to us, up to us. People say, Governor, tell me what's going to happen next week, the week after. I can't tell you. Only you know. It's the person in the mirror. You tell me how the people of New York City respond, I'll tell you what happens in New York City. You tell me how the people in Westchester respond, I'll tell you what happens in Westchester. The New Rochelle hotspot, that was all done by New Rochelle. There's no act of God, there was no external force. It happened because of what people in New Rochelle did. We know how we got here, we know how we can get from here. If we act smart, these stores open and they're smart, the customers are smart, people are smart, people on public transit are smart, then uh, we won't see those numbers go up. As we haven't, in the upstate regions that have reopened, and Long Island that has reopened. The numbers have not gone up. Why? Because people have been smart, and we have to continue to be smart. Uh, and we're going to be doing this in New York City with our partners. Uh, and I want to thank the mayor very much and his team very much. Everybody in government has been working uh, over time. And uh, none of us have been here before but we are figuring it out, and I'm proud of the way New York is figuring it out. Uh, we wish we were never here, but once we were here, uh, we have made uh, the best of it, uh, and we should be proud. And the mayor is looking fit and healthy and rested. I don't know why, but he's looking extraordinarily good. <laughs> Uh, and it's good to be with him in this, this new way of uh, everyone is virtual, everyone is Zoom. Uh, but it's not the virtual mayor, it is the real mayor of the city of New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio. Good to be with you, Mayor.
Thank you so much, Governor. Uh, Governor, I'm worried that the coronavirus is affecting your eyesight because I feel, uh, <laughs> I think, the last 90 days for all of us, a uh, lot of long days. I know you and your team have worked extraordinarily hard, and I think we all we all look a, a little less than ideal. Uh, thank you. I want to say, first of all, thank you, Governor. Thank you to your whole team for the extraordinary work that's happened over these last months. And as you said, uh, our teams talk all day long with a lot of common purpose, and we've done really important work uh, with the same strategic view, the same approach. And I want to thank you for that. Um, we are excited to get to the point of a restart for New York City. And when I talked to the people of this city this morning, I told them that the indicators were moving absolutely in the right direction but that the key to getting to a point, a definition for that phase one came from the collaboration between you and me and the state and the city to all get on the same page and make sure that we were confident that it was the right time to do it. You and I have talked and I think we are absolutely on the same page. The fact is, Governor, you've talked about the condition of the state and how incredibly different it is than even a month or two ago. I just want you to hear this good news about the city, our own health department indicators. Uh, we have set a threshold that we want to be under 200 new hospital admissions each day uh, to know we're in a safe zone. Today, Governor, only 61 new patients uh, for COVID-19 or, or similar diseases. Uh, that's breathtaking how far we've come on that. Uh, we also have said we want to be below 15% of all new tests, uh, testing a positive result for the people taking those tests. And Governor, as you know, with your help, we've all been doing more and more testing every day, literally exponential growth. Today's number will bring a smile to your face. Only 5% of those tested tested positive in New York City. So uh, these are great indicators. The third one, we still have a little work to do, but I'm very confident, I know you are too, and that's the number of people in our public hospital ICUs. This morning, Governor, we announced that threshold, that 375 threshold, we were damn close at 391 patients. But as you and I have discussed, we've got about 40 patients that actually uh, can be cared for outside of ICUs in a different setting. Uh, that gives them the long-term care they need. We're gonna work with your team and the state to figure out the right way to do that. Uh, those folks will appropriately come off the number. That's gonna put us under that threshold. Now, when you add all that together, uh, as you and I discussed, we are on now the gateway to the next big step. And Governor, as I affirm to you, we're gonna spend this coming week going out to the businesses of New York City that would be part of phase one we're going to be providing them with free uh, face coverings. We're going to be providing them with a hotline where any employer can call to figure out how to address those practical questions. I've given a lot of credit to you and your team for the guidance you've put out around phase one. I think it's very questions. If we see something that's not right, helping them correct it. But we're going to do the same for work. I have a hotline for workers to make sure they're safe and they're getting the support they need. So as you and I discussed, this next week, we will be able to implement all of that. A lot of hands-on direct work with small businesses and You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world.
live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning, Minneapolis is reeling. Tensions running high in a city on edge. A third night of protest again turning violent. Demonstrators clashing with police. Buildings, including this evacuated police precinct, burning. Protesters cheering as it went up in flames. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers, or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. It's a scene of utter chaos. Right now, this fire is raging out of control, and smoke is billowing into the air, can be seen for miles. The rioting, a dramatic escalation from more peaceful protests earlier in the day. To tear down our city like this, what's this proving? People who are supposed to protect and serve us sit up and murder us in cold blood. In South Minneapolis and nearby St. Paul, looters ransack businesses. In Louisville, Kentucky, seven people were shot at a rally against police brutality. While nationwide, from Chicago to New York to Denver, there is mounting outrage over the death of 46-year-old George Floyd and the lack of criminal charges against the four officers involved. This new video from a different angle shows two other officers not seen before side by side next to Officer Derek Chauvin, who knelt on Floyd's neck for several minutes. Overnight in a tweet, President Trump suggesting he might send the military in to assume control. Earlier, he called for an expedited federal investigation. The Attorney General, FBI, and the Attorney General to take a very strong look and to see what went on. All four officers have been fired. There is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. But patience has already worn thin. We feel as if there was a knee on all of our collective necks. This is the damage from the air. The governor has now activated the National Guard. We want justice. We're mad. I'm mad. Giovanni Thunstrom was Floyd's employer and landlord. He said Floyd had lost his job due to the coronavirus pandemic. You know, it's like a brother to me, and uh, he didn't serve to die that way. This morning, South Minneapolis is now wondering when the violence will end. Oakland, California, 2009. Eric Garner, New York City, 2014. Michael Brown, Missouri, 2014. Laquan McDonald, Chicago, 2014. Freddie Gray, Baltimore, 2015. Antoine Rose, Pittsburgh, 2018. Ahmad Aubrey in Georgia, 2020. Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, 2020. George Floyd in Minneapolis, 2020. That's that's why the outrage. That's why the frustration and the anger. It is not about one situation. It's about the same situation happening again and again and again and again. And seeing the same thing and not learning the lesson. And then it's that happening in a broader context and a broader circumstances, which is what's going on with the coronavirus which affects and kills more minorities than anyone else. You look around this country and you look at the people who are, who are dying of the coronavirus, it is disproportionate African-American people. And it's just a continuing injustice, and that's the frustration, and that's the protests. Nobody is sanctioning uh, the arson uh, and the thuggery and the burglaries. But the protesters and the anger and the fear and the frustration, yes, yes. And the demand is for justice. And when the prosecutor came out and said, well, there's other evidence, but I can't tell you anything more than that, that only incited the frustration. Injustice in the justice system. How repugnant to the concept of America and over and over and over again. Uh, I stand figuratively with the protesters. I stand against the arson and the burglary and the criminality. I stand with the protesters. And I think all well-meaning Americans stand with the protesters. Enough is enough. How many times do you have to see the same 
lesson replayed before you do something. This country is better than this. It has been better than this. And it shouldn't take this long to end the basic discrimination and basic injustice. Any questions? Governor, about the um, June 8th reopening, what becomes a challenge and begins to become the challenge is commuting. So earlier today, the mayor used the word improvise when answering whether some New Yorker would decide whether to drive in or to take the subway. Is, is that the right way to look at it? You have to sort of improvise and make that decision or should there be guidance and ideas for how we do this? Yeah, there is, uh, well, improvise. I think the mayor's point was, uh, it's up to you. You know, you want to go into New York City, you go into New York City the way you want to go into New York City. If you want to drive, you can drive. Uh, you want to pay that parking, you want to deal with that traffic, that's, that's your business. If you want to take public transit, uh, you take public transit. I understand why people uh, would be anxious about public transit. That's why the MTA is doing extraordinary work. They really are. Uh, I mean, people used to complain about how the MTA cleaned trains and buses, right? They didn't clean the trains and buses well enough. Well, they're now disinfecting them. I mean, that standard it was just unimaginable, right? You can disinfect the train. They're doing it. Uh, closing the subways at night helped, but they're disinfecting trains. The trains are disinfected. They're using UV lights, they're using all sorts of chemicals, they're experimenting with, with uh, films that you can spray on that kill a virus for 30 days that are uh, leading technology. So the public transit system will be operational, is operational, and we wouldn't operate it unless it, it's safe. People have to wear masks. Uh, but uh, the public transit system will be safe and individuals will make their own choice, as they always do, right? Um, I'm a green boy, I always have the choice, take the train or take the car. Um, but as I said, taking the car has obvious environmental issues and is incredibly expensive. About staggering the work shifts, how big a push on employers to stagger work shifts in offices when we get there? Yes, good question, Dave. Look, this has always been about finding this new normal and everyone doing their part on an individual level and employers, private companies, doing their part. And I've been frankly amazed, pleasantly, at how creative and how uh, thoughtful the employers have been in staggering their workplace, staggering hours, staggering days, uh, they, the employers have been responsive. Also, the employees won't come back otherwise. You know, the market works here. People want to work, people need jobs, but they're not putting uh, their health at risk. So I think the employees are demanding response from employers, but I think employers have been very creative. Uh, and that will continue. Governor, you many of the MTA on limit capacity in any way. You have to see if that is an issue. Uh, social distancing as we maintain it uh, in other circumstances, I don't know that you'll be able to maintain strict social distancing on a bus or a train. I don't think that's reality. I'll ask Rob Mejica to comment because he's also an MTA board member, not just the budget director. When a train is late, I blame Rob also. Uh, so they can't do strict social distancing, but they can do the cleaning protocol, the disinfecting protocol. You have to wear a mask. You have to wear a mask. Uh, and that's going to be part of the protocol. And they're going to be doing the best they can to stagger uh, volume on trains, et cetera. And they're going to have personnel who are working to limit uh, how many people get onto a train and do the staging. Rob, you want to mention anything else on that? In the guidelines you'll see, and as the governor mentioned, right, the MTA is cleaning all the cars, they're doing the disinfecting, um, they're also requiring wearing masks, and you'll see throughout the guidelines for all the reopenings to mitigate not being able to social distance, it's wear a mask when you come within six feet. So that's why you have the order on the MTA, which is always wear a mask, because it's more than likely that you will come within six feet, but once you wear a mask, you limit any risk. CDC has also said 
that surface contact with the virus is not a significant uh, uh, transmission of the disease. So that, combined with the disinfecting, combined with adding service, so right now we're at close to 80% of service with only 10% of the ridership. So as you, as you go into phase one, you're talking about increasing by about 400,000 people, the number of people traveling to work. Trains can easily manage that. Um, the guidelines will also talk about recommending staggered uh, hours, staggered start and stop times for employers, which is something, frankly, we've encouraged from before uh, the coronavirus, right? To, because we have high traffic during certain times, peak traffic. So all of those things together will mitigate it. But the MTA, the trains, and the buses will be safer and cleaner than they were before. So when the governor talks about going back better than it was before, you're going to have an MTA that was better than it was before, cleaner than it was before, and safer than it was um, before we started in March. If you put someone on the platform and say, hey, sorry, train's full, you got to wait. What we're encouraging is there's other cars, right? So right now you're saying, well, there will be people, as the governor mentioned, on the platforms. There are other cars often on the same train, right? The initial middle cars are, can be full while other cars are empty. So we'll encourage people to go into the other, to the other cars. There are not strict limits on the number of people that can get in. But like when you get to an elevator, you see eight people get into the elevator, you may sometimes say, hold on, I'm going to wait for the next one. You can do the same thing with a train and say, I might not get into it. But wearing a mask next to other people that are wearing masks, even if you're not socially distanced, has been safe. That's what we're encouraging in all of our guidelines, and that will be consistent with the MTA. Yeah. The just, can I, excuse me one second, and, just, and then I'll get right to you. Uh, the individual responsibility also pertains to uh, riding the public transit system. And yes, we, we will need a cooperative public where if you're on a subway platform and you see the subway car is crowded, okay, wait for the next one. Uh, if you see the bus come and the bus is overcrowded, okay, be responsible, wait for the next one. Uh, so people will be part of that also. Also remember this. This is only phase one. Part of the intelligence of the system is you don't go from zero to 60 miles an hour. You go from zero to 20 miles an hour. This brings 400,000 people, phase one, into the system. 400,000 is not a significant number in New York City, right, in a normal operating environment. So you start to open gradually. I used to talk about turn the valve. Just turn the valve a little bit and watch how the system operates and see how it works. And then if you have to adjust, adjust. Nobody's been here before. I'm not, I've never said, uh, I know uh, how this is gonna work. Uh, we know the answers. Nobody can give you the answers. They don't even know the questions. Uh, nobody reopened New York City. In history, nobody reopened New York City. Nobody closed down New York City in history. That'll be my claim to fame. First governor to sh close down New York City. Uh, so reopening phase one, that's all. Now, phase one has worked very well in the other regions. And starting slowly has worked very well because you see little adjustments that you have to make, frankly. Little things you wouldn't have thought of when you start to open stores, you start to open attractions. Uh, and that's, this is only 400,000 people. And we'll learn and we'll adjust. Experience is the biggest challenge because we've mentioned these superseding events and um, a commute is different than just not maintaining social distance in a store for a couple of seconds. It can be 45 minutes, it can be an hour uh, for some people if they're in relatively close, close contact, even wearing a mask. Is transit the biggest challenge? Look, they're all a challenge. To me, the biggest challenge, if I were personally, my prior, prioritization for next week are the hotspots. The zip codes with twice the infection rate. They're driving the new cases, so they're a health care issue, and it's the largest area of deaths. When it's the area of hospitalizations, it's the area of deaths. And look, I understand the economic consequences, 
Uh, this state will have an historic economic problem from this situation. And I get that painfully, but for me, from day one, it's been about the number of deaths. That has what this, this has been about that for me from day one. Any of those numbers, I know we can deal with. We can fix deficits, we can fix shortfalls, we can fight with Washington for funding. The one number that we can't fix is the number of deaths. That's the only number that keeps me up at night. And the hot spots, higher infection rate, higher hospitalization rate, higher death rate. So that's first. Governor, many local officials in the five upstate regions were expecting to start phase two earlier today. Some have called the process um, confusing and that they need more communication. What's your response to that? The, they thought it was earlier today than one o'clock? Then they believe that it would start, you know, right immediately. Today. Well, today is today and today is, yeah, they wanted it this morning instead of one o'clock. Yeah, well, the, I can understand that. Uh, but we want to make sure that the data was reviewed by all the experts. Uh, a county executive may be very good at what they do, but they're not a, uh, an expert in viral transmission in a global pandemic. Uh, I may be competent as a governor, but I am not expert in global transmissions in a viral of a viral pandemic. So I wanted to make sure we had the best minds look at all the data before we stepped forward. Because if you, it's stone to stone across the morass. If you take a step and you're not on a stone, but you step on a lily pad going across the morass, you will sink and that's bad. So uh, I wanted to have the best minds review all the data to give us their opinion They've all signed off on it. And uh, the difference between this morning and one o'clock, I never talked to anyone about timing, morning, or one o'clock. Phase three for restaurants, nine in. Um, it appears though, as though New Jersey, Connecticut will allow it in the phase two, and as you know, the city council has introduced legislation to allow outdoor dining. Is that included, could that be done earlier than phase three, if it's outdoors and people are spaced apart? It's a good question. Can we look at that? We're still looking at, so we're still looking at the guidance, right? Some areas have opened up outdoor dining in advance of indoor dining. So we're still looking at those guidelines and we haven't decided yet, but there's a possibility that you could separate outdoor dining. Um, it's a little different depending on which parts of the state, right? And where, what access you have to sidewalks and spaces for outdoor dining. But that's something that is under review. Yeah, talk about never having done this before. So you're right. It is a, a restaurants and now a new category, outdoor dining. Is that the same as a restaurant? And then what they'll say back in the office is, well, outdoor dining on 2nd Avenue in Manhattan or in Albany? Uh, what is the size of the sidewalk? What is the volume on the sidewalk? Are they socially distancing from the table on the sidewalk? But we have to look at it. Okay, one more. I'm not uh, commenting on the uh, safety or behavior of any particular protest. You've had a lot, you had a lot of violence on some of these protests. Uh, yeah, well, even, uh, but on any particular protest, obviously, uh, obey the law. I'm against uh, any of the criminality that has gone on, arson, thuggery, et cetera. But uh, Martin Luther King, uh, the right to speak up, the protest, the frustration. I stand with that because I get it. I get it. Look, my, for my life time, as basically as an adult, I've lived this, seen this from Rodney King forward. I mean, I was there for Amadou Diallo. Uh, I was there for Abner Louima. And then you have Eric Garner, 
And then you have George Floyd. It's the same case. Just change a couple of facts. It's the same exact situation. And when does it change? It's not like a situation that you can't understand. Here's a minority, here's an African American, here they are being abused, and it's the same situation. It's been 30 years since Rodney King. Amadou Diallo in New York, the reporter won a Pulitzer Prize for the reporting. Wow, great job by journalists. Great job showing the injustice. And what happened? What was the resolution? Where was the progress? Eric Garner? No, I'm with the protesters. Thank you very much. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Here's what happened live on television on CNN a short time ago. I'm sorry? You are under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? So certainly a very fluid situation here right now. We're keeping safe here with our security team. But as you can see behind me, a huge show of force right now from police on the scene as daybreak. We really start to see for the first time the damage here. It is extensive throughout most of the night. Again, it was chaos here, multiple buildings on fire. Now, though, you see emergency crews here trying to douse the flames and to keep those fires from spreading. You're joined now by Jeremiah Ellison. He's a member of the Minneapolis City Council. Councilman Ellison, good morning to you. I want to get to those protests in just a second, but at the heart of those protests, the rage is about the fact that no one has been arrested in this case. The mayor has basically called it a murder and is asking why that hasn't happened. A lot of people obviously have seen the tape of what happened. But here's what the county attorney said. He said, and this is Mike Freeman, he said uh, that there is other evidence that does not support a criminal charge. Are you privy to what that other evidence may be? No, I think the statement's vague. Uh, I wish the uh, district attorney would be more specific. And more importantly, I wish the district attorney uh, would watch the tape. Uh, see what's evident on the tape as far as the fact that uh, four officers murdered um, uh, uh, Mr. Floyd and, uh, and make the arrest. 
Well, absent uh, absent the charges, council member, um, how do you calm a city? You know, I think that we had a great opportunity on the first night to uh, respond differently uh, when it came to the situation. I think for those of us who are who kind of come from more um, activist backgrounds um, and who have participated in mass protests before, uh, you can kind of see where a crowd's going. Um, and I felt like this was really preventable. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think that uh, conventional wisdom of uh, of, 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 of force sort of won out, and uh, that was the strategy we pursued, and I, I think that strategy has proven to be um, uh, an unmitigated failure. You know what? It was interesting. Yesterday on our air, Craig interviewed one of George Floyd's best friends, NBA great Stephen Jackson, and Stephen, he was asked about those protests and what George would have thought, and he said he would have welcomed the support, but he basically said he didn't like that kind of violence in the streets. That wasn't, he said, what George Floyd would have wanted. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the one of the dynamics when when you look at a protest like that is that really the protest is uh, it's about the death of the person um, and, and not always necessarily what the person would have wanted. Right. Um, I imagine that nobody would want to see the kind of devastation that we uh, are experiencing here in Minneapolis. Uh, but what people are, are responding to uh, are, is not just uh, the death of Mr. Floyd, but also uh, Philando Castile. Uh, Jamar Clark, um, Fong Lee, these are people who have been killed by the various police departments in the metro area um, and who have whose deaths have largely gone um, unrecognized as crimes. Uh, just pull out your tea leaves for one second and just tell me finally where you think we will be one week from today. You know, um, you know, all I can do is speculate. Uh, I, I hope that um, uh, that the district attorney is able to get his act together and uh, uh, make the arrest of the four officers who uh, uh, participated in the murder. Um, and uh, and I hope that the crowd, um, I hope that the, the protesters um, uh, begin to, to, to recede and go home. Uh, I understand the rage. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is shocking to see the level of destruction that's occurred. Um, and, uh, and, and I just hope that we can um, keep as many people as safe as possible um, and, and begin to, uh, on a road to justice. Uh, and I think that's really what the protesters are calling for. All right, Minneapolis City Councilman Jeremiah Ellison. Councilman Ellison, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Overnight, the president making his position clear, writing, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. That tweet then flagged by Twitter, adding what it calls a public interest notice, saying the president's tweet violates our policies regarding the glorification of violence and the risk it could inspire similar actions today. The president also going after the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry, calling him weak and saying he should get his act together and bring the city under control or I will send in the National Guard and get the job done right. The mayor responding overnight. Weakness is refusing to take responsibility for your own actions. Weakness is pointing your finger at somebody else during a time of crisis. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes, but you better be damn sure that we're gonna get through this. About that flag that Twitter posted on the president's tweet, the company in a series of tweets of its own overnight notes, the historical context of some of the language the president used in his tweet, its connection to violence as well, they say. Twitter does not specifically detail what it is referring to, but during the bloodshed of U.S. riots in the late 1960s, Miami's police chief infuriated black leaders at the time, famously crediting the calm in his city to a get tough warning that he had delivered, saying, I've let the word filter down that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter has not taken down the president's tweet, saying it's determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. This morning, New York City, the only part of the state that's still shut down, is on the verge of reopening. It's important to remind everyone, we say restart, we do not mean rushing back 
The city is setting its sights on the next two weeks, sending between 200 and 400,000 New Yorkers back to work. It will also be a huge test for the city's sprawling mass transit system, which is now sanitized daily. The nation's former epicenter of the outbreak is close to meeting the final benchmarks for phase one, having enough hospital beds and contact tracers. We don't change what is safe from one place to another. So there are no different rules for New York City. By the first half of June, non-essential retail like clothing and furniture stores can reopen for curbside pickup. Manufacturing, construction and wholesale operations can also resume. But the new plans don't include bars and restaurants. They'll have to continue surviving on pickups and deliveries for at least another month. We're past the shopping off phase and now we're ready for the rebirth. And the point is, we, we, you know, we want it to keep getting better once it starts. Some businesses have defied the orders, opening prematurely, like this tanning salon on Staten Island. The mayor says those businesses could face fines. The goal here is not to fine businesses, not to shut down businesses, but to educate and support businesses. But we got to get it right. While infections in the city are at the lowest level we've seen in months, Governor Andrew Cuomo highlighted the importance of taking precautions, issuing an executive order giving businesses the right to refuse service for customers without face coverings. We're giving the store owners the right to say, if you're not wearing a mask, you can't come in. While enlisting the help of longtime Brooklyn natives Chris Rock and Rosie Perez to spread the message. I got the test today. I just got tested to come out here. Uh, I got a 65, so just, <laughs> just passed. Just, just passed. <laughs> Lift off. There's a big buzz about space these days, and it's not just the SpaceX rocket set to carry two American astronauts to the International Space Station, the first crew launched from U.S. soil in nearly a decade. There's also a new division of the U.S. Armed Forces, Space Force. President Trump signed a new defense bill in December, officially establishing the sixth branch of the military, the first since the Air Force was created in 1947. The establishment of the United States Space Force. Space Force is working with a $15 billion military budget. To make sure that we have everything that we need to have in space and the ability to perform the operations that we need to do. The new division will take over the Air Force's existing missions in space, like protecting satellites and GPS. But that's not all. Defend the domain of space, which is really central to our way of life today. Focus our assets and capabilities in this new domain. A division so new, it hasn't yet decided its rank structure. Obviously, we won't be called airmen. But space cadets isn't going to be one of them. I, I sure hope so, but I don't think so. <laughs> the first class of graduates excited to be getting in on the ground floor of this brave new frontier. You have so much talent in the Space Force. I was extremely lucky to be one of the four cyberspace operations officer to be able to commission straight into the Space Force this year. And I had to ask. What about an alien attack? I have no responsibility of defending you from an alien attack, so. Space, such a hot topic these days. There's even a new Netflix series called Space Force. The president is creating a new branch, Space Force, <laughs> which Mark will run. <laughs> what? The galaxy far, far away is going to make for a great adventure. The universe is a big place. Yes, it is. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. All right, it is exciting, Carrie. Carrie, and let's just hope that the Netflix Space Force does not resemble our actual Space Force. <laughs> but, but paint a picture for us if you can, buddy. What is this, this Space Force actually going to look like? What's it going to be doing on a daily basis? You know, it's so brand new. They only have 86 members right now. They haven't even figured out, as we know, the rank structure. Uh, but it will be based at the Pentagon. They will be dealing with things in outer space. It can be uh, satellites. It can be things that we don't know about because it needs to be secret. It can even be cleaning up space junk. And just to give you sort of a moment of history here, because we have all eyes on space right now with what's going to happen possibly tomorrow, over my shoulder there, that is where America's first astronaut into space, Alan Shepard, launched in uh, 1961. And it's really uh, kind of amazing to look at that replica of the Mercury that launched here. Uh, really quite a, uh, an amazing kind of attention that the whole nation is now giving 
to space with Space Force. And the reminder of what we can do. Uh, Carrie Sanders for us there at Cape Canaveral. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you. The national mood right now is, well, you know what it is. Get me out of the house. The Reynolds family spent 66 days stuck in their house in Austin. I've been at home with my three children who are six and under. So just, you know, wanted to get out of the house. Now they are first time RV renters and they just pulled into the Blue Water RV Resort on the Texas coast. Maybe we'll turn into RV people, <laughs> you know? Never <laughs> never thought anything of it, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It feels like an all-inclusive resort. Now, my family loves to camp, and we would love nothing more than to do what the Reynolds family is doing. But we live in a county in California that's still under a shelter-in-place order, and as a result, here we are, camping in our backyard. Across the country, it is a patchwork of reopenings and improvised regulations. You can't just get in an RV and park it anywhere. Reservations are required at most of the places you want to go. And even if you do get a reservation, there are new rules to follow. No visitors, no playground, no bathrooms. Camping is limited to families or households that you typically would be hanging out with during the time of COVID. But we will take it. A survey by the U.S. Travel Association found that only 18% of travelers feel safe flying and only 18% feel safe at a hotel. Maybe that's why people are buying and renting RVs in big numbers. It felt like the right first step to returning to travel. They view RVs and boating as, as fun, safe ways to control their environment. Rental company RV Share says RV rentals are twice what they were last summer. And while most RV rentals are normally booked well in advance, another company, Outdoorsy, says half their bookings are now last minute. Lots of people want to rent an RV, and they want to do it now. We're at Lake Tower! I love that we could bring our own bedding from our house and don't have to worry about somebody else cleaning it or touching it during this time of social distancing. That is good news for RV resorts. All of our holidays are already booked up for the summer. Meanwhile, I'll have to be satisfied with just hearing about the Reynolds getaway by phone from my basement. Tell me, please, what's it going to be like on the beach? Just give me, pay me a picture here. What do you? Mostly just watch the kids build sandcastles and run into the water. Just relax, not yeah. be in our house or yeah. backyard. Exactly. You guys. You know, these are amazing machines, and some people are using them, of course, for more than just fun. An estimated one million Americans treat an RV as a primary residence, and in tough economic times, a lot of people are forced to make that choice. But they can be used for other things as well. There's even an RVs for MDs Facebook page that is pairing people who own RVs with first responders, doctors, and nurses who need a place to shelter away from their family. So a lot of people looking at RVs for a lot of reasons. Oh, guys. that is super cool. Hey, Jake, I was wondering, do you need like a special driver's license if you're going to rent one of those or can you just use your regular one? You do. You're going to need one for one of the big self-contained ones. You have to spe uh, have a special license for that. To be able to, to uh, tow one around or drive one of those camper vans, and those are the ones that, of course, I have been you know, sitting here in my basement in California going, oh, oh, the, <laughs> the camper van. I would take a camper van. You know, Those ones you can get right into and pull away, which is, of course, the dream here, you guys. I would love to do it. I, let's, let's, do it. let's do a road trip later this summer, ladies. What do you say? I'll, I'll drive. Meet you. I'll meet you in the Al's middle of the country. I'll meet you years. somewhere. I don't know. I'd love to do it. I think take, a road trip would be a blast. Take the show on the road. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Al has wanted right. to put That's us right. all in the Winnebago yeah. for a long, long time. I have <laughs> yeah. been begging. Haven't you, Al? Begging to do that. Yeah. Craig, and I, Craig, you and I did that, remember? I do. Up, up in New England. Where you drove like a madman. I remember that. Where I was, I was fearful for my life. That's right. Uh, while we had you. Right. You cried like a baby. I knew that was coming. <laughs> In a recent ad for Uber, a father holds his child, friends and family wave from afar, and people hunker down in their homes, doing everything but get inside a car. The message, stay home for everyone who can't, reflects a reality devastating companies like Uber, Lyft, and Bird. Safety concerns and lockdowns have led to leaner ridership. Uber's bookings dropped 80% in April. Lyft rides fell 75% from the same month last year, and e-bikes and scooters have lost their buzz, with wheels and lime pausing operations in some markets. Not to mention the impact on drivers. How hard has it been for you driving recently in terms of just getting business? Not a lot of customers. 
I feel that it's, it's not safe for everybody. So I am driving, but I'm, I'm not sure as if I'm doing the right things. So you keep Lysol in the car with you? Yeah. Walter Stefano returned to work a couple weeks ago, protected by a plastic barrier and plenty of cleaning products, but not armed for the economic bite. How much business would you say you've lost? About 60%. You've lost 60% of your customers? Yes. Uber has offered workers 19 million in financial aid so far and has buckled down on safety since the start of the pandemic. You can't enter a car without agreeing to wear a face covering and acknowledging no symptoms. The company's pumped $50 million into cleaning supplies and PPE for drivers and new this morning, riders can book hourly windows at a flat rate to reduce exposure. Lyft, likewise, making face masks mandatory for riders and drivers and investing heavily in cleaning supplies. For ride-sharing users like Amanda Rivera, the risks at this point seem manageable. As long as you're healthy and you're taking the right precautions, I think you're safe. Thanks for helping keep your community and yourself safe. A call to action for being conscientious, wearing a mask, and refusing to ride with those who won't. If someone is not wearing a face mask, they better use the face mask, they don't get in my car. For today, Sam Brock, NBC News, Miami. Dara Khosrowshahi, who is the CEO of Uber. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Well, the numbers are just jaw dropping ridership down 80 percent in April. You've called it a shock to the system. Do you feel the worst of this crisis is behind you for Uber and ride sharing services? We certainly do. Uh, I think Uber essentially goes with the city. We are very much a local business. And when the heartbeat of the city starts beating again, uh, Uber starts moving. So we are seeing uh, business improve from those April lows, still down significantly. But we are seeing the improvement happening faster in some of the states and cities that are opening up uh, cautiously, obviously, in, let's say, in Atlanta or Houston, uh, we are seeing volumes return. And even in other states that haven't completely opened up, they're off the bottom, but they still are down significantly year on year. But we are seeing signs of life, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you want to get moving, but you want to get moving in a safe way. Well, that brings me to my next question, because a lot of folks had come to depend on Uber. I know you, the company was about to be profitable for the first time uh, by the end of the year. How do you convince people now that it's safe, that they should get in a confined space with a stranger, convincing driver, drivers and customers? Absolutely. It's a it's a two way street. And, and for us, we have redesigned the experience from top to bottom with safety in mind. Uh, our drivers and our riders have to wear a mask. And for example, we are rolling out a technology feature for our drivers where the drivers actually have to take a selfie. Uh, and we have machine learning algorithms understanding whether that driver is actually wearing a mask or saying that uh, they're wearing a mask. If a driver sees a rider who is not wearing a mask, uh, they can cancel the trip uh, if they feel unsafe as well. Uh, we've invested millions in PPE. We've got we've secured 23 million masks and are distributing them to our drivers as well. Uh, so, you know, getting out of the house, um, starting to move again uh, is going to feel funny and it may feel unsafe. And we're doing our part to make it as safe as possible. And then we're also including two way accountability. The rider and the driver essentially rate each other. And to the extent that they see behavior that's unsafe, uh, we'll instantly know about it and be able to do something about it. And to go in long term, I mean, so much about our society has changed and we don't know yet whether it's permanent. I mean, you're talking about companies who may start working from home exclusively or uh, in a much more significant way. People not going to doing the work travel so much of Uber or, or, or trips to the airport, things like that, or to concerts. Do you worry about this business long term being able to survive? I think that the focus right now, honestly, is short term in tomorrow. How can we build the safest service uh, we can. The long term will take care of itself. We think we can make the right adjustments. And actually, in certain places, let's say Hong Kong, uh, who is more advanced in terms of their uh, response, in terms of testing, masks, et cetera, 
we're seeing the business come back uh, even sometimes close to prior levels. People are getting back to work, even during what you call party hours where people are going out to restaurants. Life begins anew. While I don't expect behavior to revert to where we were previously unless there's a vaccine or something very big happens, I do think that people, uh, behaviors and people... Special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. We're coming on the air with breaking news. An arrest has been made in the death of George Floyd, the African-American man who died in police custody in Minneapolis earlier this week. Right now, the uh, Hennepin County, uh, uh, Minnesota attorney Mike Freeman uh, is speaking to reporters. Murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges later. I failed to share with you a detailed complaint will be made available to you this afternoon. I didn't want to wait any longer to share the news that he's in custody and has been charged with murder. What about the other three officers involved? The other, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, we felt it appropriate to focus on the most dangerous perpetrator. Um, I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. This conduct, this criminal action, took place on Monday evening, May 25th, Memorial Day. I'm speaking to you at 1 o'clock on Friday, May 29th. That's less than four days. That's extraordinary. We have never charged a case in that kind of time frame. Uh, and we can only charge a case when we have sufficient admissible evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. As of right now, we have that. Many people, including, give, her a, give her a follow up. Go ahead. Many people, including the mayor, have said that any other citizen with the video evidence available would have been arrested and held while awaiting charges earlier. Why didn't that happen in this case? We have charged this case as quickly as sufficient admissible evidence to charge it has been investigated and presented to us. Mike, you were saying yesterday that people should be patient or this is going to take time. What's changed since yesterday and this morning that with this afternoon and now we're seeing murder charges against Chauvin? Fair question. Uh, we have now been able to put together the evidence that we need. Even as late as yesterday afternoon, we didn't have all that we needed. We have now found it, and we felt a responsibility to charge this as soon as possible. Oh, Paul? Yeah, Mike, what was the final piece? Was it, no. Do you now have some back I'm, on the mute? Folks, I'm not going to talk specifically about this piece of evidence or that piece of evidence. You will see, and you all are veterans, I can only talk about what's in the complaint. You will see in the complaint the evidence and put it all together. We needed to have it all. Now, let me just quickly say we have evidence. We have the citizens' uh, cameras, video, the, the horrible, horrific, terrible thing that we've all seen over and over again. We have the officer's body-worn camera. We have statements from some witnesses. We have a preliminary report from the medical examiner. We have discussions with an expert. All of that has come together, so we felt, in our professional judgment, it was time to charge, and we have so done. Based on the other officer's role in the video, what criminal statutes could apply to those officers if okay. it's not murder? I'm not going to speculate today of the other officers. They are under investigation. I anticipate charges, but I'm not going to get into that. Today, we're talking about former Officer Chauvin, which we believe has met the standards to be charged, and that's what we have done. I've seen you charge other degree. Whoa, 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 whoa. How, how, how closely did you look at the second degree statutes, statutes either intentional or unintentional, uh, that, that on the surface seem to fit this, um, the videotape evidence we, we've all seen? We have looked very closely at all statutes. This is what we've charged now. Investigation is ongoing. We have more discussions to do with our experts. Um, this is the same charges that we made when we charged former Minneapolis police officer Mohammed Noor. The exact same third degree charge and manslaughter charge. Mike, I've, one, seen one one charge I've seen you charge cases faster. I've seen you charge cases faster than four days. Are you saying that you charge this is the fastest you've ever charged a police officer? This is by far the fastest we've ever charged a police officer. 
okay? Normally these cases can take nine months to a year. We have to charge these cases very carefully um, because we have a difficult burden to prove. And let me just say something about that. We entrust our police officers to use certain amounts of force to do their job, to protect us. They commit a criminal act if they use this force unreasonably. We have to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. The Hennepin County Attorney's Office is one of the few prosecutor offices in this country in the last five years to successfully prosecute a police officer for murder. And we did that on behalf of Justine Damon. Okay, that's unusual. We know how to do this. We have a very veteran prosecutor group aided by a very veteran investigator group at the BCA. On top of that, we've had great cooperation from the FBI and from United States Attorney Erica McDonald. And she may have some things to share with you soon, but she does that on her own timetable. I wanna to say to you that I'm very pleased about that level of cooperation, which frankly, I will say to you, doesn't necessarily happen in other jurisdictions, according to my friends and the national prosecutors. One last one. You last one. Border investigation. That took months, close to a year. This takes days. Did public outrage play a role in the speed of this investigation? I'm not insensitive to what's happened in the streets. My own home has been picketed regularly. My job is to do it only when we have sufficient evidence. We have it today. Mohammed Noor was a very difficult case. We didn't have the kind of videotape we need. And we didn't, and, and there was all sorts of other evidence that took us a long time. We do our level best to charge each case when we have the evidence to do it. But we cannot, and I will not allow us to charge a case until it's ready. Were you waiting this case that? is now ready, and we have charged it. Mike, do you want to make uh, clear that we the complaint has not yet been signed? It's in process, and when it's done, when it's ready, we'll. Good. Ready. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me let me state on so you have it. The complaint has been completed, and it is being processed now, and the signed copy will be made available to you today. Where was, was the autopsy? That's, that's okay. Have you given a statement to the investigators or the other three? That's all for now. Thanks, everybody. It's Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman uh, uh, announcing that charges are in the works now, two charges against officer, uh, former officer Derek Chauvin of uh, manslaughter and third-degree murder in the case of George Lloyd. There is a picture of him. He is the officer who was seen with his knee on the neck of, uh, of Mr. Lloyd on Monday. The uh, prosecutor is saying that they have moved with extraordinary speed to file these charges. He also noted when asked about the other three officers that we see in many of these tapes that they remain under investigation. He said he anticipates charges. He also hinted that the feds may be making an announcement of their own on their timetable at some point. But what we can tell you is state charges now moving forward against former officer Chauvin, uh, again, uh, manslaughter and third degree murder. Gabe Gutierrez is in the streets of uh, Minneapolis uh, where fire is still smoldering from overnight. Uh, Gabe, how has that word circulated today? Uh, hi, Lester. Well, early indications are that this is very welcome news in this community that saw so much devastation overnight. Again, still questions remaining about what will happen to those other three officers, but as you mentioned, charges anticipated there. Right now, authorities had been putting out hot spots in this area. This block, multiple buildings had burned. A restaurant and another building also went up in flames. A roof had just collapsed a short time ago. Now, Lester, I do want to point out, this is the state patrol. They have set up a perimeter here. They did so early this morning. That is very different from what happened last night, where there was virtually no police presence here. Many members of this community were frustrated by that. Earlier today, the governor had blamed local leaders for not enough of a plan uh, for, to have, and the police precinct here was breached and burned. The question tonight, will the arrest today be enough to de-escalate the violence here? Many members of this community want to know whether there will be another night of violence here or whether the increased police presence and the new charges will do anything to change that. Lester. 
Yeah, the county attorney making that announcement of the charges against former officer Chauvin today. And, of course, we note there were the three other officers. The calls have been for an arrest, for prosecution, for murder charges. Um, interesting that uh, the county attorney noting that this had moved with extraordinary speed. Uh, certainly the arrest was four days after uh, the alleged crime. Uh, but in terms of the filing of the charges, uh, uh, the report would be that the claim would be that they have moved with extraordinary speed. I want to go to uh, Pete Williams right now, our justice correspondent in our Washington newsroom. Uh, Pete, third-degree murder, um, manslaughter. How would those figure uh, in the case of what we've seen so far? A third degree murder is an unusual statute. Most states don't have it. In Minneapolis, it means killing without intent, but acting with a depraved state of mind. That's the term used in the law, without regard for human life. The lesser charge is manslaughter. That's an unintentional killing. Almost every state has some kind of uh, killing without intent. Almost every state has that kind of statute. And, you know, Lester, all along, we thought that the state would be the first to file the charges, not the federal government. Now, the federal government may file a civil rights charge, but the problem has always been in these cases. And you think back to Trayvon Martin, Michael Garner, Michael Brown, Amadou Diallo, Sean Bell, any of these high-profile police killings. It's very difficult for the Justice Department to get a conviction, because you have to prove two things under the federal statute if they ever decide to file charges. One is that the officer acted inappropriately, used unauthorized force. That seems pretty straightforward here. But you have to prove that he knew what he was doing was wrong, and that's where these cases often go south. So the Justice Department may act here, but we always thought, Lester, that the state would go first. They just have many more statutes at their disposal than the federal government does. All right. Uh, Pete, thanks. We should note that we are waiting to hear from President Trump. He had previously scheduled a news conference for around this time. We expect to go there, and uh, we would expect he will make comments on these latest developments uh, uh, in Minneapolis, as he has tweeted about them and made other comments. White House correspondent Kristen Welker has been following some of the president's response. Uh, Kristen, some of his comments have been characterized as not helpful in the community of Minneapolis right now. That's absolutely right, Lester. This is a real leadership test for President Trump. He's obviously watching what is happening in Minneapolis at this hour quite closely. We know that he did speak with his attorney general and urged for a swift investigation into exactly what happened. But as you note, the president has come under scrutiny for his handling of this crisis, including a recent tweet, Lester. And I'll read you the tweet in question earlier today, tweeting, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd. And I I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walz and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And it's the last part of the tweet, Lester, that has a lot of people criticizing President Trump. They say that it sounds a lot like something that we heard back in 1967 from a Miami police chief who was widely regarded as being racist. We put that question to the White House. Why did President Trump use that specific language? No response, but the White House really doubling down on this quote by President Trump, posting it on the official White House account. Now, this has opened up the president to a broad range of criticism, including from his Democratic rival, Joe Biden, who accused the president of fomenting violence. Former President Barack Obama saying that this shouldn't be happening in 2020. And of course, it also comes against the backdrop of his handling of this global pandemic, Lester. And so a real leadership test for President Trump. He's going to undoubtedly get a number of questions about this, about what next steps should look like, about what the role of the federal government will be moving forward. Again, we are anticipating President Trump in the Rose Garden. We expect that his focus may also be on foreign policy today, uh, but this will be at the forefront undoubtedly, Lester. All right, Kristen Welker, thank you. And Andrea Mitchell has been watching all this for us and how it's impacting the 2020 race. And it really gets back to what Kristen was just speaking of, Andrea, this idea of leadership. There is clear contrast uh, for folks to be able to, to note today. 
Indeed, uh, Joe Biden going online and uh, giving a very emotional statement, as Kristen was just referring to, talking about 400 years of racism that every American has to stand up. And this, as he is, of course, considering whom he would choose as vice president and one of those contenders, the former presidential candidate Amy Klobuchar, the senator from Minnesota, has been very much on the spot. I talked to her about an hour ago on MSNBC, and she has defended, fiercely defended her record. She has had the job of Hennepin County attorney that Mike Freeman, you just saw, bringing those charges against Derek Chauvin. That was her previous job before she went into the Senate. She was elected in 2006. And she has been under fire because that same police officer was under investigation for the fatal stabbing, uh, fa fatal shooting of a stabbing suspect. And he was not indicted by a grand jury, but she has pointed out she was already in the Senate. It was not her job. It was not on her watch. It was her <coughs> successor's watch when it went to the grand jury. She's also been criticized because there were two dozen police fatal shootings, fatal cases under on her watch. But she said in those years, it was up to grand juries, not to the local prosecutor, to deal with those cases. But this has become very much an issue. She was emotional in her response. She's calling for Attorney General William Barr to investigate, as he is investigating this case. And she is saying that she's been out in the streets talking to the, the, the officials there. She's in Minnesota, obviously. She was there last night. But this has certainly raised questions as to whether Joe Biden, under great pressure to have an African-American woman as his running mate, will now be under more pressure now, as this be has become, again, once again, tragically, a major debate in America. All right, Andrea, and as again, we noted, we're waiting to hear from President Trump, who is expected to step out in the Rose Garden for a news conference shortly. Let me go back uh, to Kristen for a moment. I understand there's some clarification uh, from the president about some of his words. As we were speaking, Lester, President Trump tweeted out a clarification of his remarks when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Let me just read you his tweets in full, because this is from the president moments ago. Looting leads to shooting, he says, and that's why a man was shot and killed in Minneapolis on Wednesday night. Or look at what just happened in Louisville with seven people shot. I don't want this to happen, and that's what the expression put out last night means. It was spoken as a fact, not as a statement. It's very simple. Nobody should have any problem with this other than the haters and those looking to cause trouble on social media. Honor the memory of George Floyd. So for the president's supporters, this will be the type of clarification that they say should turn the page on that type of language. But for his critics, they'll say that he's the president and she, he should be aware of the history and the language that it evokes. But again, Lester, bottom line, the question becomes, what will the president do next to to what extent will he address what we have witnessed in Minneapolis when he speaks at the Rose Garden? We know that former President Obama, in the wake of uh, the Ferguson uh, riots, for example, it took him about four days to come out and address the situation. What will President Trump have to say as this is, again, a leadership test for him like none other, Lester? All right, Chris, I want to go back to Pete Williams right now. I understand there's been a statement from Attorney General Barr. Well, we were just saying a moment ago that the understanding has always been that the state officials would go first, and he's now confirming what we had been told uh, privately. Uh, he calls the video of harrowing to watch and deeply disturbing. He notes that the FBI and the Justice Department are working together on in, in the investigation. He acknowledges that the process is going along quickly. The state's charging decisions will be made first, he says, and I'm confident justice will be served. So, uh, you know, this is the, the we, we've seen these things before where we've got the FBI and local authorities both investigating the state as well, in addition to the Minneapolis Police Department. But the local authorities go first because they have so many more legal options to pursue. The, the federal government's option here is basically under the civil rights law, and that's the one I was talking about earlier, that is so hard to prove. But the fact that the FBI is also involved in the investigation obviously gives you a whole separate set of eyes and ears on the case, and that can help the state officials as well. So, you know, in these cases, it's not just that the FBI gathers information and keeps it to itself. So whatever it gathers that could be relevant to the state investigation can be shared with them. So in terms of investigative manpower, it's a real force multiplier, Lester. All right, Pete Williams, thanks very much. We want to go back to Minneapolis right now. Smoke still wafting through the southern part of that city after the second night 
of, uh, of clashes and looting and fires being set to buildings. Our Gabe Gutierrez is there. Uh, Gabe, what steps are being taken in terms of policing to try and prevent a repeat of this? Uh, yeah, Lester, that's right. Well, we expect tonight to be very different because after midnight tonight, you heard earlier today the governor talked about stepping in and state resources coming in. As I mentioned earlier, this is the state patrol officers in, in riot gear. Uh, again, earlier um, yesterday evening, there was uh, no such police presence, presence, at least when the police precinct was evacuated. If we walk just a little bit over here, Lester, you can see that this continues, um, this line of um, officers continues all the way over here, and you can see community residents actually beginning to clean up the devastation from yesterday. This is actually the first time we're seeing this, and it's uh, quite wonderful to see uh, young, you know, young people, community members coming in here and cleaning up the devastation from yesterday. They say that the community members we've spoken with say that this is not what South Minneapolis is, and that they worked very, very hard to get this um, community uh, back up over the last couple of years, and they're heartbroken to see this. So their hope is that tonight there will not continue to be violence. You see the way this looks like. Community members describe it as a war zone. More officers. The Minnesota National Guard is here, and the governor is promising that tonight will be different. It should be interesting to see how many protesters show up tonight and whether those new charges make any difference in the tension here at this point, Lester. All right, uh, Gabe, thank you very much. As we noted, we've been watching a couple of, of, of spinning plates, including the president's uh, news conference. That um, not happening on schedule. We'll continue to monitor that. Uh, but we do want to remind you of the headline right now. Former officer Derek Chauvin of the uh, uh, Minneapolis PD has now been charged with manslaughter and third-degree murder. That paperwork, we're told, is being filed even as we speak, and we expect a, a full readout on it here shortly. But that's the headline. The three other officers remain under investigation. The uh, county attorney says he anticipates charges. So we're going to go off here right now. We will come back as soon as the president steps out before reporters. In the meantime, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. The last changing of the guard at Seoul's National Palace for another two weeks. Museums and parks are closing, libraries locking their doors because of an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse. 79 new cases Thursday, 58 today, the biggest jump in two months. Uh, yeah, we're in a... Seoul's public health director told me they're worried about the increase in daily infections and a rise in cases that can't be traced. It comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students in classrooms, worshipers at church. On Wednesday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof. That church now tells us they'll dial back on big services. In Brazil, the virus is still surging, with daily deaths over 1,000 for three days this week. Beaches in Rio are empty, but in the hardest hit city, Sao Paulo, they'll start reopening shopping malls and car dealers on Monday. Another hotspot in India. Hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing, and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Britain, with the highest death rate in Europe, is getting ready to reopen schools. Prince William warning of the toll on mental health. It's scary. Um, it's making a lot of people anxious and uncertain. Back in Seoul, people are once again being asked to work from home and avoid socializing, especially in big groups. With the new cases, are you worried? No, not at all. Many here still confident the country will bring the virus under control. This weekend also marks a turning point for several states and cities across this country, including the state of Maryland. Here to talk about that 
is Maryland Governor uh, Larry Hogan. Governor Hogan, always good to have you, sir. Thanks so much for your time. Before we talk about the reopening of your state, um, you have a unique perspective here. And I want to talk to you about the, the protests in Minneapolis over the death of George Floyd, because as, as you heard there in that news conference, the district attorney on uh, Thursday, he pointed to the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore back in 2015. He said that one of the reasons that they were withholding judgment was, was because they didn't want to rush to justice. His words, uh, like the rush that was done in, in Baltimore. Um, I was there in Baltimore when you called out the National Guard there. Is that a fair comparison? Is that a fair characterization of what happened in 2015? Was there a rush to justice? I don't think it's a fair comparison. Um, I, the, the evidence here seems overwhelming and clear to me. And you have a you know, the video of exactly what happened. Um, but however, the, the situation on the ground is reminiscent uh, somewhat of, of uh, the actions that took place afterwards. And um, I think back to 2015, I had just become governor of Maryland. I'd only been governor for, for 90 days and the, the worst violence in 47 years broke out in our largest city. And I reached out to Governor Walls this morning to try to offer uh, my advice. Uh, our The way we handled this situation, look, it's a tragic situation. I understand the frustration in the community. I think they've got to act. Um, we sent in the National Guard and police officers to try to keep the community s safe because in the first few hours we had 400 uh, businesses burned and looted and destroyed and 137 police and firefighters injured. Uh, but then we sent in a strong force of police and National Guard and kept the peace while allowing people to protest uh, lawfully and to express their frustrations. I immediately went to the city of Baltimore, spent an entire week uh, talking with people and walking the streets and trying to lower the temperature and listen to the concerns. Uh, and we, after the first day, we had no violence whatsoever. Um, and I, that's just my advice is that you've got to act, uh, you've got to be decisive, uh, and you've got to uh, get in there and try, because there's, the violence is not helping the situation at all. There's legitimate concerns and frustrations that have sure. to be addressed. But burning down buildings and, uh, you know, this violence and looting and burning police stations is not the answer. You are also, in addition to your responsibilities as the governor of Maryland, you're also the chair of the uh, Republican Governors Association. Uh, the president of the United States tweeting overnight. I want to make sure I get this right. He called the protesters thugs. Uh, and then he went on to say that when the looting starts, the shooting starts. It was a tweet that was later flagged by by Twitter uh, because it, it promotes violence, according to the platform. Um, you've got the ear not only of, of governors, you've got the ear of the president as well. Language like that, does it... Does it help in, the, in a situation like this? Well, let me clarify. I'm the chairman of the national governors of both the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, but, yeah, I don't think it's helpful. Um, I just mentioned uh, lowering the temperature, um, trying to uh, stop the violence uh, and to bring about calm and restore peace and law and order. And in, inflammatory rhetoric, I just don't think it's helpful uh, on, on, on either side. Um, I, I do believe that you've got to have law and order, that we've got to stop the burning and looting. Uh, but uh, inciting, um, you know, violence with, with Twitter is not the way to go about it. Like I said, I walked the streets face to face and calmly talked with folks. Um, but I, I, inciting things and, and inflammatory rhetoric isn't going to help. Thank you for the clarification, by the way. You are the chair of, of the National Governors yeah, Association. Sure. I didn't want to demote you there. Let's talk about this reopening. Yeah. <laughs> in, let's talk about this reopening in, in Maryland. Phase one, uh, outdoor pools, sports camps, outdoor dining. Um, what, what gives you the confidence to start this, this first phase of reopening there? Well, we've been doing everything uh, kind of based on the science and the, based on the facts. We've had a, a really smart coronavirus recovery team made up of some of the smartest scientists and doctors in our state and in the world uh, who've been advising us. We have great numbers that are coming down. Our positivity rate in the state is down 54 percent over its peak. Uh, we've been consistently going down on hospitalizations, on high ICUs and on infection rates. Uh, we've been ramping up our testing capability and our, our, our surge capacity and our contact tracing. And so everyone uh, felt we were in a position to slowly, gradually and safely open some of the low risk things like 
outdoor activities. Uh, so we're going a little more slowly than some states, but uh, we needed to get some parts of our economy, get some of the more uh, safe activities back on track. And it's going pretty well so far. Over Memorial Day weekend, uh, we saw these crowds there, Ocean City, Maryland, uh, wildly popular with tourists. A lot of folks on the boardwalk there, um, not a lot of social distancing, um, and, and quite frankly, and you can see it in this video here, um, the facial coverings, the face coverings, not a lot of folks wearing those. D does that concern yeah. you at all? It does concern me, and we've uh, we've talked about that. One of the things that we're trying, we're, some of the steps we've taken are to try to address that situation. Uh, first of all, the mayor uh, of Ocean City uh, opened the beach and the boardwalk. It had nothing to do with a state order, uh, but we did not have uh, any bars and restaurants open for outdoor dining, so a lot of people were just jammed in there walking on the boardwalk. Um, with the, some of the outdoor activity openings that we're doing, we're hoping to spread some of those folks out and the local uh, leaders are also taking great steps to try to enforce and to uh, message out uh, that distancing is important, that masks are suggested, uh, and uh, I, I think they're going to do a better job this weekend than they did that, that first opening weekend, hopefully. And you've been an outspoken advocate for wearing masks in public as a, as a cancer survivor. Uh, Republican Governor uh, Larry Hogan, who is the chairman of the National Governors Association. Governor Hogan, thank you. Good luck to you this weekend as well, my friend. Thank you very much. Chanel. That was a very good interview, Craig. By the way, I do want to mention, Craig, that you're next week uh, going to be hitting the road for a very special series. Uh, we're calling it Reopening America. So we certainly look forward to your reports. There's certainly a lot to talk about in the days and weeks ahead. Uncharted territory, a gut check in our battle with the coronavirus, the enormous challenge of reopening the country. Stadiums will likely be empty until next year. More antibody testing sites are popping up. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Today, the World Health Organization officially calling it a pandemic. None of us is unaffected by its impact. Coming in November, people are going to be voting for stability. I have to plan a funeral. How is this going to work? You don't prepare for giving birth in a pandemic. The importance of music is to keep our spirits up. I'm Tremaine Lee. Join me as we go into America to hear from everyday people grappling with the issues of our time. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. A pandemic that has turned our world upside down. The story changes hourly. More states are doing a slow rollout, lifting those stay-at-home orders, even with less than 2% of our nation tested. It's the 11th hour. 
Tonight, it's back to business at the Chattanooga Zoo. Three of the biggest new stars back in the spotlight. I think that it's very cool to have giraffes at a zoo because it's very hard to get them at a zoo. Whoa, a stingray! And excitement at the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, also now open. We've been stuck at home, not be able to do anything because nothing was open. But there are big changes. The number of visitors has been capped at 20 percent, even though state rules allow 50 percent occupancy. The CDC has, has suggested masks, but in our case, all of our guests are wearing masks. Even though it's not a requirement by the government. That's exactly right. And now some signs of summer's biggest tourist attractions, ghost towns for months, are ready to bounce back. Disney World, SeaWorld, and Universal Orlando, part of our parent company, NBC Universal, are planning to reopen this summer, mandating employees and guests wear masks. All parks will have temperature checks and cashless payments. But will it be enough to bring customers back. Would you feel comfortable going to a theme park right now? Theme park? Theme park. Health-wise? Uh, I don't know. Probably not. I absolutely would not uh, hesitate doing that. Going to a theme park? Not at all. I'd feel comfortable tomorrow doing that. Legoland, which also plans to reopen, says customers should be prepared to accept some risk. We are providing a safe operating experience from our operational changes but they are still accepting the liability for any illnesses that may arise. For all these theme parks, there is a real urgency to get their employees and customers back. Analysts say collectively they're losing more than $2 billion a month. In the sky above North Carolina, the state famous for being first in flight, another aviation breakthrough as long range delivery drones are called in to help in the fight against COVID-19. The company Zipline, whose drones have been dropping emergency blood transfusions in remote Rwandan villages for years, now working with Novant Health Systems to get emergency supplies to hospitals in a matter of minutes at the drop of a parachute. Two routes planned so far, with more possible in the future. Zipline drones can fly 100 miles, so it's a 50-mile radius. If you think about a drone flying a 50-mile radius, 50 miles in all directions, that's 8,000 square miles. In Florida, drones flying for UPS are helping deliver medication from CVS to retirement communities, while Google's wing drones lowering food, coffee, and groceries from the sky. Here we go. On the ground in some medical facilities, the dangerous job of sanitizing left to automatic arms immune to any disease. And while humans keep their social distance, more robots with wheels are going the extra mile. Driverless cars like these from Neuro offering contact-free delivery, making pharmacy and supply runs in Texas. Here in LA, food delivery giant Postmates sending yellow droids like this out for drop-offs. And fleets of what are called starships that became popular on some college campuses before the pandemic struck, now retooled to deliver to neighborhoods sheltering in isolation. A future among robots getting closer as us humans stay apart. Gotti Schwartz, NBC News, Los Angeles. At a playground memorial just outside Pittsburgh today, demands for justice for a three-year-old boy. Mikkel Fetterman died in April after being hospitalized for weeks with severe bruises, a skull fracture, and a brain bleed. He was a sweetheart. He was very loving. Like, he would come in the house, sit on my lap. His mother told police she was sleeping and her boyfriend was taking care of Mikkel. He has pled not guilty to criminal homicide. She's charged with involuntary manslaughter, and her lawyer says she intends to plead not guilty. With families confined under pressure, it's not an isolated case. Child Help Crisis Counselor, how can I help you? At the Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline, desperate kids are sending heartbreaking text messages. School being out is scary for me because I have to spend more time with her. My parents hit me constantly and sometimes lock me in the garage at night with the rats. I can't take it anymore. Do you happen to know if she has any bruises or marks right now? Laurel Jacobs is the hotline's clinical program manager. How are things different right now because of coronavirus? Well, we believe that one of the biggest additional risks right now is kids not having access to the safety and security of schools, daycares, organized activities. Teachers, nurses, bus drivers who by law have to report any suspicion of child abuse just aren't seeing kids as much. Without those safe adults speaking up on behalf of kids, we think that abuse is going unseen. 
So official reports of abuse to many state child protective agencies are down, even as contacts to the national hotline are substantially up, 31 percent in March and 17 percent in April. Pediatrician Narell Atkinson is a child abuse specialist at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. We're seeing an overall decrease in the number of kids coming into the hospital with injuries, but the children that are coming to the hospital with injuries tend to have more severe injuries or injuries that require hospitalization. How concerned are you right now about children? Very concerned. We have the kids that are reaching out. That actually makes me feel better, that they reach out and we can try to guide and educate and prompt. But the ones that we're not hearing from are the scariest. In this difficult period, she says, we all have a responsibility to watch for signs that a child is in danger. Kate Snow, NBC News. If you or someone you know needs help, you can text or call 1-800-4-A-CHILD or go to childhelp.org. Tonight, an outbreak at this South Korea warehouse is setting off alarm bells. It's just 79 new cases in a country of 51 million people. But it's the biggest spike in two months, and it comes as South Korea has been slowly reopening. Students returning to classrooms, worshipers back at church. Just yesterday, we watched more than 2,000 pray under the same roof, sitting three feet apart, and all but the singing choir and the pastor wearing masks. Now, with new cases, authorities are taking a step back. The health minister saying museums, parks and theaters will have to close again. Churches urged but not required to suspend services. Meanwhile, the virus is still surging in Brazil, where they're also preparing to restart a shattered economy. NBC's Bill Neely is there. For the third day in a week, Brazil has reported daily deaths of over a thousand. But here in Sao Paulo, where the outbreak is worst, they'll start reopening shopping malls, car dealers and small shops Monday. Another hotspot, India. Hundreds wait for a bus out of Mumbai. Work is disappearing and millions with no job or food are desperately trying to leave. Back here in South Korea, the government says if this latest outbreak isn't under control in the next two weeks, they'll have to close down even more. Tonight, the grim unemployment crisis is deepening. Another 2.1 million new jobless claims were filed last week, nearly 10 times more than a year ago. It's also the 10th. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good day, everyone. We are back on the air to bring you President Trump's news conference at the White House. He's expected to discuss relations with China as well as the developments today, in Minneapolis, about, where a former police officer China. has now been arrested. That's Here's the president. Measures to protect American security and prosperity. China's pattern of misconduct is well known. For decades, they've ripped off the United States like no one has ever done before. Hundreds of billions of dollars a year were lost dealing with China especially over the years during the prior administration. China raided our factories, offshored our jobs, gutted our industries, stole our intellectual property, and violated their commitments under the World Trade Organization. To make matters worse, they are considered a developing nation, getting all sorts of benefits that others, including the United States, are not entitled to. But I have never solely blamed China for this. They were able to get away with the theft like no one was able to get away with before because of past politicians and, frankly, past presidents. But unlike those who came before, my administration negotiated and fought for what was right. It's called fair and reciprocal treatment. China has also unlawfully claimed territory in the Pacific Ocean, threatening freedom of navigation and international trade. And they broke their word to the world on ensuring the autonomy of Hong Kong. The United States wants an open and constructive relationship with China, but achieving that relationship requires us to vigorously defend our national interests. The Chinese government has continually violated its promises to us and so many other nations. These plain facts cannot be overlooked or swept aside. 
the world is now suffering as a result of the malfeasance of the Chinese government. China's cover-up of the Wuhan virus allowed the disease to spread all over the world, instigating a global pandemic that has cost more than 100,000 American lives and over a million lives worldwide. Chinese officials ignored their reporting obligations to the World Health Organization and pressured the World Health Organization to mislead the world when the virus was first discovered by Chinese authorities. Countless lives have been taken, and profound economic hardship has been inflicted all around the globe. They strongly recommended against me doing the early ban from China, but I did it anyway and was proven to be 100 percent correct. China has total control over the World Health Organization, despite only paying $40 million per year compared to what the United States has been paying, which is approximately $450 million a year. We have detailed the reforms that it must make and engage with them directly, but they have refused to act. Because they have failed to make the requested and greatly needed reforms, we will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization and redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. The world needs answers from China on the virus. We must have transparency. Why is it that China shut off infected people from Wuhan to all other parts of China? It went nowhere else. It didn't go to Beijing. It went nowhere else. But they allowed them to freely travel throughout the world, including Europe and the United States. The death and destruction caused by this is incalculable. We must have answers, not only for us, but for the rest of the world. This pandemic has underscored the crucial importance of building up America's economic independence, reshoring our critical supply chains, and protecting America's scientific and technological advances. For years, the government of China has conducted illicit espionage to steal our industrial secrets, of which there are many. Today, I will issue a proclamation to better secure our nation's vital university research and to suspend the entry of certain foreign nationals from China who we have identified as potential security risks. I am also taking action to protect the integrity of America's financial system, by far the best in the world. I am instructing my presidential working group on financial markets to study the differing practices of Chinese companies listed on the U.S. financial markets with the goal of protecting American investors. Investment firms should not be subjecting their clients to the hidden and undue risks associated with financing Chinese companies that do not play by the same rules. Americans are entitled to fairness and transparency. Several of the most significant actions we're taking pertain to deeply troubling situations unfolding in Hong Kong. This week, China unilaterally imposed control over Hong Kong security. This was a plain violation of Beijing's treaty obligations with the United Kingdom in the Declaration of 1984 and explicit provisions of Hong Kong's basic law. It has 27 years to go. The Chinese government's move against Hong Kong is the latest in a series of measures that are diminishing the city's long-standing and very proud status. This is a tragedy for the people of Hong Kong, the people of China, and indeed the people of the world. China claims it is protecting national security. But the truth is that Hong Kong was secure and prosperous as a free society. Beijing's decision reverses all of that. It extends the reach of China's invasive state security apparatus into what was formerly a bastion of liberty. China's latest incursion, along with other recent developments that degraded the territory's freedoms, makes clear that Hong Kong is no longer sufficiently autonomous 
to warrant the special treatment that we have afforded the territory since the handover. China has replaced its promised formula of one country, two systems, with one country, one system. Therefore, I am directing my administration to begin the process of eliminating policy exemptions that give Hong Kong different and special treatment. My announcement today will affect the full range of agreements we have with Hong Kong, from our extradition treaty to our export controls on dual-use technologies and more, with few exceptions. We will be revising the State Department's travel advisory for Hong Kong to reflect the increased danger of surveillance and punishment by the Chinese state security apparatus. We will take action to revoke Hong Kong's preferential treatment as a separate customs and travel territory from the rest of China. The United States will also take necessary steps to sanction PRC and Hong Kong officials directly or indirectly involved in eroding Hong Kong's autonomy and so — and just, if you take a look, smothering, absolutely smothering Hong Kong's freedom. Our actions will be strong. Our actions will be meaningful. More than two decades ago, on a rainy night in 1997, British soldiers lowered the Union flag and Chinese soldiers raised the Chinese flag in Hong Kong. The people of Hong Kong felt simultaneously proud of their Chinese heritage and their unique Hong Kong identity. The people of Hong Kong hoped that in the years and decades to come, China would increasingly come to resemble its most radiant and dynamic city. The rest of the world was electrified by a sense of optimism that Hong Kong was a glimpse into China's future, not that Hong Kong would grow into a reflection of China's past. In every decision, I will continue to proudly defend and protect the workers, families, and citizens of the United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not a news conference as billed, but a statement uh, from President Trump uh, taking a number of actions against China over uh, a number of, uh, of issues, uh, including the uh, spread of the COVID virus, but certainly the president uh, making decisions here based on China's recent moves to incorporate Hong Kong under its blanket of authority. Let's go to uh, Kristen Welker right now with a little bit more about what we heard from the president. Kristen? Cracking down on China, Lester, and also announcing that the United States will pull out of the WHO, the backdrop of these actions are the fact that President Trump blames China for not being more transparent, he would argue. And really, there's bipartisan agreement about that in the early stages of the coronavirus pandemic. But it was striking to see President Trump uh, flanked by a number of his top officials and not address the American city that is currently in crisis, Minneapolis, uh, in the wake of the death of George Floyd, in the wake of what we just heard, that now murder charges are going to be brought against the officer responsible for, accused of taking his yes, life. Uh, the fact that earlier today President Trump was tweeting about the death. He's clearly been watching what's happening uh, with Mr. Floyd's death very closely and yet making no mention of it and not taking any questions from reporters. You saw my colleagues there in the Rose Garden standing up, raising their hands, trying to get questions to President Trump about what we are witnessing in Minneapolis, the unrest, the pain, and the American city in a state of crisis. And yet President Trump's focus was on China in his remarks. Now, of course, he is dealing with a dual crisis, the pandemic that has been ravaging this country, now more than 100,000 American deaths, uh, and this new crisis, this race crisis that we are witnessing unfold. Uh, and so this is a real leadership test for this president. We know that his chief rival, uh, Democrat and former Vice President Joe Biden, has spoken to the family of George Floyd. We know that he's going to be talking to our Craig Melvin about that a little bit later on today. And 
and he has spoken out uh, about Mr. Floyd. We have yet to hear fulsome remarks from President Trump about what happened in Minneapolis and what he plans to do about it. We know that he did urge his attorney general to expedite the investigation, uh, but still, what if any federal response? Can we expect to see that the riots, uh, about the riots that we all witnessed, those tragic scenes unfolding in Minneapolis overnight, Lester, that remains a key question. And undoubtedly, uh, my colleagues at the White House are going to continue to try to get those answers today, Lester. Yeah, absolutely extraordinary that he did not bring up the events in Minneapolis and the country needs some uh, healing words. The president, as you noted, uh, remaining solely on the topic of China. Let's go to Andrea Mitchell right now. Andrea, we were talking about this a, a, a bit earlier, about this issue of leadership. Uh, what are your takeaways from what we just heard? Well, it's extraordinary in that, uh, despite all of China's bad behavior, the acknowledged bad behavior, not only on Wuhan, but on years and years of cyber hacking and other, other kinds of uh, aggressions in the South China Sea. There's been plenty of evidence of that. But now you have the two great superpowers, the only two remaining economic superpowers, uh, the U.S. and China coming up behind, and now what the Chinese have called a new Cold War. Uh, this is a frightening development on the world stage for these issues not to be resolved through diplomacy, for this president, who as recently as January was praising President Xi, January and February, for his handling of the pandemic. So he went overboard in one direction uh, at the same time that he was negotiating a trade deal, and now he's cracking down on China and getting out of the World Health Organization. We were the leader of the World Health Organization, which is not only about this COVID virus, but is about malaria, TV, HIV, AIDS, polio, tuberculosis. Uh, the support for the World Health Organization and our leadership there has been, in, in decades, we helped found it. And for us to now get out of it and take all of our money away uh, and not have participated in their last big meeting on COVID-19 in London, we were the only uh, great power world leaders not participating is extraordinary. Also, citing the fact that he's going to stop the visas for graduate students from China. These are among the most uh, valuable, intellectually valuable, and also tuition-paying, full tuition-paying graduate students in the United States. The American Association of University Presidents is very much against this. The Chamber of Commerce is very much against this. So there is bipartisan support. This will be popular politically. But it also opens a big economic gap, and he's also threatening uh, uh, Chinese investors, Chinese companies, on American exchanges. This is a major step. It is a major. All right, Andrea Mitchell, thank you. A statement from President Trump on relations with China, not a news conference, as we were led to believe. No questions answered, no statement from the president on the events in Minnesota, where a former police officer has now been charged with murder and the death of an African-American man, George Floyd, while he was in police custody on Monday. We'll have full details coming up later on NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Lester Holt, NBC News, New York. Good day. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's go right out to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Lioto. She has the very latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, give us an update. Hey, Allison, lots of news in this hour. First, the now former police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter, according to Minnesota's Public Safety Commissioner. Here's County Attorney Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third degree murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges. Now, public outcry over the death of George Floyd continued overnight, turning increasingly violent. A police precinct was set on fire in Minneapolis and unrest broke out in St. Paul. Now, from NBC's Jamie Nodal, the battle between President Trump and Twitter continues after the tech company put a warning label on one of the president's tweets, calling protesters, quote, thugs, and saying, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter said it was, quote, glorifying violence. Now, later this morning, the official White House account put out the same tweet, and Twitter again put a warning label on it. This, of course, follows Twitter for the first time uh, adding a fact check label to, to two of the president's tweets earlier this week. Now, news from Kentucky, protesters demanding justice for Breonna Taylor, 
who was killed by Louisville police back in March, turned violent last night. That's from NBC's Phil Helsel and Dennis Romero. Seven people were shot with at least one in critical condition. A police sergeant told NBC News that officers were not involved in those shootings. Audio from a 9-11 call made the night of uh, Breonna Taylor's death was also released. In a tweet, Governor Andy Bashar said, quote, my heart aches for Louisville and our country. Breonna Taylor's family and the public deserve the truth. And lastly, a new study shows prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine surged by nearly 2,000 percent in March after the president first promoted the drug as a potential treatment for coronavirus. That's the latest from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has often touted the use of the anti-malarial drug, even taking it himself, though it has not yet been proven to be an effective treatment against the coronavirus. These findings also follow a study published earlier this month showing that hospitalized patients of COVID-19 patients that took hydroxychloroquine would be more likely actually to die than those who didn't. Now, those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. Thank you so much. And we are, of course, staying on top of the breaking news out of Minnesota today. The officer shown on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before he died has been arrested and charged with both third degree murder and manslaughter last night in Minneapolis. A third straight night of protests. Police there using tear gas and clashes with some of those protesters. There was looting. There were fires, including a fire at the police department's third precinct, home to the four officers fired after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz said the world is watching the visceral pain in response to Floyd's death, and he urged people to come together to restore peace. I understand that, and I will not patronize you as a white man without living those, those lived experiences of how very difficult that is, but I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard, not those who throw firebombs into businesses that are communities of colors have worked so hard to build. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And, and Morgan, Officer Derek Chauvin charged, arrested. What is the reaction there uh, in Minneapolis today? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. We know the word of Chauvin's arrest has made its way through this crowd here, but uh, we're not seeing the numbers that we did yesterday, and we're also not seeing that, mm -hmm. uh, that tension necessarily that we witnessed uh, with the hundreds of people gathering uh, near some of the businesses behind me. I can say that one of the reasons behind that is probably this increased police presence, and I'll just kind of let you take a look. These are state patrol officers that came in early this morning uh, and established a very wide perimeter around some of the more damaged areas here in Minneapolis. And through the better part of yesterday evening and well into the night, um, there was no sign of any police presence per se uh, or National Guard. And we know that the governor signed that proclamation yesterday, allowing the National Guard to, to come in and help is needed, uh, but we really didn't see that resource being used until today. And you can see that police are out here in mass uh, letting firefighters do their job uh, while also maintaining uh, a perimeter, not just here in this area, but uh, well, well around that 10 block radius that was significantly damaged uh, over the past several days. So uh, as it stands right now, Chauvin's arrest uh, from those that I've spoken to here in the crowd, they say is a hopeful first step uh, towards achieving justice uh, in the death of George Floyd. Uh, but everyone's saying there's uh, much more to come. Those three other officers that were involved uh, in the death of mm -hmm. Floyd uh, have yet to be taken into custody. However, we are hearing from officials that charges do await them as well. Uh, so very much a, a watch and wait mentality here right now. Um, yeah. And everyone just kind of uh, taking a deep breath after so many days uh, of tension uh, in this community. Allison. Uh, Morgan, you mentioned the National Guard there. The governor saying they did not pre-deploy the National Guard uh, ahead of last night's protest. Did he say why they did not do that last night? Now, we're still waiting on an exact reason uh, regarding the National mm -hmm. Guard, Allison. We do know that the mayor of Minneapolis was also questioned uh, as to why he chose to I guess, not um, increase resources at the 3rd Precinct building. Mm -hmm. uh, the mayor saying that you know, no human life is worth the cost of a building. 
And certainly there will be a lot of questions being raised in the days and weeks, months going forward uh, as to how the response was, uh, was handled here uh, or, or not, rather. Allison. Morgan, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota rather, Attorney General Keith Ellison also spoke today and said that state leaders are committed to long-term change. Here's what he said. But I want to be clear that if the message was this situation with Mr. Floyd is intolerable, absolutely unacceptable, and must change, that message has been sent and received as well. And go the governor, myself, the lieutenant governor, all of us are committed to that long-term change. Is that helping to ease the tension in the city as well? Uh, or Morgan, are people telling you they will continue to come out uh, until they see more arrests? Well, we've heard from numerous people in the crowd, Allison, that they're determined to make sure that, you know, George Floyd is much more than a hashtag and that you can't let uh, the damage and destruction that we've seen over the past several days uh, be what people remember the most from this. Uh, however, that's going to be a, a tough hurdle to overcome simply when you witness the devastation that we've seen here in this city. They say that, you know, the system is broken and that it will take uh, a long term committed uh, change uh, or change or mo movement rather to see change happen. Mm -hmm. And so it all comes down to sustaining this uh, movement. Um, and it's going to be a, a long road ahead. Allison. Morgan, uh, before we let you go, talk to me, if you will, about uh, what folks there woke up to this morning. I, I know there was looting last night. Uh, there were fires. I know there are local businesses uh, that have been affected by this. Uh, have people been coming back and seeing property of theirs, things of theirs destroyed today? Absolutely. And uh, the unfortunate rea reality is that last night played out basically like a carbon copy of, of the night prior to that. And that is a relatively peaceful yeah. protest that happened throughout the day and into the evening uh, suddenly or not so suddenly, rather, began to disintegrate. And vandalism happened uh, one block after another. And one thing that struck me is that whenever I arrived in Minneapolis and made my way to this scene, uh, I saw a small business not too far from where I'm standing uh, with uh, the owner putting up uh, plywood over all the windows. And he wasn't necessarily um, even that close to the damage that happened the night prior. And I asked him, you know, better safe than sorry. He's like, yeah, I don't want to take any chances. I drove past that business this morning. The windows knocked out. The whole place burned. So that is uh, unfortunately what a lot of people are facing today. Uh, another night of damage. Uh, so many fingers being crossed that tonight isn't a repeat of last night. But we just still don't know with uh, still a lot of um, unease, a lot of anger simmering here in this community. Allison? Yeah. Understandably so. Morgan Chesky in Minneapolis, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Earlier today, Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman stressed the fact that his department moved with unprecedented speed, bringing third-degree murder charges against Officer Chauvin. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. We have never charged a case in that kind of time frame. Uh, and we can only charge a case when we have sufficient admissible evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. As of right now, we have that. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins me now. And Danny, less than 24 hours ago, prosecutors here said that they needed more time uh, to gather more evidence before they could announce any charges. What changed in that short time? Do we have Danny, guys?
All right, it looks like we don't have Danny there. We'll try to get him a little bit later. Twitter now labeling another one of President Trump's tweets, this time a warning label on a tweet about the Minneapolis protests. President Trump tweeted, quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Waltz and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Now, Twitter says that tweet violated its rules against glorifying violence. The phrase there, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, dates back to the 1960s. Miami Police Chief Walter Headley used it to address his department's crackdown on black neighborhoods. Headley's words and his aggressive policing policies contributed to the city's race riots in the late 60s and were denounced by civil rights leaders. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joining me now. And Kelly, I want to talk uh, with you about those tweets in a moment. But first, uh, President Trump spoke this afternoon about U.S. relations with China. His first public remarks since the officer in George Floyd's case was charged with manslaughter and murder. Did the president weigh in here? He did not weigh in on the events in Minnesota at all, and that is really stunning because certainly the president has a power and megaphone larger than any scale and could have done so if he wanted to. He did have tweets late uh, in the hour before going out and speaking on China, which is, of course, an important topic and one that has a very significant ramifications. But at a point when uh, the country is experiencing a lot of pain over social justice issues, a lot of concern about the events in Minnesota involving the death of George Floyd, the charging of that officer, potential charges for other officers who were involved in that arrest, and all of the destruction and uh, pain that is being experienced by that community. The president did not take any questions and made no comments about that, instead sticking to his focus with some significant announcements regarding the U.S. relationship with China over Hong Kong and China's aggressive move uh, decades really ahead of schedule of taking over Hong Kong, which is supposed to be a part of China, but with its own uh, sort of autonomy. And it has, of course, been a place that is important to the financial markets and a place where some of the heavy hand of China is typically not present with surveillance and so forth. The president saying the special status the U.S. has with Hong Kong is being terminated and the U.S. is stepping away from its responsibilities and its involvement with the World Health Organization organization. That is something the president has been hinting at for weeks now, blaming the World Health Organization for not properly warning the U.S. and other countries about the devastating effects of the Wuhan virus at the time in Wuhan itself uh, in those early days and how that virus then, of course, has spread and has become COVID-19 as we all know it now. So these are significant events, but it also casts the president as being in his own lane, dealing with an issue that he considers important and tuning out everything that was happening with Minnesota in terms of his ability to speak speak directly to the public with that Rose Garden event. Allison? Uh, Kelly, let's talk about the tweets from President Trump today. The White House backed the president. They retweeted him. That also got a warning. Do we know if the president intended to quote Headley there? Uh, is the White House saying anything about those tweets? We're not getting any specifics on that. Certainly the president at age 73 lived through that era, and it was perhaps a phrase familiar to him. It is hard to imagine that he was specifically quoting that uh, police chief because of the obvious uh, racial tones of violence that would not be what any American president would want to do. And yet the president has done a lot of questionable things when it comes to Twitter and his uh, speaking to the public through that platform. He also then tweeted about sort of an adjustment saying that looting leads to shooting was not so much about a police chief, as you've just outlined the history, but that the volatile nature of these events when protests take on violence, that there can be uh, what might not have been intended, person-on-person -person violence, not police on individuals in the community, and suggesting that that's what he was referring to, that there was someone shot in Minnesota as a consequence of the demonstrations and protests that grew more violent with fires and vandalism and looting. So it is hard to imagine the president wouldn't have understood the context of that phrase and its volatile racial nature, yet he used it anyway, 
and then try to uh, soften it perhaps or explain it in a way uh, to uh, to soften its impact. But that's the kind of thing that reporters certainly would have liked to have had the president address in the Rose Garden, and we'll certainly want to ask him at other opportunities where the president is in front of the media uh, in order to explain that. There are real issues happening in Minnesota that sort of call out for presidential leadership. The president opted not to take that moment, instead keeping his focus on China. Allison? Kelly, the president also singled out uh, the mayor of Minneapolis for being, quote, weak and showing a total lack of leadership. Uh, here's how the mayor fired back. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes. But you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. Kelly, the president has attacked the mayor before. For people who aren't familiar, could you tell us a little bit about their relationship? Well, this is a kind of tension that the, the president has often leveled on local officials. Of course, uh, Mayor Fry is a Democrat and the president. Remember, in the context of what in many other years, we, we'd be talking campaign politics. It's an election year, just a few months, uh, really, until the heat of the fall election. And Minnesota is one of the states where President Trump narrowly lost in 26, and his campaign has set its sights on trying to win Minnesota, put that into all of this context as well. And the president has had a tense relationship there. And this is the kind of thing where uh, people on the ground, in the community, people who call Minnesota home, will try to assess what they think of the president's conduct, the mayor's conduct, and Governor Walls. Now, President Trump did acknowledge speaking to Governor Walls and talking about wanting to be supportive with any uh, sort of federal resources that could be brought to bear. But there will be a real test here over the next days about the tone and is it the right time to be criticizing local officials when it comes to uh, they're in the moment of kind of the heat of the crisis. And that is perhaps not helpful uh, from the federal government. Instead, often the federal government is there as backup to try to provide help. This is a test of leadership for the president, as it is for the mayor and the governor. And the public will certainly uh, make a decision on how they think each of these different elected officials are handling this crisis. Allison? Quite a test of leadership. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. At least seven people shot in Louisville, Kentucky last night. Protesters there were rallying against the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. She was killed in a police raid of her apartment back in March. Joining me now, Louisville's Wave 3 news anchor and reporter, Taylor Durden. Taylor, great to have you. Uh, after a violent night, could you tell us what it's like there in Louisville today? How are folks doing? Yeah, you know, Allison, people are waking up this morning. If they were downtown or near downtown at all, it looked very different than it had yesterday morning. Uh, when I was there last night, I can tell you that as things started to diminish, people weren't really around anymore because it started to rain. So at that time, a lot of the protesters decided to go home. There was trash all over downtown. Police were still there in their gear, their riot gear, kind of blocking off intersections. But this morning, people are waking up to big holes in buildings. They're waking up to damage to cars, broken broken windows, several different buildings, including the police department, uh, one of the statues in front of Metro Hall in downtown Louisville, also damaged. They had, protesters had ripped the arm off of King Louis um, there. And so people are waking up to a very different downtown. And right now, police are still down there right now, just keeping an eye on this scene. They are expected to possibly have people out there again tonight. And so that's kind of what we're seeing right now, Allison. Yeah, at least seven people shot there. What can you tell us, if anything, about the shooting victims? What do you know? So we haven't been told much about the shooting victims, but we do know that police okay. tell us that police did not fire their weapons at all. Um, they're saying that it's from people in the crowd. Police said that they didn't start doing anything with tear gas or any kind of um, pepper bullets or anything like that um, until they heard those gunshots. 
At first, there were two people shot. We started hearing that pretty early on. Um, we've had some other reporters who were on the scene that could see it from afar. Um, and a lot of people just scattering at that point. You hear the gunshots, obviously you're going to run. Uh, we had reporters there on the scene that also went and ducked for cover. Um, and then after that, we started hearing the count just continuing to go up. We know that at least two, one person last night was in critical condition. I don't know if that condition has changed. Uh, but we do know that um, two people are in stable condition at the hospital. All seven of them were taken to the hospital. Hospital, but as of now, they all seem to be okay. So that is some good news. Taylor, how is the city handling the situation there today? Are they preparing for more protests over the weekend? Uh, you know, I think so. Um, it sounds like from what we're yeah. hearing here that they are anticipating something potentially tonight and into the weekend as well. I think a lot of people um, hearing about last night there's a lot of tension here. I mean, for two months, people wanted to hear the name Breonna Taylor, and they didn't. And so the, the fact that people are saying that, her family is just happy that people are saying it. They told us um, last night and even today that they're upset that things took a turn. Initially, the, the protest was peaceful for several hours, and then there was a shift where some of the violence started, some of the damage started happening. That's something that her family says they don't want to see. They don't want that to happen. They want this to be peaceful. They do want her name out there. They're happy that people are saying her name, but they don't want this to be a, a violent kind of a situation, Allison. All right, Taylor, thank you so much. Taylor Durden, anchor and reporter for Wave 3 News. Great to have you with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, the man seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck, arrested, charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams is with me now from Washington. And Pete, could you talk us through the charges here? Sure. So um, basically one charge adds one other element that the other one doesn't have. The manslaughter charge, manslaughter is okay. a common charge in many states. It's basically unintentional killing of another person. Uh, through negligence or carelessness or something like that. Now, this is a second-degree manslaughter charge, um, which basically says creating an unreasonable risk and taking a chance of causing death. And then in addition to that, there's a charge, a more serious charge, of third-degree murder. Now, that is an uncommon statute. Not many states have it. It's basically an unintentional killing with, as the statute says, using somewhat antiquated language, with a depraved state of mind and a disregard for the personal safety of others. And what the probable cause statement says here now that's, that's uh, attached to the charges, it says that uh, at first, uh, George Floyd was compliant when they tried to arrest him, but when they wanted to put him in the squad car, he stiffened up, said he was claustrophobic, struggled with the officers, intentionally fell down, they say, said he was not going to get in the car, refused to stand still, and while standing outside the car, the charges say, he began saying and repeating that he couldn't breathe. Then he went down on the ground. He's still handcuffed, face down, and he keeps saying, I can't breathe, multiple times, according to the uh, charges, and said, Mama, and please, as well. Now, the charges say that the officer who was charged with this, Officer Derek Chauvin, had his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, eight minutes and 46 seconds in total. And it says that he continued to hold his knee on it for two of those, uh, almost three of those minutes after Mr. Floyd was non-responsive. And it also says in the last sentence of the charging documents, police are trained that this type of restraint with a subject in a prone position is inherently dangerous. And the state officials have said they don't train in the use of putting a knee on someone's neck. Now, I will also say this. Uh, for the last 15 or 20 years, there has been uh, law enforcement training material that says when you put someone down on the ground prone, meaning they're face down mm -hmm. with their hands behind their back, right. and then you put pressure on their back or their neck, it increases the risk that they won't be able to breathe and they could suffocate. And there have been many cases uh, where the police are either uh, a police are either found guilty of doing something wrong or more often there's a settlement between the police department, the city or the state and the family of the victim uh, the, in which cash is paid out, uh, you know, can be huge damages paid out. There have been some 
in Minnesota just a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, all around the country, you see this happen a lot. So it is a risky maneuver. And what police officials will tell you is that the training is it's common to arrest people in that position to, to get them under control. But once you have them cuffed and once they are no longer resistant, you roll them onto their side or you get them to sit up or even stand up. After all, right. the experts will tell you the, ob the, the obligation of the police, once they make the arrest, is to get the person safely either to jail or to the hospital. And obviously that's not what happened here. Uh, Pete, thanks for explaining uh, this in such an expert way. I mean, it's it's so basic. I can, as you describe what it's like for someone to be prone and have a, a knee on their neck, I, I found myself catching my breath. You just can imagine how difficult sure. it is to breathe in this situation. Uh, what is next now? I mean, people were were uh, protesters were waiting uh, to see if uh, Chauvin would be arrested and charged. What happens next for him in this process? And, and then how about the other three officers? Are we expecting that they could potentially face charges here? It's possible. Uh, I don't really know much about the other three. I mean, uh, some police officials have said they found it very disturbing that the other officers simply stood around when George Floyd was in such yeah. obvious distress and didn't do anything or try to intervene. Now, what the whether there's a statutory obligation for them to do so, what the criminal offense would be, I don't know. Um, the, the next step would right. be George Floyd is uh, George Chauvin is already in. I'm sorry, uh, Derek Chauvin is already in custody. Derek Chauvin. Uh, he'll, mm -hmm. he'll be going through the court procedure. Now, we have to see whether the federal government will file any charges, any civil rights charges. We always assumed that the state would go first because the only uh, the state has a lot of statutes at its disposal for cases like this. Uh, the, the federal government does not. Uh, so the only option for the federal government would be to charge someone in this situation with violating uh, civil rights. And that is a very hard case to prove because you have to prove that an officer uh, used unreasonable force and knew it was unreasonable and did so on purpose. It's, it's relatively easy to, to prove the first part. It's very hard to prove what the officer's state of mind was. And that's why yeah. you so often see in right. these cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, you name it, uh, uh, many other cases uh, where people have been uh, killed by police in custody that the feds try to make a case and can't. So we always assume that state would go first, whether the federal government will or not, we'll have to see. All right, Pete Williams, thanks so much. You bet. Earlier today, Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman stressed the fact that his department moved with unprecedented speed, bringing third degree murder charges against Officer Chauvin. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. We have never charged a case in that kind of time frame. Uh, and we can only charge a case when we have sufficient admissible evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. As of right now, we have NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins me now. And Danny, less than 24 hours ago, prosecutors said they needed more time to gather more evidence before they could announce any charges. What changed since then? They take a huge risk anytime prosecutors decide to charge police officers. But with the advent of mm -hmm. video virtually everywhere on people's phones and security systems, they had quite a bit of evidence to piece together from different angles how this arrest went down and how it went bad. The challenge then becomes once they've determined that some law was violated, that this was a bad arrest and a bad use of force, is figuring out which statute that it fits into. And Pete Williams talked a little about this, but interestingly enough, in Minnesota, third degree murder and involuntary manslaughter are really not that different when it comes to the state of mind involved. One involves manslaughter, involves an unintentional killing uh, with a conscious disregard of risk. In other words, when you did what you did, you were aware that it caused a risk and that risk was unjustifiable. The same thing happens with third degree murder, except that the risk is so great. It's what we call in law school depraved heart uh, in state of mind. In other words, the act itself is so, so risky that it's almost the same as intending to kill. And the classic example is taking a gun and shooting it into a crowd. You may not intend to hit anyone, 
But shooting a gun into a crowd is right. something that is just so dangerous, you might as well have intended a, a fatal outcome. That is uh, arguably right. a difficult bar to meet. But with the lesser included offense of manslaughter, uh, the prosecutors here have covered a lot of bases. Uh, Danny, how about the other three officers? Floyd's family, uh, protesters say they would like the three of the those three other officers at the scene to face criminal charges. Uh, d do you think that we'll see charges here? And if they are, what is their defense? We talked a little bit with Pete about uh, the, the complexity of charging them potentially here. These are much more difficult officers to charge because Yes, on the one hand, okay. as law enforcement officers, they have an affirmative duty to get involved uh, when they see somebody who is at, at risk of being seriously harmed, especially someone that they themselves have arrested. But on the other hand, those that may not have had a good angle at the, uh, at the victim while he was on the ground, those that may have been standing a few mm -hmm. feet away and maybe didn't realize what was happening, or maybe they were given assurances uh, by the defendant that everything's okay, he's fine, uh, he's just, you know, he's just uh, uh, pretending that he's hurt and he's not we may find out that there are different levels of culpability and that becomes a lot mm -hmm. more difficult to charge, especially if you can't show there's any common agreement among the officers and it doesn't appear to be any evidence of that right now. You have to demonstrate that they knowingly disregarded their, their affirmative duty to get involved when somebody is at risk of very serious harm. It's an obligation that police officers have, that regular citizens do not. We are legally privileged as regular citizens to walk by someone in distress. Police officers have a legal duty to get involved. Danny, do prosecutors here run the risk of overcharging? And and by that, I mean, is there any concern uh, that that bringing too many charges could prove to be too much for a conviction? You have the uh, third degree murder and then you have the lesser included offense of manslaughter. I can see a jury struggling with the really, really nuanced difference between acting recklessly for involuntary okay. manslaughter and acting super duper recklessly uh, for third degree murder. And I can see them struggling with that. And generally speaking, we've seen historically that police officers can bring a lot to a defense by arguing that they had some kind of apprehension of fear of safety or that they were responding to force. And what you see historically is that juries are more likely to give the benefit of the doubt to police officers when it comes to use of force. So I can see a jury struggling with the mm -hmm. definition, but expect the prosecution to have plenty of experts, uh, including folks possibly even in the Minneapolis Police Department, to testify that this kind of use of force, this specific technique, uh, was either not sanctioned or not trained or something that was totally outside of what was expected of officers. That will go a long way if they can get that kind of expert to testify uh, to showing that this use of force was unreasonable under the circumstances. Danny, uh, we all have a lot of questions right now. Uh, your legal expertise more helpful than ever in a time like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. George Floyd's death sparking protests across the country. Denver went into lockdown yesterday after someone there fired a gun near a peaceful protest. Protesters in Columbus, Ohio, charged the state capitol. And more demonstrations are expected there today. And protesters are also rallying in New York for a second day. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is there. And Ron, uh, what's happening where you are in the city? Well, Allison, there's a crowd of several dozen protesters that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They're supposed to start at 4 o'clock, but it's starting early. And they've moved down here, and they are converging on the New York Criminal Court building and the district attorney's office here. You can see there's a big NYPD police presence on bikes all around this area. There are literally hundreds of police officers trying to make sure things stay under control. A little bit further down the street here, you can see... It looks like there are a couple of people who are here. Yesterday, there were 70 people arrested. There were confrontations. There were a couple of police officers who were injured and had concussions. Um, so the police were ready for this. And this all started happening in the last half hour or so. But you can see things are getting a little bit chaotic. The police, of course, are well prepared for these kinds of things. The protesters are here in support 
of protesters out in Minneapolis. They're also, this is a we can't breathe protest, which of course echoes Eric Gardner. The Garner case happened six years ago, next month, July 2014. To this day, no officer has been charged with a crime in that case. And these protesters are very aware of that. You can see here they're bringing out some guy yeah. who is causing some problems. It's unsure whether what exactly he was doing down here, but um, clearly the police are not playing with this. They don't want any trouble back here. So just watching yeah. the situation, it's a very narrow street. And um, and again, it's um, the police are... You are unlawfully in the road. So this is also the police are concerned about not just crowd control during an incident here, during a protest, but of course there's social distancing. We're in the middle of a pandemic as well. And that's not happening either. So the police are saying that they are going to start arresting people for disorderly conduct if need be. And you can see there's a lot of energy down here. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of resentment. And now you can see the, the police are really being adamant about um, clearing the street down here. Yeah, Ron, you can feel it. You can hear it. You can see it there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure that you're in a safe place. This looks like a, a, a man who, he doesn't look like one of the, the protesters. They were much younger people. And um, this is an extreme situation here where they just carry this guy out. He looks to be in some distress. Now the police are picking him up by all and just uh, carrying him out. Okay, let's just get let's get him understand where we are here. Let's get out of the street. All right, the cops are insisting that we get out of the street and on the sidewalk, trying to bring order here. Let's see if we can see what's on what's going on down there a little bit. Um, um, because this is right, where we'll, the, we'll the heart you, Ron, of the protests are. Just as long as you're in a safe are. place. Uh huh. Yeah, we're in a safe place. This is a this is, seems to be the heart of the protest. Okay. The police are drawing a firm line here where they are blocking the protesters and the protesters are now moving they're moving further on and that seems to be what the police want is for them to keep moving and to go further on well stay with it see what happens out here but um another crazy situation all of a sudden allison yeah, uh, Ron, unbelievable. Uh, before I let you go, if you're able to stick with us, one thing you said that struck me, Eric Garner, six years ago, it's hard to believe uh, it has been that long. What else are, are folks there telling you as you speak with protesters there today? Well, there was some relief. There was some relief, obviously, when the officers, one of the officers out in Minneapolis was charged because here it's been six years and there have been no charges. There was a, a state grand jury that looked at the Garner case. The federal prosecutors looked at this for five years. Two administrations, the Obama administration, eventually the Trump administration. And it was just uh, July of last year that the attorney general decided that there would be no civil rights federal charges filed against the officer. The officer, Daniel Petaleo, was fired as a result of a NYPD internal disciplinary hearing. But there has net to this day been anyone held criminally responsible in the Eric Garner death. And so when things started happening out in Minnesota, it looked like that. It looked like that. Everyone was, was dreading that this case out there, the Floyd case, could go on. Here's another arrest. They're taking out another individual. Yeah. The police are not. Um, the police are not playing. The police do not want this to get out of control, and they are. They are. They are serious today. You can see over there across the street. There's a strong presence guarding the entrance to the courthouse. And that's the answer to the district attorney's mm -hmm. office as well. And now the um, the police and the protesters are moving on down into Chinatown. More dense streets. More dense streets, more people. Um, 
We'll have to see see where this goes. Ron, we have seen protests in New York City before, uh, Union Square in particular, downtown, no stranger uh, to people expressing how they feel, uh, demands for justice. Uh, uh, you name it. I mean, we talked about Eric Garner, but there have been cases before. How does what you're seeing today uh, uh, compare to protests you've covered in the past? You know, Allison, I hate to say it, but it has this feeling of deja vu all over again that, you know, the yeah. first big protest I can remember covering was out in Los Angeles after the Rodney King trial in the early 90s. Yeah. That's what, um, 30 years ago? Um, and that was, you know, there's yep. videotape there, too. And everyone thought those officers would be convicted because of the videotape, but they weren't. Um, but, and that, that caused the L.A. uprising, as it's called. Here's another person getting arrested there. They've got um, the person's hands in restraints. Uh, it seems that the, there's a... It looks like the main crowd of the protesters have gone further up the street there. They're way down there. They're about three or four blocks ahead of us. And, um, okay. but the police are, are blocking this area of the city off right here now as well. It's just, it's, it's, it's really chaotic down here. This was supposed to be a, 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 yeah. a, a protest. In, a, in Foley Square, it was a, an area that was surrounded, cordoned off. There's another, that's at least the third or fourth person we've seen um, taken away. Here's another woman, young woman over here. Right up over here. And we can hear an a, a announcement from the police telling people to not block the streets. And there's yet another arrest going on over there by that car. You see it? Watch the car over there, guys. Why don't we can? Why don't we keep on going down? We're going to keep on going down and see what else we can see down here. Can you hear the uh, chant there now? It's uh, Ron, hands up. I was going to ask you, what are they chanting? The, um, anthem okay. from Ferguson. Hands up, don't shoot, which was the anthem rallying cry in Ferguson after the death of Michael Brown. Another case where yeah. a grand jury did not bring charges. The officer never faced charges. The federal government chose not to prosecute as well. These civil rights cases have a very high burden of proof threshold to convict an officer. Officers are given the benefit yeah. of the doubt because they are licensed and they are expected to use force. So to convict an officer of excessive force, deadly force, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. tough burden. And just looking at some statistics recently, it's, it's very rare still, you know, many, many years later, that officers are ever convicted in these kinds of cases. Let's see. Uh, let's get on the. We're gonna get on the sidewalk out of here, as they're telling us to do. Trying to do this as well as keep my distance from everybody as well. Yeah, Ron, I, I wanted, wanted to ask you about that. I mean, this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, how is social distancing playing into the protest today? Is it at all? Believe me, Allison, it is forefront in my mind, in our crew's mind, we are trying to keep our distance and trying to do this as safely as possible. This is the last thing I expected to happen down here today. But you can see many of the folks in the crowd wearing masks. They're not six feet apart. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, we really want to just stay away from this and show you what's happening, but not get too close. It's just, um, yeah. Uh, 
But the police, you can see, have things under control. The police have, have really, they were out here. They knew this was coming. This had been advertised as, you know, there were, this was advertised as a march that was going to start at 4 o'clock. So the police are out here in force. I can see even more police reinforcements in that direction coming this way. And, and here we seem to have reached a, a point of standoff where the officers and that group are face to face. And uh, we seem to have hit a point now where here things are sort of calming, if I could use that word in this crazy context. Yeah, yeah. Ron, uh, we would stick with you even longer, uh, but but you are in demand today, so I have to let you go to some of our uh, other colleagues at NBC and MSNBC. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for your coverage today, whether you in the heart are in the heart of the coronavirus epidemic or uh, at the protests here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for bringing us to the biggest stories in New York these days. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Police brutality and race are, are quickly becoming top issues in the 2020 election in the wake of George Floyd's death. Joe Biden pouncing on President Trump for his response to the looters in Minnesota. The presumptive Democratic presidential nominee issuing a short but stern response to Trump's Twitter post. Enough. The former vice president calling for real leadership earlier today. This is no time for incendiary treats, tweets. It's no time to encourage violence. This is a national crisis. We need real leadership right now, leadership that will bring everyone to the table so we can take measures to root out systemic racism. We need justice for George Floyd. We need real police reform that hold cops to a higher standard that so many of them actually meet, that holds bad cops accountable that repairs relationship between law enforcement and the community they're sworn to protect. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli joining me now. And Mike, uh, it was a, a longer talk uh, from Joe Biden. What else did he have to say today? Well, Allison, the first thing that he actually said was that he had just spoken uh, with the family of George Floyd. That's significant because yeah. obviously we haven't heard much from the White House about this in terms of whether there's been any attempt to reach out to his family. Uh, but we, we have talked about this often. Biden's campaign says that Joe Biden's superpower is empathy. And we know uh, just how much he has spent time on the campaign trail and then in, in his daily life, speaking with others who have experienced loss in his life. Tomorrow is, as a matter of fact, the fifth anniversary uh, of the death of his eldest son, Bo. So that was an interesting thing for him to make a point oh. of saying at the top. Um, but the larger point that he's made, not just in this uh, remarks that he delivered today, but in previous um, days as well, is he's talked about racism and these systemic inequalities having to do uh, with racism as an open wound in this country. In, in his remarks today, he said that those of us who are in positions of power have a responsibility to do more uh, to address this, that our silence, our complacency makes us complicit in some of these issues, and that to, to move beyond this without taking and making hard choices uh, to try to do things on a policy front would only uh, further scab over, open, scab this open wound rather than uh, providing a long-term fix. And the one last thing that I would mention is it's interesting when he talked about the need for police reforms, and he said the need to hold bad cops accountable. Joe Biden is uh, somebody who throughout his career has styled himself as very much a law and order Democrat. He's touted his relationships with law enforcement and first responders repeatedly. So for, for him to make that kind of comment is not something he does lightly because he really values those relationships as well. Uh, Mike, the George Floyd case is also putting the spotlight back on Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who served as a prosecutor there. Uh, she's being criticized for not prosecuting the same cop seen kneeling on George Floyd in another case involving the fatal shooting of a man back in 2006. Uh, this is what she told MSNBC about it earlier today. That investigation continued into a time where I was already sworn into the U.S. Senate. I never declined the case. I have said repeatedly, back when I was the county attorney, the cases that we had involving officer involving shootings went to a grand jury. That was a true in every jurisdiction across our state, and that was true in many jurisdictions across the country. 
I think that was wrong now. I think it would have been much better if I took the responsibility and looked at the cases and made the decision myself. But let me make this clear. We did not blow off these cases. Mike Klobuchar is one of the contenders to be Biden's, Biden's VP. Uh, how does this affect her chances? Yeah, I mean, we so often talk about this vice presidential search process as if it's taking place in a vacuum, that Biden's simply going to be able to make a choice on the merits alone and not having to do with external events. And I think what this episode really emphasizes is that's not the case, uh, that very much what's happening in real time uh, around the country is going to be shaping Biden's thinking and the thinking of his team about who he chooses. And it's worth noting that already, even before the events of the past week in Minnesota, simply the news that Amy Klobuchar was being vetted was met with a lot of unease among some progressive activists who not only have issues with her as being yeah. a centrist as, as Joe Biden is, but because of her record in Minnesota as a prosecutor. They, they'd already thought that that was an issue. And now they're coming out today and saying this is disqualifying. Now, Andrew Mitchell, in that same interview, asked Klobuchar if this should maybe lead her to withdraw from consideration as Biden's potential running mate. And she said that's a decision that Joe Biden has to make. But she was clearly looking for an opportunity to defend her record in this in this score. The Biden mm -hmm. campaign not addressing this at all, of course, as they haven't been addressing any details about his vice presidential search process. Uh, Mike, does this also bring up concerns for the Biden campaign about his own record on racial issues and that those could come under fire again? Yeah, I'll remind you that one week ago at this time, we were talking about the interview that Biden had just done with The Breakfast Club. And there was one element of that yeah. interview, of course, yep. that got a lot of attention, what he had to say at the end about you ain't yes. black if you can't see the difference between me and Trump. But the rest of that interview really included a, a, a long discussion about his uh, role in authoring the 1994 crime bill. And I think it's likely that we're going to see a discussion as this case in Minnesota continues, whether or not the elements of that crime bill necessarily uh, have a factor here. Uh, but the other point, which is interesting, having spoken today with a number of outside groups who are among those who have been pressuring Joe Biden to pick a woman of color as his running mate, is to say that it's less actually about simply making sure that you check a box, that you have diversity for diversity's sake. It's really more important that you have a, a diversity of perspectives and views, but also a record on the issues that yes. are important to them. And so for Biden, and it's not necessarily important that he just choose a woman of color. They said there, there are women, there are white women that he could choose from who might actually even be better on these issues than Biden himself in his past, but also some of the other contenders. And so this is all something that I think is going to be part of the discussion going forward. Yeah, it's not just optics, it's perspective for sure. Uh, Mike, one last question for you. Former President Obama also issued a statement on the Minneapolis protests today. What is he saying? Yeah, interesting always to hear from the former president, given how rarely uh, even if it's more frequently of late, he chooses to engage on these kinds of issues. Remember, I was covering the White House uh, when we saw riots in Baltimore and, of course, the situation in Ferguson, and we saw really how the president at the time grappled with these situations. In his statement today, he talks about how we're all looking forward to a new normal as states begin to really reopen uh, now following the pandemic, which we're still very much grappling with. Uh, but he said that sense of normalcy, yeah. we also have to understand uh, is not very normal for a lot of people, that there are, there are people of color, especially, who are dealing uh, with the kinds of uh, systemic issues that we see here. And he said it's, a, it's a coming upon all of us of, in good faith to come together and have a discussion. That's very much uh, classic Obama in a lot of ways, how he tried to have discussions about these issues when he was in office and now doing the same uh, from the outside. All right, Mike Memley, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Allison. The nation's capital reopening today, Washington, D.C., moving into phase one now that its daily coronavirus numbers have dropped for 14 days. NBC News reporter Ali Vitale joins us now from D.C. And Ali, just a week ago, Dr. Burke said there's still significant virus in the city. And when we spoke with you earlier this week, it wasn't clear if D.C. would go ahead and open today because of a setback in its 14 days of declining numbers. Why did the mayor decide to go ahead and open D.C. now? And what can you tell us about the numbers there? Well, 
Allison, we've seen D.C. be a little bit slower in its reopening. They've been much more conservative. They've really wanted to see those 14 days of consecutive declining cases. As you mentioned, over the weekend, that consecutive decline was interrupted. They then reset that countdown clock, not to zero, but to 11, which meant on Wednesday they were able to say that they'd hit that metric that they'd been looking for for so long, and that on Friday, today, they were going to be able to start phase one reopening. And what that means is that places like like barber shops, hair salons, uh, retail shops are able to start doing curbside pickup. Restaurants with outdoor spaces are allowed to start bringing people back. But at the same time, there's a lot of consternation because as we've seen across the country, these guidelines may start to be lifted, but then it's really up to the local business owners what they feel comfortable with and how they proceed with that reopening. Yeah, Ellie, you mentioned some of the things that are opening. Phase one, a lift stay at home orders. The mayor calling it stay at home light. Uh, what are business owners there right. uh, telling you uh, about reopening? And, and yeah, and what is uh, still closed right now? Are there notable things that you still cannot do uh, in D.C.? Look, stay at home late is probably the right way to look at it, because even as I've been traveling to neighboring states like Maryland and Virginia, local officials mm -hmm. there are saying that they're easing restrictions. But at the same time, they're still urging people to stay at home. Social distancing is still important. Wearing masks is still really important. It says one business owner reminded me today for people who see these states starting to reopen. It doesn't mean that you're just flipping a switch and stores are coming back to what they were before the virus. For so many of these local business mm -hmm. owners, that I've spoken to, the reopening guidelines really do force them to relook at their business model and figure out how that business model works in the post-coronavirus pandemic era. So for example, there was one business owner who has a beer garden here who I spoke to. That's a place where people mostly flow in and out. They don't need reservations. But now that business owner has to institute a reservation system. They've got to make decisions about if they're going to allow people to stay for as long as they want or if they're going to kick them out after two hours. Again, really look looking at that business model. For that one business in particular, they're deciding to stay closed a little bit longer until they can make adjustments to reopen in a way that they feel comfortable. On the other side, I've spoken to business owners who say they're reopening, but that they did a lot of research for what it will look like and how to make people feel comfortable coming back to their businesses. I want to show you a piece of that conversation as well as another conversation I had with a business owner who's not reopening and why. Listen to those. For us and my team, we took a three-hour meeting just to go through every single step. We also um, sent out a questionnaire to our clients, which was very important to us to get a feel of how they were feeling. Because we can open our business because the mayor said it was okay and it's time, but if we don't have customers, it doesn't serve us well. It's not easy to flip a switch and refill the store with inventory and to call my whole team back because we've lost significant some, you know, amounts of money in the past two months. And Allison, to me, the conversations that I had even just this morning really show the range of emotions for so many of these business owners, all of them scrambling to figure out what their business model looks like yeah. right now. And I have to say, the first woman that you heard from there who owns that beauty salon, she really put in the work, sending out that questionnaire to a lot of the people who come to her salon, trying to figure out what they felt comfortable with, and then taking that feedback, taking that data, and implementing it when she talked to her staff, trying to make her customers feel as comfortable as possible while also listening to her staff about how they'll feel comfortable coming to work. So for so many of these business owners here in D.C., but then also across the board, it's this juggling act of trying to get back to business, trying to keep people safe and trying to make sure that people feel comfortable while they're doing all of that. Yeah, I mean, Ali, you can flip that sign from closed to open, but a whole lot more goes into bringing those businesses back. Uh, thank you for sharing some of those business owner stories. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's go right out to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the very latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, give us an update. Hey, Allison, lots of news in this hour. First, the now former police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter, according to Minnesota's public safety commissioner. Here's County Attorney Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third degree murder 
We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges. Now, public outcry over the death of George Floyd continued overnight, turning increasingly violent. A police precinct was set on fire in Minneapolis, and unrest broke out in St. Paul. Now, from NBC's Jamie Nodal, the battle between President Trump and Twitter continues after the tech company put a warning label on one of the president's tweets, calling protesters, quote, thugs, and saying, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter said it was, quote, glorifying violence. Now, later this morning, the official White House account put out the same tweet, and Twitter again put a warning label on it. This, of course, follows Twitter for the first time uh, adding a fact check label to, to two of the president's tweets earlier this week. Now, news from Kentucky, protesters demanding justice for Breonna Taylor, who was killed by Louisville police back in March, turned violent last night. That's from NBC's Phil Helsel and Dennis Romero. Seven people were shot with at least one in critical condition. A police sergeant told NBC News that officers were not involved in those shootings. Audio from a 9-11 call made the night of uh, Breonna Taylor's death was also released. In a tweet, Governor Andy Bashar said, quote, my heart aches for Louisville and our country. Breonna Taylor's family and the public deserve the truth. And lastly, a new study shows prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine surged by nearly 2000 percent in March after the president first promoted the drug as a potential treatment for coronavirus. That's the latest from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has often touted the use of the anti-malarial drug, even taking it himself, though it has not yet been proven to be an effective treatment against the coronavirus. These findings also follow a study published earlier this month showing that hospitalized patients of COVID-19 patients that took hydroxychloroquine would be more likely actually to die than those who didn't. Now, those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. Thank you so much. Out of Minnesota today, the officer shown on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before he died has been arrested and charged with both third degree murder and manslaughter. Last night in Minneapolis, a third straight night of protests, police there using tear gas and clashes with some of those protesters. There was looting. There were fires, including a fire at the police department's third precinct, home to the four officers fired after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz said the world is watching the visceral pain in response to Floyd's death, and he urged people to come together to restore peace. I understand that. And I will not patronize you as a white man without living those those lived experiences of how very difficult that is. But I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard, not those who throw firebombs into businesses that are communities of colors have worked so hard to build. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And and Morgan, Officer Derek Chauvin charged, arrested. What is the reaction there uh, in Minneapolis today? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. We know the word of Chauvin's arrest has made its way through this crowd here, but uh, we're not seeing the numbers that we did yesterday, and we're also not seeing that, mm-hmm. uh, that tension necessarily that we witnessed uh, with the hundreds of people gathering uh, near some of the businesses behind me. I can say that one of the reasons behind that is probably this increased police presence, and I'll just kind of let you take a look. These are state patrol officers that came in early this morning uh, and established a very wide perimeter around some of the more damaged areas here in Minneapolis. And through the better part of yesterday evening and well into the night, um, there was no sign of any police presence per se uh, or National Guard. And we know that the governor signed that proclamation yesterday, allowing the National Guard to, to come in and help is needed. Uh, but we really didn't see that resource being used until today. And you can see that police are out here in mass uh, letting firefighters do their job uh, while also maintaining a, a perimeter, not just here in this area, but uh, well, well around that 10 block radius that was significantly damaged uh, over the past several days. So uh, as it stands right now, Chauvin's arrest uh, from those that I've spoken to here in the crowd, they say is a hopeful first step uh, towards achieving justice uh, in the death of George Floyd. Uh, but everyone's saying there's uh, much more to come. 
Those three other officers that were involved uh, in the death of mm -hmm. Floyd uh, have yet to be taken into custody. However, we are hearing from officials that charges do await them as well. Uh, so very much a, a watch and wait mentality here right now. Um, yeah. And everyone just kind of uh, taking a deep breath after so many days uh, of tension uh, in this community. Allison. Twitter now labeling another one of President Trump's tweets, this time a warning label on a tweet about the Minneapolis protests. President Trump tweeted, quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walz and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty and we will assume control. But when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Now, Twitter says that tweet violated its rules against glorifying violence. The first phrase there, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, dates back to the 1960s. Miami Police Chief Walter Headley used it to address his department's crackdown on black neighborhoods. Headley's words and his aggressive policing policies contributed to the city's race riots in the late 60s and were denounced by civil rights leaders. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joining me now. And Kelly, I want to talk uh, with you about those tweets in a moment. But first, uh, President Trump spoke this afternoon about U.S. relations with China, his first public remarks since the officer in George Floyd's case was charged with manslaughter and murder. Did the president weigh in here? He did not weigh in on the events in Minnesota at all, and that is really stunning because certainly the president has a power and megaphone larger than any scale and could have done so if he wanted to. He did have tweets late uh, in the hour before going out and speaking on China, which is, of course, an important topic and one that has a very significant ramifications. But at a point when uh, the country is experiencing a lot of pain over social justice issues, a lot of concern about the events in Minnesota involving the death of George Floyd, the charging of that officer, potential charges for other officers who were involved in that arrest, and all of the destruction and uh, pain that is being experienced by that community. The president did not take any questions and made no comments about that, instead sticking to his focus with some significant announcements regarding the U.S. relationship with China over Hong Kong and China's aggressive move. Uh, decades really ahead of schedule of taking over Hong Kong, which is supposed to be a part of China, but with its own uh, sort of autonomy. And it has, of course, been a place that is important to the financial markets and a place where some of the heavy hand of China is typically not present with surveillance and so forth. The president saying the special status the U.S. has with Hong Kong is being terminated and the U.S. is stepping away from its responsibilities and its involvement with the World Health Organization. Organization. That is something the president has been hinting at for weeks now, blaming the World Health Organization for not properly warning the U.S. and other countries about the devastating effects of the Wuhan virus at the time in Wuhan itself uh, in those early days and how that virus then, of course, has spread and has become COVID-19 as we all know it now. So these are significant events, but it also casts the president as being in his own lane, dealing with an issue that he considers important and tuning out everything that was happening with Minnesota in terms of his ability to speak directly to the public with that Rose Garden event. Allison? Uh, Kelly, let's talk about the tweets from President Trump today. The White House backed the president. They retweeted him. That also got a warning. Do we know if the president intended to quote Headley there? Uh, is the White House saying anything about those tweets? We're not getting any specifics on that. Certainly the president at age 73 lived through that era and it was perhaps a phrase familiar to him. It is hard to imagine that he was specifically quoting that uh, police chief because of the obvious uh, racial tones of violence that would not be what any American president would want to do. And yet the president has done a lot of questionable things when it comes to Twitter and his uh, speaking to the public through that platform. He also then then tweeted about sort of an adjustment saying that looting leads to shooting was not so much about a police chief, as you've just outlined the history, but that the volatile nature of these events when protests 
take on violence, that there can be uh, what might not have been intended, person-on-person -person violence, not police on individuals in the community, and suggesting that that's what he was referring to, that there was someone shot in Minnesota as a consequence of the demonstrations and protests that grew more violent with fires and vandalism and looting. So it is hard to imagine the president wouldn't have understood the context of that phrase and its volatile racial nature, yet he used it anyway and then try to uh, soften it, perhaps, or explain it in a way uh, to uh, to soften its impact. But that's the kind of thing that reporters certainly would have liked to have had the president address in the Rose Garden, and will certainly want to ask him at other opportunities where the president is in front of the media uh, in order to explain that. There are real issues happening in Minnesota that sort of call out for presidential leadership. The president opted not to take that moment, instead keeping his focus on China. Allison? Kelly, the president also singled out uh, the mayor of Minneapolis for being, quote, weak and showing a total lack of leadership. Uh, here's how the mayor fired back. Donald Trump knows nothing about the strength of Minneapolis. We are strong as hell. Is this a difficult time period? Yes. But you better be damn sure that we're going to get through this. Kelly, the president has attacked the mayor before. For people who aren't familiar, could you tell us a little bit about their relationship? Well, this is a kind of tension that the, the president has often leveled on local officials. Of course, uh, Mayor Fry is a Democrat and the president. Remember, in the context of what in many other years, we, we'd be talking campaign politics. It's an election year, just a few months, uh, really, until the heat of the fall election. And Minnesota is one of the states where President Trump narrowly lost in 26, and his campaign has set its sights on trying to win Minnesota, put that into all of this context as well. And the president has had a tense relationship there. And this is the kind of thing where uh, people on the ground, in the community, people who call Minnesota home, will try to assess what they think of the president's conduct, the mayor's conduct, and Governor Walls. Now, President Trump did acknowledge speaking to Governor Walls and talking about wanting to be supportive with any uh, sort of federal resources that could be brought to bear. But there will be a real test here over the next days about the tone and is it the right time to be criticizing local officials when it comes to uh, they're in the moment of kind of the heat of the crisis. And that is perhaps not helpful uh, from the federal government. Instead, often the federal government is there as backup to try to provide help. This is a test of leadership for the president, as it is for the mayor and the governor. And the public will certainly uh, make a decision on how they think each of these different elected officials are handling this crisis. Allison? Quite a test of leadership. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, the man seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck, arrested, charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams is with me now from Washington. And Pete, could you talk us through the charges here? Sure. So um, basically one charge adds one other element that the other one doesn't have. The manslaughter charge. Manslaughter is okay. a common charge in many states. It's basically unintentional killing of another person. Uh, through negligence or carelessness or something like that. Now, this is a second-degree manslaughter charge, um, which basically says creating an unreasonable risk and taking a chance of causing death. And then in addition to that, there's a charge, a more serious charge, of third-degree murder. Now, that is an uncommon statute. Not many states have it. It's basically an unintentional killing with, as the statute says, using somewhat antiquated language, with a depraved state of mind and a disregard for the personal safety of others. And what the probable cause statement says here now that's, that's uh, attached to the charges, it says that uh, at first uh, George Floyd was compliant when they tried to arrest him, but when they wanted to put him in the squad car, he stiffened up, said he was claustrophobic, struggled with the officers, intentionally fell down, they say, said he was not going to get in the car, refused to stand still, and while standing outside the car, the charges say, he began saying and repeating that he couldn't breathe. Then he went down on the ground. He's still handcuffed, face down, and he keeps saying, I can't breathe, multiple times, according to the uh, charges, and said, Mama, and please, as well. Now, the charges say that the officer who was charged with this, Officer Derek Chauvin, 
had his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, eight minutes and 46 seconds in total. And it says that he continued to hold his knee on it for two of those, uh, almost three of those minutes after Mr. Floyd was non-responsive. And it also says in the last sentence of the charging documents, police are trained that this type of restraint with a subject in a prone position is inherently dangerous. And the state officials have said they don't train in the use of putting a knee on someone's neck. Now, I will also say this. Uh, for the last 15 or 20 years, there has been uh, law enforcement training material that says when you put someone down on the ground prone, meaning they're face down mm -hmm. with their hands behind their back, right. and then you put pressure on their back or their neck, it increases the risk that they won't be able to breathe and they could suffocate. And there have been many cases uh, where the police are either uh, a police are either found guilty of doing something wrong or more often there's a settlement between the police department, the city or the state and the family of the victim uh, the, in which cash is paid out, uh, you know, can be huge damages paid out. There have been some in Minnesota just a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, all around the country, you see this happen a lot. So it is a risky maneuver. And what police officials will tell you is that the training is it's common to arrest people in that position to, to get them under control. But once you have them cuffed, and once they are no longer resistant, you roll them onto their side or you get them to sit up or even stand up. After all, right. the experts will tell you the, ob the, the obligation of the police, once they make the arrest, is to get the person safely either to jail or to the hospital. And obviously that's not what happened here. Uh, Pete, thanks for explaining uh, this in such an expert way. I mean, it, it's so Basic, I can, as you describe what it's like for someone to be prone and have a, a knee on their neck, I, I found myself catching my breath. You just can imagine how difficult sure. it is to breathe in this situation. Uh, what is next now? I mean, people were, were uh, protesters were waiting uh, to see if uh, Chauvin would be arrested and charged. What happens next for him in this process? And, and then how about the other three officers? Are we expecting that they could potentially face charges here? It's possible. Uh, I don't really know much about the other three. I mean, uh, some police officials have said they found it very disturbing that the other officers simply stood around when George Floyd was in such yeah. obvious distress and didn't do anything or try to intervene. Now, what the, whether there's a statutory obligation for them to do so, what the criminal offense would be, I don't know. Um, the, the next step would right. be George Floyd is uh, George Chauvin is already in. I'm sorry, uh, Derek Chauvin is already in custody. Derek Chauvin. Uh, he'll, mm -hmm. he'll be going through the court procedure. Now, we have to see whether the federal government will file any charges, any civil rights charges. We always assumed that the state would go first because the only uh, the state has a lot of statutes at its disposal for cases like this. Uh, the, the federal government does not. Uh, so the only option for the federal government would be to charge someone in this situation with violating uh, civil rights. And that is a very hard case to prove because you have to prove that an officer uh, used unreasonable force and knew it was unreasonable and did so on purpose. It's, it's relatively easy to, to prove the first part. It's very hard to prove what the officer's state of mind was. And that's why yeah. you so often see in right. these cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, you name it, uh, uh, many other cases uh, where people have been uh, killed by police in custody that the feds try to make a case and can't. So we always assume that state would go first, whether the federal government will or not, we'll have to see. All right, Pete Williams, thanks so much. You bet. At least seven people shot in Louisville, Kentucky last night. Protesters there were rallying against the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. She was killed in a police raid of her apartment back in March. Joining me now, Louisville's Wave 3 news anchor and reporter, Taylor Durden. Taylor, great to have you. Uh, after a violent night, could you tell us what it's like there in Louisville today? How are folks doing? Yeah, you know, Allison, people are waking up this morning. If they were downtown or near downtown at all, it looked very different than it had yesterday morning. Uh, when I was there last night, I can tell you that as things started to diminish, people weren't really around anymore because it started to rain. So at that time, a lot of the protesters decided to go home. There was trash all over downtown. Police were still there in their gear, their riot gear, kind of blocking off intersections. But this morning, people are waking up to big holes in buildings. They're waking up to damage to cars, broken 
broken windows, several different buildings, including the police department, uh, one of the statues in front of Metro Hall in downtown Louisville, also damaged. They had, protesters had ripped the arm off of King Louis um, there. And so people are waking up to a very different downtown. And right now, police are still down there right now, just keeping an eye on this scene. They are expected to possibly have people out there again tonight. And so that's kind of what we're seeing right now, Allison. Yeah, at least seven people shot there. What can you tell us, if anything, about the shooting victims? What do you know? So we haven't been told much about the shooting victims, but we do know that police mm -hmm. tell us that police did not fire their weapons at all. Um, they're saying that it's from people in the crowd. Police said that they didn't start doing anything with tear gas or any kind of um, pepper bullets or anything like that um, until they heard those gunshots. At first, there were two people shot. We started hearing that pretty early on. Um, we've had some other reporters who were on the scene that could see it from afar. Um, and a lot of people just scattering at that point. You hear the gunshots, obviously you're going to run. Uh, we had reporters there on the scene that also went and ducked for cover. Um, and then a after that, we started hearing the count just continuing to go up. We know that at least two, one person last night was in critical condition. I don't know if that condition has changed. Uh, but we do know that um, two people are in stable condition at the hospital. All seven of them were taken to the hospital. Hospital, but as of now, they all seem to be okay. So that is some good news. Taylor, how is the city handling the situation there today? Are they preparing for more protests over the weekend? Uh, you know, I think so. Um, it sounds like from what we're yeah. hearing here that they are anticipating something potentially tonight and into the weekend as well. I think a lot of people um, hearing about last night there's a lot of tension here. I mean, for two months, people wanted to hear the name Breonna Taylor, and they didn't. And so the, the fact that people are saying that, her family is just happy that people are saying it. They told us um, last night and even today that they're upset that things took a turn. Initially, the, the protest was peaceful for several hours, and then there was a shift where some of the violence started, some of the damage started happening. That's something that her family says they don't want to see. They don't want that to happen. They want this to be peaceful. They do want her name out there. They're happy happy that people are saying her name, but they don't want this to be a, a violent kind of a situation, Allison. All right, Taylor, thank you so much. Taylor Jordan, anchor and reporter for Wave 3 News. Great to have you with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
this country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage. Answers to your questions. Insight from medical experts. And up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. George Floyd's death sparking protests across the country. Denver went into lockdown yesterday after someone there fired a gun near a peaceful protest. Protesters in Columbus, Ohio, charged the state capitol. And more demonstrations are expected there today. And protesters are also rallying in New York for a second day. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is there. And Ron, uh, what's happening where you are in the city? Well, Allison, there's a crowd of several dozen protesters that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's supposed to start at 4 o'clock, but it's starting early. And they've moved down here, and they are converging on the New York Criminal Court building and the district attorney's office here. You can see there's a big NYPD police presence on bikes all around this area. There are literally hundreds of police officers trying to make sure things stay under control. A little bit further down the street here, you can see... It looks like there are a couple of people who are here. Yesterday, there were 70 people arrested. There were confrontations. There were a couple of police officers who were injured, had concussions. Um, so the police were ready for this. And this all started happening in the last half hour or so. But you can see things are getting a little bit chaotic. The police, of course, are well prepared for these kinds of things. The protesters are here in support of protesters out in Minneapolis. They're also, this is a we can't breathe protest, which of course echoes Eric Gardner. The Gardner case happened six years ago, next month, July 2014. To this day, no officer has been charged with a crime in that case. And these protesters are very aware of that. You can see here, they're bringing out some guy who causing some problems. It's unsure whether what exactly he was doing down here, but um, clearly the police are not playing with this. They don't want any trouble back here. So just watching yeah. the situation, it's a very narrow street. And um, and again, it's um, the police are... You are unlawfully in the so this is also the police are concerned about not just crowd control during an incident here during a protest but of course this social distancing we're in the middle of a pandemic as well and that's not happening either so the police are saying that they are going to start arresting people for disorderly conduct if need be and you can see there's a lot of energy down here there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of resentment. And now you can see the, the police are really being adamant about um, clearing the street down here. Yeah, Ron, you can feel it, you can hear it, you can see it there for sure. Yeah, absolutely, make sure that you're in a safe place. This looks like a, a, a man who, he doesn't look like one of the, the protesters. They were much younger people. And um, this is an extreme situation here where they just carry this guy out. He looks to be in some distress. Now the police are picking him up by all and just uh, carrying him out. Okay, let's just get, let's get, a, understand where we are here. Let's. Get out of the orders. Get out of the street. All right, the cops are insisting that we get out of the street and on the sidewalk, trying to bring order here. Let's see if we can see what's on, what's going on down there a little bit. Um, um, because this is right, where we'll, the, we'll the heart of the protests are. We'll stick with you, Ron, just as long as you're in a safe are. place. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, we're in a safe place. This is a, this seems to be the heart of the protest. The police are drawing a firm line here where they are blocking the protest because the protesters are now moving, they're moving further on. And that seems to be what the police want is for them to keep moving and to go further on. We'll stay with it, see what happens out here. But, um, kind of a crazy situation all of a sudden. Allison? Yeah, uh, Ron, unbelievable. Uh, before I let you go, if you're able to stick with us, one thing you said that struck me, Eric Garner, six years ago, it's hard to believe uh, it has been that long. What else are, are folks there telling you as you speak with protesters there today? Well, there was some relief. There was some relief, obviously, when the officer, one of the officers out in Minneapolis was charged, because here it's been six years and there have been no charges. There was a, a state grand jury that looked at the Garner case. The federal prosecutors looked at this for five years, two administrations, the Obama administration, eventually the Trump administration. And it was just uh, July of last year that the attorney general decided that there would be no civil rights federal charges filed against the officer. The officer, Daniel Petaleo, was fired as a result of a NYPD internal disciplinary hearing. But there has not to this day been anyone held criminally responsible in the Eric Garner death. And so when things started happening out in Minnesota, it looked like that. It looked like that. Everyone was, was dreading that this case out there, the Floyd case, could go on. Here's another arrest. They're taking out another individual. Yeah. The police are not. Um, the police are not playing. The police do not want this to get out of control, and they are. They are. They are serious today. You can see over there across the street. There's a strong presence guarding the entrance to the courthouse. And that's the answer to the district attorney's mm -hmm. office as well. And now the, um, the police and the protesters are moving on down into Chinatown. More dense streets. More dense streets, more people. Um, we'll have to see, see where this goes. Run. We have seen protests in New York City before, uh, Union Square in particular, downtown, no stranger uh, to people expressing how they feel, uh, demands for justice, uh, uh, you name it. I mean, we talked about Eric Garner, but there have been cases before. How does what you're seeing today uh, uh, compare to protests you've covered in the past? You know, Allison, I hate to say it, but it has this feeling of deja vu all over again that, you know, the yeah. first big protest I can remember covering was out in Los Angeles after the Rodney King trial in the early 90s. Yeah. That's what, um, 30 years ago? Um, and that was, you know, there's yep. videotape there too. And everyone thought those officers would be convicted because of the videotape, but they weren't. Um, but, and that, that caused the LA uprising as it's called. Here's another person getting arrested there. They've got, um, the person's hands and restraints. Uh, it seems that the, there's a... It looks like the main crowd of the protesters have gone further up the street there. They're way down there. They're about three or four blocks ahead of us. And... Um, okay. But the police are, are blocking this area of the city off right here now as well. It's just, it's, it's, it's really chaotic down here. This was supposed to be a, 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 yeah. a, a protest in, a, in Foley Square. It was a, an area that was surrounded, cordoned off. There's another, that's at least the third or fourth person we've seen um, taken away. Here's another woman, young woman over here. Right up over here. And we can hear a, a, a announcement from the police telling people to not block the streets. And there's yet another arrest going on over there by that car. You can see it. Watch the car over there, guys. Why don't we can why don't we keep on going down? We're going to keep on going down and see what else we can see down here. Can't 
and you hear the uh, chant there now. It's uh, hands up. I was going to ask you, what are they chanting? The, um, anthem okay. from Ferguson. Hands up, don't shoot, which was the anthem rallying cry in Ferguson after the death of Michael Brown. Another case where yeah. a grand jury did not bring charges. The officer never faced charges. The federal government chose not to prosecute as well. These civil rights cases have a very high burden of proof threshold to convict an officer. Officers are given the benefit yeah. of the doubt because they are licensed and they are expected to use force. So to convict an officer of excessive force, deadly force, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. tough burden. And just looking at some statistics recently, it's, it's very rare still, you know, many, many years later, that officers are ever convicted in these kinds of cases. Let's see. Uh, let's get on the, we're going to get on the sidewalk out of here, as they're telling us to do. Trying to do this as well as keep my distance from everybody as well. Yeah, Ron, I wanted, wanted to ask you about that. I mean, this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, how is social distancing playing into the protest today? Is it at all? Believe me, Allison, it is forefront in my mind, in our crew's mind. We are trying to keep our distance and trying to do this as safely as possible. This is the last thing I expected to happen down here today. But you can see many of the folks in the crowd wearing masks. They're not six feet apart. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, we really want to just stay away from this and show you what's happening, yeah. but not get too close. It's just, um, yeah. but the police, you can see, have things under control. The police have, have really, they were out here. They knew this was coming. This had been advertised as, you know, there were, this was advertised as a march that was going to start at 4 o'clock. So the police are out here in force. I can see even more police reinforcements yeah. in that direction coming this way. And, and here we seem to have reached a, a point of standoff where the officers and that group are face to face. And uh, we seem to have hit a point now where here things are sort of calming, if I could use that word in this crazy context. Yeah, yeah. Ron, uh, we would stick with you even longer, uh, but but you are in demand today, so I have to let you go to some of our uh, other colleagues at NBC and MSNBC. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for your coverage today, whether you in the heart are in the heart of the coronavirus epidemic or uh, at the protests here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for bringing us to the biggest stories in New York these days. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Police brutality and race are, are quickly becoming top issues in the 2020 election in the wake of George Floyd's death. Joe Biden pouncing on President Trump for his response to the looters in Minnesota. The presumptive Democratic presidential nominee issuing a short but stern response to Trump's Twitter post. Enough. The former vice president calling for real leadership earlier today. This is no time for incendiary treats, tweets. It's no time to encourage violence. This is a national crisis. We need real leadership right now, leadership that will bring everyone to the table so we can take measures to root out systemic racism. We need justice for George Floyd. We need real police reform that hold cops to a higher standard that so many of them actually meet, that holds bad cops accountable that repairs relationship between law enforcement and the community they're sworn to protect. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli joining me now. And Mike, uh, it was a, a longer talk uh, from Joe Biden. What else did he have to say today? Well, Allison, the first thing that he actually said was that he had just spoken uh, with the family of George Floyd. That's significant because yeah. obviously we haven't heard much from the White House about this in terms of whether there's been any attempt to reach out to his family. Uh, but we, t we have talked about this often. Biden's campaign says that Joe Biden's superpower is empathy. And we know uh, just how much he has spent time on the campaign trail and then in, in his daily life, speaking with others who have experienced loss in his life. Tomorrow is, as a matter of fact, the fifth anniversary 
uh, of the death of his eldest son, Bo. So that was an interesting thing for him to make a point oh. of saying at the top. Um, but the larger point that he's made, not just in this uh, remarks that he delivered today, but in previous um, days as well, is he's talked about racism and these systemic inequalities having to do uh, with racism as an open wound in this country. And in, in his remarks today, he said that those of us who are in positions of power have a responsibility to do more uh, to address this, that our silence, our complacency makes us complicit in some of these issues, and that to, to move beyond this without taking and making hard choices uh, to try to do things on a policy front would only uh, further scab over, open, scab this open wound rather than uh, providing a long-term fix. And the one last thing that I would mention is it's interesting when he talked about the need for police reforms, and he said the need to hold bad cops accountable. Joe Biden is uh, somebody who throughout his career has styled himself as very much a law and order Democrat. He's touted his relationships with law enforcement and first responders repeatedly. So for, for him to make that kind of comment is not something he does lightly because he really values those relationships as well. Uh, Mike, the George Floyd case is also putting the spotlight back on Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who served as a prosecutor there. Uh, she's being criticized for not prosecuting the same cop seen kneeling on George Floyd in another case involving the fatal shooting of a man back in 2006. Uh, this is what she told MSNBC about it earlier today. That investigation continued into a time where I was already sworn into the U.S. Senate. I never declined the case. I have said repeatedly, back when I was the county attorney, the cases that we had involving officer involving shootings went to a grand jury. That was a true in every jurisdiction across our state, and that was true in many jurisdictions across the country. I think that was wrong now. I think it would have been much better if I took the responsibility and looked at the cases and made the decision myself. But let me make this clear. We did not blow off these cases. Mike Klobuchar is one of the contenders to be Biden's, Biden's VP. Uh, how does this affect her chances? Yeah, I mean, we so often talk about this vice presidential search process as if it's taking place in a vacuum, that Biden's simply going to be able to make a choice on the merits alone and not having to do with external events. And I think what this episode really emphasizes is that's not the case, uh, that very much what's happening in real time uh, around the country is going to be shaping Biden's thinking and the thinking of his team about who he chooses. And it's worth noting that already, even before the events of the past week in Minnesota, simply the news that Amy Klobuchar was being vetted was met with a lot of unease among some progressive activists who not only have issues with her as being yeah. a centrist as, as Joe Biden is, but because of her record in Minnesota as a prosecutor. They, they'd already thought that that was an issue. And now they're coming out today and saying this is disqualifying. Now, Andrea Mitchell, in that same interview, asked Klobuchar if this should maybe lead her to withdraw from consideration as Biden's potential running mate. And she said that's a decision that Joe Biden has to make. But she was clearly looking for an opportunity to defend her record in this in this score. The Biden mm -hmm. campaign not addressing this at all, of course, as they haven't been addressing any details about his vice presidential search process. Uh, Mike, does this also bring up concerns for the Biden campaign about his own record on racial issues and that those could come under fire again? Yeah, I'll remind you that one week ago at this time, we were talking about the interview that Biden had just done with The Breakfast Club. And there was one element of that yeah. interview, of course, yep. that got a lot of attention, what he had to say at the end about you ain't yes. black if you can't see the difference between me and Trump. But the rest of that interview really included a, a, a long discussion about his uh, role in authoring the 1994 crime bill. And I think it's likely that we're going to see a discussion as this case in Minnesota continues, whether or not the elements of that crime bill necessarily uh, have a factor here. Uh, but the other point, which is interesting, having spoken today with a number of outside groups who are among those who have been pressuring Joe Biden to pick a woman of color as his running mate, is to say that it's less actually about simply making sure that you check a box, that you have diversity for diversity's sake. It's really more important that you have a, a diversity of perspectives and views, but also a record on the issues that yes. are important to them. And so for Biden, and it's not necessarily important that he just choose a woman of color. They said there, there are women, there are white women that he could choose from who might actually even be better on these issues than Biden himself in his past, but also some of the other contenders. And so this is all something that I think is going to be part of the discussion going forward. 
Yeah, it's not just optics, it's perspective for sure. Uh, Mike, one last question for you. Former President Obama also issued a statement on the Minneapolis protests today. What is he saying? Yeah, interesting always to hear from the former president, given how rarely, uh, even if it's more frequently of late, he chooses to engage on these kinds of issues. Remember, I was covering the White House uh, when we saw riots in Baltimore and, of course, the situation in Ferguson. And we saw really how the president at the time grappled with these situations. In his statement today, he talks about how we're all looking forward to a new normal as states begin to really reopen uh, now following the pandemic, which we're still very much grappling with. Uh, but he said that sense of normalcy, yeah. we also have to understand, uh, is not very normal for a lot of people, that there are, there are people of color, especially, who are dealing uh, with the kinds of uh, systemic issues that we see here. And he said it's a, it's a coming upon all of us of, in good faith to come together and have a discussion. That's very much uh, classic Obama in a lot of ways, how he tried to have discussions about these issues when he was in office and now doing the same uh, from the outside. All right, Mike Memley, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Allison. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Protesters in George Floyd's hometown of Houston are now taking to the streets. Members of Black Lives Matter Houston rallying at Houston City Hall. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joining me now from Houston. Priscilla, we can hear the crowds chanting. Tell us what's happening there now. Yeah. Allison, well, easily a few thousand people have turned out today to protest and rally in honor of George Floyd. As you mentioned, he is from Houston. He grew up and went to high school just a few miles from here. And so you've got all these people out here, a lot of signs. Uh, there's one in particular that actually talks about the fact that this pandemic isn't the only thing that's killing black people. Racism is also a huge problem right now. Folks calling for the police to be prosecuted. We heard a chant earlier uh, this afternoon that said, you know, an arrest is not enough. They want to see convictions happen here. And, you know, this seems to, uh, of the people that I've spoken to, it seems like a very personal issue for them. Some people said that it felt like when that officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck, it was as though he had his knee on, on their necks. Um, and just also hearing from people that this is the community where uh, George Floyd grew up and they really feel like, you know, he's given, he's created, given so much to the fabric of this community. And it was important for them to come out today and protest that. We've got some speeches going on over in this area. And so you hear some of the 
chanting and things like that rising up from there. But most of the folks who are back here can't even necessarily hear that. So they're really operating on their own accord with their chants and their signs. And I will say that they've handed out masks at the beginning of this protest. Most of the folks here are in masks. So also aware that there is a pandemic going on, but that wasn't going to stop them from coming out today uh, to rally about this. Allison. Yeah, Priscilla, I was going to ask you a little more about the nature of those protests today. If you got the sense that people uh, were socially distant, if you felt like they were peaceful in nature, uh, if you could describe a little more just sort of what the energy is like there today. Yeah, I mean, I think early on this rally actually got started about a half hour early because people were getting so impassioned and delivering mm -hmm. these passionate speeches. And so folks decided to start marching early from the park down here to City Hall. We haven't seen a lot of distancing. There's obviously not a lot of space for that when you've got thousands of people out. But folks are wearing those masks, as you can see. Um, and, you know, the, the crowd has thinned out a little bit and folks have been able to create some space. Um, but I mean, folks are really are really passionate about it. And there, you know, the news came down just a little bit before this, that the officer had been arrested and folks were happy to hear that. But they still want to know. President Trump is speaking with business executives about their plans to reopen. Let's listen in. We all saw what we saw, and uh, it's uh, very hard to even conceive of anything other than what we did see should never happen, should never be allowed to happen, a thing like that. But we're determined that justice be served. And uh, I spoke to members of the family, terrific people, and we'll be reporting as time goes by. Uh, we think that uh, we also have to make the statement, and it's very important that uh, we have peaceful protesters, and support the rights for peaceful protesters. We can't allow a situation like happened in Minneapolis to descend further into lawless anarchy and chaos. And we understand that very well. It's uh, very important, I believe, to the family, to everybody, that the memory of George Floyd be a perfect memory. Let it be a perfect memory. The looters should not be allowed to drown out the voices of so many peaceful protesters. They hurt so badly what is happening, and it's uh, so bad for the state and for that great city. So we are working very closely with the Justice Department. We're working with local law enforcement. We're working with everybody, and we're speaking with the family. And hopefully everything can be uh, fairly taken care of. I understand the hurt. I understand the pain. People have uh, really been through a lot. The family of George is entitled to justice, and the people of Minnesota are entitled to live in safety. Law and order will prevail. The Americans will honor the memory of George and uh, the Floyd family. It's very important to us. It's very important to me to see that Everything is taken care of properly. It's a horrible, horrible situation. And uh, so we'll be reporting back in due course and as quickly as possible. I'm pleased to welcome American industry leaders to the White House as we continue to safely reopen America. We're glad to be joined by Jeff Pilati of Wyndham Hotel. And resorts, uh, Wyndham Hotels have been a uh, really terrific company over the years. Brian Goldner of Hasbro, Dave Hoffman of Duncan Brands, Gary Kelly of Southwest Airlines, really good jobs they've done. Rodney McMullen of Kroger, thanks, Rodney. Oscar Munoz, United, thank you, Oscar, United Airlines. Brad Smith of Microsoft, that stock has done very well, I will say. Great job. Great job. Sonia Sengal of Gap. And uh, thank you very much. Also with us are Secretary of Treasury Steve Mnuchin and Secretary of Labor Jean Scalia. Our nation continues to mourn for the lives claimed by the virus and grieve for the families who have lost loved ones. We continue to battle the invisible enemy. 
We're directing the full resources and support of the federal government to safeguard high-risk populations, especially in nursing homes. We've been a very powerful strategy on nursing homes for quite a while. The best strategy for public health is to aggressively protect the most vulnerable while allowing younger and healthier Americans to work safely. Nationwide hospitalizations, new cases and deaths are all declining. We are tracking cases and hospitalizations daily, and states are demonstrating their ability to rapidly identify and contain new outbreaks. Our testing is the best in the world. We've now surpassed 15 million tests, which is much more than any other country by a factor of many times. We've completed over 15 million, and uh, that is, uh, I think we can say that's a record by a lot. And we're going to give you a big report on testing tomorrow. We have new tests coming out that are uh, above and beyond anything that anybody would have thought even possible just a couple of months ago. In many places, we've uh, had more tests available than people seeking them, uh, Florida and others have uh, said that they have testing and they, uh, they don't have enough people to take the test. So we've come a long way. We started with an empty cupboard. We didn't have a lot that we inherited. And uh, we are, I think, really, they've stepped up to the plate on ventilators, on tests, and on equipment and gowns and everything else, gloves. If you look at uh, masks, everybody has masks now. To maintain the health and safety of our society. We must also maintain the health of our economy. There's a reason why our nation's life expectancy is closely correlated with economic development. A never-ending shutdown would increase, not reduce the total loss of life in the United States while failing to focus resources on the most vulnerable. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of the invisible enemy. A lot of progress. A lot of things have happened that have uh, taught us a lot. Nobody's ever seen anything like this, and there certainly hasn't been anything like this since over 100 years, 1917. I want to thank all of these great companies for being here and representing their company and themselves and our country so well. We're going to be having a discussion with the companies as to suggestions they have. We think we're going to have a very strong opening, which has just started, really. We had the greatest economy in history of any country, not just ours. The greatest in history. We had the best employment numbers that we've ever had. We've had the best uh, numbers in every way, whether it's uh, the biggest tax cuts, the greatest regulation cuts of any president. Nobody's even come close. We've rebuilt our military. We have the strongest military we've ever had. New equipment coming in all the time. A lot of it You've been listening to President Trump at a roundtable with industry executives talking about reopening their businesses. But at the start, he did address the George Floyd case, saying that Floyd's memory should not be tainted by the violence in Minneapolis. We'll have much more on this in just a bit. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris, and you are watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is following the very latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, give us an update. Starting off our headlines uh, this hour with news out of Minneapolis. The officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Take a listen to the county attorney, Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third-degree murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges later. In a statement, uh, Floyd's family and his attorney called it a, quote, overdue step on the road to justice and added they expected a first-degree murder charge. According to NBC's Tom Winter, charging documents say the former officer held his knee on Floyd's neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd was unresponsive. Floyd's death was spar has sparked outcry in cities across the country. Crowds of people gathered in Manhattan this evening. At least 70 people were arrested at, at protests in the city yesterday. That's according to our affiliate there. Demonstrations were also planned in Boston, Atlanta, and several other cities. 
Now, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo today saying New York City is on track to reopen June 8th as long as certain criteria are met. Those metrics relate to the city's hospital capacity and contact tracing capabilities. Now, while entering phase one will likely be welcome news to some New Yorkers, things may look a little different. Here's Governor Cuomo. Uh, and it's going to be different. It is reopening to a new normal. It's a safer normal. People will be wearing masks. People will be socially distanced. Now from NBC's Erica Edwards, a constant question is how early did coronavirus start spreading in the United States? Well, the CDC reporting today new estimates that it started as early as late January. That's before certain measures were taken by the White House to curb the spread uh, of coronavirus. And as for questions around whether the virus had arrived in the U.S. as early as November or December, the deputy director for infectious diseases said, quote, we looked for evidence of early widespread transmission and could not confirm it. At least 102,000 people in the United States have now died at the hands of COVID-19. President Trump today announcing the United States will cut ties with the World Health Organization, a move that will likely draw criticism from public health experts and American, American allies. That's from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has repeatedly blamed the agency for its response to the pandemic. Take a quick listen to the president earlier. Because they have failed to make the requested and greatly needed reforms, we will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization and redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. Now, the president also announcing today he would be taking steps to revoke Hong Kong's special trade status with the U.S. following China's move to impose a national security law that undermines the territory's autonomy. Trump said he would be directing his administration to, quote, begin the process of eliminating policy exemptions that give Hong Kong different and special treatment. He also added that the U.S. would be taking steps to sanction Chinese officials as well as Hong Kong officials that were directly or indirectly involved. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. Lots of news there on this Friday. Allison, back to you. Yeah, it has been quite a news day. Alexa, thank you so much. An arrest and charges in Minnesota today. Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer, seen here kneeling on George Floyd's neck before his death, charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Meanwhile, the city bracing for another night of violent protests. It's fourth in a row. Businesses have been looted here, buildings set on fire, including the police department's third precinct. That's home to the four officers who were let go after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz is asking for peace. Us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard. And I refuse to have it take away the attention of the stain that we need to be working on. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And Morgan, how are people there reacting to the charges? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. It really is a mixed bag, depending upon who you talk to upon hearing the news of Derek Chauvin's arrest. I spoke to two African-American gentlemen who traveled here from St. Paul today to try to help clean up this area. And they say this is a hopeful first step towards justice uh, with his arrest and the potential arrest of those other three officers who were involved in the death of George Floyd. In the meantime, we're standing in this crowd right now that's beginning to grow in size like we've seen over the past several days uh, here just a couple blocks away from that third precinct police station. And throughout uh, this crowd, we've heard uh, basically people saying that third degree murder is not enough. That's merely a slap on the wrist and that's not actual justice uh, that they hope comes against these police officers they believe murdered George Floyd. So the mood here is uh, one of, I guess, cautious optimism, you could almost say, from people uh, hoping to see uh, steps towards justice being taken, uh, but acknowledging that with just one officer in custody, they know that there's uh, still much uh, longer road ahead when it comes to justice. Allison? Yeah. Morgan, police didn't seem entirely prepared for the widespread protests that happened there last night. Uh, has that changed? Do they seem to be in a better position tonight? 
Uh, that's certainly what they hope, Allison. We do know that last night um, yeah. we haven't heard the exact details on what the strategy was because we weren't able to see uh, really any police or National Guard uh, in or around the police station uh, after midnight, especially when that crowd made its way into that building and essentially had free reign of about a 10 block uh, radius where so much damage took place. This is a little bit different today. Uh, we're standing here uh, among this crowd about 10 yards behind me. If you can push in, you can see that there is a line of state patrol officers uh, that have really been in Minneapolis in this area since early this morning when they established a very wide perimeter here, especially surrounding those heavily damaged areas, allowing firefighters to get in there, try to put out some of those hot spots because due to the presence of that crowd, uh, they were unable to do so uh, really for the majority of last night. So these state patrol officers combined with National Guard uh, makes for a much more visible presence here uh, in this neighborhood for sure. Allison. Morgan, I know you've spoken with some of the activists there. What else are they telling you about why it was so important to be there? You know, one of the main reasons people came here today, Allison, wasn't just to witness the aftermath firsthand, but it was to hopefully uh, make it to where people didn't just see this devastation on television and think that that's what this was all about. Uh, the two young men I spoke to who came from St. Paul, they go to the same church. Uh, they had enlisted friends to come here and volunteer to try to pick up some of the mess that was caused uh, as a result of the looting and of the vandalism last night. Uh, they were very passionate about uh, trying to send a message that isn't just one of violence. Uh, and they had this to say in an interview. Take a listen. I think that what's unfortunate is when people peacefully protest and their protest isn't heard, if officials don't respond, then this, this scene right here eclipses it. It kind of just shuts the message out. But if peaceful protest doesn't get answers, if it doesn't bring awareness, and you don't offer any other alternative. You let people just be destructive. So that's certainly the hope, Allison. They have a message they want to send out. They know it's not going to be an easy solution and that it will take time more than anything. And so that is a, a little bit of hope amidst the heartbreak here in Minneapolis. Allison? Yeah, Morgan, can we talk a little bit more about the looting, the fires, the destruction that community is dealing with today? I imagine so many people are, are walking out into the streets and seeing shops damaged and property of theirs damaged and, and just overwhelmed by the destruction. It, absolutely. And I think to, to watch it on television, as so many people did last night when they saw those buildings one after another go up in flames, it did draw a fair amount of people from the surrounding area who essentially just came here to witness what happened firsthand because they couldn't believe it uh, when they saw it on television last night. It has been a very bleak day today uh, because just as we saw from Wednesday night into Thursday, there was significantly more damage from Thursday night into Friday. Uh, and one of the most stark uh, images that I witnessed was upon arriving in Minneapolis yesterday morning, I saw a liquor store that had the owner outside boarding up the windows with plywood uh, just as a precaution. He wasn't impacted the prior night. I asked him if he was going to stay through the night to make sure his property was OK. He said, absolutely not. And it was a good thing that he wasn't there because when we drove by today, that business, uh, just a shell of what it was, burned out, windows smashed in. Uh, just one of so many buildings that continued to see uh, that, that were damaged last night. And so you have a crowd here that's frustrated that those other officers haven't been taken into custody. You also have people that live here in Minneapolis who are just a few blocks away in a, a residential area, walking out of their homes just a few blocks to witness smoke-filled skies and buildings that are still on fire. Uh, so it's a very interesting juxtaposition uh, between kind of this movement uh, and the folks who call this area home uh, trying to wrap their heads around all of it, uh, as we all are. Allison? Absolutely. Morgan Chesky in Minneapolis, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. President Trump spoke moments ago expressing condolences to George Floyd's family. The president saying uh, that he vows uh, that the federal there will be a federal investigation into the Floyd case. 
terrible event, terrible, terrible thing that happened. I've asked that the Department of Justice expedite the federal investigation into his death and do it immediately, do it as quickly as absolutely possible. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joining me now. And Kelly, in his earlier Rose Garden briefing, the president didn't say a word about the situation in Minnesota. He finally addressed it at his roundtable this afternoon. What else did he say? Well, this appears to be a situation where the president wanted to separate the remarks, to have the Rose Garden event be about China, which is significant in its own way, and then to begin this roundtable with uh, lengthy remarks where he offered his condolences to the Floyd family, talked about having spoken to members of George Floyd's family. As you played there, a short clip that included the president talking about urging the Department of Justice to swiftly examine the events that have happened to see if there are any federal civil rights matters that could be pursued against the officers. We know that today uh, the first charges against one of the officers have been filed with officials in Minnesota saying it's possible charges would also uh, be brought against other officers. The president also talked about the importance of the environment uh, that has really taken hold beyond the events directly related to George Floyd to the larger community, as Morgan was just explaining to us with the protests, the fires, the uh, vandalism and rioting, and the president calling for calm. So these are the most lengthy comments from President Trump on this. I was with him on Wednesday when we were in Florida. He was there for the launch that did not happen. And I asked him about the Floyd case. It was the first time that he spoke about this publicly. He said that he had seen the video and called it a very, very sad and horrific uh, set of actions. Today, going further, we don't yet know why the president chose not to do this during the Rose Garden when there were lots of reporters expecting to have a chance to ask questions. Uh, there are reporters, a smaller group, who are with him at this ongoing event that's still happening dealing with uh, coronavirus with a number of guests there. That's where the president decided to make these specific remarks about Minnesota, the Floyd family, and the larger social issues. Undoubtedly, he will get some questions. Whether he entertains those questions or not remains to be seen. But this is one of those times when you have an American city going through a crisis is literally on fire, uh, questions about social justice, policing practices, and all of the uh, community impact on people who live in Minnesota, as well as other protests that have uh, responded to this around the country. And uh, the president needing to step forward and say something. We've seen President uh, Barack Obama, former president, speaking out on Twitter, saying this cannot be normal. We've seen Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, speak about this, also saying that he had uh, had a phone conversation with members of the Floyd family. So the president is now putting himself involved in this in a way where he is siding with the family, he says, and also calling for peace and responsibility in Minnesota. What will be a real test now is the tone the president uses. He got uh, a lot of criticism for some of the tweets where he used a phrase that echoes back to the 1960s and policing during times of civil unrest. The If there is looting, there will be shooting, a very volatile phrase. He'd used that on Twitter and then tried to explain that it wasn't about police action, he claimed that it was about the uh, inherent risks when there is demonstration and violence, uh, that lives can be in jeopardy or taken by violence if protest becomes so volatile that it spills into criminal activity as well. So the president is now on record and is saying that the Department of Justice will take action, that this is a local matter, but one where the federal government has a role to play as well. And many will wonder if the tone and the words of the president uh, will speak to these communities and if that will be viewed as helping the situation or how people will accept his words. That's something we'll be tracking going forward. Allison? Kelly, the president also today making some pretty big announcements about Hong Kong and the World, World Health Organization, rather. Could you tell us about those? On a different day, Allison, these would be huge, significant news-breaking events. Absolutely. With the president. 
And it's all, of course, about context, where uh, the United States is uh, certainly concerned about what's happening and the impact of Minnesota. Uh, this is also an important foreign policy development for the president, effectively breaking with China over its uh, exerting new control over Hong Kong, which is supposed to have autonomy uh, for decades to come under longstanding agreements, that it is a part of China but has some autonomy. Uh, the president saying that special relationships that the U.S. has had with Hong Kong Kong, uh, will be severed because of that. And he's also withdrawing the United States from the World Health Organization, which is a stunning move in the pandemic that we continue to experience. The U.S. had been the largest donor nation to the World Health Organization. The president has complained loudly that they, he believes that the World Health Organization did not do enough to warn other nations about the dangers of the COVID-19 virus and that it was, in, in the president's view, too sympathetic to China, which the president argues was concealing the nature of uh, the outbreak and the danger of human transmission and so forth. Not having U.S. funding to the World Health Organization will certainly draw criticism. The president is saying those funds can be directed to other organizations that can help on public health matters around the world. But this is a very notable set of moves from the White House, uh, a cold war is what China officials say is happening between the U.S. and China, these two great economic powers. Certainly, the president added to that today. And then his moves on the World Health Organization are also quite notable, given that uh, the country is still dealing with this illness. Allison? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. It's good to be with you. Derek Chauvin, the officer at the center of George Floyd's death, charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter today. A state charging documents allege that the former Minneapolis police officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd became non-responsive. NBC News investigations correspondent Tom Winter joining me now. And Tom, uh, a, a big day here in this case. Walk us through mm. the charges here. Uh, right. So uh, what we received today is charges against Chauvin. As you said, uh, we've got a second, a third degree uh, murder charge as well as a second degree manslaughter charge. Now, the third degree uh, murder charge carries a maximum penalty of 25 years. That's the officer that you see there uh, in that uh, still frame of the video that, of course, we've all seen at this point. The manslaughter charges ca uh, carries a, a maximum of 10 years in prison. Essentially, what prosecutors are saying here is that this officer officer um, committed this crime, and they allegedly committed his crime because he showed an indifference uh, to his life. So essentially here, you're, you're not saying that this is a premeditated murder, but because of the actions that this officer took, um, that it is a crime because he deprived him of his life, and it was because of the officer's actions. So that's kind of the, the legal definition or, or the technical factors, if you will. Uh, we know from the probable cause affidavit for, for police to make the arrest um, that essentially what happened here is he he kept his knee on his neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after another officer told him, hey, I don't think he has a pulse. Uh, and those other officers didn't do anything either, according to the to the complaint. In total, it was almost nine minutes that he had his neck, uh, his knee on his uh, neck, uh, George Floyd's neck. And I think the important thing here, Allison, is that um, even though they said at different points George Floyd uh, interfered with and resisted arrest. Uh, the, the kind of the key component here is that once he was uh, in a non-responsive state, that they kept that going forward. On top of that, the use of force yeah. guide in the Minneapolis Police Department makes it pretty clear uh, that this is a technique to be used if you put somebody into an unconscious position when they're actively resisting arrest. And obviously, when somebody uh, doesn't have a pulse, uh, they can't be actively resisting arrest. So um, uh, a set of uh, pretty damning yeah. facts here for the officer that was charged today. Absolutely, Tom. Do we have any sense at this stage of what kind of a sentence these charges could carry? Yeah, so uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, for the manslaughter charge, uh, looking at uh, upwards of 10 years. Uh, and then for the uh, okay. second or third degree murder charge, excuse me, uh, we're looking at uh, up to 25 years and obviously fines and all sorts of other issues associated with it. Um, what's not mm -hmm. clear to us, and we're still trying to get the details, whether or not 
uh, those sentences can be stacked. Typically, in a state case, they can't. What I mean by that is, can they add the 25 plus the 10? No, they would probably be uh, separate and serve concurrently here. But uh, but we're a long ways uh, away from that. And, uh, you know, we could be looking at other charges, too. Yes, I know it is a, a long journey here. I know it's also, though, a question uh, that people have about what those charges could potentially mean in terms of uh, sentence or jail time. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, as you said, Tom, still a long way to go. Uh, civil rights right. attorney Benjamin Crump released a statement calling on prosecutors to charge Chauvin with first degree murder. Why did the state attorney decide to go for third degree murder? A charge a lot of people uh, haven't heard before instead. Right. So there's all sorts of varying levels of uh, murder. And in Minnesota and in the Minnesota laws and regulations that are obviously governing this, um, when you go for first degree murder, you have to show premeditation and intent. So in other words, uh, Allison, what I would need to do is if I was going to charge you with that, I would have to say, well, okay, you definitely knew that you were going to kill that person. You specifically targeted that person and you planned for it in advance. And so far, uh, based on the investigation to date, there's no indication that this officer set out uh, to kill George Floyd that specific day and took actions that were, in fact, going to kill him um, uh, willfully and specifically. So I think that's kind of a, it goes to intent. Um, that's basically what you're looking at. As far as a second degree mm-hmm. murder charge, uh, that may be possible. And of course, uh, today, the, uh, the the attorney uh, for Hennepin County, which is overseeing this case, he said that, uh, in fact, he has not ruled out uh, additional charges or upgrading the charges at some point. It's early in this investigation, but when it is this early in the investigation, uh, you have to be careful, Allison, not to overcharge. Uh, you also have, now that you have a person arrested, uh, now that you have the charges filed, you can work from there. There's nothing precluding the prosecutors here. Uh, uh, based on any further evidence that they develop of uh, of upping these charges to more serious counts. Uh, Tom, in, in terms of George Floyd, we have the uh, medical examiner's preliminary findings. Mm-hmm. They're out. What uh, do those findings say about his death? Right, exactly, Allison. So those findings were included in the uh, complaint that was filed today against this police officer. Yeah. And what those what those findings detail it wasn't explicitly, according to the medical examiner, uh, that knee to his neck uh, that killed uh, that killed Floyd. Essentially, okay. what they're saying is, look, he had some underlying health conditions. He had some heart conditions. He's got some hypertension uh, underlying health conditions. And it was this interaction with this officer, that knee to the neck, plus those underlying health conditions that kind of all contributed together were all factors that led, uh, unfortunately, to his death here. So uh, that's what was included. Uh, but it is a preliminary finding. Of course, there's other things that they'll be taking a look at, toxicology, et cetera, uh, to p- kind of paint a more full picture. Um, but for right now and what they needed to make these charges today, uh, they have the information they need from the medical examiner. Tom, one last question for you. A lot of people wondering about the other three officers. Will they likely face charges here? Mm. Really good question. You know, I found it very interesting in the complaint today uh, that they made a note that when one of the officers detected that there was no longer a pulse uh, mm-hmm. on Floyd, at that point, none of the other officers who were involved, there were two others that were uh, on his body. So essentially, one was kind of holding him down in the midsection, the other was holding down his legs, that none of them changed their positions. So uh, along with Chauvin, who was char- uh, charged today, uh, the other two officers who were involved, uh, there were actually touching Floyd at the time uh, that he lost his pulse, they didn't change their posture position either. And they say they know this because there were body cameras that were on uh, that were able to see this. So when you look at that, you say, okay, were those officers, they may not have been applying the knee to the neck, but should they have gotten up? Should they have done something at that point? Uh, Should they have tried to get help a little bit sooner for Floyd uh, or at least kept him from being pinned down? So that's something uh, that I think is a little bit of a tell in that uh, complaint Mm -hmm. today that would seem to indicate to me that uh, they're far from off the hook in this case. All right, Tom Winter, thanks so much for your reporting. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage. Answers to your questions. Insight from medical experts. And up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before his death, was charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. MSNBC host Ali Velshi joining me now from Minneapolis. And Ali, we can hear the crowds. We can hear folks there. How are they reacting to Chauvin's arrest? Well, we're just uh, going through a shift change here. I'll just ask uh, Miguel to show you what's going on. State police here uh, in front of this barricade. Some of them are leaving. They're getting taunted by a number of the protesters. Let me set the uh, stage for you. We are three blocks away from the 3rd Precinct Police Station, which is over there. We were right there last night, and there was no police presence at all. Now you can see there's a lot of state police here. Uh, you've also got National Guard people on either side. We're not seeing any Minneapolis police here right now. But, yeah, so what's happened here is that they have created a set of barricades and a perimeter around the police station, and they pushed protesters back. Now, during the course of the day, there were protesters in the morning, so the fire engines were able to get out here and put out a number of the fires. Uh, there's still one building smoldering over there, but there were several. In fact, Miguel, if you could just show them over there, there's another building on fire right uh, behind us over there. So they're trying to sort of keep control of things, and Allison, what's happened is the mayor has declared a curfew tonight, 8 p.m. Uh, Minneapolis time, 9 p.m. Eastern, until 6 a.m. Okay. tomorrow night and Sunday night. And so what we're trying to figure out is what happens next. Do these people leave and go home? Do the police uh, back off? There seems to be a strategic effort to not get into a conflict with protesters, and that's what we're looking at right now. Ali, you said it. You were in the crowds practically all night last night. We saw fires and looting. Uh, what is the expectation tonight, and does it feel different at all to you there at this stage? Look, you can't really tell in the day, because during the day at this time, it was sort of like this. People gathered around as a little bit of tension. But remember, there was no police to go up against last night. There were no police in the area. So we don't know what the expectation is. Every time we look over here, take a look over there, Miguel. You see more shift change police coming in. Uh, the police are definitely establishing a presence in the distance. You can see they have taken back the uh, police precinct. So nobody knows what's going to happen tonight. When there's a curfew, do people go home? Do they go to St. Paul? Uh, do they get into sort of uh, taunting battles with the police around the city? We, we don't know what's going to happen tonight, uh, but I would say the tension's a little higher here with each passing hour. Absolutely. Ali, have they said anything more? It doesn't sound like it, but about what that means at curfew time? Do they just expect people to go home, or have they said what will happen if you stay out? 
No. That's the question. No. Uh, it's gone out as a tweet. Uh, the mayor has said it. It's not clear who has to go home and what the police are going to do about it. Remember, for parts of Minneapolis, particularly here in South Minneapolis, it was not evident 24 hours ago there was police control over the area. Now they've closed off areas. I don't know if you call that control, but this area for the next sort of six blocks and maybe three blocks in either directions, maybe 10 square blocks, that's all under police control. Uh, but I don't know how that all uh, how that all plays out at 8 o'clock when the curfew goes into effect. We'll be here to see, but we don't know. Are people going to go home? Are they going to take the, the message from the mayor, or are they going to be back out here in the streets as they have been every night since uh, since Monday? All right, we know you will be there. Allie, stay safe. Thanks for your reporting. Bye-bye. Former police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged, but there are still so many questions about his encounter with George Floyd. NBC News investigative reporter Emmanuel Saliba looked at security camera footage and cell phone videos from our social news gathering team and pieced together this timeline. It's just after 8 p.m. on May 25th, and the security cameras of this local restaurant are rolling. The indicated time is about 20 minutes fast. A blue Mercedes has been parked curbside on East 38th Street for several minutes. We do not have footage showing when it arrived. George Floyd is in the driver's seat. A police car pulls up in front of this local convenience store and two officers walk in. Minneapolis police said in a statement their officers responded to a report of a forgery in progress, meaning someone was trying to use counterfeit money in a store. A few minutes later, the officers crossed the street and approached the vehicle. The police said they found the suspect in his car. The first officer approaches the driver while his partner walks around to the passenger side. The interaction between the officer and Floyd can't clearly be seen from this angle, but the driver of this black vehicle filmed part of it on his phone. The officer struggles to get Floyd out of the car. His colleague walks over to help him put the handcuffs on. The black car drives off. Floyd falls briefly to the ground. The officer helps him back up before leading him towards the sidewalk where he directs Floyd to sit on the ground. A park police car shows up to the scene. Redacted body cam footage from that new officer was released by the park police chief. The officer exits the car to see his two colleagues questioning Floyd and two people who were just in the car. A few minutes later, the officer helps Floyd up off the ground. The video has no sound, so we don't know what was said between the two officers and Floyd in this moment. They walk him across the street back towards their squad car. Floyd falls to the ground once more. Police originally said they noticed Floyd going into medical distress and called an ambulance to the scene. Another police car pulls up, obstructing our view from this angle and making it hard to clearly see what unfolded in the next four minutes between the officers and Floyd. We do see Officer Chauvin pull up to the scene with his colleague. And behind the vehicle's open door, we can make out what seems to be a struggle. Whatever was happening between Floyd and the officers at that very moment caught the attention of this passerby who stops to watch. Two minutes later, a witness standing on Chicago Avenue captures part of the scene unfolding behind the squad car. One officer looks over as three of his colleagues restrain Floyd, who is lying face down on the ground in handcuffs. We don't know how Floyd ended up on the ground. One officer is pressing his knee into Floyd's neck, which we see clearly in this video, taken only seconds later by another witness standing in front of the grocery store. She captured the next 10 minutes of his deadly arrest up until he is taken away in an ambulance. It took nearly four days for the officer at the center of George Floyd's death to be charged. Protesters say that was too long, but Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman disagrees. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. This conduct, this criminal action, took place on Monday evening, May 25th, Memorial Day. 
I'm speaking to you at one o'clock on Friday, May 29th. That's less than four days. That's extraordinary. This is by far the fastest we've ever charged a police officer. Joining me now, NBC News and MSNBC legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, it has been a long time. Wonderful to have you on News Now. Uh, first, what do you think about the time it took here to arrest Chauvin? Allison, great to see you again. And, um, you know, four days does seem like the authorities moved fairly quickly. However, what I'll say is mm -hmm. that in my 22 years as a homicide prosecutor, we would often uh, review, approve, and issue arrest warrants in murder cases within hours of the murder if the evidence was clear and indisputable with respect to homicide liability. What I see on these tapes makes it look like it is clear and indisputable when you have one officer kneeling on the neck of somebody who's already in handcuffs, who's already incapacitated by four officers uh, applying restraint. And when that officer keeps the knee on the neck of the suspect for six minutes until he loses consciousness yeah. and another three minutes after that, Allison, that seems like a case where there could have been an arrest warrant issued immediately upon reviewing that videotape. Glenn, I want to ask you about the charges, but since we're talking about the video, I want to stay on that for a minute because so many of us looked at it and thought, oh my goodness, this is so obvious here, uh, but you're talking about it in terms of charges, but how about in terms of prosecution? Uh, because we know this is not the first time uh, we've had a case where there has been video. How, what do you say to people who think this should be easy to prosecute here? Look what happened in that video. First of all, no case is a sure thing. No case is easy to prosecute. Take it from me yeah. because I've lost plenty of cases over my career. Um, and particularly yeah. when you are prosecuting a police officer, um, you know, yeah. the police officer will argue that he was in fear for his life. He was protecting the community. And, you know, there are some jurors who might be sitting in that jury box who are amenable to those kind of arguments. However, when you have a, cl a case of clear excessive force by police officer, officers causing yeah. the death of a citizen that they are sworn to protect, this is a case that had to be brought, should have been brought even more promptly than it was. And like I say, Allison, nothing is a sure thing, but I think on the evidence, it will prove right. to be a very compelling case at trial. All right, Glenn, so let's talk about the two charges here, third degree murder and manslaughter. Uh, can you explain those for those of us who aren't as familiar with the law as you are? Sure. First of all, it's not unusual to charge in the alternative. That means even though there's only one homicide, it's not unusual for prosecutors to bring two different homicide charges because there are different elements that go into proving a manslaughter versus a third degree murder. So a third degree murder under the, the laws of Minnesota um, carries with it up to 25 years in prison. And it is essentially a, a homicide in which the, the defendant, the suspect, doesn't necessarily have to intend to kill the victim, but he has to act in an eminently dangerous way that demonstrates an extreme disregard for human life. So it's not like an intentional first degree premeditated murder. It is really this extreme level of recklessness and disregard for human life. So that is the more serious of the two charges. The manslaughter, Allison, is much easier to prove because it really mm -hmm. is a gross negligence standard. If you acted in a way that was grossly negligent and as a result of your negligent conduct, somebody died, that will um, serve as manslaughter liability. Okay. That only carries a 15-year maximum prison term under Minnesota law. So there are two different charges that will be brought. But let me tell you, Allison, I don't think the charging is necessarily over because that's the government's opening salvo. However, they can investigate right. the case and they can ultimately indict the officer or officers for a higher level of homicide if 
the evidence as it develops supports those greater charges. Glenn, Floyd's family here wanted first-degree mur murder charges. Why do you think we saw this third-degree charge instead? Well, first of all, as I say, it's an opening salvo, but we have to see what all of the evidence shows. First-degree yeah. murder is typically a murder that involves premeditation and deliberation. Now, premeditation is forming right. a design to kill another person. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, intend to kill that person and put your plans in place for days and weeks. It can be as quick as a couple of minutes that you engage in premeditation. And then deliberation, which is turning your intent to kill over in your mind, giving it a second thought, and deciding to do it, can also take place very quickly. But premeditation and deliberation, those are states of mind that we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in a murder case. And even in the, the more run of the mill, the more routine murder case not involving a police officer, those are very high burdens for prosecutors to prove. Um, we have to see where the evidence lays out, but it may be that they end up bumping this up from a third degree murder to a second degree murder. Mm -hmm. um, but I am glad that even after a four day delay, they have brought charges against the, the officer who seems to be most culpable. However, there, cer there certainly seems to be criminal culpability with those other officers who were applying pressure until Mr. Floyd was dead. Yeah, Glenn, let, let me ask you about that. As you said, there were three other officers involved in this incident. Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman says he does anticipate charges. What do you think prosecutors might look at there? You know, I think um, it really depends on exactly what the medical examiner rules with respect to the cause and manner of death. Um, that will determine, in part, the level of culpability um, and the appropriate charges that could be brought against the other officers who were involved in restraint while the, the main offender, it looks like Officer Covan, had his knee on the neck of George Floyd until he stopped moving and even thereafter until he was dead. So those officers who were applying restraint, they have a duty of care to Mr. Floyd as well. And it's a duty to protect Mr. Floyd's life, not assist Officer Covan in ending Mr. Floyd's life. Glenn Kirshner, always appreciate your legal expertise, uh, but we could really use it in times like this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Twitter putting another label on one of President Trump's tweets, this time a warning on this tweet about the Minneapolis protests. The president tweeting, quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walz and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty and we will assume control. But when the looting starts, the shooting starts. NBC News senior media reporter Dylan Byers joining us now. And Dylan, what happened here with President Trump's tweet? Uh, uh, how is Twitter explaining this particular label? Sure. Well, for Twitter, the, the calculation here is they have a policy. And one of those policies is that uh, they don't condone tweets promoting violence. Normally, uh, if, if any random Twitter user, even yourself or myself, were to post a tweet promoting violence, they would take that tweet down. They might even go further into looking at whether or not they should ban the user, uh, uh, him or herself. In this case, when you're talking about the president of the United States or any government official or major political figure, they have made the judgment that it is so politically newsworthy and important for people to be able to see that tweet and talk about that tweet and discuss that tweet. It's violence. They hide it and then they give you the option to click on it. Now, Twitter is sort of locked in a little bit of a a, a, a sort of push and pull with the White House right now, because what the White House then did is it went out from the official White House account and tweeted out the same language, forcing Twitter to put yet another disclaimer on that tweet. And this is sort of a back and forth and a little bit of a game of whack-a-mole that we might see play out well into next week. Uh, Dylan, there is some history to the last part of the tweet when the president says when the looting starts, the shooting starts. For our viewers who aren't familiar with it, could you give us some of the background? Yeah, absolutely. And so it, it dates back to a statement that was made by the uh, Walter Headley, the chief of police in Miami back in 1967. And in that same statement, he effectively said that they didn't mind being accused of police brutality. 
Uh, it was then echoed by the segregationist George Wallace in 1968, one year later. And I think it's telling that that is the quote that the president cited, uh, because things are starting to feel a lot like 1968 right now in America with what we see in Minneapolis and, 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 and with the, um, you know, with, with the, with what happened, uh, in Minneapolis. So, uh, you know, the, the white house is now trying to claim that the president wasn't promoting violence, that he was condemning violence. It's a very hard case to make when you're, when you're quoting segregationists. Yeah. Yeah, sure is. Dylan Byers, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to head over uh, to the White House. President Trump taking questions from reporters. Let's listen in. Well prepared. But we brought in the National Guard. They'll be very prepared tonight. Thank you all very much. Mr. Thank you, please. Thank you. Mr. President, would you support a civil Justice Department investigation? Mr. President, come on, guys, let's go quickly. Come on, guys, let's go. Come on, guys, let's go. Former Vice President Joe Biden demanding justice in the death of George Floyd, saying, quote, none of us can be silent. Here's what he told MSNBC and Today Show anchor Craig Melvin after Derek Chauvin's arrest was announced. For your time, sir, let, let's just start with uh, the news of the day. Of course, as you know, um, the officer who, who had his knee on George uh, George Floyd's neck uh, for almost nine minutes, charged with third degree murder, charged with manslaughter um, of, of Floyd's family, indicating that they would have preferred a first degree murder charge. Uh, do you think that justice has been served? Well, it's not finished yet. We'll see what happens. Uh, look, I, I'm not going to make the fact that he was charged with murder and was charged with manslaughter as well as a minimum of what should have been done. Nine minutes on that man's neck when his face was up against the curb and being crushed is totally, totally, totally inappropriate under any circumstances. And uh, it is it is it is it's brutality. Uh, President Trump indicated uh, a short time ago that um, the administration, at least, had spoken with with George Floyd's family. I know that you've talked to you've talked to the family as well. Um, it was a private conversation. I, I don't I don't want to put you in a tough spot to divulge the contents of the conversation, but can you characterize at least um, what what you said to them, what they said to you? What I said to them was that. Uh, I had just a little bit of sense from different losses what a black hole they felt like they're in. They felt like they're being sucked into this great void within their chest, I, that, they, that they just felt lost. And, uh, and I indicated to them that uh, um, when they talked to me about George, he seemed to be everybody's mentor in the family. His brothers, his cousins, who were his peers, who fought him as a brother the way everybody looked to him for leadership, the kind of decent man he was, that uh, it has a profound impact on a whole family. But I was incredibly impressed with how, how uh, significantly um, they had focused on what was at stake. Um, I was incredibly impressed at their, uh, at their depth of their sense of the impact on not just their family, but the entire community. I was, in, and they, they, they had a, they, they were worried about the violence in the streets as well. They, they were just in a truly, truly impressive family. And, uh, and we talked about, uh, about loss and, um, and I urged them to do what at least help my family. Uh, not the same thing. My, my son was not murdered, and my daughter and my wife were not murdered. They were killed in an accident by a tractor trailer. I'm not suggesting that, but I am saying that. I said the only thing that I know is that George will be part of their heart and their consciousness the rest of their lives. And the day will come when they think of George instead of crying, they'll have a smile first. That's when they know they're going to make it, but stick with one another. They'll get one another through. 
and they were very, um, they, they were more grateful than they should have been. I was grateful they took the call from me because I wanted to let them know how much courage and grace and, and how unimaginably painful it is for this moment. I promised them I'd do anything in my power to see justice was served for George. Uh, you know, we must, we have to do this. It's who we are as a country. We have to step up. We have to step up at this moment. And I think the public is ready to. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? Yeah. If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. The Paycheck Protection Program is supposed to help small businesses during this pandemic, but NBC News has learned that private jet owners are also benefiting from the program. NBC News senior political analyst Jonathan Allen joins me now. He worked on this story with Steph Rule and Mike Capetta. Uh, John, private jets, not exactly the small businesses most people uh, were picturing here. Your reporting focuses on an aviation company in California. How did they qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program, and what did they do with the money. You know, it's interesting, Allison. They got uh, two different pots of money. One of them is uh, from uh, an aviation payroll support program that goes to their sort of main costs. And then the other one, they got that PPP loan. And what that does is it allows them to pay uh, flight attendants and uh, and pilots and other people who are jet owners, but the management company sort of a pass-through. Uh, it's complicated stuff, but the short answer is jet owners don't have to pay to keep their pilots on uh, because of the PPP program. So a lot of people might have raised eyebrows over this one, not exactly what they were thinking. What is the company saying here? I mean, the company says uh, they've lost 94% of uh, their flights uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that a lot of okay. these uh, people who work for the jet owners would end up uh, would end up losing their jobs uh, if it weren't for some sort of relief. John, there are some pretty strict stipulations about what businesses can do with the PPP money if they want loan forgiveness. Are there rules that stop business owners from handing over funds to people who aren't employees? Um, there are very uh, sort of strict ideas of the rules uh, that you have to uh, give okay. a certain percentage of the money to uh, to employees. 
And at the same time, uh, there's not a lot of oversight right now of the program. There may be at a later date, uh, the company Clay Lacey Aviation, in, the, in a letter that we obtained uh, that they had sent to their jet owners, said that it's possible that the uh, loan might not be forgiven. And in that case, they won't give uh, the main benefit that they gave to these jet owners, which is a credit with the uh, with the aviation company, meaning that they get uh, a credit to their account. Um, if it's clawed back or if the loan doesn't become forgivable for some reason, uh, then those credits will disappear. Uh, so they anticipate the possibility of that, but also in reading the letter that they sent, it seems pretty clear they believe that they are uh, both qualified for the loan and will uh, be able to get it to a point where uh, it is forgiven. Are you seeing anything similar to this with other types of companies outside of the private jet space? Uh, this is the first one, but we're going to keep digging. Uh, there's very little oversight right now of any of these programs from uh, the government. There was a $2.2 trillion CARES Act that included uh, some of the small business money and also uh, money to rescue the aviation industry. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of the things uh, flying out the door in Washington, uh, there have not been uh, the sort of rigorous oversight mechanisms you would think. Um, and as a result, uh, there's a lot of work for journalists to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and John, it seems like you've got almost two extremes here, right? On one hand, you have these small business owners who are so worried about doing everything the right way because they need to have those loans forgiven uh, if they want to survive. And, and then you hear a story like this, and it makes people wonder if maybe the next time around when we're looking at stimulus, uh, if we need to do things a little differently for these businesses. I mean, really, it's amazing what you've got here is people who own private jets, uh, essentially, uh, potentially laying off pilots and uh, and flight attendants uh, for the relative pittance uh, that it would cost to keep them on board. Um, and the other thing is a company like Clay Lacey Aviation is first in line. If you are a company that's taken major loans from banks, if you're a company that's getting $27 million from uh, another uh, you know, piece of uh, federal, uh, federal assistance, uh, it's going to be very easy for you to go get that loan. I know a lot of small business owners that, and the types of businesses that you would think about, restaurants and the like, uh, felt like they were at the back of the line, and the truth is they were. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. John Allen, I always look forward to seeing your reporting on NBCNews.com. We love it even more when you come to visit us on News Now. Thank you and have a great weekend. My pleasure. You too, Allison. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's go right out to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the very latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, give us an update. Hey, Allison. Lots of news in this hour. First, the now former police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter, according to Minnesota's public safety commissioner. Here's County Attorney Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third degree murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges. Now, public outcry over the death of George Floyd continued overnight, turning increasingly violent. A police precinct was set on fire in Minneapolis, and unrest broke out in St. Paul. Now, from NBC's Jamie Nodal, the battle between President Trump and Twitter continues after the tech company put a warning label on one of the president's tweets, calling protesters, quote, thugs, and saying, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter said it was, quote, glorifying violence. Now, later this morning, the official White House account put out the same tweet, and Twitter again put a warning label on it. This, of course, follows Twitter for the first time uh, adding a fact check label to, to two of the president's tweets earlier this week. Now, news from Kentucky, protesters demanding justice for Breonna Taylor, who was killed by Louisville police back in March, turned violent last night. That's from NBC's Phil Helsel and Dennis Romero. Seven people were shot with at least one in critical condition. A police sergeant told NBC News that officers were not involved in those shootings. Audio from a 9-11 call made the night of uh, Breonna Taylor's death was also released. In a tweet, Governor Andy Bashar said, quote, my heart aches for Louisville and our country. Breonna Taylor's family and the public deserve the truth. 
And lastly, a new study shows prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine surged by nearly 2,000 percent in March after the president first promoted the drug as a potential treatment for coronavirus. That's the latest from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has often touted the use of the anti-malarial drug, even taking it himself, though it has not yet been proven to be an effective treatment against the coronavirus. These findings also follow a study published earlier this month showing that hospitalized patients of COVID-19 patients that took hydroxychloroquine would be more likely actually to die than those who didn't. Now, those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. Thank you so much. Out of Minnesota today, the officer shown on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before he died has been arrested and charged with both third degree murder and manslaughter. Last night in Minneapolis, a third straight night of protests, police there using tear gas and clashes with some of those protesters. There was looting. There were fires, including a fire at the police department's third precinct, home to the four officers fired after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz said the world is watching the visceral pain in response to Floyd's death, and he urged people to come together to restore peace. I understand that. And I will not patronize you as a white man without living those those lived experiences of how very difficult that is. But I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard, not those who throw firebombs into businesses that are communities of colors have worked so hard to build. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And and Morgan, Officer Derek Chauvin charged, arrested. What is the reaction there uh, in Minneapolis today? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. We know the word of Chauvin's arrest has made its way through this crowd here, but uh, we're not seeing the numbers that we did yesterday, and we're also not seeing that mm-hmm. uh, that tension necessarily that we witnessed uh, with the hundreds of people gathering uh, near some of the businesses behind me. I can say that one of the reasons behind that is probably this increased police presence, and I'll just kind of let you take a look. These are state patrol officers that came in early this morning uh, and established a very wide perimeter around some of the more damaged areas here in Minneapolis, and through the better part of yesterday evening and well into the night, um, there was no sign of any police presence per se uh, or National Guard. And we know that the governor signed that proclamation yesterday, allowing the National Guard to to come in and help as needed. Uh, But we really didn't see that resource being used until today. And you can see that police are out here in mass uh, letting firefighters do their job uh, while also maintaining uh, a perimeter, not just here in this area, but uh, well, well around that 10 block radius that was significantly damaged uh, over the past several days. So uh, as it stands right now, Chauvin's arrest uh, from those that I've spoken to here in the crowd, they say is a hopeful first step uh, towards achieving justice uh, in the death of George Floyd. Uh, but everyone's saying there's uh, much more to come. Those three other officers that were involved uh, in the death of Mm -hmm. Floyd uh, have yet to be taken into custody. However, we are hearing from officials that charges do await them as well. Uh, So very much a a watch and wait mentality here right now. Um, And everyone just kind of uh, taking a deep breath after so many days uh, of tension uh, in this community. Allison. Uh, Morgan, you mentioned the National Guard there. The governor saying they did not pre-deploy the National Guard uh, ahead of last night's protest. Did he say why they did not do that last night? Uh, We're still waiting on an exact reason uh, regarding the National Mm -hmm. Guard, Allison. We do know that the mayor of Minneapolis was also questioned uh, as to why he chose to I guess, not um, increase resources at the 3rd Precinct building. Mm -hmm. Uh, The mayor saying that you know, no human life is worth the cost of a building. And certainly there will be a lot of questions being raised in the days and weeks, months going forward uh, as to how the response was uh, was handled here uh, or, or not, rather. Allison. Morgan, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, rather, Attorney General Keith Ellison also spoke today and said that state leaders are committed to long term change. Here's what he said. But I want to be clear that if the message was 
This situation with Mr. Floyd is intolerable, absolutely unacceptable, and must change. That message has been sent and received as well. And go the governor, myself, the lieutenant governor, all of us are committed to that long-term change. Is that helping to ease the tension in the city as well? Or Morgan, are people telling you they will continue to come out uh, until they see more arrests? Well, we've heard from numerous people in the crowd, Allison, that they're determined to make sure that, you know, George Floyd is much more than a hashtag and that you can't let uh, the damage and destruction that we've seen over the past several days uh, be what people remember the most from this. Uh, however, that's going to be a, a tough hurdle to overcome simply when you witness the devastation that we've seen here in this city. They say that, you know, the system is broken and that it will take uh, a long term committed uh, change uh, or change or mo movement rather to see change happen. Mm -hmm. And so it all comes down to sustaining this uh, movement. Um, and it's going to be a, a long road ahead. Allison. Morgan, uh, before we let you go, talk to me, if you will, about uh, what folks there woke up to this morning. I, I know there was looting last night. Uh, there were fires. I know there are local businesses uh, that have been affected by this. Uh, have people been coming back and seeing property of theirs, things of theirs destroyed today? Absolutely. And uh, the unfortunate rea reality is that last night played out basically like a carbon copy of, of the night prior to that. And that is a relatively peaceful yeah. protest that happened throughout the day and into the evening. Uh, suddenly, or not so suddenly, rather, began to disintegrate. And vandalism happened uh, one block after another. And one thing that struck me is that whenever I arrived in Minneapolis and made my way to this scene, uh, I saw a small business not too far from where I'm standing uh, with uh, the owner putting up uh, plywood over all the windows. And he wasn't necessarily... Um, even that close to the damage that happened the night prior. And I asked him, you know, better safe than sorry. He's like, yeah, I don't want to take any chances. I drove past that business this morning. The windows knocked out. The whole place burned. So that is uh, unfortunately what a lot of people are facing today. Uh, another night of damage. Uh, so many fingers being crossed that tonight isn't a repeat of last night. But we just still don't know with uh, still a lot of... Um, unease, a lot of anger simmering here in this community. Allison? Yeah. Understandably so. Morgan Chesky in Minneapolis, thank you so much. Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, the man seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck, arrested, charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. NBC News justice correspondent Pete Williams is with me now from Washington. And Pete, could you talk us through the charges here? Sure. So um, basically one charge adds one other element that the other one doesn't have. The manslaughter charge, manslaughter is okay. a common charge in many states. It's basically unintentional killing of another person uh, through negligence or carelessness or something like that. Now, this is a second degree manslaughter charge, um, which basically says creating an unreasonable risk and taking a chance of causing death. And then in addition to that, there's a charge, a more serious charge of third degree murder. Now, that is an uncommon statute. Not many states have it. It's basically an unintentional killing with, as the statute says, using somewhat antiquated language, with a depraved state of mind and a disregard for the personal safety of others. And what the probable cause statement says here now that's, that's uh, attached to the charges it says that uh, at first, uh, George Floyd was compliant when they tried to arrest him. But when they wanted to put him in the squad car, he stiffened up, said he was claustrophobic, struggled with the officers, intentionally fell down, they say, said he was not going to get in the car, refused to stand still. And while standing outside the car, the charges say, he began saying and repeating that he couldn't breathe. Then he went down on the ground. He's still handcuffed, face down. And he keeps saying, I can't breathe multiple times, according to the uh, charges, and said, mama and please as well. Now, the charges say that the officer who was charged with this, Officer Derek Chauvin, had his knee on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes, eight minutes and 46 seconds in total. And it says that he continued to hold his knee on it for two of those, uh, almost three of those minutes, after Mr. Floyd was non-responsive. 
And it also says in the last sentence of the charging documents, police are trained that this type of restraint with a subject in a prone position is inherently dangerous. And the state officials have said they don't train in the use of putting a knee on someone's neck. Now, I will also say this. Uh, for the last 15 or 20 years, there has been uh, law enforcement training material that says when you put someone down on the ground prone, meaning they're face down mm -hmm. with their hands behind their back, right. and then you put pressure on their back or their neck, it increases the risk that they won't be able to breathe and they could suffocate. And there have been many cases uh, where the police are either uh, a police are either found guilty of doing something wrong or more often there's a settlement between the police department, the city or the state and the family of the victim uh, the, in which cash is paid out, uh, you know, can be huge damages paid out. There have been some in Minnesota just a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, all around the country, you see this happen a lot. So it is a risky maneuver. And what police officials will tell you is that the training is it's common to arrest people in that position to, to get them under control. But once you have them cuffed, and once they are no longer resistant, you roll them onto their side or you get them to sit up or even stand up. After all, right. the experts will tell you the, ob the, the obligation of the police, once they make the arrest, is to get the person safely either to jail or to the hospital. And obviously that's not what happened here. Uh, Pete, thanks for explaining uh, this in such an expert way. I mean, it, it's so Basic, I can, as you describe what it's like for someone to be prone and have a, a knee on their neck, I, I found myself catching my breath. You just can imagine how difficult sure. it is to breathe in this situation. Uh, what is next now? I mean, people were, were uh, protesters were waiting uh, to see if uh, Chauvin would be arrested and charged. What happens next for him in this process? And, and then how about the other three officers? Are we expecting that they could potentially face charges here? It's possible. Uh, I don't really know much about the other three. I mean, uh, some police officials have said they found it very disturbing that the other officers simply stood around when George Floyd was in such yeah. obvious distress and didn't do anything or try to intervene. Now, what the, whether there's a statutory obligation for them to do so, what the criminal offense would be, I don't know. Um, the, the next step would right. be George Floyd is uh, George Chauvin is already in. I'm sorry, uh, Derek Chauvin is already in custody. Derek Chauvin. Uh, he'll, mm -hmm. he'll be going through the court procedure. Now, we have to see whether the federal government will file any charges, any civil rights charges. We always assumed that the state would go first because the only uh, the state has a lot of statutes at its disposal for cases like this. Uh, the, the federal government does not. Uh, so the only option for the federal government would be to charge someone in this situation with violating uh, civil rights. And that is a very hard case to prove because you have to prove that an officer uh, used unreasonable force and knew it was unreasonable and did so on purpose. It's, it's relatively easy to, to prove the first part. It's very hard to prove what the officer's state of mind was. And that's why yeah. you so often see in right. these cases, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, you name it, uh, uh, many other cases uh, where people have been uh, killed by police in custody that the feds try to make a case and can't. So we always assume that state would go first, whether the federal government will or not, we'll have to see. All right, Pete Williams, thanks so much. You bet. Earlier today, Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman stressed the fact that his department moved with unprecedented speed, bringing third degree murder charges against Officer Chauvin. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. We have never charged a case in that kind of time frame. Uh, and we can only charge a case when we have sufficient admissible evidence to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. As of right now, we have NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins me now. And Danny, less than 24 hours ago, prosecutors said they needed more time to gather more evidence before they could announce any charges. What changed since then? They take a huge risk anytime prosecutors decide to charge police officers. But with the advent of mm -hmm. video virtually everywhere on people's phones and security systems, they had quite a bit of evidence to piece together from different angles how this arrest went down and how it went bad. The challenge then becomes once they've determined that some law was violated, that this was a bad arrest and a bad use of force, 
is figuring out which statute that it fits into. And Pete Williams talked a little about this. But interestingly enough, in Minnesota, third degree murder and involuntary manslaughter are really not that different when it comes to the state of mind involved. One involves manslaughter, involves an unintentional killing uh, with a conscious disregard of risk. In other words, when you did what you did, you were aware that it caused a risk and that risk was unjustifiable. The same thing happens with third degree murder, except that the risk is so great. It's what we call in law school depraved heart uh, in state of mind. In other words, the act itself is so, so risky that it's almost the same as intending to kill. And the classic example is taking a gun and shooting it into a crowd. You may not intend to hit anyone, but shooting a gun into a crowd is right. something that is just so dangerous, you might as well have intended a, a fatal outcome. That is uh, arguably right. a difficult bar to meet, but with the lesser included offense of manslaughter, uh, the prosecutors here have covered a lot of bases. Uh, Danny, how about the other three officers? Floyd's family, uh, protesters say they would like the three of the those three other officers at the scene to face criminal charges. Uh, do you think that we'll see charges here? And if they are, what is their defense? We talked a little bit with Pete about uh, the, the complexity of charging them potentially here. These are much more difficult officers to charge because Yes, on the one hand, okay. as law enforcement officers, they have an affirmative duty to get involved uh, when they see somebody who is at risk of being seriously harmed, especially someone that they themselves have arrested. But on the other hand, those that may not have had a good angle at the uh, at the victim while he was on the ground, those that may have been standing a few mm -hmm. feet away and maybe didn't realize what was happening, or maybe they were given assurances uh, by the defendant that everything's okay, he's fine, uh, he's just you know he's just uh, 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 pretending that he's hurt and he's not we may find out that there are different levels of culpability, and that becomes a lot mm -hmm. more difficult to charge, especially if you can't show there's any common agreement among the officers, and it doesn't appear to be any evidence of that right now. You have to demonstrate that they knowingly disregarded their, their affirmative duty to get involved when somebody is at risk of very serious harm. It's an obligation that police officers have, that regular citizens do not. We are legally privileged as regular citizens to walk by someone in distress. Police officers have a legal duty to get involved. Danny, do prosecutors here run the risk of overcharging? And and by that, I mean, is there any concern uh, that that bringing too many charges could prove to be too much for a conviction? You have the uh, third degree murder and then you have the lesser included offense of manslaughter. I can see a jury struggling with the really, really nuanced difference between acting recklessly for involuntary okay. manslaughter and acting super duper recklessly uh, for third degree murder. And I can see them struggling with that. And generally speaking, we've seen historically that police officers can bring a lot to a defense by arguing that they had some kind of apprehension of fear of safety or that they were responding to force. And what you see historically is that juries are more likely to give the benefit of the doubt to police officers when it comes to use of force. So I can see a jury struggling with mm -hmm. the definition, but expect the prosecution to have plenty of experts, uh, including folks possibly even in the Minneapolis Police Department, to testify that this kind of use of force, this specific technique, uh, was either not sanctioned or not trained or something that was totally outside of what was expected of officers. That will go a long way if they can get that kind of expert to testify uh, to showing that this use of force was unreasonable under the circumstances. Danny, uh, we all have a lot of questions right now. Uh, your legal expertise more helpful than ever in a time like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. At least seven people shot in Louisville, Kentucky last night. Protesters there were rallying against the shooting death of Breonna Taylor. She was killed in a police raid of her apartment back in March. Joining me now, Louisville's Wave 3 news anchor and reporter, Taylor Durden. Taylor, great to have you. Uh, after a violent night, could you tell us what it's like there in Louisville today? How are folks doing? 
Yeah, you know, Allison, people are waking up this morning. If they were downtown or near downtown at all, it looked very different than it had yesterday morning. Uh, when I was there last night, I can tell you that as things started to diminish, people weren't really around anymore because it started to rain. So at that time, a lot of the protesters decided to go home. There was trash all over downtown. Police were still there in their gear, their riot gear, kind of blocking off intersections. But this morning, people are waking up to big holes in buildings. They're waking up to damage to cars, broken Open windows, several different buildings, including the police department, uh, one of the statues in front of Metro Hall in downtown Louisville, also damaged. They had, protesters had ripped the arm off of King Louis um, there. And so people are waking up to a very different downtown. And right now, police are still down there right now, just keeping an eye on this scene. They are expected to possibly have people out there again tonight. And so that's kind of what we're seeing right now, Allison. Yeah, at least seven people shot there. What can you tell us, if anything, about the shooting victims? What do you know? So we haven't been told much about the shooting victims, but we do know that police okay. tell us that police did not fire their weapons at all. Um, they're saying that it's from people in the crowd. Police said that they didn't start doing anything with tear gas or any kind of um, pepper bullets or anything like that um, until they heard those gunshots. At first, there were two people shot. We started hearing that pretty early on. Um, we've had some other reporters who were on the scene that could see it from afar. Um, and a lot of people just scattering at that point. You hear the gunshots, obviously you're going to run. Uh, we had reporters there on the scene that also went and ducked for cover. Um, and then at, after that, we started hearing the count just continuing to go up. We know that at least two, one person last night was in critical condition. I don't know if that condition has changed. Uh, but we do know that um, two people are in stable condition at the hospital. All seven of them were taken to the hospital. Hospital, but as of now, they all seem to be OK. So that is some good news. Taylor, how is the city handling the situation there today? Are they preparing for more protests over the weekend? Uh, you know, I think so. Um, it sounds like from what we're yeah. hearing here that they are anticipating something potentially tonight and into the weekend as well. I think a lot of people um, hearing about last night, there's a lot of tension here. I mean, for two months, people wanted to hear the name Breonna Taylor, and they didn't. And so the, the fact that people are saying that, her family is just happy that people are saying it. They told us um, last night and even today that they're upset that things took a turn. Initially, the, the protest was peaceful for several hours, and then there was a shift where some of the violence started, some of the damage started happening. That's something that her family says they don't want to see. They don't want that to happen. They want this to be peaceful. They do want her name out there. They're happy that people are saying her name, but they don't want this to be a, a violent kind of a situation, Allison. All right, Taylor, thank you so much. Taylor Jordan, anchor and reporter for Wave 3 News. Great to have you with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. President Trump spoke this evening and expressed his condolences to George Floyd's family. The president says the Justice Department is looking into the case. Terrible event, terrible, terrible thing that happened. I've asked that the Department of Justice expedite the federal investigation into his death and do it immediately, do it as quickly as absolutely possible. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joining me now. And Kelly, in his earlier Rose Garden briefing, the president didn't say a word about the situation in Minnesota. He finally addressed it at his roundtable this afternoon. What else did he say? Well, this appears to be a situation where the president wanted to separate the remarks, to have the Rose Garden event be about China, which is significant in its own way, and then to begin this roundtable with uh, lengthy remarks where he offered his condolences to the Floyd family, talked about having spoken to members of George Floyd's family. As you played there, a short clip that included the president talking about urging the Department of Justice to swiftly examine the events that have happened to see if there are any federal civil rights matters that could be pursued against the officers. We know that today uh, the first charges against one of the officers have been filed with officials in Minnesota saying it's possible charges would also uh, be brought against other officers. The president also talked about the importance of the environment uh, that has really taken hold beyond the events directly related to George Floyd to the larger community, as Morgan was just explaining to us 
with the protests, the fires, the uh, vandalism and rioting, and the president calling for calm. So these are the most lengthy comments from President Trump on this. I was with him on Wednesday when we were in Florida. He was there for the launch that did not happen. And I asked him about the Floyd case. It was the first time that he spoke about this publicly. He said that he had seen the video and called it a very, very sad and horrific uh, set of actions. Today, going further, we don't yet know why the president chose not to do this during the Rose garden when there were lots of reporters expecting to have a chance to ask questions. Uh, there are reporters, a smaller group, who are with him at this ongoing event that's still happening dealing with uh, coronavirus with a number of guests there. That's where the president decided to make these specific remarks about Minnesota, the Floyd family, and the larger social issues. Undoubtedly, he will get some questions. Whether he entertains those questions or not remains to be seen. But this is one of those times when you have an American city going through a crisis, literally on fire, uh, questions about social justice, policing practices, and all of the uh, community impact on people who live in Minnesota, as well as other protests that have uh, responded to this around the country. And uh, the president needing to step forward and say something. We've seen President uh, Barack Obama, former president, speaking out on Twitter, saying this cannot be normal. We've seen Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, speak about this, also saying that he had uh, had a phone conversation with members of the Floyd family. So the president is now putting himself involved in this in a way where he is siding with the family, he says, and also calling for peace and responsibility in Minnesota. What will be a real test now is the tone the president uses. He got uh, a lot of criticism for some of the tweets where he used a phrase that echoes back to the 1960s and policing during times of civil unrest. The If there is looting, there will be shooting, a very volatile phrase. He'd used that on Twitter and then tried to explain that it wasn't about police action, he claimed that it was about the uh, inherent risks when there is demonstration and violence, uh, that lives can be in jeopardy or taken by violence if protest becomes so volatile that it spills into criminal activity as well. So the president is now on record and is saying that the Department of Justice will take action, that this is a local matter, but one where the federal government has a role to play as well. And many will wonder if the tone and the words of the president uh, will speak to these communities and if that will be viewed as helping the situation or how people will accept his words. That's something we'll be tracking going forward. Allison? Kelly, the president also today making some pretty big announcements about Hong Kong and the World, World Health Organization, rather. Could you tell us about those? On a different day, Allison, these would be huge, significant news-breaking events. Absolutely. And it's all, of course, about context, where uh, the United States is uh, certainly concerned about what's happening and the impact of Minnesota. Uh, this is also an important foreign policy development for the president, effectively breaking with China over its uh, exerting new control over Hong Kong, which is supposed to have autonomy uh, for decades to come under longstanding agreements, that it is a part of China but has some autonomy. Uh, the president saying that special relationships that the U.S. has had with Hong Kong uh, will be severed because of that. And he's also withdrawing the United States from the World Health Organization, which is a stunning move in the pandemic that we continue to experience. The U.S. had been the largest donor nation to the World Health Organization. The president has complained loudly that they, he believes that the World Health Organization did not do enough to warn other nations about the dangers of the COVID-19 virus and that it was, in, in the president's view, too sympathetic to China, which the president argues was concealing the nature of uh, the outbreak and the danger of human transmission and so forth. Not having U.S. funding to the World Health Organization will certainly draw criticism. The president is saying those funds can be directed to other organizations that can help on public health matters around the world. But this is a very notable set of moves from the White House, uh, a cold war is what China officials say is happening between the U.S. and China, these two great economic powers. Certainly, the president added to that today. And then his moves on the World Health Organization are also quite notable, given that uh, the country is still dealing with this illness. Allison? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Police brutality and race are quickly becoming top issues in the 2020 election in the wake of George Floyd's death. Joe Biden pouncing on President Trump for his response to the looters in Minnesota. The presumptive Democratic presidential nominee issuing a short but stern response to Trump's Twitter post. Enough. The former vice president calling for real leadership earlier today. This is no time for incendiary treats, tweets. It's no time to encourage violence. This is a national crisis. We need real leadership right now, leadership that will bring everyone to the table so we can take measures to root out systemic racism. We need justice for George Floyd. We need real police reform that hold cops to a higher standard that so many of them actually meet, that holds bad cops accountable and repairs relationship between law enforcement and the community they're sworn to protect. NBC News correspondent Mike Memoli joining me now. And Mike, uh, it was a, a longer talk uh, from Joe Biden. What else did he have to say today? Well, Allison, the first thing that he actually said was that he had just spoken uh, with the family of George Floyd. That's significant because yeah. obviously we haven't heard much from the White House about this in terms of whether there's been any attempts to reach out to his family. Uh, but we, we have talked about this often. Biden's campaign says that Joe Biden's superpower is empathy. And we know uh, just how much he has spent time on the campaign trail and then in, in his daily life, speaking with others who have experienced loss in his life. Tomorrow is, as a matter of fact, the fifth anniversary uh, of the death of his eldest son, Bo. So that was an interesting thing for him to make a point oh. of saying at the top. Um, but the larger point that he's made, not just in this uh, remarks that he delivered today, but in previous um, days as well, is he's talked about racism and these systemic inequalities having to do uh, with racism as an open wound in this country. In, in his remarks today, he said that those of us who are in positions of power have a responsibility to do more uh, to address this, that our silence, our complacency makes us complicit in some of these issues, and that to, to move beyond this without taking and making hard choices uh, to try to do things on a policy front would only uh, further scab over, open, scab this open wound rather than uh, providing a long-term fix. And the one last thing that I would mention is it's interesting when he talked about the need for police reforms, and he said the need to hold bad cops accountable. Joe Biden is uh, somebody who throughout his career has styled himself as very much a law and order Democrat. He's touted his relationships with law enforcement and first responders repeatedly. So for, for him to make that kind of comment is not something he does lightly because he really values those relationships as well. 
Uh, Mike, the George Floyd case is also putting the spotlight back on Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, who served as a prosecutor there. Uh, she's being criticized for not prosecuting the same cop seen kneeling on George Floyd in another case involving the fatal shooting of a man back in 2006. Uh, this is what she told MSNBC about it earlier today. That investigation continued into a time where I was already sworn into the U.S. Senate. I never declined the case. I have said repeatedly, back when I was the county attorney, the cases that we had involving officer, involving shootings, went to a grand jury. That was a true in every jurisdiction across our state, and that was true in many jurisdictions across the country. I think that was wrong now. I think it would have been much better if I took the responsibility and looked at the cases and made the decision myself. But let me make this clear. We did not blow off these cases. Mike Klobuchar is one of the contenders to be Biden's, Biden's VP. Uh, how does this affect her chances? Yeah, I mean, we so often talk about this vice presidential search process as if it's taking place in a vacuum, that Biden's simply going to be able to make a choice on the merits alone and not having to do with external events. And I think what this episode really emphasizes is that's not the case, uh, that very much what's happening in real time uh, around the country is going to be shaping Biden's thinking and the thinking of his team about who he chooses. And it's worth noting that already, even before the events of the past week in Minnesota, simply the news that Amy Klobuchar was being vetted was met with a lot of unease among some progressive activists who not only have issues with her as being yeah. a centrist as, as Joe Biden is, but because of her record in Minnesota as a prosecutor. They, they'd already thought that that was an issue. And now they're coming out today and saying this is disqualifying. Now, Andrew Mitchell, in that same interview, asked Klobuchar if this should maybe lead her to withdraw from consideration as Biden's potential running mate. And she said that's a decision that Joe Biden has to make. But she was clearly looking for an opportunity to defend her record in this in this score. The Biden mm -hmm. campaign not addressing this at all, of course, as they haven't been addressing any details about his vice presidential search process. Uh, Mike, does this also bring up concerns for the Biden campaign about his own record on racial issues and that those could come under fire again? Yeah, I'll remind you that one week ago at this time, we were talking about the interview that Biden had just done with The Breakfast Club. And there was one element of that yeah. interview, of course, yep. that got a lot of attention, what he had to say at the end about you ain't yes. black if you can't see the difference between me and Trump. But the rest of that interview really included a, a, a long discussion about his uh, role in authoring the 1994 crime bill. And I think it's likely that we're going to see a discussion as this case in Minnesota continues whether or not the elements of that crime bill necessarily uh, have a factor here. Uh, but the other point, which is interesting, having spoken today with a number of outside groups who are among those who have been pressuring Joe Biden to pick a woman of color as his running mate, is to say that it's less actually about simply making sure that you check a box, that you have diversity for diversity's sake. It's really more important that you have a, a diversity of perspectives and views, but also a record on the issues that yes. are important to them. And so for Biden, and it's not necessarily important that he just choose a, a woman of color. They said there, there are women, there are white women that he could choose from who might actually even be better on these issues than Biden himself in his past, but also some of the other contenders. And so this is all something that I think is going to be part of the discussion going forward. Yeah, it's not just optics, it's perspective for sure. Uh, Mike, one last question for you. Former President Obama also issued a statement on the Minneapolis protests today. What is he saying? Yeah, interesting always to hear from the former president, given how rarely, uh, even if it's more frequently of late, he chooses to engage on these kinds of issues. Remember, I was covering the White House uh, when we saw riots in Baltimore and, of course, the situation in Ferguson, and we saw really how the president at the time grappled with these situations. In his statement today, he talks about how we're all looking forward to a new normal as states begin to really reopen uh, now following the pandemic, which we're still very much grappling with. Uh, but he said that sense of normalcy, yeah. we also have to understand, uh, is not very normal for a lot of people, that there are, there are people of color, especially, who are dealing uh, with the kinds of uh, systemic issues that we see here. And he said it's, a, it's a coming upon all of us of, in good faith to come together and have a discussion. That's very much uh, classic Obama in a lot of ways, how he tried to have discussions about these issues when he was in office and now doing the same uh, from the outside. All right, Mike Memley, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Allison.
George Floyd's death sparking protests across the country. Denver went into lockdown yesterday after someone there fired a gun near a peaceful protest. Protesters in Columbus, Ohio, charged the state capitol. And more demonstrations are expected there today. And protesters are also rallying in New York for a second day. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen is there. And Ron, uh, what's happening where you are in the city? Well, Allison, there's a crowd of several dozen protesters that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's supposed to start at 4 o'clock, but it's starting early. And they've moved down here, and they are converging on the New York Criminal Court building and the district attorney's office here. You can see there's a big NYPD police presence on bikes all around this area. There are literally hundreds of police officers trying to make sure things stay under control. A little bit further down the street here, you can see... It looks like there are a couple of people who are here. Yesterday, there were 70 people arrested. There were confrontations. There were a couple of police officers who were injured, had concussions. Um, so the police were ready for this. And this all started happening in the last half hour or so. But you can see things are getting a little bit chaotic. The police, of course, are well prepared for these kinds of things. The protesters are here in support of protesters out in Minneapolis. They're also, this is a we can't breathe protest, which of course echoes Eric Gardner. The Gardner case happened six years ago, next month, July 2014. To this day, no officer has been charged with a crime in that case. And these protesters are very aware of that. You can see here, they're bringing out some guy who causing some problems. It's unsure whether what exactly he was doing down here, but um, clearly the police are not playing with this. They don't want any trouble back here. So just watching yeah. the situation, it's a very narrow street. And um, and again, it's um, the police are... You are unlawfully in the so this is also the police are concerned about not just crowd control during an incident here, during a protest, but of course this social distancing. We're in the middle of a pandemic as well, and that's not happening either. So the police are saying that they are going to start arresting people for disorderly conduct if need be. And you can see there's a lot of energy down here. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of resentment. And now you can see the, the police are really being adamant about um, clearing the street down here. Yeah, Ron, you can feel it. You can hear it. You can see it there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure that you're in a safe place. This looks like a, a, a man who, he doesn't look like one of the, the protesters. They were much younger people. And um, this is an extreme situation here where they just carry this guy out. He looks to be in some distress. Now the police are picking him up by all and just uh, carrying him out. Okay, let's just get, let's get him, understand where we are here. Let's. All right, the cops are insisting that we get out of the street and on the sidewalk, trying to bring order here. Let's see if we can see what's on, what's going on down there a little bit. Um, um, because this is right, where we'll, the, we'll the heart you, of the protests are. Just as long as you're in a safe are. place. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're in a safe place. This is a, this is, seems to be the heart of the protest. Okay. The police are drawing a firm line here where they are blocking the protesters and the protesters are now moving they're moving further on and that seems to be what the police want is for them to keep moving and to go further on well stay with it see what happens out here but um another crazy situation all of a sudden allison yeah, uh, Ron, unbelievable. Uh, before I let you go, if you're able to stick with us, one thing you said that struck me, Eric Garner, six years ago, it's hard to believe uh, it has been that long. What else are, are folks there telling you as you speak with protesters there today? Well, there was some relief. There was some relief, obviously, when the officer, one of the officers out in Minneapolis was charged, because here it's been six years and there have been no charges. There was a, a state grand jury that looked at the Garner case. 
the federal prosecutors looked at this for five years, two administrations, the Obama administration, eventually the Trump administration, and it was just uh, July of last year that the attorney general decided that there would be no civil rights federal charges filed against the officer. The officer, Daniel Petaleo, was fired as a result of a NYPD internal disciplinary hearing, but there has net to this day been anyone held criminally responsible in the Eric Garner death. And so when things started happening out in Minnesota, it looked like that. It looked like that. Everyone was, was dreading that this case out there, the Floyd case, could go on. Here's another arrest. They're taking out another individual. Yeah. The police are not, um, the police are not playing. The police do not want this to get out of control. And they are, they are, they are serious today. You can see over there across the street, there's a strong presence guarding the entrance to the courthouse. And that's the interest of the district attorney's mm -hmm. office as well. And now the, um, the police and the protesters are moving on down into Chinatown. More dense streets. More dense streets, more people. Um, we'll have to see, see where this goes. Run. We have seen protests in New York City before, uh, Union Square in particular, downtown, no stranger uh, to people expressing how they feel, uh, demands for justice, uh, uh, you name it. I mean, we talked about Eric Garner, but there have been cases before. How does what you're seeing today uh, uh, compare to protests you've covered in the past? You know, Allison, I hate to say it, but it has this feeling of deja vu all over again that, you know, the yeah. first big protest I can remember covering was out in Los Angeles after the Rodney King trial in the early 90s. Yeah. That's what, um, 30 years ago? Um, and that was, you know, there's yep. videotape there too. And everyone thought those officers would be convicted because of the videotape, but they weren't. Um, but, and that, that caused the LA uprising as it's called. Here's another person getting arrested there. They've got, um, the person's hands in restraints. Uh, it seems that the, there's a... It looks like the main crowd of the protesters have gone further up the street there. They're way down there. They're about three or four blocks ahead of us. And... Um, okay. But the police are, are blocking this area of the city off right here now as well. It's just, it's, it's, it's really chaotic down here. This was supposed to be a, 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 yeah. a, a protest in, a, in Foley Square. It was a, an area that was surrounded, cordoned off. There's another, that's at least the third or fourth person we've seen um, taken away. Here's another woman, young woman over here. Right up over here. And we can hear a, a, a announcement from the police telling people to not block the streets. And there's yet another arrest going on over there by that car. You can see it. Watch the car over there, guys. Why don't we can why don't we keep on going down? We're going to keep on going down and see what else we can see down here. Can you hear the uh, chant there now? It's uh, hands Ron, up. I was going to ask you, what are they chanting? The, um, anthem okay. from Ferguson. Hands up, don't shoot, which was the anthem rallying cry in Ferguson after the death of Michael Brown. Another case where yeah. a grand jury did not bring charges. The officer never faced charges. The federal government chose not to prosecute as well. These civil rights cases have a very high burden of proof threshold to convict an officer. Officers are given the benefit yeah. of the doubt because they are licensed and they are expected to use force. So to convict an officer of excessive force, 
deadly force, it's a, it's a tough burden. And just looking at some statistics recently, it's, it's very rare still, you know, many, many years later, that officers are ever convicted in these kinds of cases. Let's see. Uh, let's get on this. We're going to get on the sidewalk out of here, as they're telling us to do. Trying to do this as well as keep my distance from everybody as well. Yeah, Ron, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, how is social distancing playing into the protest today? Is it at all? Believe me, Allison, it is forefront in my mind and our crew's mind. We are trying to keep our distance and trying to do this as safely as possible. This is the last thing I expected to happen down here today. But you can see many of the folks in the crowd wearing masks. They're not six feet apart. There's a lot of passion. There's a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, we really want to just stay away from this and show you what's happening, yeah. but not get too close. It's just, um, yeah. but the police, you can see, have things under control. The police have, have really, they were out here. They knew this was coming. This had been advertised as, you know, there were, this was advertised as a march that was going to start at 4 o'clock. So the police are out here in force. I can see even more police reinforcements yeah. in that direction coming this way. And, and here we seem to have reached a, a point of standoff where the officers... And that group are face to face. And uh, we seem to have hit a point now where here things are sort of calming, if I could use that word in this crazy context. Yeah. Yeah. Ron, uh, we would stick with you even longer, uh, but but you are in demand today, so I have to let you go to some of our uh, other colleagues at NBC and MSNBC. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for your coverage today, whether you in the heart are in the heart of the coronavirus epidemic or uh, at the protests here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for bringing us to the biggest stories in New York these days. Appreciate it. Sure thing. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. There are nearly 6 million confirmed coronavirus cases around the world, with almost 2 million here in the U.S. While the infection rate in New York City is slowing down, other parts of the country are now bracing for the worst. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. Dr. John, the CDC is now forecasting more than 115,000 COVID deaths in the U.S. by June 20th. How would you describe the state of the pandemic in our country right now? 
And Allison, I think the best way to describe the state of the pandemic is it's in flux. And essentially what you're seeing is what we've talked about all along, that once things open up, you can start seeing spikes in cases, and hopefully those spikes don't turn into outbreaks. But we're starting to see, not just here, but in other countries as well that have opened up, they're having to shut down things because cases are starting to creep up. Here we haven't had that shutdown so much because things are just reopening, but that's something the governments, that's something the public health officials are definitely looking at because we know we're going to have a second wave in the fall time frame, but what we think we're going to have now is a second spike in this first wave that we've had, and we want to make sure that second spike in the wave is as small as we can make it, and it doesn't turn into an outbreak, Allison. Dr. John, some more information about hydroxychloroquine today. That's the malaria drug that President Trump took prophylactically and has been promoting as a possible treatment. Uh, the VA is scaling back its use of that drug. What can you tell us about that? So it's not just the VA, but a lot of different organizations are scaling back the use of the drug mm -hmm. hydroxychloroquine, because if you remember a couple of months ago, President Trump and a lot of other people were saying, you know, this is going to be the drug that's really going to help us with coronavirus. And most experts are saying, you know, we need to wait a little bit here. We need to make sure through testing that this is something that can give us some benefit and doesn't cause much risk. It's a drug that's been used in the past, so we know it's fairly safe, but it did have some side effects, particularly cardiac arrhythmias. And that's the big concern that's come out, showing that it doesn't work as well as we, we would like it to. It doesn't seem to work very well. And it does have that cardiac arrhythmia type issue. And so most organizations, including the VA, are now saying, you know, let's hold off a little bit on this and not use it. Let these tests go through to see what happens in clinical trials to find out exactly how well it, how well people tolerate it, what it can be used for, what dosing, all those things we need to figure out before we just start giving them to people. So it's one of the treatments that's out there still being looked into, but there are a lot of other treatments being looked into as well. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit of time. We just need to let that time go by as we do these different research trials. Dr. John, we know that people with underlying health conditions suffer more from the coronavirus, but a recent study uh, from Lancet now says that it's far deadlier for cancer patients. Why cancer patients in particular, and what should both cancer patients and their loved ones know here? And Allison, you're correct. You know, for months we've been talking about the fact that people at high risk categories, those over the age of 65 with pre-existing conditions, those pre-existing conditions usually being high blood pressure, kidney disease, lung disease, or heart issues, those types of things made them more likely to suffer consequences from coronavirus. But we weren't really sure about cancer patients, particularly cancer patients that were undergoing chemotherapy or cancer treatment at this time. And what this study is showing is they are also at high risk and high risk from dying from coronavirus. So I think the the message here is essentially, if you're a cancer patient, if you're going through chemotherapy or other types of treatment, you need to be extra careful about making sure you're not exposed to coronavirus. Prevention is going to be key. If you do start having symptoms, make sure you get in sooner rather than later so you can get the treatments and the supportive care that we do know that seems to work for coronavirus. But again, for family members, the biggest thing is don't expose these family members who might be undergoing uh, cancer treatments or have cancer to mm -hmm. any type of coronavirus risk or, or mitigate it as best you can and just take care of everybody. But this puts them in the high risk category and somebody we definitely want to make sure we keep an eye on to prevent it. And if it starts to treat it as early as we can with what we have left, Allison. Great advice, Dr. John. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend. You bet. You too. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Morris, and you are watching NBC News Now. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is following the very latest headlines for us from NBC News. Alexa, give us an update. Starting off our headlines uh, this hour with news out of Minneapolis. The officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Take a listen to the county attorney, Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third-degree murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges later. In a statement, uh, Floyd's family and his attorney called it a, quote, overdue step on the road to justice and added they expected a first-degree murder charge. According to NBC's Tom Winter, charging documents say the former officer held his knee on Floyd's neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd was unresponsive. Floyd's death was spar has sparked outcry in cities across the country. Crowds of people gathered in Manhattan this evening. At least 70 people were arrested at, at protests in the city yesterday. That's according to our affiliate there. Demonstrations were also planned in Boston, Atlanta, and several other cities. 
Now, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo today saying New York City is on track to reopen June 8th as long as certain criteria are met. Those metrics relate to the city's hospital capacity and contact tracing capabilities. Now, while entering phase one will likely be welcome news to some New Yorkers, things may look a little different. Here's Governor Cuomo. Uh, and it's going to be different. It is reopening to a new normal. It's a safer normal. People will be wearing masks. People will be socially distanced. Now from NBC's Erica Edwards, a constant question is how early did coronavirus start spreading in the United States? Well, the CDC reporting today new estimates that it started as early as late January. That's before certain measures were taken by the White House to curb the spread uh, of coronavirus. And as for questions around whether the virus had arrived in the U.S. as early as November or December, the deputy director for infectious diseases said, quote, we looked for evidence of early widespread transmission and could not confirm it. At least 102,000 people in the United States have now died at the hands of COVID-19. President Trump today announcing the United States will cut ties with the World Health Organization, a move that will likely draw criticism from public health experts and American, American allies. That's from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has repeatedly blamed the agency for its response to the pandemic. Take a quick listen to the president earlier. Because they have failed to make the requested and greatly needed reforms, we will be today terminating our relationship with the World Health Organization and redirecting those funds to other worldwide and deserving urgent global public health needs. Now, the president also announcing today he would be taking steps to revoke Hong Kong's special trade status with the U.S. following China's move to impose a national security law that undermines the territory's autonomy. Trump said he would be directing his administration to, quote, begin the process of eliminating policy exemptions that give Hong Kong different and special treatment. He also added that the U.S. would be taking steps to sanction Chinese officials as well as Hong Kong officials that were directly or indirectly involved. And those are the latest headlines for this hour. Lots of news there on this Friday. Allison, back to you. Yeah, it has been quite a news day. Alexa, thank you so much. An arrest and charges in Minnesota today. Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer, seen here kneeling on George Floyd's neck before his death, charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. Meanwhile, the city bracing for another night of violent protests. It's fourth in a row. Businesses have been looted here, buildings set on fire, including the police department's third precinct. That's home to the four officers who were let go after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz is asking for peace. Us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard. And I refuse to have it take away the attention of the stain that we need to be working on. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And Morgan, how are people there reacting to the charges? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. It really is a mixed bag, depending upon who you talk to upon hearing the news of Derek Chauvin's arrest. I spoke to two African-American gentlemen who traveled here from St. Paul today to try to help clean up this area. And they say this is a hopeful first step towards justice uh, with his arrest and the potential arrest of those other three officers who were involved in the death of George Floyd. In the meantime, we're standing in this crowd right now that's beginning to grow in size like we've seen over the past several days uh, here just a couple blocks away from that third precinct police station. And throughout uh, this crowd, we've heard uh, basically people saying that third degree murder is not enough. That's merely a slap on the wrist. And that's not actual justice uh, that they hope comes against these police officers they believe murdered George Floyd. So the mood here is uh, one of, I guess, cautious optimism, you could almost say, from people uh, hoping to see uh, steps towards justice being taken, uh, but acknowledging that with just one officer in custody, they know that there's uh, still much uh, longer road ahead when it comes to justice. Allison? Yeah. Morgan, police didn't seem entirely prepared for the widespread protests that happened there last night. Uh, has that changed? Do they seem to be in a better position tonight? 
Uh, that's certainly what they hope, Allison. We do know that last night um, yeah. we haven't heard the exact details on what the strategy was because we weren't able to see uh, really any police or National Guard uh, in or around the police station uh, after midnight, especially when that crowd made its way into that building and essentially had free reign of about a 10 block uh, radius where so much damage took place. This is a little bit different today. Uh, we're standing here uh, among this crowd about 10 yards behind me. If you can push in, you can see that there is a line of state patrol officers uh, that have really been in Minneapolis in this area since early this morning when they established a very wide perimeter here, especially surrounding those heavily damaged areas, allowing firefighters to get in there, try to put out some of those hot spots uh, because due to the presence of that crowd, uh, they were unable to do so uh, really for the majority of last night. So. These state patrol officers combined with National Guard uh, makes for a much more visible presence here uh, in this neighborhood for sure. Allison. Morgan, I know you've spoken with some of the activists there. What else are they telling you about why it was so important to be there? You know, one of the main reasons people came here today, Allison, wasn't just to witness the aftermath firsthand, but it was to hopefully uh, make it to where people didn't just see this devastation on television and think that that's what this was all about. Uh, the two young men I spoke to who came from St. Paul, they go to the same church. Uh, they had enlisted friends to come here and volunteer to try to pick up some of the mess that was caused uh, as a result of the looting and of the vandalism last night. Uh, they were very passionate about uh, trying to send a message that isn't just one of violence. Uh, and they had this to say in an interview. Take a listen. I think that What's unfortunate is when people peacefully protest and their protest isn't heard, if officials don't respond, then this, this scene right here eclipses it. It kind of just shuts the message out. But if peaceful protest doesn't get answers, if it doesn't bring awareness, and you don't offer any other alternative, you let people just be destructive. So that's certainly the hope, Allison. They have a message they want to send out. They know it's not going to be an easy solution and that it will take time more than anything. And so that is a, a little bit of hope amidst the heartbreak here in Minneapolis. Allison? Yeah, Morgan, can we talk a little bit more about the looting, the fires, the destruction that community is dealing with today? I imagine so many people are, are walking out into the streets and seeing shops damaged and property of theirs damaged and, and just overwhelmed by the destruction. It, absolutely. And I think to, to watch it on television, as so many people did last night when they saw those buildings one after another go up in flames, it did draw a fair amount of people from the surrounding area who essentially just came here to witness what happened firsthand because they couldn't believe it uh, when they saw it on television last night. It has been a very bleak day today uh, because just as we saw from Wednesday night into Thursday, there was significantly more damage from Thursday night into Friday. Uh, and one of the most stark uh, images that I witnessed was upon arriving in Minneapolis yesterday morning, I saw a liquor store that had the owner outside boarding up the windows with plywood uh, just as a precaution. He wasn't impacted the prior night. I asked him if he was going to stay through the night to make sure his property was OK. He said, absolutely not. And it was a good thing that he wasn't there because when we drove by today, that business, uh, just a shell of what it was, burned out, windows smashed in. Uh, just one of so many buildings that continued to see uh, that, that were damaged last night. And so you have a crowd here that's frustrated that those other officers haven't been taken into custody. You also have people that live here in Minneapolis who are just a few blocks away in a, a residential area walking out of their homes just a few blocks to witness smoke filled skies and buildings that are still on fire. Uh, so it's a very interesting juxtaposition uh, between kind of this movement uh, and the folks who call this area home uh, trying to wrap their heads around all of it, uh, as we all are. Allison. Absolutely. Morgan Chesky in Minneapolis, thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Derek Chauvin, the officer at the center of George Floyd's death, charged with third degree murder and manslaughter today. A state charging documents allege that the former Minneapolis police officer had his knee on George Floyd's neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after Floyd became 
non-responsive. NBC News investigations correspondent Tom Winter joining me now. And Tom, uh, a a big day here in this case. Walk us through Mm. the charges here. Uh, right. So uh, what we received today is charges against Chauvin. As you said, uh, we've got a second, a third degree uh, murder charge as well as a second degree manslaughter charge. Now, the third degree uh, murder charge carries a maximum penalty of 25 years. That's the officer that you see there uh, in that uh, still frame of the video that, of course, we've all seen at this point. The manslaughter charges ca- uh, carries a, a maximum of 10 years in prison. Essentially, what prosecutors are saying here is that this officer officer um, committed this crime, and they allegedly committed his crime because he showed an indifference uh, to his life. So essentially here, you're, you're not saying that this is a premeditated murder, but because of the actions that this officer took, um, that it is a crime because he deprived him of his life, and it was because of the officer's actions. So that's kind of the, the legal definition or, or the technical factors, if you will. Uh, we know from the probable cause affidavit for, for police to make the arrest um, that essentially what happened here is he he kept his knee on his neck for two minutes and 53 seconds after another officer told him, hey, I don't think he has a pulse. Uh, and those other officers didn't do anything either, according to the to the complaint. In total, it was almost nine minutes that he had his neck, uh, his knee on his uh, neck, uh, George Floyd's neck. And I think the important thing here, Allison, is that um, even though they said at different points George Floyd uh, interfered with and resisted arrest, uh, the the kind of the key component here is that once he was uh, in a non-responsive state, that they kept that going forward. On top of that, the use of force guide in the Minneapolis Police Department makes it pretty clear uh, that this is a technique to be used if you put somebody into an unconscious position when they're actively resisting arrest. And obviously, when somebody uh, doesn't have a pulse, uh, they can't be actively resisting arrest. So um, uh, a set of uh, pretty damning facts here for the officer that was charged today. Absolutely, Tom. Do we have any sense at this stage of what kind of a sentence these charges could carry? Yeah, so uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, for the manslaughter charge, uh, looking at uh, the upwards of 10 years. Uh, and then for the uh, okay. second deg- uh, third degree murder charge, excuse me, uh, we're looking at uh, up to 25 years and obviously fines and all sorts of other issues associated with it. Um, what's not mm-hmm. clear to us, and we're still trying to get the details, whether or not uh, those sentences can be stacked. Typically, in a state case, they can't. And what it. I mean by that is, can they add the 25 plus the 10? No, they would probably be uh, separate and serve concurrently here. But uh, but we're a long ways uh, away it. from that. And, uh, you know, we could be looking Absolutely. at other charges, too. Yes, I know it is a, a long journey here. I know it's also, though, a question uh, that people have about what those charges could potentially mean in terms of uh, sentence or jail time. Uh, but mm-hmm. again, as you said, Tom, still a long way to go. Uh, civil rights right. attorney Benjamin Crump released a statement calling on prosecutors to charge Chauvin with first degree murder. Why did the state attorney decide to go for third degree murder? A, a charge a lot of people uh, haven't heard before instead. Right. So there's all sorts of varying levels of uh, murder. And in Minnesota and in the Minnesota laws and regulations that are obviously governing this, um, when you go for first degree murder, you have to show premeditation and intent. So in other words, uh, Allison, what I would need to do is if I was going to charge you with that, I would have to say, well, okay, you definitely knew that you were going to kill that person. You specifically targeted that person and you planned for it in advance. And so far, uh, based on the investigation to date, there's no indication that this officer set out uh, to kill George Floyd that specific day and took actions that were, in fact, going to kill him um, uh, willfully and specifically. So I think that's kind of a, it goes to intent. Um, that's basically what you're looking at. As far as a second degree mm-hmm. murder charge, uh, that may be possible. And of course, uh, today, the, uh, the the attorney uh, for Hennepin County, which is overseeing this case, he said that, uh, in fact, he has not ruled out uh, additional charges or upgrading the charges at some point. It's early in this investigation, but when it is this early in the investigation, uh, you have to be careful, Allison, not to overcharge. Uh, you also have, now that you have a person arrested, uh, now that you have the charges filed, you can work from there. There's nothing precluding the prosecutors here uh, uh, based on any further evidence that they develop of uh, of upping these charges to more serious counts. 
Uh, Tom, in, in terms of George Floyd, we have the uh, medical examiner's preliminary findings. Mm -hmm. They're out. What uh, do those findings say about his death? Right, exactly, Allison. So those findings were included in the uh, complaint that was filed today against this police officer. Yeah. And what those what those findings detail, it wasn't explicitly, according to the medical examiner, uh, that knee to his neck uh, that killed uh, that killed Floyd. Essentially, okay. what they're saying is, look, he had some underlying health conditions. He had some heart conditions. He's got some hypertension, uh, underlying health conditions, and it was this interaction with this officer that knee to the neck plus those underlying health conditions that kind of all contributed together were all factors that led, uh, unfortunately, to his death here. So uh, that's what was included. Uh, but it is a preliminary finding. Of course, there's other things that they'll be taking a look at, toxicology, et cetera, uh, to kind of paint a more full picture. Um, but for right now and what they needed to make these charges today, uh, they have the information they need from the medical examiner. Tom, one last question for you. A lot of people wondering about the other three officers. Will they likely face charges here? Mm. Really good question. You know, I found it very interesting in the complaint today uh, that they made a note that when one of the officers detected that there was no longer a pulse uh, mm -hmm. on Floyd, at that point, none of the other officers who were involved, there were two others that were uh, on his body. So essentially, one was kind of holding him down in the midsection. The other was holding down his legs, that none of them changed their positions. So uh, along with Chauvin, who was char uh, charged today, uh, the other two officers who were involved, uh, they were actually actually touching Floyd at the time uh, that he lost his pulse, they didn't change their posture or position either. And they say they know this because there were body cameras that were on uh, that were able to see this. So when you look at that, you say, OK, were those officers, they may not have been applying the knee to the neck, but should they have gotten up? Should they have done something at that point? Uh, should they have tried to get help a little bit sooner for Floyd uh, or at least kept him from being pinned down? So that's something uh, that I think is a little bit of a tell in that uh, complaint mm -hmm. today that would seem to indicate to me that uh, they're far from off the hook in this case. All right, Tom Winter, thanks so much for your reporting. Thank you. President Trump spoke this evening and expressed his condolences to George Floyd's family. The president says the Justice Department is looking into the case. Terrible event, terrible, terrible thing that happened. I've asked that the Department of Justice expedite the federal investigation into his death and do it immediately, do it as quickly as absolutely possible. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joining me now. And Kelly, in his earlier Rose Garden briefing, the president didn't say a word about the situation in Minnesota. He finally addressed it at his roundtable this afternoon. What else did he say? Well, this appears to be a situation where the president wanted to separate the remarks, to have the Rose Garden event be about China, which is significant in its own way, and then to begin this roundtable with uh, lengthy remarks where he offered his condolences to the Floyd family, talked about having spoken to members of George Floyd's family. As you played there, a short clip that included the president talking about urging the Department of Justice to swiftly examine the events that have happened to see if there are any federal civil rights matters that could be pursued against the officers. We know that today uh, the first charges against one of the officers have been filed with officials in Minnesota saying it's possible charges would also uh, be brought against other officers. The president also talked about the importance of the environment uh, that has really taken hold beyond the events directly related to George Floyd to the larger community, as Morgan was just explaining to us with the protests, the fires, the uh, vandalism and rioting, and the president calling for calm. So these are the most lengthy comments from President Trump on this. I was with him on Wednesday when we were in Florida. He was there for the launch that did not happen. And I asked him about the Floyd case. It was the first time that he spoke about this publicly. He said that he had seen the video and called it a very, very sad and horrific uh, set of actions. Today, going further, we don't yet know why the president chose not to do this during the Rose garden when there were lots of reporters expecting to have a chance to ask questions. Uh, there are reporters, a smaller group, who are with him at this ongoing event that's still happening dealing with uh, coronavirus. 
with a number of guests there. That's where the president decided to make these specific remarks about Minnesota, the Floyd family, and the larger social issues. Undoubtedly, he will get some questions. Whether he entertains those questions or not remains to be seen. But this is one of those times when you have an American city going through a crisis, literally on fire, uh, questions about social justice, policing practices, and all of the uh, community impact on people who live in Minnesota, as well as other protests that have uh, responded to this around the country. And uh, the president needing to step forward and say something. We've seen President uh, Barack Obama, former president, speaking out on Twitter, saying this cannot be normal. We've seen Joe Biden, his Democratic rival, speak about this, also saying that he had uh, had a phone conversation with members of the Floyd family. So the president is now putting himself involved in this in a way where he is siding with the family, he says, and also calling for peace and responsibility in Minnesota. What will be a real test now is the tone the president uses. He got uh, a lot of criticism for some of the tweets where he used a phrase that echoes back to the 1960s and policing during times of civil unrest. The If there is looting, there will be shooting, a very volatile phrase. He'd used that on Twitter and then tried to explain that it wasn't about police action, he claimed that it was about the uh, inherent risks when there is demonstration and violence, uh, that lives can be in jeopardy or taken by violence if protest becomes so volatile that it spills into criminal activity as well. So the president is now on record and is saying that the Department of Justice will take action, that this is a local matter, but one where the federal government has a role to play as well. And many will wonder if the tone and the words of the president uh, will speak to these communities and if that will be viewed as helping the situation or how people will accept his words. That's something we'll be tracking going forward. Allison? Kelly, the president also today making some pretty big announcements about Hong Kong and the World, World Health Organization, rather. Could you tell us about those? On a different day, Allison, these would be huge, significant news-breaking events. Absolutely. And it's all, of course, about context, where uh, the United States is uh, certainly concerned about what's happening and the impact of Minnesota. Uh, this is also an important foreign policy development for the president, effectively breaking with China over its uh, exerting new control over Hong Kong, which is supposed to have autonomy uh, for decades to come under longstanding agreements, that it is a part of China but has some autonomy. Uh, the president saying that special relationships that the U.S. has had with Hong Kong Kong, uh, will be severed because of that. And he's also withdrawing the United States from the World Health Organization, which is a stunning move in the pandemic that we continue to experience. The U.S. had been the largest donor nation to the World Health Organization. The president has complained loudly that they, he believes that the World Health Organization did not do enough to warn other nations about the dangers of the COVID-19 virus and that it was, in, in the president's view, too sympathetic to China, which the president argues was concealing the nature of uh, the outbreak and the danger of human transmission and so forth. Not having U.S. funding to the World Health Organization will certainly draw criticism. The president is saying those funds can be directed to other organizations that can help on public health matters around the world. But this is a very notable set of moves from the White House, uh, a cold war is what China officials say is happening between the U.S. and China, these two great economic powers. Certainly, the president added to that today. And then his moves on the World Health Organization are also quite notable, given that uh, the country is still dealing with this illness. Allison? Kelly O'Donnell, thank you so much. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage. Answers to your questions. Insight from medical experts. And up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Former police officer Derek Chauvin has been charged, but there are still so many questions about his encounter with George Floyd. NBC News investigative reporter Emmanuel Saliba looked at security camera footage and cell phone videos from our social news gathering team and pieced together this timeline. It's just after 8 p.m. on May 25th, and the security cameras of this local restaurant are rolling. The indicated time is about 20 minutes fast. A blue Mercedes has been parked curbside on East 38th Street for several minutes. We do not have footage showing when it arrived. George Floyd is in the driver's seat. A police car pulls up in front of this local convenience store and two officers walk in. Minneapolis police said in a statement their officers responded to a report of a forgery in progress, meaning someone was trying to use counterfeit money in a store. A few minutes later, the officers crossed the street and approached the vehicle. The police said they found the suspect in his car. The first officer approaches the driver while his partner walks around to the passenger side. The interaction between the officer and Floyd can't clearly be seen from this angle, but the driver of this black vehicle filmed part of it on his phone. The officer struggles to get Floyd out of the car. His colleague walks over to help him put the handcuffs on. The black car drives off. Floyd falls briefly to the ground. The officer helps him back up before leading him towards the sidewalk where he directs Floyd to sit on the ground. A park police car shows up to the scene. Redacted body cam footage from that new officer was released by the park police chief. The officer exits the car to see his two colleagues questioning Floyd and two people who were just in the car. A few minutes later, the officer helps Floyd up off the ground. The video has no sound, so we don't know what was said between the two officers and Floyd in this moment. They walk him across the street back towards their squad car. Floyd falls to the ground once more. Police originally said they noticed Floyd going into medical distress and called an ambulance to the scene. Another police car pulls up, obstructing our view from this angle and making it hard to clearly see what unfolded in the next four minutes between the officers and Floyd. We do see Officer Chauvin pull up to the scene with his colleague. And behind the vehicle's open door, we can make out what seems to be a struggle. 
Whatever was happening between Floyd and the officers at that very moment caught the attention of this passerby who stops to watch. Two minutes later, a witness standing on Chicago Avenue captures part of the scene unfolding behind the squad car. One officer looks over as three of his colleagues restrain Floyd, who is lying face down on the ground in handcuffs. We don't know how Floyd ended up on the ground. One officer is pressing his knee into Floyd's neck, which we see clearly in this video, taken only seconds later by another witness standing in front of the grocery store. She captured the next 10 minutes of his deadly arrest up until he is taken away in an ambulance. Today, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, seen on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before his death, was charged with third-degree murder and manslaughter. MSNBC host Ali Velshi joining me now from Minneapolis. And Ali, we can hear the crowd. We can hear folks there. How are they reacting to Chauvin's arrest? Well, we're just uh, going through a shift change here. I'll just ask uh, Miguel to show you what's going on. State police here uh, in front of this barricade. Some of them are leaving. They're getting taunted by a number of the protesters. Let me set the uh, stage for you. We are three blocks away from the 3rd Precinct Police Station, which is over there. We were right there last night, and there was no police presence at all. Now you can see there's a lot of state police here. Uh, you've also got National Guard people on either side. We're not seeing any Minneapolis police here right now. But, yeah, so what's happened here is that they have created a set of barricades and a perimeter around the police station, and they pushed protesters back. Now, during the course of the day, there were protesters in the morning, so the fire engines were able to get out here and put out a number of the fires. Uh, there's still one building smoldering over there, but there were several. In fact, Miguel, if you could just show them over there, there's another building on fire right uh, behind us over there. So they're trying to sort of keep control of things, and Allison, what's happened is the mayor has declared a curfew tonight, 8 p.m. Uh, Minneapolis time, 9 p.m. Eastern, until 6 a.m. Okay a.m. tomorrow night and Sunday night. And so what we're trying to figure out is what happens next. Do these people leave and go home? Do the police uh, back off? There seems to be a strategic effort to not get into a conflict with protesters, and that's what we're looking at right now. Ali, you said it. You were in the crowds practically all night last night. We saw fires and looting. Uh, what is the expectation tonight, and does it feel different at all to you there at this stage? Look, you, you can't really tell in the day, because during the day at this time, it was sort of like this. People gathered around. as a little bit of tension. But remember, there was no police to go up against last night. There were no police in the area. So we don't know what the expectation is. Every time we look over here, take a look over there, Miguel. You see more shift change police coming in. Uh, the police are definitely establishing a presence in the distance. You can see they have taken back the uh, police precinct. So nobody knows what's going to happen tonight. When there's a curfew, do people go home? Do they go to St. Paul? Uh, do they get into sort of uh, taunting battles with the police around the city? We, we don't know what's going to happen tonight, uh, but I would say the tension's a little higher here with each passing hour. Absolutely. Ali, have they said anything more? It doesn't sound like it, but about what that means at curfew time? Do they just expect people to go home, or have they said what will happen if you stay out? No. That's the question. No. Uh, it's gone out as a tweet. Uh, the mayor has said it. It's not clear who has to go home and what the police are going to do about it. Remember, for parts of Minneapolis, particularly here in South Minneapolis, it was not evident 24 hours ago there was police control over the area. Now they've closed off areas. I don't know if you call that control, but this area for the next sort of six blocks and maybe three blocks in either directions, maybe 10 square blocks, that's all under police control. Uh, but I don't know how that all uh, how that all plays out at 8 o'clock when the curfew goes into effect. We'll be here to see, but we don't know. Are people going to go home? Are they going to take the, the message from the mayor, or are they going to be back out here in the streets as they have been every night since uh, since Monday? All right, we know you will be there. Allie, stay safe. Thanks for your reporting. It took nearly four days for the officer at the center of George Floyd's death to be charged. Protesters say that was too long, but Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman disagrees. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. This conduct, this criminal action, took place on Monday evening, May 25th, Memorial Day. I'm speaking to you at 1 o'clock on Friday, May 29th. That's less than four days. That's extraordinary. This is by far the fastest we've ever charged a police officer. 
Joining me now, NBC News and MSNBC legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, it has been a long time. Wonderful to have you on News Now. Uh, first, what do you think about the time it took here to arrest Chauvin? Allison, great to see you again. And, um, you know, four days does seem like the authorities moved fairly quickly. However, what I'll say is mm -hmm. that in my 22 years as a homicide prosecutor, we would often uh, review, approve, and issue arrest warrants in murder cases within hours of the murder if the evidence was clear and indisputable with respect to homicide liability. What I see on these tapes makes it look like it is clear and indisputable when you have one officer kneeling on the neck of somebody who's already in handcuffs, who's already incapacitated by four officers uh, applying restraint. And when that officer keeps the knee on the neck of the suspect for six minutes until he loses consciousness yeah. and another three minutes after that, Allison, that seems like a case where there could have been an arrest warrant issued immediately upon reviewing that videotape. Glenn, I want to ask you about the charges, but since we're talking about the video, I want to stay on that for a minute because so many of us looked at it and thought, oh my goodness, this is so obvious here, uh, but you're talking about it in terms of charges, but how about in terms of prosecution? Uh, because we know this is not the first time uh, we've had a case where there has been video. How, what do you say to people who think this should be easy to prosecute here? Look what happened in that video. First of all, no case is a sure thing. No case is easy to prosecute. Take it from me yeah. because I've lost plenty of cases over my career. Um, and particularly yeah. when you are prosecuting a police officer, um, you know, yeah. the police officer will argue that he was in fear for his life. He was protecting the community. And, you know, there are some jurors who might be sitting in that jury box who are amenable to those kind of arguments. However, when you have a, a case of clear excessive force by police officer, officers causing yeah. the death of a citizen that they are sworn to protect, this is a case that had to be brought, should have been brought even more promptly than it was. And like I say, Allison, nothing is a sure thing, but I think on the evidence, it will prove right. to be a very compelling case at trial. All right, Glenn, so let's talk about the two charges here, third degree murder and manslaughter. Uh, can you explain those for those of us who aren't as familiar with the laws you are? Sure. First of all, it's not unusual to charge in the alternative. That means even though there's only one homicide, it's not unusual for prosecutors to bring two different homicide charges because there are different elements that go into proving a manslaughter versus a third degree murder. So a third degree murder under the, the laws of Minnesota um, carries with it up to 25 years in prison. And it is essentially a, a homicide in which the, the defendant, the suspect doesn't necessarily have to intend to kill the victim, but he has to act in an eminently dangerous way that demonstrates an extreme disregard for human life. So it's not like an intentional first degree premeditated murder. It is really this extreme level of recklessness and disregard for human life. So that is the more serious of the two charges. The manslaughter, Allison, is much easier to prove because it really mm -hmm. is a gross negligence standard. If you acted in a way that was grossly negligent and as a result of your negligent conduct, somebody died, that will um, serve as manslaughter liability. Okay. That only carries a 15-year maximum prison term under Minnesota law. So there are two different charges that will be brought. But let me tell you, Allison, I don't think the charging is necessarily over because that's the government's opening salvo. However, they can investigate right. the case and they can ultimately indict the officer or officers for a higher level of homicide if the evidence as it develops supports those greater charges. Glenn, Floyd's family here wanted first degree mur murder charges. Why do you think we saw this third degree charge instead? 
Well, first of all, as I say, it's an opening salvo, but we have to see what all of the evidence shows. First yeah. degree murder is typically a murder that involves premeditation and deliberation. Now, premeditation is forming right. a design to kill another person. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, intend to kill that person and put your plans in place for days and weeks. It can be as quick as a couple of minutes that you engage in premeditation. And then deliberation, which is turning your intent to kill over in your mind, giving it a second thought and deciding to do it can also take place very quickly. But premeditation and deliberation, those are states of mind that we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in a murder case. And even in the, the more run of the mill, the more routine murder case, not involving a police officer, those are very high burdens for prosecutors to prove. Um, we have to see where the evidence lays out, but it may be that they end up bumping this up from a third degree murder to a second degree murder. Mm -hmm. um, but I am glad that even after a four day delay, they have brought charges against the, the officer who seems to be most culpable. However, there, cer there certainly seems to be criminal culpability with those other officers who were applying pressure until Mr. Floyd was dead. Yeah, Glenn, let, let me ask you about that. As you said, there were three other officers involved in this incident. Hennepin County Attorney Mike Freeman says he does anticipate charges. What do you think prosecutors might look at there? You know, I think um, it really depends on exactly what the medical examiner rules with respect to the cause and manner of death. Um, that will determine, in part, the level of culpability um, and the appropriate charges that could be brought against the other officer, officers who were involved in restraint while the, the main offender, it looks like Officer Covan, had his knee on the neck of George Floyd until he stopped moving and even thereafter until he was dead. So those officers who were applying restraint, they have a duty of care to Mr. Floyd as well. And it's a duty to protect Mr. Floyd's life, not assist Officer Covan in ending Mr. Floyd's life. Glenn Kirshner, always appreciate your legal expertise, uh, but we could really use it in times like this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Allison. Former Vice President Joe Biden demanding justice in the death of George Floyd, saying, quote, none of us can be silent. Here's what he told MSNBC and Today Show anchor Craig Melvin after Derek Chauvin's arrest was announced. For your time, sir, Let, let's just start with uh, the news of the day. Of course, as you know, um, the officer who, who had his knee on George, uh, George Floyd's neck uh, for almost nine minutes, charged with third degree murder, charged with manslaughter um, of, of Floyd's family, indicating that they would have preferred a first degree murder charge. Uh, do you think that justice has been served? Well, it's not finished yet. We'll see what happens. Uh, look, I, I'm not going to make the fact that he was charged with murder and was charged with manslaughter as well as a minimum of what should have been done. Nine minutes on that man's neck when his face was up against the curb and being crushed is totally, totally, totally inappropriate under any circumstances. And uh, it is it is it is it's brutality. Uh, President Trump indicated uh, a short time ago that um, the administration, at least, had spoken with with George Floyd's family. I know that you've talked to you've talked to the family as well. Um, it was a private conversation. I, I don't I don't want to put you in a tough spot to divulge the contents of the conversation. But can you characterize at least um, what what you said to them, what they said to you? What I said to them was that. Uh, I had just a little bit of sense from different losses, what a black hole they felt like they're in. They felt like they're being sucked into this great void within their chest, I, that, they, that they just felt lost. And, uh, and I indicated to them that uh, um, when they talked to me about George, he seemed to be everybody's mentor in the family. His brothers, his cousins, who were his peers, who thought of him as a brother, the way everybody looked to him for leadership, the kind of decent man he was, that uh, it has a profound impact on a whole family. But I was incredibly impressed with how, how uh, significantly um, 
They had focused on what was at stake. Um, I was incredibly impressed at their uh, at their depth of their sense of the impact on not just their family but the entire community. I was in, and they, they they had a they were worried about the violence in the streets as well. But they they were just a truly truly impressive family and uh, and we talked about uh, about loss and. Um, and I urge them to do what at least help my family. Uh, not the same thing. My, my son was not murdered and my daughter and my wife were not murdered. They were killed in an accident by a tractor trailer. I'm not suggesting that, but I am saying that. I said the only thing that I know is that George will be part of their heart and their consciousness the rest of their lives. And the day will come when they think of George, instead of crying, they'll have a smile first. That's when they know they're going to make it. But stick with one another. They'll get one another through. And they were very, um, they, they were more grateful than they should have been. I was grateful they took the call from me because I wanted to let them know how much courage and grace and, and how unimaginably painful it is for this moment. I promised them I'd do anything in my power to see justice to serve for George. Uh, you know, we must. We have to do this. It's who we are as a country. We have to step up. We have to step up at this moment. And I think the public is ready to. Twitter putting another label on one of President Trump's tweets, this time a warning on this tweet about the Minneapolis protests. The president tweeting, quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walz and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty and we will assume control. But when the looting starts, the shooting starts. NBC News senior media reporter Dylan Byers joining us now. And Dylan, what happened here with President Trump's tweet? Uh, how is Twitter explaining this particular label? Sure. Well, for Twitter, the, the calculation here is they have a policy. And one of those policies is that uh, they don't condone tweets promoting violence. Normally, uh, if, if any random Twitter user, even yourself or myself, were to post a tweet promoting violence, they would take that tweet down. They might even go further into looking at whether or not they should ban the user, uh, uh, him or herself. In this case, when you're talking about the president of the United States or any government official or major political figure, they have made the judgment that it is so politically newsworthy and important for people to be able to see that tweet and talk about that tweet and discuss that tweet. It's violence. They hide it and then they give you the option to click on it. Now, Twitter is sort of locked in a little bit of a a, a, a sort of push and pull with the White House right now, because what the White House then did is it went out from the official White House account and tweeted out the same language, forcing Twitter to put yet another disclaimer on that tweet. And this is sort of a back and forth and a little bit of a game of whack-a-mole that we might see play out well into next week. Uh, Dylan, there is some history to the last part of the tweet when the president says when the looting starts, the shooting starts. For our viewers who aren't familiar with it, could you give us some of the background? Yeah, absolutely. And so it, it dates back to a statement that was made by the uh, Walter Headley, the chief of police in Miami back in 1967. And in that same statement, he effectively said that they didn't mind being accused of police brutality. Uh, it was then echoed by the segregationist George Wallace in 1968, one year later. And I think it's telling that that is the quote that the president cited, uh, because things are starting to feel a lot like 1968 right now in America with what we see in Minneapolis and, 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 and with the, um, you know, with, with the, with what happened, uh, in Minneapolis. So, uh, you know, the, the white house is now trying to claim that, the president wasn't promoting violence, that he was condemning violence. It's a very hard case to make when you're when you're quoting segregationists. Yeah, yeah sure is. Dylan Byers, thanks so much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. The Paycheck Protection Program is supposed to help small businesses during this pandemic, but NBC News has learned that private jet owners are also benefiting from the program. NBC News senior political analyst Jonathan Allen joins me now. He worked on this story with Steph Rule and Mike Capetta. Uh, John, private jets, not exactly the small businesses most people uh, were picturing here. Your reporting focuses on an aviation company in California. How did they qualify for the Paycheck Protection Program, and what did they do with the money. You know, it's interesting, Allison. They got uh, two different pots of money. One of them is uh, from uh, an aviation payroll support program that goes to their sort of main costs. And then the other one, they got that PPP loan. And what that does is it allows them to pay uh, flight attendants and uh, and pilots and other people who are jet owners, but the management company is sort of a pass-through. Uh, it's complicated stuff, but the short answer is jet owners don't have to pay to keep their pilots on uh, because of the PPP program. So a lot of people might have raised eyebrows over this one, not exactly what they were thinking. What is the company saying here? I mean, the company says uh, they've lost 94% of uh, their flights uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that a lot of okay. these uh, people who work for the jet owners would end up uh, would end up losing their jobs uh, if it weren't for some sort of relief. John, there are some pretty strict stipulations about what businesses can do with the PPP money if they want loan forgiveness. Are there rules that stop business owners from handing over funds to people who aren't employees? Um, there are very uh, sort of strict ideas of the rules uh, that you have to uh, give okay. a certain percentage of the money to uh, to employees. And at the same time, uh, there's not a lot of oversight right now of the program. There may be at a later date, uh, the company Clay Lacey Aviation, in, the, in a letter that we obtained uh, that they had sent to their jet owners, said that it's possible that the uh, loan might not be forgiven. And in that case, they won't give uh, the main benefit that they gave to these jet owners, which is a credit with the uh, with the aviation company, meaning that they get uh, a credit to their account. Um, if it's clawed back or if the loan doesn't become forgivable for some reason, uh, then those credits will disappear. Uh, so they anticipate the possibility of that, but also in reading the letter that they sent, it seems pretty clear they believe that they are uh, both qualified for the loan and will uh, be able to get it to a point where uh, it is forgiven. Are you seeing anything similar to this with other types of companies outside of the private jet space? 
this is the first one, but we're going to keep digging. Uh, there's very little oversight right now of any of these programs from uh, the government. There was a $2.2 trillion CARES Act that included uh, some of the small business money and also uh, money to rescue the aviation industry. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of the things uh, flying out the door in Washington, uh, there have not been uh, the sort of rigorous oversight mechanisms you would think. Um, and as a result, uh, there's a lot of work for journalists to yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, and John, it seems like you've got almost two extremes here, right? On one hand, you have these small business owners who are so worried about doing everything the right way because they need to have those loans forgiven uh, if they want to survive. And, and then you hear a story like this, and it makes people wonder if maybe the next time around when we're looking at stimulus, uh, if we need to do things a little differently for these businesses. I mean, really, it's amazing what you've got here is people who own private jets, uh, essentially, uh, potentially laying off pilots and uh, and flight attendants uh, for the relative pittance uh, that it would cost to keep them on board. Um, and the other thing is a company like Clay Lacey Aviation is first in line. If you are a company that's taken major loans from banks, if you're a company that's getting $27 million from uh, another uh, you know, piece of uh, federal, uh, federal assistance, uh, it's going to be very easy for you to go get that loan. I know a lot of small business owners that, and the types of businesses that you would think about, restaurants and the like, uh, felt like they were at the back of the line, and the truth is they were. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. John Allen, I always look forward to seeing you reporting on NBCNews.com. We love it even more when you come to visit us on News Now. Thank you and have a great weekend. My pleasure. You too, Allison. South Korea tightening restrictions again after a spike in coronavirus infections. Public places, including museums and theaters, shut down immediately. NBC News correspondent Kelly Kobiea reports from Seoul. A big shift today here in Seoul, home to half of this country's population, some 25 million people, of people in the metropolitan area being told to stay inside over the weekend. Public parks, public buildings like museums, theaters, uh, art galleries have all been closed for the next two weeks, all because of this outbreak centered around one of South Korea's biggest e-commerce businesses. It started in a logistics hub, a logistics warehouse. Uh, several hundred people have already been tested. About 100 have tested positive, among them delivery workers and some of the people that they came into contact with. I spoke to the public health director for the city of Seoul today. He told me they're not just concerned about the rise in cases. They saw actually the biggest spike in daily new cases this past week than they have in two months. They're also concerned about a rise in cases that they can't trace. They can't figure out the source of them. Uh, so this is why they're putting these new measures in place. They're hoping that they can really clamp down, stop the spread of this new cluster in Seoul. Uh, and the next two weeks, they say, really are critical. Allison. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's go right out to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She has the very latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, give us an update. Hey, Allison, lots of news in this hour. First, the now former police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested and charged with third degree murder and manslaughter, according to Minnesota's Public Safety Commissioner. Here's County Attorney Mike Freeman. He has been charged with third degree murder. We are in the process of continuing to review the evidence. There may be subsequent charges. Now, public outcry over the death of George Floyd continued overnight, turning increasingly violent. A police precinct was set on fire in Minneapolis, and unrest broke out in St. Paul. Now, from NBC's Jamie Nodal, the battle between President Trump and Twitter continues after the tech company put a warning label on one of the president's tweets, calling protesters, quote, thugs, and saying, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Twitter said it was, quote, glorifying violence. Now, later this morning, the official White House account put out the same tweet, and Twitter again put a warning label on it. This, of course, follows Twitter for the first time uh, adding a fact check label to, to two of the president's tweets earlier this week. Now, news from Kentucky, protesters demanding justice for Breonna Taylor, 
who was killed by Louisville police back in March, turned violent last night. That's from NBC's Phil Helsel and Dennis Romero. Seven people were shot with at least one in critical condition. A police sergeant told NBC News that officers were not involved in those shootings. Audio from a 9-11 call made the night of uh, Breonna Taylor's death was also released. In a tweet, Governor Andy Bashar said, quote, my heart aches for Louisville and our country. Breonna Taylor's family and the public deserve the truth. And lastly, a new study shows prescriptions of hydroxychloroquine surged by nearly 2,000 percent in March after the president first promoted the drug as a potential treatment for coronavirus. That's the latest from CNBC's Berkeley Loveless. The president has often touted the use of the anti-malarial drug, even taking it himself, though it has not yet been proven to be an effective treatment against the coronavirus. These findings also follow a study published earlier this month showing that hospitalized patients of COVID-19 patients that took hydroxychloroquine would be more likely actually to die than those who didn't. Now, those are the latest headlines for this hour. As always, we'll be back a little later with more, Allison. Thank you so much. Out of Minnesota today, the officer shown on video kneeling on George Floyd's neck before he died has been arrested and charged with both third degree murder and manslaughter. Last night in Minneapolis, a third straight night of protests, police there using tear gas and clashes with some of those protesters. There was looting. There were fires, including a fire at the police department's third precinct, home to the four officers fired after Floyd's death. Today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz said the world is watching the visceral pain in response to Floyd's death, and he urged people to come together to restore peace. I understand that. And I will not patronize you as a white man without living those, those lived experiences of how very difficult that is. But I'm asking you to help us. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard, not those who throw firebombs into businesses that are communities of colors have worked so hard to build. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joining me now from Minneapolis. And, and Morgan, Officer Derek Chauvin charged, arrested. What is the reaction there uh, in Minneapolis today? Yeah, Allison, good afternoon. We know the word of Chauvin's arrest has made its way through this crowd here, but uh, we're not seeing the numbers that we did yesterday, and we're also not seeing that, mm -hmm. uh, that tension necessarily that we witnessed uh, with the hundreds of people gathering uh, near some of the businesses behind me. I can say that one of the reasons behind that is probably this increased police presence, and I'll just kind of let you take a look. These are state patrol officers that came in early this morning uh, and established a very wide perimeter around some of the more damaged areas here in Minneapolis. And through the better part of yesterday evening and well into the night, um, there was no sign of any police presence per se uh, or National Guard. And we know that the governor signed that proclamation yesterday, allowing the National Guard to, to come in and help is needed. Uh, but we really didn't see that resource being used until today. And you can see that police are out here in mass uh, letting firefighters do their job uh, while also maintaining uh, a perimeter, not just here in this area, but uh, well, well around that 10 block radius that was significantly damaged uh, over the past several days. So uh, as it stands right now, Chauvin's arrest uh, from those that I've spoken to here in the crowd, they say is a hopeful first step uh, towards achieving justice uh, in the death of George Floyd. Uh, but everyone's saying there's uh, much more to come. Those three other officers that were involved uh, in the death of mm -hmm. Floyd uh, have yet to be taken into custody. However, we are hearing from officials that charges do await them as well. Uh, so very much a, a watch and wait mentality here right now. Um, yeah. And everyone just kind of uh, taking a deep breath after so many days uh, of tension uh, in this community. Allison. Uh, Morgan, you mentioned the National Guard there. The governor saying they did not pre-deploy the National Guard uh, ahead of last night's protest. Did he say why they did not do that last night? Now, we're still waiting on an exact reason uh, regarding the National mm -hmm. Guard, Allison. We do know that the mayor of Minneapolis was also questioned uh, as